So I just watched this video by Peng Penguify. I don't know how to pronounce their name. Penguify, Penguify. Uh, one of my favorite YouTubers. Um, and uh, he posted this video on his second channel. And the, the video is very relatable to me. Um, I highly recommend checking it out. Uh, if you're a Denpo, if you're someone who watches this channel, then you're probably going to also relate to this Penguify, Penguify videos. It's, I think, kind of a similar, similar communities, sim similar people, autists and so on. But yeah, watching that video kind of inspired me to make more podcasts. In fact, he was the Penguify. I should just decide how to say his name. Penguify. Penguify. Um... He was the person who originally inspired me to do the first um, podcast to relax and study to video because he made a video called like X amount of origami to relax and study to. And I thought that was a really good video format for like the long form off the cuff autobiographical stuff that I like to talk about. Um, and... Oh yeah, I want to talk about the Mario video at some point during this. But, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So, <coughs> I watched this Penguify video, and uh, yeah, I really liked it. Uh, and I thought I should record a video, it inspired me to record a podcast. Uh, yeah, there was some stuff, um, I don't know, I haven't planned out what I'm going to talk about as thoroughly as I did last time, so this might be a little more mangled. I'm also just kind of, I've been playing TF2 for like five hours straight and my brain is kind of rotting. So, yeah. Uh, this, oh yeah, this is what I was going to talk about. So, I feel like there's one, like, key difference. Whenever I hear people that I relate to a lot, like, they talk about having really similar thought processes and life experiences to me, uh, like, extremely similar to the point where it's like, 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 you know, at first, I'm trying desperately not to do, okay, I'm trying not to mention Digibo, but I kind of, I'm just going to bring up Digibo once, I promise you this is not going to be like the last time where half the video is about Digi, we're going to bring up Digibo once right now and then never again, I promise you, uh, like, Digi would also talk about life experiences and I would relate heavily and, you know, this was the first time I'd ever heard anyone talk about stuff that I could relate to on that level, have that sort of similar thought processes and so on. But it turns out, you know, that this is actually a pretty common thing with us kind of people, shut-in kind of people, autist-type people, I guess. I don't know. I think, yeah, maybe what I'm describing is just having a level of autism. Uh, yeah, it's it's not, you know, it wasn't as miraculous as I first thought to find someone who had similar experiences to me. Of course, I have friends and people I know who also I can relate to strongly uh, nowadays that I didn't have back then. Um, and they all have, yeah, you know, tell similar stories about being in school and similar stories about being online and so on. But there's, a, there's two, like, aspects where I always differ from these other people, where I feel like I am, I'm not relatable. Uh, and I feel like, you know, very strange about it because it almost feels like I'm lying like I'm cheating by pretending to be like these people or similar when I have these like two glaring differences and they're somewhat related uh, the first one is niche interests as a kid now I always had niche interests but I feel like it was not the same level as other people who talk about this sort of thing like both Penguify and Digi were bronies as, as a kid, uh, I was never a brony, um, but, but more than that, like, I just never had, like, the problem wasn't that I wasn't interested in this stuff, like, I can guarantee you I would have been a brony, or I would have been really into Homestuck, the problem was simply that I didn't have any way to find this stuff when I was a kid, like, I wasn't, I was, there's, there's two types of stupid, right, there's two types of stupid, there's, that one type of stupid is just not having enough knowledge, and the second type of stupid is when you have the knowledge but you don't know how to use it properly or sort through it or uh, get at it properly. Um, so I never had the second type of stupid. Well, sometimes I have, especially as a kid and a teenager, especially, especially. 
I don't know what I'm talking about. I definitely did have that second type of stupid as well as a teenager, especially. And obviously still to some extent today, I'm not a genius or anything. Um, I hope I'm smarter than I was when I was 14, but uh, yeah. But the main thing that I lacked was the first type of stupid. The first, like I just didn't have the knowledge in the first place to even make use of. I didn't have, uh, like, I didn't know where to go. to f- Like, I didn't know how people found these sorts of interesting things. No one ever, I don't even know to this day how people find this sort of, how people found this sort of stuff back then. Like, I know now we have algorithms and search engines that are really good and Discord communities and so on. I find new stuff to be interested in, it feels like, every other day. But when I was a kid, um, the internet was a little different and I I don't know how did people find Homestuck back then. How did people find the forums that they hung out on? I mean, by the time I was hanging out on forums, it was later than most people. Or even, you know, when I was really young, all of my friends were on uh, MSN, which I never had, well, I didn't have a computer back then. And I never had video games, so just fundamentally, I would have loved to have these niche interests, and to some extent I did. But I feel like you know, most of the time, people, uh, like, pengraphy, pengraphy, I, I'm like, whatever, are talking about, like, how they, ha- as a kid, they had all these niche interests, and they would try and talk to people about it, and no one would be interested, um, I didn't even have, I would have been that guy, but I didn't even have the opportunity to be that guy, except by the time I got into magic, really, um, like, if I remember correctly, the first thing I got, I got a, I believe, what do they call it? Hyperfixation. The first thing I got fixated on was beatboxing. You know, you know, <laughs> beatboxing. When I was uh, maybe, I don't, I, my ages are hard. Let's go with like eight, nine. I, I found out about beatboxing and I would just beatbox to myself all the time. I can still do it. I'm still like slightly better than average at beatboxing, which is a stupid fucking skill to have. You'd imagine as a musician it's really useful, and I do think it helped me to get an ingrained sense of rhythm as a as a kid. Uh, so it probably was a good thing, just general musical knowledge. Like that's probably good. I never really thought about that until just now. Yeah, I bet learning to beatbox did help me to internalize rhythm and meter uh, more strongly as a kid. So that's probably a good thing. Uh, but I, it's not like I ever use it in, when I'm actually recording songs. You'd think, you know, I'm not Beardy Man, right? Like, like I would love to be Beardy Man if Beardy Man wasn't already Beardy Man. Like, the way he makes music on the fly live, like, with the improvisational sh- sort of aspects and the, the like, off-the-cuff spontaneity of it all, that feels, like, so natural to me because the first creative musical thing I ever did was beatboxing. And I kind of, yeah, I kind of been searching for that workflow my whole life. Like, since it's so fast to have an idea and then make a sound that sounds like that idea when you're making mouth noises, um, you know, like, that's being the first real musical creativity I had. I've just always been searching for ways to make my, make stuff faster. And, you, you know, Logic, I've actually... After finally updating to the newest version of Logic, they've actually added this feature, called, like a live loops feature like Ableton has. Um, but I'm so used to the workflow of like the normal Logic workflow, and I'm so fast with it, that live loops is actually slower for me. Maybe if I pra- like went back to square one and learned it from scratch, I'd actually look up some like YouTube tutorials, I could be using live loops more often, but yeah, whatever. Um, so that was the first thing I was interested in, but there's nothing to really talk to anyone about beatboxing, you know? Like, there's nothing to there's nothing to go on an autistic rant about with beatboxing. You just kind of make noises. Like, the furthest I ever... The, the closest I ever got was when... Because I would be always beatboxing in class. The teacher, at one point, was like, Hey, you should do it. I, I think they thought I was looking... F- I mean, they were right. They were thinking oh, he wants to, like, show off that he can beatbox, and then they said at some point in, the, like, one lesson, like, hey, do a do a beatboxing performance in one of the class, and so I did it, and I had fun. I did, uh, I mean, again, I was, like, seven. I wasn't particularly good at it, but 
I thought it was fun, and it seemed like people, I don't actually have any idea how people thought of it who were in the class, but whatever. So that was the first thing that I got really into. Um, I had a very brief dinosaur phase, but that, yeah, that didn't really last very long. There was something else. Pokemon, I guess, was a big one. Pokemon and Ben 10 were two big ones. Um, but the problem was that in my school, um, the Pokemon games weren't such a big deal until later. Like, the because the, I, I would play Pokemon Emerald, right? That was the first Pokemon game I had. But I was too young to understand it. I don't know, the timeline gets kind of jumbled in my head. Uh, I just remember that no one wanted to talk about the Pokemon games until I was in, like, year six when Diamond and Pearl came out. And then there was, like, a brief surge of people wanting to talk about the Pokemon games. But I wasn't particularly good at the games. Like, it wasn't like I could flex having shinies or, you know, legendaries or anything like that. Like, I, I was kind of bad at the games uh, and not particularly fast as a gamer. So, you know, it wasn't like there was any sort of social aspect to it like that, really. But I just knew all the Pokemon names and I like really obsessed over the different, just just the, the looks and the names of the Pokemon. But then, you know, once you graduate into secondary school, suddenly Pokemon is like kiddie shit and no one wants to talk about it anymore. And not just in the sense of like, oh, and then I had to keep it to myself. I also lost interest uh, by that time as well. Uh, it, it, yeah. Um, and then Ben 10... Uh, you know, I, I, I didn't, it didn't even occur to me that people in my school would be interested in Ben 10. I would just only talk to my, I mean, I remember one of the first times I ever went on, a, on like a, a rant about autistic hyperfixation. I like interrupted my, I was like, this can't wait. I need to go right now, interrupt my dad doing whatever he's doing and explain Ben 10 to him in as much detail as I can possibly master. And I did it. And I, even at the time, I could tell you, you, there's a feeling that you get when you're like, there's, there's a thing that you will experience a lot of like being a, an autistic person ranting about a, a, a fixation or whatever. And you get this feeling from the other person that they're not really interested in what you're saying or even necessarily following it, but they're just humoring you. And, like, they're not being rude about it, but they're just being polite and saying, like, oh, yeah, that's interesting, and they're not going to remember any of it or anything like that, or they're not asking any questions, um, which is fine. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just an experience you're going to have a lot. Uh, like, I can't... Obviously, I don't expect people to instantly get hooked on whatever I'm interested in just from describing it to them. You know, I don't think... There's very few times when that's happened to me on the other side, so... You know, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it's just an experience. Like, the vibe of, like, I can tell this person isn't actually interested from the responses they're giving, but I don't care, I just need to say this thing. Like, that's something that would happen to me a lot, and I very specifically remember that happening with Ben 10. And I was really into Upgrade, the Ben 10 alien, just as a being. He was really cool to me. Um, and Accelerate, those are the best ones. And Cannon, Cannonbolt, Cannon, Cannonbolt, Cannonbolt, I think was his name. The guy that rolls up like Sonic. He was also really cool. Those are like the best ones. Uh, uh, but yeah, I never talked to anyone in school about that. So, I, but that's not really a niche interest because everyone would have been watching Ben 10 as well. Like everyone at that age would have also been watching Ben 10. Uh, and the only other thing that I, yeah, so whatever. And then, um... The next thing that I got into, I actually got pretty lucky here, which is that you, you guys ever have like school like trends? Oh, I should finish my thought about Pokemon. I said that like the the video games weren't the big thing because the the, the TCG was the big thing in my school. Pokemon cards uh, was the big thing, uh, trading and stuff. And then eventually one person like sold his Pokemon deck for like a lot of money to someone in school and they banned, like the teachers found out and they banned Pokemon cards because of that. Uh, yeah. I, I say it was a lot of money. It, I don't remember. It really was not a lot of money from an adult perspective. But from a kid perspective, I, it was a lot of money. I don't remember how much. Uh, but anyway, uh, they wouldn't even play the game, really. The only people who would actually play card games was prior to the Pokemon. Like, the Pokemon thing was us in the younger years. But the, the, the upper years... 
they were into Yu-Gi-Oh! And they would actually play the game against each other. But we didn't really play Yu-Gi-Oh! Actually, am I remembering this correctly? I think it might have been the case that because the... So at first, Pokemon cards were a thing. And then... But it was... Then it became small because it became... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It became overshadowed by Yu-Gi-Oh! And then I was the only... I, like There was just me and like a small group of other people who would do the Pokemon. But it wasn't so much that I... Like, again, it, I was type 1 stupid in this situation. Because I didn't understand Pokemon cards very well at all. Like, I couldn't have a classic autism rant moment where I where I talk about Pokemon cards to you. Because I didn't have any real understanding of what it would even mean to do that. Like, I didn't have anything to talk about. I just thought it was neat. So then going into secondary school, there was... This thing called Miyachi, which you definitely don't know about, but it's basically a hacky sack, but instead of you can only hit it with your feet, it's you can only hit it with the back of your hands, and you do like tricks with it. It's a skill toy. It's like an obscure skill toy. And for some strange reason, that like spread through my school like wildfire. Everyone got really into that. And I also got really into it. And I found my Miyachi years later. And, you know, at the time I was doing these tricks with it and I thought it was like there was stuff that I was really struggling with. Right. And then I came back to it a few years later and all of these tricks that I thought were hard were so easy. And I was very confused as to like, why was I ever struggling to do these tricks? Like none of this is difficult in the slightest. <laughs> this is almost trivially easy uh, to the point where it's like not even fun because it's kind of trivially easy. Um, but that was cool because that was like a very autism friendly thing to be into, skill toys in general, right? And so that's that sort of going through the school and me getting introduced to it, that was that was actually sick. So it's another situation where I didn't have this niche hobby that I couldn't talk to anyone about because everyone was into this thing. And outside of the things that people were into, I had no idea how to find new things. Um, uh, and then after that, I got into magic. Uh, like card magic, but I got into card magic with a school friend, so it would just, and I always had just one friend. You know what, this is a good time to talk about this, actually. So, uh, tangent. Tangent that could be its own video. I'm not gonna split this up into parts like the other one, I'm just gonna, well, I might, I don't have any real plans. This one's less planned, we're doing, we're more off the cuff this time. Uh, so, what was I gonna say? Oh yeah, so, at, in school, Actually, no, 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 I'm not going to talk about this now. I'm going to talk about this after I go through this, this autistic obsession, hobby, niche hobby thing. That's what we should call it, niche hobby. After we go through the niche hobby thing, I'll come back and I'll talk about the other thing. Okay, perfect. So, yeah, I got into card magic, but I got into card magic with a friend in school. And because we both got into it at the same time, no, no one else was particularly interested in it, but... The great thing about card magic, as an autistic child, is that it's a, it's a social catalyst, right? Like, it, it is, it lets you talk to people. You have to talk to people to perform card magic. And it was fucking amazing for me, having this, like, in to, to like, a little barrier of social interaction. Because, you know, when you're autistic and you're interacting with people, you a lot of autistic people including me we have like scripts right we have sort of like rote answers and rote questions and stuff that we always default to that we know work every time because otherwise you know if we're just improvising it's going to go very wrong often um and magic is all about patter the patter is essentially having a script that you go through every time when you do a trick uh, it's not like a strict script but having like beats of patter that you hit when you are doing a trick sometimes they're really important to how the trick works like they could be misdirection or subtle psychological um techniques um which are very fun when you pull those off uh, but sometimes they are just like little jokes that you do when you do the trick and, and stuff like that little bits of polish and so doing magic is a kind of a perfect thing for an autistic person right because it requires a lot of sitting in your room practicing over and over and over again and doing a thing with your fingers and stuff like that right the adhd autism fidget thing skill toy thing but then also 
it also require like it's also an interactive thing that makes people think you're cool and is entertaining and i i was all about entertaining people and making you know being very desperate for affirmation and attention throughout this entire time in my life so it was pretty good for me um but then for some reason <laughs> well, i guess the problem was that i performed all the tricks to all the people in my class and even not in my class and people just kind of got bored and people didn't want to see magic tricks anymore and i also got bored of performing the same tricks to the same people because after a while they start you know the thing about learning magic which is why i don't recommend people learn magic even though these days with the internet it's kind of on unav- like the the it's it's a little unavoidable like people um come across like magic tricks revealed on youtube and tiktok and so on all the time and so magic is very different now than it was when i was doing it uh but i generally don't recommend looking at like how the magic is done because most ma- like the majority of tricks work on the same like 10 fundamental moves and principles uh, and once you like you learn what those principles are very quickly you might not be able to do them very well you know you might not be anywhere near as technically skilled as a professional magician but you learn what the principles are and so even if you can't do them as well as a professional or like someone really good at magic because you know what they are you know what to look for and so most tricks don't work on you anymore because you just know the principles like you know that's a double lift that's a second deal that's a bottom deal that's a false cut that's like you know you know once you know the the like 10 or so basic principles that underlie most of magic then uh yeah like there's only like the only tricks that are going to fool you are like the exceptional ones and then you end up chasing the high which is why the show fool us the pen and teller fool us show exists is literally because pen and teller like every magician is chasing the high of the first time they saw a magic trick and it absolutely fooled them uh which is a great feeling especially when you're a magician like when you're a magician you're like how the fuck did he do like when i watch like uh some of these people and they're just fucking insane the worst part that is and by worst i mean best because it's like you you get when you get your mind blown it's this weird like bittersweet feeling of like you you've lost you failed to catch them out but also like holy shit that was amazing um uh and like the 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 worst one is when you know roughly how someone did like that there's only one way someone could have done something and yet the way they did it was so smooth you didn't catch them at all and you're like wait he forced that what when wait when did he do when did he fucking plant that when did he do it? like you know like that's that's the craziest bit um so anyway i got into magic um and then uh yeah after people started to be too familiar with my tricks and so on i would also do magic to people like just all the time like i would i would do magic because i would be practicing with cards in my hand on the bus on the way like home from school and on the, the way to school and i had like at the time i was in an orchestra and i would be you know doing magic to people in the orchestra i was in like a young orchestra for for kids uh, like i would be doing it constantly to everyone um and like in the bus you know it would be like a like two times a week kind of occurrence where i would be practicing on the bus and someone would be like someone and cuz you know all the schools end at the same time so there would often be other school kids on the bus as well it would be mostly like school kids on buses and so you know one of them would so it was really loud i think um uh yeah and someone would be like did you magic she like show me a magic trick and i'd end up doing like performances on the bus to to these people and sometimes it, they wouldn't go well which was also a good life lesson like it, it's one of the best things about magic is that you you're never go- you know you can practice for hours and hours but in the real world when uh people are unpredictable tricks just fail sometimes like you there is no trick that you can hit 100% of the time with 100% of people in 100% of situations you can be re- unless you're insane if you're really insane you can 
but that at that point it because like the way you become insane is just by failing so many times that you know what to do in every situation uh like the uh crowd control type of stuff uh like sometimes because the problem with magic right is that that all the things that seem like they don't matter actually really really matter right and all the things that seem like they really matter by the time you're doing them the magic like they don't matter that's the whole point that's like how magic works that's the basic psychology is that like you always do a move when it seems like you're doing nothing you never want to do a move when it looks like you're doing a move right but you can misdirect by making it look like you're doing a move but actually everything's already done uh you know like an example would be uh like changing a card like if you have a, a card and you want to change it to a different card in the spectator's hands you know you put the card in this in their hands and then you you'd be like and now i'm going to reach in between your hands and i'm actually going to change it so fast that you're not even going to feel anything and then you mine that out and it's all fucking stupid patter bullshit just to make the trick have some sort of narrative to it but the thing is by the time you're doing that patter the trick's already done like you're just building up hype for when they're going to open their hands and find out that the card was changed but in reality you never put their card in you never put the original card in their hands like you put it you put the card was already changed before you ever did anything that looked like it could be a, a magical move or anything so the reason i bring that up is because sometimes these things are spectator dependent sometimes the thing that's a move depends on the spectator doing something really specific but if you're like overly specific with their directions now like you're drawing attention to it so you have to somehow give really specific directions that mean they won't fuck up the trick for you but also make it seem like very naturalistic like that's not the part of the trick that matters this is just the build up and then the end where the trick happens by which time you've already done the trick like that's the bit that matters and then you draw attention to it like there's a weird psychological thing that's happening here where you have to use really specific language but make it seem very naturalistic and casual um and you learn a few tricks like this um for example there was one trick where again it's something where i'm placing a card in a spectator's hand and it, the the card is already a different card like it's not the card the card that i'm putting in their hand isn't the card they think i'm putting in their hand right uh, it's part of a, a thing, but anyway, and so what I started to, the first time I would say, and just put your hand out, and then I'm gonna put the card on your hand, and people would just take it and look at it, like, and they'd be like, oh, what? And then the trick would would be weird, right? Uh, so I started to say like, put your hand out flat like a table, and then it's like, and and then the second I I would put the card there, I would look at look them in the eye. Because people have a natural response that if you if you look up at them in the eye, they will naturally look up to meet your eye normally, unless they're really burning your hands because they're trying to catch you out. In which case, you can use that to your advantage too. But you know, normally, like most people, if you do something and then you look up, so like you're going to look them in the eye, they will look up to meet your eyes too. And that, like, that's all you have to do is d like distract them for the like fifteen or for the like the little bit where they first have the instinct to turn over the card because if you've already put the card in their hand you've said flat like a table so they they know exactly what to do they have no excuse like if they grab the card the wrong way that's entirely up like their fault they know they're trying to fuck up the trick and like no one none of their friends are going to like them for fucking up a trick right that's not impressive it's just stupid no one wants to fuck up a trick on purpose very few sometimes people do but it's it's rare and in those cases you just don't you just you just avoid those people um so you say flat like a table and you you mime it right with your own hand like put your hand out flat like a table and you mime it and then they do the same thing and you put you put the card in keep your hand on top of the card so they don't have the opportunity to move it and then look up and start talking to them they'll look up to meet your eyes and then you can take your hand off the card and then you then they're not going to turn it over it's so but without at no point like you have to do all of that so that you avoid saying like do not turn the card over because it, you can't say that because then it implies that the card is not what they think it is. You can't say that out loud, but you have to like use all of this psychological shit to make it heavily implied that they don't have the opportunity to turn the card over in the first place, but without actually drawing any attention to this fact, like without seeming, making it seem completely natural. Like, because the real magic trick, this is something I didn't really understand when I was doing magic as a kid, but I've learned 
getting back into magic as an adult. The real magic doesn't even happen while you're doing it. Like, the real trick is all about making people remember how it happened. And it doesn't matter. Like, the 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 point of doing something like this, this, like, subtlety of, like, how you keep someone from turning the card over without telling them, don't turn it over, is that when they go back and they run over the trick in their mind to try and figure out how they did it, they're going to think, and I could have turned over that card and looked at it, but I just chose not to. It was a free choice, even though it wasn't really a free choice at all. Um... And you, you can manipulate people's memories like that. And that's what the real trick is, right? Because is it that the real trick is after the final effect has happened, the first thing a spectator does is they run through the trick in their memory to try and figure out how it was done. And so if you can use subtleties like that to try and like imprint slightly different events than what actually happened, like, oh, I could have turned the card over, even though in reality you never had the opportunity to. I made sure you didn't. Like, that's the thing, that that's those sorts of subtleties are the things that make a trick from, like, good to great. Anyway, that was a big fucking tangent. <laughs> so, yeah, magic. That was cool. But then I got into cardistry from magic. If you don't know what cardistry is, it's basically, like, fancy shuffling playing cards. Cardistry is way less um, impressive to the average person. It's the sort of thing that's only impressive to people who know how hard it is, but it just kind of all looks the same to the average person. Which is part of what got me sort of disenchanted with the whole cardistry scene after a while. Is it kind of felt like wankery. Like you're just doing shit to impress other people who also do the same shit. Uh, just to show off. But cardistry is more like a skill toy. It's like pen spinning. It's like me. Uh, it's like uh, kendama. It's like skateboarding. Like the, the point is just to do tricks and then record those tricks and put them in montages on YouTube kind of situation. Uh, and I also got into that with the same friend who I'd gone into magic with. Uh, although he was, he stayed a little more into magic than I did, I sort of went full in on cardistry, and I was pretty into the cardistry scene for a while, um, yeah, uh, pretty, and, I mean, like, I was hard, this was, like, the only thing I fucking cared about in life, <laughs> I was a bit of an understatement, I was really into this cardistry thing for a while, I was spending, like, one thing that cardistry people do in the same way that, like, CSGO players spend money on skins, even though they don't actually help you be good at the game, uh, cardists spend money on expensive decks of cards, even though they don't really... Sometimes they do. There are some decks that have um, different, different properties to them uh, that will help with certain things. Um, some examples are uh, the Verts deck is supposedly the back design is created to like accentuate the moves of cardistry to make it look more uh like i don't even know more more movie <laughs> it, it it makes it look better and they succeeded in that like the, the deck works um there's all but not just the back design also like this the, there's two aspects to what makes a playing card feel how it does the stock which is how thick the paper is or the sort of paper it's made out of and uh the finish which is the sort of coating or processing that makes like the surface of the card feel the way it does so most cards if you get a deck of bicycles and you look really closely you'll see that the card is like covered in really really tiny pock pock marks it's called an air cushion finish um and there are different types of finishes that are diff they're good for different things uh and in particular there's a deck called the absolute deck which was made as a marketing thing for absolute vodka but it's pretty rare these days because it was just like a brief marketing stunt but for whatever reason that deck has a finish that is really useful for doing one very specific move called a padiddle where you spin a card on your finger and for whatever reason the finish of the absolute deck just works really well for padiddles that's an example of how cards actually have an effect but on the whole like the point is just that they're fancy back designs that look cool and so you know my i got my i spent a lot of time convincing my parents to buy me expensive decks of cards uh which was maybe kind of stupid especially the other reason was because my friend who i was into cardistry with was rich like like his dad was a ceo of a like mid-sized company uh and founder like he, he was rich uh, and so he would always have the best, coolest, newest decks. Uh, he had a really big deck collection by the end of it, um, which he sold everything. 
um, I believe. Uh, but yeah, because so I would I was like, you know, wanted to him to be impressed by my decks, and it's also funny because if you're Australian, deck kind of sounds like dick, which is like kind of yeah. We were teenagers. We definitely made that joke a lot. Uh, so yeah, we did cardistry. Oh, I I did cardistry with this guy for a while. But again, because I it was with this guy, and also I was really in the community for cardistry. It didn't matter that I couldn't talk to anyone in real life about my hobbies because by this point I'd found, I mean, I didn't, there wasn't, well, there was this one guy that I went to school with who I could talk to about. And then also uh, I was like more of a lurker, but I was kind of in the cardistry community. And then at this point I got into 4chan more hardcore for like a couple of years. I started going on 4chan and this is where I started to, like, actually, dis this, like, helped me to actually discover internet things, right? Because, like, people will actually talk about stuff on 4chan, and so you just discover stuff that people are talking about. Prior to this, I had no idea how people ever found stuff on the internet. Uh, I don't even remember how I got into magic for the first time. I, I think, like, my parents bought me a magic kit for Christmas, and I just liked it and kept looking into it further. I actually think that's how it happened. That is how it happened. I remember now. They bought me a magic kit. It had, it had one of these like, uh, I don't know what the trick's called, but it's like a, a particular coin vanish that kind of fucking sucks. It's like a really terrible coin vanish. That's like a self-working gimmick coin vanish. And that was, but that was the best trick in the in the box. Like most of them were really bad, uh, but the the coin vanish one was like could actually work as an effect. Uh, and then it also had a deck of cards in it, and uh, yeah, and then I was learning on YouTube for a while, and that's because I would just look up like beginner magic tricks, and that's how I learned um, the trick Jack the Bounty Hunter, which was the first card trick I ever learned. Um, anyway, so yeah, what I'm saying here is, unlike you know people who are saying they were, you know, really into MLP or really into anime or anything like this tf2 something like this instead of that i was really into this thing that was inherently social uh, on the half of magic and also with someone in my school who i could talk to it about and then with cardistry i was still had someone that i could talk to and uh, i was also like online in this community uh, making videos and stuff which is how i learned to edit uh so yeah, I just never had the experience of having this niche interest that you can't talk about. Instead, I had a niche interest that that I could talk about. Uh, and I briefly got into pen spinning, uh, but I was never very... I was not good at it. I'm still not good at it, but I'm getting better, thanks to Horror Love's advice. Uh, but I'm still... Yeah, I'm still not very good at pen spinning. Which is funny, because Penguiffy also, in that video, describes pen spinning in class like being in, in the back of class and just spinning a pen and I like I was like you're literally me I I did the exact same thing I would be flourishing and pen spinning just constantly in class because I couldn't focus otherwise like I just needed to be doing something with my hands and then that's how I learned to par to padiddle is that you know learning to put once you've learned to padiddle it's not that hard but for me learning to padiddle took like four months and the way I did it was every day I would be in school all day padiddling in class. Uh, a padiddle is a really hard flourish where you, you spin a card on your finger and then you like spinning a card on your finger is easy to do for like a second. But the difficult thing is with the padiddle, you have to like move, move your hand around in order to keep the card spinning for as long as you can. Um, and that's the hard part because cards are extremely light. They catch the air. Uh, they're not very sticky, like they, they don't stick to your finger. And so it's really hard to keep the momentum going without the card falling off. You have to be like hyper aware of every little movement and physics of the card. It's actually really fun uh, to learn. I kind of recommend trying to learn a padiddle because it's, it's a really... You can't do it outside though because any gust of any like slight wind will just completely fuck you. Uh, so yeah, pen spinning briefly, I got into, and 4chan I started to get into, which eventually led to me getting into anime, 
And yes, that's true. The first time I actually experienced having a hobby that I couldn't talk to anyone about was anime. Um, but also, I wasn't, like, at that time period, I didn't get, like, hardcore into anime until after I left school. And by that time, I already had close online friends who were into anime and I could talk to her about them. So it didn't matter that I couldn't talk to anyone in real life about it because I didn't have anyone to talk to in real life anyway. Uh, and my my two IRL friends, uh, Young Sai and Lil Crazy Bitch, uh, eventually... I just kept talking to them about anime. <laughs> I just kept talking to Young Sai about anime so much that he eventually just was like, fuck it, I'll just start watching anime. And now he's like super into anime, although his taste is absolute garbage. No offense. I know you're not watching this, Sai, but literal JoJo's fan. Like, come on. I, I feel like this is like the worst. I've talked about this before, but like this is like the worst mistake of my life. I spend years trying to anime pill this guy. Right? I'm like, I show him Fooly Cooly. I show him Panty and Stocking. I show him Ava, I show him Lane, because he's like a film guy, right, so I'm showing him like the more, he's into films and he's also relatively into western cartoons, which is why I showed him Panty and Stocking, um, uh, so, he, so he's into like art films and, you know, that sort of thing, so I'm like Lane, Ava, Fooly Cooly, you know, <laughs> the, the big art, artsy anime things i show him all of those he likes them but i'm like still trying to convince him to get into anime and then after literally like years of trying to like discuss anime with him and talk to him about it and it's like what does he get into jjk jojo's uh vinland saga uh fucking demon demons what they what demon slayer is that what it's called i don't even remember kimetsu no yaiba that one like, the, he has the most normy fucking taste in the universe. Ugh. Kill me. I did this. I mean, he also likes Berserk. But I don't... I have never read Berserk. I know. I know. You don't have to tell me in the comments. I already know. So, yeah. By the time... By the time I actually had hobbies, I couldn't talk about people in real life. I wasn't in school anymore. I didn't have to. But the main problem was just that I didn't, well, then there was that period when I was in, like, doing my GCSEs where I was just going completely fucking nuts, um, like, most depressed, most insane I've ever been, um, well, close to it anyway, self-harm period, cutting myself period, and that was, uh, at that point, the only, you know, I, I sort of stopped using 4chan, because I was trying to make friends and I wanted to be more normy but then I sort of got back into it and anyway there was a whole period of my life that's kind of hard for me to even remember because I was just kind of in a haze the whole time of just incredibly weird depression emo shit and all the friends I had at the time were awful uh they were all terrible people I was like super awkward pu like peak puberty no idea how to like not only was I super awkward peak puberty, but I had also just moved schools for the first time in my life. And the school atmosphere of being in a normal school instead of these weird private schools that I'd been in. Which, if you're new here, I was in a private school not because I'm particularly wealthy, but because of a very particular coincidence where my dad uh, was helping out a Turkish billionaire and as part of the Turkish billionaire's, like, thanks, he offered to pay for my schooling. Was And so, because they had, like, my dad and this Turkish billionaire had this relationship, they, the, 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 this guy would um, pay for, pay for my schooling as part of the, like, like, the two things he would do as, like, thanks were pay for my schooling, because he had a relationship with the school, the private school that I was going to, and the the billionaire had a relationship with the private school that I was going to, and he would also pay for family holidays to this resort that he owned, um, which I guess didn't cost very much money for him, but he would let us stay there for free, is the point. Uh, so that was kind of pog. Uh, but the second they sort of stopped, you know, the, the my dad and this guy ended up not working together anymore because of complicated reasons that I don't understand because I wasn't privy to them because I was a kid uh I got pulled the fuck out of that school uh and well that was part of it and also I got expelled but <laughs> I didn't really 
it's com I got I I uh, I like to say I exited by mutual agreement that like anyway I I got partially expelled but also partially um, my parents just couldn't afford to send me there anymore and so I went to a normal school I went to a really rough school actually I went from like posh not like the poshest possible private school because it was an international school right which is kind of like a weird private school thing where it's lots of kids come and they just stay for like a year while their parents are working abroad and then they go away so it wasn't like a normal like you know super posh private school boarding school or anything like that although everyone was also really rich but they were also all from lots of different countries and it was kind of a just a very non-typical like a very atypical schooling experience especially as the only kid in that school whose parents weren't like very very wealthy uh i mean don't get me wrong i wasn't poor growing up uh, not well not when I first started you know but when I was first going to the school my parents were like you know solidly middle class uh, over time they lost the financial system the financial situation in my family got a little worse um, it wasn't quite as good anymore but still I would say so still definitely middle class uh, but you know these other kids were like the upper end of upper middle class to like you know pretty I, I mean again this guy's dad was like one of my closest friends dad was like the ceo of a pretty big company uh i had like another friend who's or i i didn't like they weren't my friend but uh, like one of the kids his dad was like a legitimately an aristocrat in some like african country uh like a uh, like a, a prince of some kind i know it's like a, a meme african prince but like le like not no joke actually an african his dad was like legitimately something like that uh i don't know if it was actually a prince but something like that like these there were some real rich rich dads um uh there was a girl whose mom was like a reasonably celebrated artist i don't remember her name uh anyway then moving to a very rough school uh with like uh, uh where multiple people uh i think there were in the first year i was at that school five of the kids in my class went to juvie that's how rough we're talking <laughs> it was not good and there's also something called peru which i don't remember what it stands for but it's a uh it's like the step before juvie basically it's like a special school for kids who are violent or whatever and there were more kids who went there um so very from this like n like prissy little middle class school where i was like relatively the broke one to this extremely rough school where i was like one of the rich ones <laughs> very strange experience and i'm like in this weird adolescent thing and there's the pressure of gcse's no wonder I, and all my friends were assholes <laughs> like everyone i knew was just a complete dickhead no wonder I went fucking nuts. Uh, but yeah, at that point, like, I didn't... The only hobbies I had were, like, emo music and cardistry and uh, R9K. Or by the, like, not at first, but by the end I was getting back into R9K. Uh, and then, like, right at the end, before I started leaving that school, I watched, like, SAO and Junibio uh, and uh, No Game, No Life. But, yeah. Then... What I'm saying here is that I didn't have this experience of having niche hobbies that I couldn't talk to anyone about, and that makes me feel like a fraud hanging out in these, saying I relate to these people who have had that experience be very um, central to them. Whereas for me, everyone else had common hobbies like video games, and I just had nothing for most for like my young younger part of my childhood, and then later on, I had niche hobbies, but I had a friend who I could talk to about it. So it wasn't so bad uh, in that aspect. I wasn't socially ostracized for it. Hey, speaking of social ostracization, let's talk about the second thing that I have different from all these other people, um, which is, v I'm going to call it vertedness. You know, there's extrovertedness and introvertedness. So I'm just going to call them in general vertedness. Uh, everyone who seems I seem to relate to on this level was an introvert for their whole lives. Whereas I was the class clown. I would constantly be in trouble for speaking out in class and trying to make people laugh and do magic tricks and so on. I was desperate for attention. 
I had zero self-awareness and zero self-control. Uh, zero. I'm talking like really, really impulsive, like scarily, BPD, you know, whatever, just like giga impulsive. Uh, and so rather than being really quiet and having no friends, I was really fucking loud and obnoxious. Um, now there's this movie called Meet the Robinsons. I was also depressed. So that's, that's important. So there's this movie called Meet the Robinsons. It's a kid's movie, animated movie. Uh, I don't know if anyone, any of you know it, but there's a scene in Meet the Robinsons. I watched this in the cinema with my, with my, my dad. And there's a scene in this movie where they're doing this sort of villain backstory thing. And, um, there's, there's one particular little bit in the backstory where the villain, he's walking down the hallway in his school and his head is sort of hung low and he's like, you know, looking sternly straight ahead, looking like angry and whatever. And he's walking down the hallway and there's two kids in the hallway. And as he walks past, he says, they say like, hey man, nice backpack. Or like, oh, hey, do you want to come over to my place to, tonight? And then the voice in the voiceover, he says, they all hated me, right? Like the gimmick, the, the, the joke being, actually it was all in his head. No one had any problem with him. He just sort of like got obsessed with the idea that everyone hated him. And my dad was just like, this is you. <laughs> like He was just pointing his, uh, he was just obsessive. Like he kept, uh, refer- like he would reference this scene constantly. He, I guess he really liked this scene. It's a good scene. It's kind of an original villain backstory because the movie's like a time travel movie. It's a weird fucking film. But anyway, he would reference this scene a lot about me. And to some extent, he was right. Like, I considered myself like someone who didn't really have any friends and was kind of closed off and introverted. In fact, one time, we, there was a, uh, we were learning in school, in English class, about what introverted and extroverted meant, which I think everyone already knew, so I don't know why they were teaching us this. But as part of the lesson, they said, um, like, go up in front of the class and or like go up and if you feel like you're introverted stand on the left and if you feel like you're extroverted stand on the right and I stood on the introverted side and when I did everyone laughed like I was running a bit everyone laughed and was like no you're definitely extroverted and I was like huh strange you know so it seems like you know from the outside I was this very extroverted sociable person loads of friends But from my perspective, during this whole schooling time, I had one friend and I was very closed off. Because from my perspective, I wasn't close with anyone. Like, not really. I was close with one person at a time, and I was just sort of desperately looking for attention and approval from everyone else and trying to make them laugh, but not necessarily, you know opening up or being particularly close to them but I they didn't necessarily see it that way you know I had someone in I've had at that time there were some people who you know I considered myself to maybe be like friendly with but not close friends who a couple of times would open up to me and tell me stuff that was like problems they were going through or whatever I never did the same thing (laughs) you know like I I would I mean it's not like I was a dickhead to them I mean I would try and help I, but I was I was surprised because they saw me as a close friend. From my perspective, I wasn't really close to anyone except for one person at a time, you know, being the, the guy I was doing magic with. Uh, so uh, there was this, like, strange disconnect between my behavior and how it appeared from the outside that I was... And then my inter- internal perception, where I was convinced everyone hated me, I was convinced I didn't have any friends, and I wasn't close to anyone. And in some senses, I was right, because I felt like I couldn't make a true connection with these people, even though I might talk to them and be friendly with them, and from the outside, it might appear like we were friends. I, f- like, somewhere, in th- it didn't, I didn't understand that, because internally, I was feeling like I couldn't make a true connection with these people. And this is, so this is something that's very different from how, from how everyone that I relate to online explains their school experience. They all talk about how they were very closed off and didn't have any friends and didn't talk to anyone. Even my IRL friends, like even little crazy bitch, I don't want to go like airing his shit too much, but he was extremely introverted in school, like extremely introverted, like borderline mute introverted. Um, 
Whereas I was the opposite. Like I was way too extroverted and had no self control and no no filter at all and faced consequences for it constantly. But I didn't have any ability to change. I didn't have the capacity to think before I acted because my brain was broken or whatever. Like, and I had trouble understanding basic stuff. Like, for example, hey, why am I getting punished so harshly? All I did was make a joke in class. I couldn't understand that, like, well, yeah, if all you did was make a joke in class, this would be too harsh. But the thing is, you've been doing this every day, every lesson for the past, like, three years. Like, of course the punishment is going to escalate. And it wouldn't work on me because I didn't... Like, when they did this, it just made me resent the teachers more. It just made me think they were just treating me unfairly. And I think they... To, still, I think they were treating me unfairly. I think they didn't... I think any reasonable person, especially since they knew I had problems at home, I think any reasonable person should, as a teacher, think, like, okay, well, clearly this kid doesn't need punishment. He needs help. Uh... And, you know, I don't know the full story of, like, how my teachers were in contact with my parents. Like, maybe my parents were the ones who were saying, no, he did. Like, don't don't send him to a psychiatrist or whatever. And maybe it's a good thing that I didn't go to a psychiatrist. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, so, so, yeah, I didn't have this experience of, like, the, the sort of intense social socialization that other people had. Uh, in fact, I got accused... You know, other people have stories of being bullied, and I, as an adult, I look back and I realize at least five points in my life where I was bullied, but I hadn't, I didn't know that was happening at the time. I just didn't, I, I was so un self aware, I didn't even understand that that was bullying. Like, I, I just knew, like, hey, there are these people that just make fun of me every day and, you know, call me names and hit me and, uh, you know, humiliate me every day, and that's just life, like, that's just how it works, I didn't even understand that that was bullying, I, that's just how social interactions work, I didn't know, uh, and, you know, even despite that, I was accused of bullying, uh, twice during my schooling, once when I was really young, um, in which case, the, the whole situation, you know, I'm, this was, like, really young, I don't have particularly good memory of it, um, but as I, like, looking back on it, it seems like I was definitely an asshole. I was also, like, seven, so I can't really, you know, I didn't have underst any real understanding of what my actions were. At eight, let's say, like, eight, eight, nine years old, maybe. Um, yeah, I was too young to really understand what it even meant to, you know, tease someone or hurt someone psychologically. Um, but also, it was definitely a two-way thing. Like, I, I, I was also receiving the same sort of teasing and so on from the same people that I was accused of hurting but still I think you know <laughs> yeah you know what when I was eight years old and I used to tease that guy that was fucked up for me to do I shouldn't have done that okay I agree the second time I was accused of bullying we've already gone over it multiple times but that one was absolute bullshit it was a conspiracy against me it was planned I fully truly believe this it was like premeditated there was intercommunication between, like, parents and teachers that I wasn't privy to. There was intercommunication between teachers and each other that I wasn't privy to, and the teachers from the primary and secondary school that I wasn't privy to. There was a plan, like, this, this guy who accused me was, like, a fucking villain. Like, he had planned this all out. He had a perfect story lined up that was just completely false. The teachers completely, like, uh, mishandled... Uh, the entire situation they did not in any way search for proof of any kind they sort of accepted the allegations and then used psychological manipulation interrogation techniques uh, over literally weeks of pressuring and interrogating me into a false confession this legitimately happened to me and i think permanently if they if had ever had any trust in teachers or adults to have like my back this was the thing that completely threw that out of the window when I was pressured and interrogated until delivering a false confession uh, as part of some sort of grand fucking plan by this kid and his parents and his brother to like fuck me for god knows what reason I, I don't I literally don't know what reason uh, I never talked to this kid I, I don't know how to convince you that I never bullied him but like I 
I think I, in my entire life, said five words to him before this thing happened. Um, so that was complete bullshit. The final time um, where, where I was a fucked up little gremlin bullying person is actually the one I regret most, because this was in, in the, the rougher school, um, and no one ever accused me of bullying. I've just come to this realization myself as I've grown up, and I, re- I legitimately regret it every day. There was this kid who was pretty nerdy, you know, acne. Um, he, like, didn't really have any dress sense, you know. Uh, uh, kind of a, if I had to identify it, I would say he was a kind of a Redditor. Um, and I, I used to, you know, everyone used to take the piss out of him and I joined in. I, I was terrified of being ostracized from my social group and I joined in when people would take the piss out of him. He was really into TF2. Which, you know, these days I would have fucking loved to talk to this guy and talk about TF2 and play with him. Uh, but at the time, you know, I had barely played TF2. Or I don't even think I had played TF2 at the time. He was into TF2 and, and uh, Fallout. And, like, you know, these days I this guy seems, like, super up my ass. Like, this sounds like the sort of guy I would love to hang out with. And at the time, I just joined in on everyone else bullying this kid. And I legitimately regret it every day. And I wish I could, like, apologize to him and say, like, I... It was I was fucked up. It was a fucked up situation, but I shouldn't have done it. Like that was definitely wrong. Even though it wasn't like it was particularly harsh. Like there was never anything physical. We were just sort of light teasing, but consistent light teasing for for a long period of time. Like I probably helped to make this kid's life a little bit more miserable, and I I fucking wish I hadn't done that. I you know I I definitely wasn't the worst. I never instigated any bullying against him. Uh, but I, I joined in because I was a fucking sheep and I, I couldn't stand up for him. Even when I knew, even I, there's not even an excuse of like, oh, I was too young to understand. I knew that this was fucked up and I just did it anyway because I, I was, I don't know why. I was too much of a pussy to stand up to my friends who were assholes. And so I joined in. Like, I regret this every day. Like, this was, this was, this, this was a bad thing for me to do. And and you know what the act the only time I actually did something bad never got in trouble for it once no one none of the teachers even noticed or knew it was happening, no one knew it was happening. And I did like the thing is when I wasn't with that friend group and I was talking to this kid I I, I won't say his name, but when I wasn't with that friend group and I was talking to him one on one, I was amicable with him like we weren't super close or anything but I had I remember like at lunchtime having conversations with him and being on like being fine and being having making jokes and stuff but when I was around that friend group I was just fucking you know an asshole I just joined in being an asshole because I was a fucking retard you know so I feel like pangraphy is is that kid that I that I fucking joined in on bullying and I yeah like that's a big that's a pretty big difference right like that's that's something I regret pretty deeply uh thankfully i i don't think i've ever done anything like that again uh since you know that was a time in my life when i was just so incredibly fucked up as a guy like uh, my brain was just completely out of my control i was just completely dissociated zombie mode completely fucking all over the place depressed uh, cutting myself suicidal no idea adolescent everything was going wrong like thankfully Getting out of that situation helped me a lot, and I've never done anything fucked up like that again, at least not to my knowledge, not not that I'm aware of. Uh, so then, after all of these years of being really extroverted, it turns out that the only reason that I was speaking out in class and making jokes all the time and having bad behavior and so on was because I couldn't focus, and I was trapped in a prison for kids all day long where I was extremely bored, and I didn't have any real friends, and I didn't have any real way of making connections with people, and uh, I was basically bored. That was, And I was just desperate for any ways to entertain myself. And the second I got out of that school and went to a different school, and then you know, to do my A-levels, went to a different college, which is kind of college in the UK, we call college, like... I think it's high school in the US, I don't know, but it, college is sort of a, the way it's formatted is kind of in between school and university, and it's a bit more of, like, it's a little more self-directed, a little more like uni, you don't take the same number of classes, but each class is longer, and you start to specialise, so, like, I was taking A-levels in 
at first I was taking A levels in film and uh, photography because uh, I wanted to be a film editor. Uh, and you know, now that I was actually doing stuff I was interested in in school for the first time in my life and uh, actually meeting cool people, this is where I met little crazy bitch. And also becoming a massive stoner, smoking weed constantly. Um, I was no longer an asshole, but I did drop out of that school. I was still was unable to perform academically, but I, I, I did, uh, I wasn't a, a dick to anyone. And more importantly, I became an introverted. Suddenly, the desire to speak to people disappeared, and instead, I was quite happy to read Slaughterhouse Five by myself at lunchtime or whatever. So then I, I. I Dropped out of that school, did fucked up shit for a while, went to a different school the next year, uh, joined late, so I again didn't really have any friends, um, and I had a blissful few months of, like, every day I would bring my ThinkPad in, and I would watch anime in the common room during lunch and during break, and it was fucking wonderful, I wouldn't talk to anyone, it was, it was, a, it was a beautiful experience. It was so blissful, I would go in, you know, I would, I would s- sit through the lessons with my headphones on, listening to music or watching YouTube or most of the time watching out, talking to people online. And at lunchtime, this is how I, this is how I watched Lucky Star. I would go to the common room, I'd watch Lucky Star on my first ever ThinkPad, you know, with no rising or anything. And I would sit down and I'd watch Lucky Star and I would have a blast. And I would also be stoned <laughs> all the time. And, uh, and then I had to go and make a fucking friend. And this guy, this kid was a fucking retard. The guy that I was friends with, I kind of hated him by the end of it. We both hated each other. We never talked the second school was over, but whatever. This is kind of beyond the scope of this. But again, I was much more introverted in this school. But also I was high all the time, so I was just more laid back in general. And then I started to get way too anxious from being high all the time, and so I stopped smoking weed. But yeah, that was the weird stoner arc. I have very little memory of this period of my life, for obvious reasons. Um, but yeah, that was a thing. So I, I guess in conclusion, I feel a bit like a fraud saying, oh, I relate so strongly to these people, to people like Penguafi and lots of that. I'm bringing him up as an example, but there's lots of it. There's lots of people who have similar experience where I say, oh, I relate so much. And I feel that internally, like they say stuff and I'm like, that is me. Like sitting in the back of class, pen spinning, thinking like, why is no one coming up to me and saying, this kid clearly needs help, he's clearly f- depressed, he's clearly fucked up. Like, why has no one noticed? I feel like I would notice. Like, that thought process that, that Pengraphy brought up in the video is like, ex- I've had that exact thought process. Like, everything he said was so relatable. But then at the same time, there are these two glaring differences when it comes to niche hobbies and when it comes to extroversion um, or vertedness. Uh, when it comes to vertedness, where it's like big glaring differences. And I feel like a fraud. I feel like I'm lying to myself when I say I relate to these people because then I look back on an objective level and I see like, hold on a minute, these two like formative formative experiences or these two fundamental aspects of the experience are vastly different. But also I think I've explained over the past hour how even though they are different, they somehow resulted in the same, they were just different expressions of the same internal thing. That's how I feel about them. But like, I relate to this kind of person because even though we, ex- like, I had an atypical way of expressing those same feelings, we still had the same feelings and the same thought processes and we still went through the same sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, I don't know, maybe tell me in the comments if I'm fraud. And now for something completely different, although slightly related, which is, I mentioned I was playing TF2. Uh, I've, I've been playing TF2 again. I am filled with the desire to improve at this goddamn fucking game. Uh, I don't know why I started playing TF2 again. I, the thing about TF2, right? is 
it's a it's a it's objectively a great game or what i mean by that is i i i don't actually mean that it's objectively a great game let me phrase that better i know it has potential to be my favorite game of all time essentially it has all the ingredients for the exact type of thing i want from video games and in fact i often catch myself thinking god i fucking wish that i'd spent the last few years playing tf2 instead of i wish i'd spent those 3000 hours on tf2 instead of csgo because i feel like being really good at, like like if i had spent 3000 hours playing tf2 I would be good at the game instead of spending 3000 hours in CS:GO and just being like mid. Like if you spend 3000 hours playing TF2, you can pub stomp. You spend 3000 hours playing CS, like nothing. It has no you're just the set you're just as good as you were. Like you're like it has no effect on your life. It, it just is just meaningless. You're just queuing nuke 24/7 and listening to screaming russians you you spend 3000 hours in tf2 you can fucking you know pull off insane rocket jumps and shit i kind of wish i'd spent those those hours of my life playing playing this game instead which is the first time i've ever regretted the 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 hours played number on my steam page because it's obviously a mark of pride for any any gamer not that i'm much of a gamer but the having a high having that number be big is a mark of pride and a mark of de- de- degeneracy of course um and yeah i i i've been just wishing that i'd spend that time playing tf2 instead not that i actually do wish that cuz i probably wouldn't be having nearly as much fun as i am if i wasn't already intimately familiar with like source movement mechanics and also cisco is a great game <coughs> i i love that game so i don't know what i'm talking about there's a reason why i spent so much time playing cs it's cuz it's a fucking great game with a level of like it just has so much mechanical depth to it that you can play the same map for a few thousand hours and still find it fun. But the thing the difference with with CS or the reason why I find myself thinking this, I I think like like reflecting on it now is that CS has um doesn't have that many mecha- like it has a it focuses almost entirely on depth of mechanics rather than breadth like pretty much all you need to know you like you need to learn movement you need to learn the maps you need to learn economy which i still haven't done uh, <laughs> you need to learn uh, game sense and you need to learn the ak the m4 the orp the deagle and pistols and basic strategy and those are basically the skills that you have in CS like there's nothing else to the game really other than those skills now every single one of those skills pretty much has insane depth to it like you can practice your whole life and not reach the skill ceiling in any single one of those things but you know you learn that in you you st- you learn the basics of all of those things you like you learn to be competent at all of that okay i say that i still have not co- <laughs> the ak spray pattern somehow still not quite ingrained in my memory still still not quite got that one down don't know how 3000 hours can't spray down enemies properly kill me but generally <laughs> like you you get the you become competent at all of those mechanics fairly quickly and then you're just improving incrementally and of course there's sort of a <clears throat> diminishing returns effect the better you are the less you know the slower it takes to get even better um whereas TF2 also has a really high level of mechanical depth 
I it doesn't have as high, in my opinion maybe it does at the highest like pro levels but in normal games it doesn't have anywhere near the for me you know maybe there's some TF2 pro in the comments is going to be like yeah actually if you're playing proper competitive with a team the game is highly strategic and I'm I'm sure that's true but that's not what most people do like uh the the strategy the level of sort of mental chess going on uh per game is mostly f it's it's more short term like it's more like okay i'm fighting this scout right now and he just jumped behind a wall which means he's probably low on health so if i swing around this other side i might be able to catch him on the other side but maybe he's debating me to or maybe you're the scout and you're like haha i actually i'm just going to swing behind this wall so that he thinks i'm low he's going to chase me and i'm going to hide and then jump over his head, and then shoot, like, there's levels of that, but those are, like, really quick, snappy interactions, right, uh, or, like, you know, running into a fight, and then realizing, oh, I can't win this, and then using some sort of movement option to escape, and get health, or whatever, uh, whereas CS is slower paced, it has a more drawn out thought process, where it's like, okay, I know I heard an enemy over here, like, 30 seconds ago, and by this time, he could either have gotten, he's, you know, enemies that you hear are, like, clouds of probability, it's like, okay, so by this time, he could have gone all the way down this hallway, or he could have gone down to B, in which case, he could be holding from this, this, or this angle, so when I open this door, I need to be pre-aiming ramp, because that's a likely spot that he could hold in the time that he's had, there's no way he had enough time to get all the way down to silo, um, and it, maybe I've used some utility or whatever, like, there's a lot, it's more long-term, like, I don't know how to explain it, but the strategies take place over a longer time scale, I guess, if that makes sense. Uh, like, that sort of thing isn't really present in TF2, and th I'm not saying that's a good or bad thing, that's just kind of how it is. Like, both both are fun. And there's also, I mean, this all fundamentally leads back to the, the biggest difference between the two games, in my opinion, which is the time to kill high versus low time like csgo infamously has a uh, low time to kill almost every gun in the game is a one hit headshot or two hit headshot um uh like you, you die very quickly if you fuck up whereas in tf2 if you overextend you can escape in cs if you overextend you're dead uh <clears throat> both of these have i used to be of the opinion that when I first tried TF2 more recently, I, w I was frustrated by this. I felt like I wasn't getting rewarded for outplaying people. That, like, I would get myself into a strong position and have, a, like, a strong position or advantage over someone and hit the nasty first shot, and then they would just reposition and kill me. Or they would just fall back you know, which is not something that you ever have to deal with in CS. Like, if you get the positional advantage and you land that nasty first shot, you've won the interaction. And so my brain was in CSGO mode of, like, everything that matters is getting that strong positional advantage for the, f f to win the initial interaction, rather than, like, actually, positional advantage is just one aspect of the interaction, and then follow-through is equally important, and also, like, positional, like, uh, having an awareness of, like, uh, I'm still only just figuring this stuff out, like, I, I'm still bad at it in TF2, but, like, understanding when's a good time to, like, let's say you're punishing an enemy, and they're sort of running backwards away from you, but they're also damaging you at the same time, it's like, okay, how much stock can I put in my own, like, ability to follow through, what class am I fighting right now, am I going to be able to catch this, like, if if this if this is a a pyro, should I chase this person down or should I not? Is there health around the corner that they're about to grab and then fuck me? Uh, am I like a scout who has no health? Should I chase this person down or fall back? Uh, if I do fall, like how do I make sure that I already always have the option to fall back and I'm not putting myself in a position where I'm I'm stuck if the fight doesn't go well? Like that's the sort of thing you have to be thinking about in TF2, which is quite different from CS because in CS. The time to kill is so low, and there's also hits done, uh, uh, which means when you get shot, your movement speed slows down to a crawl. Uh, so you, if you engage in a fight, 
you it's very hard to fall back mid gunfight you you kind of have to com full commit to every interaction which makes the gameplay much more strategic and it's been difficult you know initially i was frustrated but now i'm seeing the appeal of both sides the main thing that made me seal the appeal of mo of like having the the higher time to kill is uh playing demo with with the pipe gun thing and hitting nasty air shots like where you you like that after i hit a, hit that for the first time it was like okay sure 90% of the time you're not going to hit these well if I, if you're me and you're not very good at the game yet i will be eventually okay we're 100 hours in i just have to do that 10 more times and then i'll be like decent i think uh but uh yeah like you you most of the time you're not going to insta kill an enemy just from having a positional advantage but those the, like if you can if, like the it's it's like melee it's like combos in melee like sure hitting one one like nice hit i don't really play melee so i don't know anything but like sure hitting like one one attack on an enemy is just kind of like whatever whereas in in cs hitting one attack on an enemy is the is the decide like that's can be the deciding factor a lot of the time in tf2 hitting one attack on an enemy is like okay you're opening yourself up for the possibility of hitting a nasty combo like okay you've hit the first pipe and launched him into the air but can you predict his arc and flick and like hit the next shot and it's and then the the fucking dopamine of hitting like boom and then you 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 fucking predict the movement a second shot into the combo and then a third shot boom dead like that is that dopamine it's like, oh, I understand where the dopamine comes from here. I understand the appeal of, of high time to kill. It's like the 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 like predictive movement and and tracking and stuff, if you can hit combos like this, is just fucking insane. Like playing I started playing Scout today for the first time, actually trying to play Scout. And like sure I suck. But the those couple of times when I can like perfectly jump around an enemy and it's like i am simultaneously e evading his rocket and positioning myself to hit the next scattergun shot and then you just pump bullet 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 and then they're dead it's so satisfying so i i yeah whereas originally i didn't like this about the game because i was so used to cs i now think both options are fun uh yeah, although it is kind of annoying. The the 15 second respawn thing on Valve servers is just so annoying in TF2. I wish the respawns were faster. I I end up playing on fast respawn community servers cuz I I just find it really I, like when you when you're me and you suck, like I'm sure if you're good at the game, it's not too much of a big deal. Like it feels like an appropriate punishment because dying is like you fucked up and you know how you fucked up. But a lot of the times since I'm still pretty bad at the game when i die i'm not re entirely sure what i did to cause myself to die you know like i'm i i i know that i must have fucked up somehow but i don't i i don't have the game knowledge to understand what it was that fucked me a lot of the time and so being punished really harshly for that is just annoying like what i really need is fast respawn servers because the best way for me to improve is to just get as much time in the game as possible just play more um, but yeah, I really do think TF2 is a lot like Melee, uh, from everything I know about Melee, although obviously it's a bit less focused on the sort of competitive aspects, uh, but man, it's a good fucking game, I'll tell you that much, and here's something interesting. Uh, this is why I will never play Valorant. Uh, well, I well first reason I won't play Valorant is that it installs a rootkit on your computer. But the and I'm also just a hard, hardline CS:GO player, so I kind of have my pride on that level, of like I'm not gonna play I'm not gonna play Valorant. It's for casuals. It's for e e girls and whatever. But uh, on a more pragmatic level. Uh, the Valorant just represents philosophically something I don't like, like the sort of locked off um, modern gaming 
handholdy stuff that I don't like. Uh, I, I like the 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 simple two two things make CS:GO. There are two mechanics that that's that make CS:GO and TF two when compared to Overwatch just incomparably better. Uh, and those two things are the developer console and community servers. I don't see the point in playing a game that doesn't have those things. And obviously, that's not even talking about the gameplay mechanics, but, you know, that's whatever. I, I, even aside from that, the developer console, being able to customize everything, you know, I'm a fucking Linux user, okay? I need to. I need the availability, the openness to customize everything and to change options as I please, not just to have sort of really basic level, like Windows tier, Mac tier. I'm using a Mac right now, but whatever options like i need linux level options you know i need to be able to go in there and type commands into a command line and community servers like the customizability the openness the community and the the weirdness the wackiness the fact that you can just find weird shit that just a complete lack of cohesion like you can go into the community server browser and you can find something that is just like, hey, here's this map 24-7. Like, if you want to play that map, great, wonderful, amazing. Maybe I just want to play that map 24-7. But then you can also go into the community server browser and you can find, like, uh, some random fucking, you know, map, like, server that's running this map with, like, 2007 era memes all over it that just like is complete visual you know eye rape and, and doesn't make any sense and there's just a bunch of people like congoing around and I don't know whatever or you, you can go on community servers and you know find maps that are not in the spirit of the game at all that are super active like like or stuff that would never be put into a normal Counter Strike game or, or or whatever that are super active, um, and you can find dead servers. You can and that's not even to mention like the custom game modes. You know, surf, b hop, zombie mod, RP, prison thingy, whatever the jailbreak. Uh, you know, death run, H and S surf combat there's a billion right like these things just simply this is like this is why you know i know a, a lot of people they think they think tf2 is dying and there was a point there where it was right there was a like kind of had a normal life cycle for a game i actually took a screenshot uh you know if you look when it launched it's getting you know right in when it launched it was getting uh you know, over 100k players, and then it sort of settled down to maybe around 50k, 70k, peaks back up to 100k every now and then, I guess when some sort of event happens, but hovers, you know, around like 70, 80k, uh, and then slowly goes down from like 2016, it's like the line just slowly going down, 2017, 2018, some peaks when like events happen, but slowly going down, 2019 ends up below 50k players in 2019. And you're like, okay, that's like a normal life cycle for a game. You know, it comes out and it slowly gets less popular. But then you look at the chart and from 2019 up until 2023, it's going straight up. And now, you know, at the end of 2022, TF2 had more players than ever. It's more active than ever. The game has been like completely revived and it's hovering at like 150k, like, and I, if you look more closely... Like every like the daily active users is, you know anywhere between like ninety k to like one hundred and thirty k recently, like that's a pretty active game honestly, and of course CS:GO also is like the biggest game on Steam. Uh, that game's not exactly dying. Uh, what was I talking about? Sorry, I got distracted reading something. Uh, so the, the point I'm trying to make here is these games are old, 
you you know you would expect that games like this just wouldn't have that much staying power given the fact that unlike a game like Valorant which has like seasons and new operators announced and drops and you know all of this stuff to keep players engaged the point i'm trying to make here is that TF2 is unmaintained there hasn't been new content for that game in years and it's more popular than it's ever been like are you kidding me that goes against all common sense tf2 is i i don't know how to impress this upon you in any like the, it, how insane this is tf2 is an unmaintained game it is abandoned by its developer everyone knows this pretty much right it it is almost abandoned by its developer that sure they started doing stuff again because there was a massive uproar but it's like pretty fucking close to, to, like, abandoned, as close as, like, any modern, still active game could get, right? And yet, it's doing more numbers than ever. Like, years and years and years after being abandoned. And it was supported for years. Like, and it, it, there's no other explanation as to how this could happen well, the game is good, first of all, but lots of games are good. There's no other explanation other than it's also so open that it allows for massive replayability. And, you know, so many different options. And it's the same for CSGO. CSGO, I guarantee you, you know, maybe it would be very popular with without the openness that it has, but... Uh, it would probably be pretty big, and maybe if it was a bit more handholdy, like Valorant, a little easier to get into, more friendly to new players, if the community was less toxic, whatever, it would, it would probably, it, it might it might have a spike in popularity, but I don't think it would have lasted for as long as it has if it was like that. In the same way that, like, if you try and play Minecraft without any, if you were to somehow forget the fact that you craft a crafting table with four wooden planks in your inventory, for example, or how you make a nether portal. Like, it doesn't... It didn't used to say this in the game. It started... They started to put this in because of one fucking YouTube Let's Play of a guy trying to figure all of this out completely blind. That's why they put broken nether portals in the game, was because this one YouTube Japanese guy Let's Playing Minecraft completely blind... Like, not looking at comments, not looking at walkthroughs, not looking at the wiki, having no prior knowledge of Minecraft. No, he knows nothing about the game. Pito Pito, right? This Japanese guy, playing Minecraft with no context at all, could not figure out how to make a nether portal. And and it he had no fucking clue. And develop, literally, this is what happened. Developers of Minecraft saw this Let's Play and were like, oh shit, wait... <laughs> You're telling me there's nothing in the game that tells you how to do this? There's no hint? And a lot of Minecraft is like that. Where the only reason that we find Minecraft to be easy, at least on a basic level, or, you know, usable at all, is because every single person has this massive cultural context where they have just been surrounded by Minecraft YouTube videos their whole lives or since they were a kid that it's like you can't imagine not knowing the basic mechanics of Minecraft in the same way the CSGO community sure they're like memorizing spray patterns is hard and navigating the community server browser is weird and so on you know having to play for hours on a new account or whatever like there's a whole bunch of weird or the community is toxic in cs or whatever although i don't everyone says the community is toxic in csgo to be frank with you the community in csgo like to me the community in csgo is just normal like that's just what video games are like video, video <laughs> it's firstly it's not that it's not that bad like, I, are people just, like, of course someone's going to tell you to kill yourself. <laughs> like, that's just how video games are. That's, like, what are you talking about? You're playing an online game. Also, I don't want to go into too much detail about that, because I actually plan to make a video about 
Um, well, I won't give any any I won't give any more details because if I talk about it now, I'll never make it. But I'm gonna make force myself to stop talking about that because that's gonna be covered in a video I'm trying to make. Uh, so yeah, sure. Like the it, the Cisco is unfriendly to new players, and it's definitely unfriendly to bad players. Uh, the skill floor in CS is so high; it's like really high now that like modern, you know, gold novas would have been supreme at the beginning of the game's life cycle. Like the okay, maybe that's not maybe that's an exaggeration, but the game's skill floor is super high, and it's really hard as a new player to get good and so on. Uh, but everyone just knows that who plays the game. It's just sort of an accepted part of it. So yeah, it's less it's less friendly, but the, uh, it, it, in exchange, it's more open. It's so like the game itself is less user friendly to get into. It's less handholdy. Which, but but as a by sacrifice, it's like Linux. You know, by sacrificing that, it allows many many more possibilities even though it has a steeper learning curve uh, and it's not just CS but it's, that, that applies to all software that like you, you basically choose like do you want to be have a really really strong new user experience first user experience or do you want to appeal to the people who already like your, your software or the people who are who would be the hardcore people who would be willing to put in the effort to learn it and honestly i take i i choose the latter every time and the problem here is capitalism right because the second type of software is just better every time anyone who uses software knows this um oh shit oh i just got an important email okay well that that makes a lot of sense. I uh, I'll have to go talk to Dots mate about that. Boring boring stuff related to bills. Uh anyway, all right, that completely threw off my train of thought. Uh God, being an adult is so fucking boring. Oh, I have to talk to my fucking gas company because of the fucking I hate this shit, man. Uh whatever. Uh Um, what was I? T oh yeah, it's TF two. So I've been playing. I think the, what I like doing in TF two is trimping. <laughs> Frankly, that is why I started playing the game again, and that is why I continue to play the game. Trimping is fun. Demo night, however, is a hard fucking class to be good at. It is not an easy class to be good at. Pure Demo Knight is really fucking hard to be good at. You, I don't even really understand how you'd be good at it. Like, I know it's po I know there are people who are really good at Demo Knight. I, I, I think they're just... They just have, like... You have to have insane... You have to have a lot of patience. You have to have really good positioning and, like, map awareness and game sense. You have to choose your fights very specifically, uh, and you have to obviously have insane movement, um, and you can you just can't miss with your with your sword, like you you can't fuck up the your like distance uh, or anything. I don't know. There's there's too. It's really difficult. Pure demonite is like. I don't think it's viable for me. Uh, hybrid demonite. Is also pretty fucking hard, um, because you don't have stickies, obviously, as like a normal demo. But it's a trade-off that is worth it, especially given the pipe bomb, the pipe launcher thing. I wish I remembered what it was called. Uh, hold on. Let me look up some stuff. Uh, the Iron Bomber, I think I'm talking about. Or Stock. I don't know, whatever. These things are sick. 
these things are sick and they feel great to use they're really hard to use because they have an art like they shoot up if you don't know anything about tf2 you probably do but they shoot they shoot the, you, like a, a thing that explodes when it hits an enemy it does 100 damage every time very easy to understand or the stock the stock does the stock stock fucking thing anyway i don't know what i'm i don't know what i'm talking about anyway it's cool and it, it the problem the thing that makes it hard is that it, it's a projectile it's not hit scan and it also has an arc to it like it, gravity affects it and so you have to lead shots you have to like predict movement and lead your shots and also you have to like account for the the drop you know you have to you have to fucking account for the arc of your 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 projectile uh which makes it a pretty steep learning curve from someone who is used to see us go hit scan everything that is just not a skill that i have cultivated um but it is so satisfying to hit <laughs> to get kills with it is inc insanely like it's like as satisfying as one league headshots and you as you know those are like best in gaming type of deals uh so yeah so the, the idea of hybrid demo knight is you can switch to you don't have to just use your sword which means if you're fighting a faster class who can run away from you or you're you're just not close enough you can switch now i'm having some trouble adapting to this but actually like as i've been playing today and i had a whole fucking arc today where i was just playing the worst fucking tf2 i've ever played in my life for hours i spent like two hours just just getting demolished i uh, it was it was legitimately just pure suffering i was just spent two hours just getting absolutely demolished i could not get a single kill and the enemy team they just eventually, like, there were so many scouts, and you, I just couldn't hit. It's so hard to hit scouts with the Iron Bomber. Like, you can't hit scouts with a sword because they're faster than you as a demo. So, like, if you if you hit them once, they're just going to run away from you. The only way you can, like, reliably kill scouts as demo knight is you have to charge into them to do, to get a mini, like, do a charge damage and mini crit and, and stuff. And then if you have, like... Uh, I think two heads on the island do it to me. Well, whatever. Actually, I don't know how much. I don't know exactly how much damage everything does. But you can sometimes, with the islander, get insta kills on scouts and lower health scouts. You can charge into them and insta kill them. But if you don't insta kill them, if it's gonna take two hits to kill a scout, you may as well not even try unless they're cornered in a building, because they can just run away from you. And so you have to try and use the iron bomber. Or whatever, the fucking... I don't even think I'm using the Iron Bomber. I, I need to remember... What's it fucking called? Weapons, primary. Stock grenade launcher. I think that's what I'm using, maybe. Yeah, let's just say this, this the, the fucking stock grenade launcher. That's what I'm using. Uh, Okay, let's let's stop calling it the Iron Bomber because I don't actually have that unlocked. I will switch to it when I do have it unlocked, but whatever. It's, it's, but the grenade launcher, you have to try and hit them with the grenade launcher because they can just run away from you, right? Uh, the problem is scouts are the most mobile game and the most mobile class in the game, and it's really hard to predict their movement, <laughs> and they move super fast. Uh, so it's just really fucking hard to hit scouts. And they can just dance around you. I'm sure a good player who has like a lot of experience predicting movement and leading shots and stuff can can do reliable damage to scouts. But I am, it's not a good. It's not like an easy matchup. Like demo knight versus sniper is like natural, natural, natural prey, right? Sniper, you're fucked, right? You're fucked if you're a sniper and you see me coming at you. You're just dead. If you're a lone medic, you know. It, you're not as fucked as snipers, but you're pretty fucked. If you're a lone spy, you know, it's GG for you, okay? Then if, if there's opposites. Like, if I if I see a... a um, 
you know, if I'm getting fucked by a pyro, I'm just fucked by that pyro. I have to run away, or if I don't have a charge, I'm just dead. Um, you know, there's uh, heavies, I don't stand a chance. Like, especially a heavy with a medic, like, I just don't stand a chance. I, my only, in that situation, fall back, this is what I've learned. In that situation, if there's a heavy fucking me, run away and then try and just long range shoot the medic, like, do a little bit of damage to the medic with the grenade launcher. And then it, maybe I can charge in, kill the medic in two or three swings, and then charge out, and then let my team deal with the heavy. That's that's what I've been trying to do. Uh, I think that's a useful thing to do, is kill the medic in that situation, let my team, because I don't stand a chance against the heavy. heavy. Uh, yeah, scout is not a good matchup. Like, I think a good player could probably beat a scout, but it's not like an easy-peasy matchup, like, like a spy or a, sc a sniper. Um, I'd say it's it's one of the harder ones, uh, for me at least. Anyway, the other team was so had so many scouts, and for some reason I didn't just leave the server. I should have just left the server, but I was like, no, I'm I'm gonna stay here so I can practice my scout matchup. Uh, this was a stupid fucking idea. Well, I don't know if I got any better at it. Probably not. I don't think I got a single kill for like an hour. Uh, they just had so many scouts, and I was trying to f fucking hit them, and I couldn't hit them, and it was super frustrating, and I was just dying every time, because somehow, apparently, scouts can just two-shot in you. I I don't know this was in the game. It seems a little unfair to me. And when I'm playing scout, it never seems like I can two-shot anyone. I don't know how these guys are just fucking two-shotting me, but whatever. I didn't know that was a thing, but... A scout, all they have to do is walk up to you, and they come out of nowhere, because they're super fucking fast, right? And then all they have to do is pump, they just go boom, and then you try and shoot them, and you can't do it, because they're scouts. And boom, and then you're dead. 15 seconds. <laughs> Until you can respawn. And this was just fucking going on forever. And eventually, everyone left the server. I, I You know, it's a community server. Actually, no, it wasn't. It was actually an official Valve casual server. Um, and everyone just left, except for me and this one other guy. And he was playing NG originally. Uh, and it was just... We were playing on a Harvest. Because that's that's the only map I'm playing right now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play other maps once I get better at the game. But I, I think Harvest... It's good for trumping. It's, it's a fun map. Like, it's very fast-paced. Uh, I, I don't know. I like Harvest. It's fun. Uh, but yeah, it was just me versus this NG, and obvious, and I just didn't stand a chance, because he, he could just put a sentry down on the control point, and it, it just kind of fucked me, <laughs> I, I didn't know what to do, so event, and then he decided to switch to, but I was doing okay, like, I wasn't winning the 1v1s, but, like, I was destroying his sentries and making him annoyed, so I think he just got annoyed at that, and he switched to scout, and so then it was me as demo, hybrid demo knight, versus this scout and I knew I didn't stand a chance so I thought what has a good matchup against the scout I, I don't know uh, so I just decided to switch to scout myself because uh, you know that'll be fun I guess um, so then we just did scout like it was me random guy me as a scout him as a scout and suddenly after like an like an hour and a half maybe two hours it, it was it was it was about the length of the latest episode of The Yard, so however long, like an hour and 45, whatever. Finally, I switched to Scout, suddenly I can get kills. Like, holy shit, I'm a, I'm a Scout player. <laughs> so, suddenly I switched to Scout, and it's like, I can hit shots. And I don't, I don't, like, we, we played a few rounds, and, like, I didn't, I, I don't think I won overall, I wasn't keeping track of how many we won, but I think I just barely lost, like, a, uh, on the but I won like quite a few rounds in these one v ones. Of like, King of the Hill. Uh, in this sort of scout mirror match. Uh, and it was it was pretty crazy. <laughs> like suddenly, I could uh, I would I I don't know how to describe it because I had never played played scout before. I should have said that earlier. I've never played scout until today. Not properly. I've, like, played Scout to see what it's like, and then switched off after dying. 
because I was like, oh, you have no health, that just fucking sucks, uh, let me switch back, like, this gun doesn't do any damage, uh, but, yeah, this, this scout mirror match, I was, like, trying, you know, first I didn't really understand what's happening, but I hit my flicks, because I'm a CSGO player, that's what we do, you know, I hit, I hit the fucking flicks with the scatter gun, and then, and I, and I got the kill, and I was jiggle peeking like a CSGO player, I was retarded, um, and then, you know, after, like, five or so of these, like, fights, I start to be figuring out the double jump, and, like, start to getting, getting the hang of scout movement a little better, and evasive movement properly, unpredictable defensive movement, and I'm still not good at it, not compared to the players who are actually good at it, of course, don't even, I'm not even gonna pretend, when I say get good, I don't mean actually good, but I got pretty okay for me, and this guy who I was fighting against was clearly fairly good, and I mean, I lost on the grand scheme of things, but I I think I had played respect, respectably. Like, okay, I do actually have some skill in this game. Not, like, an immense amount, but I have just played a first-person shooter game for enough hours that I have basic FPS skills, and Scout is going to test your basic hitscan FPS skills. I have those. I have source engine movement skills, and I have basic flick shooting skills. Like, okay, I can play Scout. Now, Scout is way more boring than Demo Knight, because you can't trimp, and you can't do the silly movements and hit crazy uh, pipe shots or grenade shots. Uh, you know, it's, it's nowhere near as wacky, it's nowhere near as fun. And at a certain point, I would rather be playing the less effective but more fun class than the more effective but less fun class. But Scout is still fun. And so, you know, after doing reasonably well with Scout, I joined a community, the, the other guy left, so I was alone in the server, so I joined a community Harvest 24-7 server and played Scout for a bit. And playing Scout changed the game for me because I have no health, but I'm really fast. And I have this gun that only works at a certain, that only works well at a certain range. Like, it's all about positioning, it's all about evasive maneuvers, and understanding that you have low health, knowing when to retreat and stuff, and it's like I unlocked. And I played Scout for a bit. I didn't play particularly well, but when I switched back to Demo after a while of playing Scout, suddenly I was way better. Like, I was understanding, okay, I'm low, I should fall, but, like, what situations, like, oh, okay, I'm, if I go and, like, I'm overextending, or, like, okay, I can't take that fight, uh, or, like, knowing when is appropriate to fall back, when is appropriate to chase down, uh, you know, not 100% of the time, of course, m maybe not even, you know, but, uh, you know, at least 40% of the time, which is better than zero, which I was at before. So I actually made some improvements to my gameplay from playing Scout, and I started to actually rack up some decent kill streaks. Not actually decent compared to people who are good at the game, but for me, like PBs, like previously my my person when i first got in, got back into tf2 uh i was i my best was of a four kill streak and then yesterday i got a six kill streak and today i got a seven kill streak uh which was pretty good pretty good for me you know i i know i know solar light is out here getting like 50 kill streaks on demo night I'm not solo light, okay? He has like 12,000 hours in the game. Okay, give me a fucking break. I have a hundred. <sighs> anyway, I just like TF2. It's fun. It's a fun video game. It's very wacky. And yeah, this, this is, I feel like this is a little more scrappy, like this is kind of, kind of fucked up as a podcast, you know, kind of, kind of rambly, but this is supposed to be background content, I guess, so it doesn't really matter. Um, uh, so the other thing I was going to say is, uh, there's a lot of, I don't even know what to call it, I guess I could call it hype, there's a lot of hype around 
CSGO Source 2. Uh, if somehow you don't know Source, you know, everyone knows. Everyone knows Source 2 is a thing, right? The, the, the sequel to the Source engine. And Dota is in Source 2, and Half Life Alex is in Source 2. And there's been hype for years about Counter Strike getting ported to Source 2. Uh, and for a while, it was like, oh, it's not going to happen because it's unfinished. But then Half Life Alex came out, and it was like, well, clearly the Source 2 engine is finished enough to make a AAA game. It's surely finished enough to make CSGO in Source 2. When's it going to get ported to Source 2? And it seems like it's going to happen pretty soon. It seems like. Or at least it's it's all but... I mean, it's confirmed at this point that they're, that, that they're working on it due to various leaks. It's confirmed. No one knows when it's going to happen. Valve doesn't talk about these things, of course. But it, it's confirmed that, like, it's basically confirmed by leaks that, like, there have been multiple maps like confirmed there are source 2 versions of multiple existing counter strike maps like there are multiple maps that have been converted to source 2 which seems to hint that someone somewhere is working on converting the game to source 2 my worry now everyone just seems hype about this i guess because there hasn't been like a super major csgo update in a while although they added anubis i mean that's a pretty fucking big update, I don't know, um, but, uh, and everyone's hyped for Source 2, I don't know why everyone's hyped for Source 2, the only thing I can think of, I mean, what does Source 2 actually bring to the table, better graphics, that's pretty much it, uh, I don't think CSGO looks bad, I don't know, I, it's hard for me to have an unbiased take, to me, CSGO just looks like CSGO, doesn't really look good or bad, it just looks like itself. It's like Mario 64. Like, those are two games that I find... I find it hard to judge whether Mario 64 or CSGO actually look good, because they just... I just they just look like themselves, you know? Um, I, I mean, I can tell you that some of the older CSGO maps, like the old Inferno, it looked bad. It looked bad. Or it looked very old. I wouldn't say bad, or I didn't like it. Um, and I think that, like, Nuke looks good, but those are about as far as my opinions go. Ancient definitely looks modern, uh, Anubis looks alright, I guess. The game's not about looks. I don't know why people care about graphical fidelity. Like, do you care about Source 2, about the game looking better? You play on 4-3 stretched. <laughs> So you can get, like, a, a better FPS. Like, we all know no one's playing this game for how it looks. People play in super low resolutions with all the levels of detail turned all the way down so they can get a couple more f frames because that's what the game's about, not about looking good. Like, what matters more than if it looks good is if it if it is readable, um, which, honestly, Counter-Strike has a pretty sp sp spotty history with map and like player model readability and they ended up just sort of brute forcing a fix for it where player model contrast is just increased by default which still doesn't work great because they used to have it figured out and then they added the agent skins which everyone fucking hates the agent skins everyone hates agent skins and the weird thing is that everyone hates it and they still bought it like why i don't understand I don't understand why Valve implemented it, and I don't understand why people bought it even though everyone hated it. What was the point? Just because it's wacky? Very strange. It's like if no one bought the agent skins, then Valve wouldn't... And I guess, since they haven't really made any new ones for a while, I guess Valve has figured out that they're not a high priority, but then why even make the ones that exist? I don't know. It's it's really stupid. It's definitely one of the worst things they've done to CS. But do you want Source 2? Like, what What the fuck do you want Source 2 for? It's it, it, Is it going to make the game look better? Like, who cares? The game already looks fine, and no one plays the game for the looks anyway. Like, that should be a 
like not a fucking priority. The only thing that it would actually bring is that games could look better but run faster because Source 2 is optimized. It's very well optimized, right? That's It was really finalized to make a VR game where which was pushing hardware to its limits, where it needed to look really modern while also being really well optimized. And so Source 2 is like, that's what it's good for. Um, but it's not going to be better optimized than just having a more basic map, right? Like it's not going to really improve anything on an old map that isn't... I mean, CS is already pretty famously not a very demanding game in the first place. I don't understand. I don't understand. The only thing it could possibly do is fuck everything up. Like, all it's going to do is fuck the movement system and change the physics and all your old grenade lineups aren't going to work anymore. Like, like, I do you have really have faith in Valve to like implement Source Two and not change the physics at all? Like, they'll they'll port the movement physics one to one because if they fuck with it, like everyone's gonna hate it. I'm especially gonna hate it. I mean, it's possible that they fuck with it and somehow retain everything that makes it good and make it better or just make it the same but different and maybe it feels fine. Uh, I doubt it. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how compatible Source, like, how, how does that, does air strafing work properly in Source 2? Can it? I mean, Source is an engine, but then again, like, Source is weird, because Source is the only engine with a fandom, (laughs) right? Like, there's no, like, like, there's no other fandom for, like, Unity or Unreal, but Source is such a unique thing, with such a unique vibe, and like appeal that it, it, it just source the source engine itself a game engine not even a series but just an end a game engine has like a fandom which includes me uh which is very strange but yeah i i don't know i suppose source 2 is supposed to be modular right so maybe they just import like a lot of the i mean the smart thing for valve to do would be to just keep all of the physics and movement stuff from the older source version and just update the graphical aesthetic stuff from source 2. Like, I think they might do that. Like, I think Valve is stupid. Like, they'll, they, they've made terrible updates to CSGO, and it wouldn't surprise me if they fucked up the game, updating it to source 2. Um, but also, they're not that stupid. Like, they're stupid, but they're not that stupid. Uh, I just don't really see why it's a big deal. I think people are just tired of being kind of cock-teased about it. I think the only reason anyone cares is because we've just been, like... It's the sort of thing where it's like, well, it doesn't... Maybe it's not that important, but if it gets brought up, it kind of is a big deal in the back end. So, of course, it's going to get mentioned if there's leaks relating to it, right? That makes sense to me. And I think it's just been so many years that CSGO players have been hearing, like, vague vague leaks about Source 2, that it's just slowly built up hype in the background. It's just been this thing we've been hearing about forever. And no one's stopped to think, like, but why do we even care? Like, why do we need this? Like, maybe they should be working on making the game good, better. Maybe they should be working on fixing, like, broken stuff in the game, rather than... I mean, CSGO isn't that broken as a game. It's pretty good. Uh... But but there's definitely still stuff that needs work. Uh, I mean, the hit reg. Re- if you will rework the hit reg from the ground up, maybe, you know, fewer CS gold moments, fix some of the fucking stupid shit that's in the game. Fix the weapon balance, maybe, because the, the entire game is CT-sided right now, which is retarded. First time in CS go history that the entire game has been CT-sided. Anyway, that's just dumb. Uh, yeah. It's the next day. Actually, maybe I shouldn't be recording right now, because I'm kind of going to need to get up and cook. Let him cook. Jesse, we need to let him cook. God, that was fucking cringe. Kill me literally kill me. This is how I get when I'm hungry. I just get fucking depressed.
it's actually fucked up. This is why, like, I don't know, whatever. Um, you know what? Yeah, it's a bad idea to record. I, I, I'm just gonna go make food and come back. So actually, earlier today, this is not what I was originally gonna talk about in this segment. Earlier today, I, um ended up having a very brief chat with uh, a casual TF2 on Discord. Uh, If you don't know, I cannot recommend enough this guy's YouTube channel. It's one of, like, easy top 10 YouTube channels of all time for me. Uh, I love this guy's videos. Criminally underrated. Uh, If you like these sorts of ridiculously long talky videos, he has one. He he also has a 12-hour long video, just like me. And he has some other long talky videos, but he also makes videos more specifically about TF2. And they they have like a, a, a music-y bent, artsy bent. I don't know. I just love this guy's videos. Um, we haven't really talked much in the past. I know he is aware of my music. Uh, that's about it. Anyway, um, I briefly talked to him today. And mentioned, you know, that I'm, I have like a, a hundred hours in TF2 and that I'm trying to get better. And, uh, he was surprised to learn that me, as a CSGO veteran, I, when I say that, I mean, I've been playing CS for a long time, not that I'd necessarily have a lot of hours. I know 3000 is like pretty mid for CS. Uh, but I've just been playing since like tw- like 2015, which is a pretty long time. Anyway, uh, he was surprised to find out that I main Demonite or hybrid Demonite these days. Uh, pure Demonite is just too fucking difficult, man. <laughs> I might switch back to pure... I mean... No, you know what? I don't think I'll ever switch back to pure Demo Knight. Because air shots are just the best feeling in the world. It's it's literally drugs. It's so much... Th- I've never gotten dopamine like that from a video game. It's like... Like when you hit them with the bop. And then they fly up in the air. And then you flick. And then the bop. And then it you track them. And then they just... Go, ah... It's just the best, uh, like, anyway, he was surprised to learn that I played demo, um, and I said I've been trying out Scout recently, and he said that makes much more sense, and I just think it's interesting. I'm kind of fascinated by this difference between CS and TF2, because uh, they're both obviously source-based FPS games uh, with a lot of mechanical depth to them, Um but they're also, like, they're both extremely similar and extremely different. And I think that's really interesting. I've been, like, quite interested in comparing them in my head. I already did a big run about this earlier in this video. Anyway. Uh, yeah, like, why, as a CSGO player, you know, I have some natural skill with the hits to gain weapons. Not that much, because I have zero... I have very little experience with defensive movement or evasive movement, since that's not a thing in CS. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, whatever. But just general flick playstyle is, like, my natural habitat. So if I had to say, like, if you want transferable skill, play sniper. Because the sniper, the like, the stock sniper rifle, is it's just the scout. It's the exact same gun. Um, if you have any experience... Or, ping, or playing Scout in CSGO, you will be instantly cracked at Sniper. In fact, I basically switched off of Sniper. Real, like, I tried Sniper for a bit once, and I switched off because it was just boring. Because I was already... I wasn't amazing at it, but Sniper's obviously a very like situational kind of class. Like, you have one job, you hold down long sight lines, and that's about it. You just sort of set up camp and you you hold you you stand in the two fort 
bit where the snipers stand and you aim at the other side of the two fort bit where the snipers stand and you shoot other snipers and that's what you do all game and it's kind of fun um but the fact that i could just hop in immediately to a random two fort lobby and play about as well as any other sniper is just boring because it's just it just makes me think i could be doing this exact same gameplay but in a game where there are way more tactics involved and uh, it's just more mentally stimulating. Huntsman Sniper is different, obviously. Huntsman is fun, even though it's fucking pure luck. <laughs> but it's also fun. Uh, but Stock Sniper is just like... I don't know. It wasn't. It wasn't. It's not different enough from CS, but it's also similar enough. It's it's similar enough to CS that it just makes me think: Why am I just playing a worse version of this other game? It it almost feels like they just shoved, like sniper. He's slow. He has no health, and he just uh, like watches angles all game. It's like they just took the Counter Strike mechanics and just put it in the middle of TF two for no like it's it's very weird. Uh, so other than sniper, you know, scout is all about hit scan weapons. It's again, it's pretty different because you have to like moving and shooting at the same time. Obviously, different from from CS and the double jump and stuff like that. But you will have natural transferable skills if you play um scout and so i've already talked about this i already talked about this in this video um but he, he was surprised to find out that i played demo and i think demo night is such a really fascinating thing in a video game maybe it's just because it's very novel to me right now but i'm still fascinated by the existence of subclasses like the fact that the game basically has these nine classes but then it just has like two secret classes <laughs> it's really interesting like there's the nine classes but then also there's huntsman sniper and demo knight is i guess there's also other more like less common ones but those are the two big ones mainly demo knight uh like you take this sort of mid pretty slow pretty mid like not you know Demo's playstyle is you stand back and you set sticky traps and you fuck up, you, you, you ruin engineers days, right, you, you spam, spam into engine nests and stuff like that, do splash damage, find groups of enemies that are like stacked up and, you know, do whatever, sort of hang back and fuck with engineers <laughs> and try and stay away from scouts. Uh, <clears throat> like the fact that this class can be turned into the fastest class in the game by just switching out one weapon slot but only briefly like it's it's adds a whole bunch of like that it's very tactic it's very tactic because well it's just very i mean as like trimping just feels good Trimping is, is, like, I like to go fast in video games. It's my favorite thing to do in video games. If you look at my my 3x3 three three that I talked about in the last the last time I did this, um, let me see if I can actually find it. Uh, one second. Yeah, every single one is basically, well, not, almost every single one is about going fast pretty much they're all about going fast that's what i like to do i like to i like it when objects move fast and i'm i'm objects and they have like momentum and stuff yeah, you may tell you might tell me that counter strike and half life aren't about going fast but they are the way i play them they're all about having quick satisfying movement and there's nothing quicker or more satisfying than trimping like you just fucking fly across the whole map in an, in a second and it's there's a very high skill ceiling to it and uh is it tactically useful 
Is it actually <laughs> ish? It's uh, definitely not as tactically useful as rocket jumping, just because the uh, you know the market gardener exists. Um, and rocket jumping is more versatile since you can pull it out whenever you need to, basically. Uh, but you're faster than rocket jumping. Uh, and the, the reason the charge exists in the first place is so that you can get yourself quickly into melee range to do damage with a sword. Uh, it's, a, it's a weird bug, the way it works. It doesn't, like, I... It's it's very source engine, but it's also you, not in any other source engine game. It's it's a very unique mechanic, uh, and honestly, it's most useful as a sort of to let you get in, get out real quick of situations, and just sort of pick pick an enemy off and then run away. Uh, But but trimping is just super fun. I I don't know if there are like trimp maps like there are like. Uh, let me look it up. Trimp underscore wavy. <laughs> I'm looking at this right now. Huh. Yeah, they exist. I might have to give this a go at some point. This doesn't look that hard. <laughs> Maybe it is hard, but... Oh, this looks a little tricky. It gets harder as it goes along, I suppose. <sighs> I fucking love the Source Engine, man. Uh, sorry, you got a little distracted there. Uh, I just, I really find it fascinating that this exists in a video game. That, like, there's this completely unique movement mechanic that is, like, fairly niche. In an already fairly niche game, there's nothing, there's no other game with anything like this. And, like, is it actually useful? Yeah, I mean, I have definitely... Or, and I remember I'm not particularly good at the game like remember that I'm I think I'm I've just like the only thing I care about doing is the trimp fast and cool and already like just today I I I remember like a couple of I mean one particular situation I thought was really cool is I I I was on harvest as I tend to be and I was on you know, spawn, run up to the roof. Well, actually, I didn't run up to the roof. Anyway, I, I, I trimped using a little slope over to the enemy roof. And then there was a sniper there. I killed the sniper. And then a soldier rocket... Like, while I was killing the sniper, a soldier rocket jumped up to the roof from, from the enemy spawn. And uh, the sniper had done some melee damage to me. It wasn't a super clean kill. So I was... Already, like, I think he just hit me once with his little sword thing. So I was, like, a little low, but I thought I could probably take the soldier if I had landed some clean pipes. So I try and, so I switch to the, so to, to, to the, the grenade launcher, and I try and hit the soldier. And I hit him once, but he's hitting rockets on me like crazy. And so he hits the, he, he launches the second rocket at my feet. And then I realize I'm not going to be able to win this. So I, uh, while I'm like, I get shot up in the air, I crouch jump to surf his rocket, which puts me right up in the air. You know, normally this would not be a very good position to be in because he could, like, I can't really escape. But then I, like, while I'm in the air, activate the charge and strafe directly back down into the roof all the way across the map <laughs> like uh, like as far as like, like as fast and far as you could possibly go like it was it was perfect like I, I couldn't have done it I mean I'm not going to say that this was entirely skill I, I, I think I got kind of lucky uh, but like 
and eva ev evading, and then went all the way back, got some more health, and then, you know, got fucked. <laughs> and then I was like, hell yeah! And then I got backstabbed <laughs> by a spy <laughs> who was invisible. I uh, just got completely fucked. But, uh, you know, evading dying like that is super satisfying. Because it, it, yeah, it's just, uh, it gives you uh, this, this crazy three-dimensional option in the game, which I, I just really like. Uh, I don't remember, what was I even talking about? I just wanted to vaguely rant about TF2. Yeah, sorry for talking about TF2 so much. I, I'm just kind of fixated on it right now. Maybe this podcast is really fucking boring because all the shit I'm saying is like stuff that everyone else already knows from when they played TF2 like 10 years ago. But I never had that experience. I'm only, I'm way behind the times. And I'm just kind of fixated on learning as much as I can. I'm in full autism mode. I'm just spent, it's just, it's just like I must consume all the information about this video game that is possible. It's great. TF2. Team Fortress 2 is the Super Smash Bros. melee of first-person shooters. And Team Fortress 2 is the... is the... the is... is... <laughs> Team Fortress 2 is the... the talking heads of first-person shooters of multiplayer first-person shooter online video games. Team Fortress 2 is the the talking heads of multiplayer f online first-person shooter video games. There you go. That's my, that's my, there's my takes. There's my take. Team Fortress 2 is the the talking heads of multiplayer online first-person video games. First-person shooter video games. Anyway. You can figure out why that is for yourself. I want to talk about the Mario video. So I made a video that was quite different from from other things I've made. Uh, it was called... Uh, can you... Hi, my is it you. possible to beat Mario 64 without touching grass? That's what the video was called. Um, and you've probably seen it, so I don't necessarily need to talk about it that much. Uh, but the reason I made it, which I, I thought about mentioning in the video, I ended up just not having a place to put it, is because I found, I watched a video called, like, Can You Beat Every Mario Game? Or like, how it, no, it was called How Fast Can You Touch Grass in Every Mario Game, I, I believe. Um, and so, and... When I watched that video, I thought, like, touching grass, I basically had the thought that was the intro, that, like, that's a fun challenge, but but the reverse. But I don't want to go every game for a couple of reasons. Firstly, I don't like the 2D, I don't like 2D platformers that much in general. Uh, I mean, I'm the only Mario game I care about is Mario 64. Let's just be frank here. Really. I mean, I care a little bit about Odyssey, but like 99% of my Mario interest is Mario 64. Uh, so, you know, just do that game. And also, I don't have the capacity to play the other ones. I've never, like, I've, at least I've played some Mario 64, and I'm very knowledgeable about the game for layman, for someone who's not a speedrunner. Oh, I got an in speaking of speedrunner, I got an absolutely fucking unhinged comment. Oh, it was by the same person who was being unhinged in my stream chat. What is up with this this fucking person? This is just a, it's, it, this this person is fucking unhinged. Like this is one of the I I'm glad that I'm attracting weirdos like this. Like it's fucking weird and hilarious. You know, not to call you out, but I won't. But I thought it was like when I when I first it was one of the first comments I got on the video, and I thought it was a copy pasta at first that I just hadn't seen, but it's not. This person unironically believes this. It's very strange. It 
It's one of the most... I don't even... I don't even want to read it out. I don't even want to give it attention. You can find it if you go to the video. This is one of the dumbest fucking comments I've ever had. <laughs> In fact, I think it's the the dumbest, most unhinged comment that has ever appeared under one of my videos. And for that, I'm I'm thankful. So I made this uh, highly edited, marketable um video and just because i was inspired by these other videos uh, and i had a cool idea for an intro that was pretty much it i thought there's been a couple of times when i've had the idea of doing challenge run videos or like more like a, maybe a video essay type thing uh, but they've never had a like a cent i could i always struggle to find the central hook to make those videos interesting because, like, I will watch one of those videos about anything. It doesn't have to have a hook, even if it's fairly low quality. Um, uh, it, like, for example, Nathaniel Bandy, who, funny enough, also watched the same video I watched and had the exact same idea I did, although he did it slightly differently. He does a lot of challenge run videos uh, in Mario games. But, like, his style is he doesn't really use, a, like, a hook. He doesn't really have any any particular flashiness to him. He's kind of a more of a workman director. Like like there are certain film directors, right, who are very flashy, very stylistic. Um, and then there was like, uh, and then there there are certain film directors who's who are very like uh, pragmatic and don't like to show, like don't want to make their own directing style the center of it and Nathaniel Bandy definitely falls into the second category like his videos are like just exactly what they say on the tin with no frills and it's kind of you know some people might say they're low quality uh they're maybe not as creative as some other videos I agree but I also they're really good for falling asleep too they're like top tier falling asleep content they're very comfy. Uh, but I, so I, I will watch those sorts of videos, but I don't really, the, it's not interesting enough for me to put the effort in to make it. So that's why I've never made a video like this before, because I've never had like a central hook. Whereas this one, once I came up with that idea for the intro, where I could actually tie in some commentary on like being a shut-in, uh, even if it's mainly just as kind of a, a gimmick or a joke, uh, that's the thing that made me actually want to put effort into the video. Like, I had the idea, and then, like, a couple of days later, I randomly had the idea for the intro, and I, I wrote the intro down. Uh, and then, like, once I wrote that intro down, I thought, this is too good, like, I have to make this video. Not that this is, like, some mind-blowing, you know, this is, like, a fairly standard challenge run video with, like, a little bit of a gimmick at the beginning. I'm, I'm not here to say I've changed the YouTube game or anything, but... For me, I've changed my own YouTube game doing this because I've never done anything like it before. So it's kind of a a bit of a milestone. And then after this, after I finished it, I was having a bit of a crisis for a while, right? Because I've been, I've sort of been thinking, like, I got lots of, I mean, I've had a really positive reception. I'm really glad you guys like this video because I put a lot of effort into it. Um, and... Uh, it's had a really positive reception, which, you know, at the end of the day, I don't want to just make mainstream videos to get popular, but I, um, like, it seems like my existing fan base actually likes this. So that's, that's what I'm most happy with, is that I was a little worried that people might think that this video didn't, didn't feel like me, but I'm glad that people, like, who already liked my weird, long, vloggy videos, like this as well um and i would be happy you know and but then the problem is that this is not the sort of thing that i have ideas for all the time like after making this video i've been sort of pressuring myself to 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 make a follow-up to like well this is what my channel is supposed to be now since this this is like clearly the best video i've made uh, which I don't know, I don't know, I think it might be true, I don't know, 
it's hard to judge these things but it's like if this is the you know how do i put this okay i gotta make more video basically it just feels like i'm pressured like oh i have to make more videos like this now which is a little tricky because i've i've been racking my brain for ideas and i have a couple i have a few ideas um but n none of them have the same hook like and th th that's the first thing in f like the the there's there's a couple that i have I'm not going to reveal them in case I actually end up doing them, but one of them I think might be, like, really fucking hard. <laughs> like, the actual challenge might be, might take me, like, weeks or months. Like, this one was, like, a you know, two days of LBLJ. Like, that sucked, and it really fucked my hands up, uh, but it was survivable. Um, but this might, th this other one might take me a really long time of grinding. Uh, I think it is like way too hard, and that's like the best idea that I've had. Uh, and it's not even a I don't know it it doesn't have a particularly, I I don't know it's not as it's not as satisfying and and easy to understand maybe it is I don't know but I'm a little worried about that video I don't know if it'll ever come out and then the other I another I I mean I had a couple of other challenge run ideas but then I had an idea for kind of a a video essay e kind of thing. Because I would really like to be making videos in the same niche as, like, Richter and Ratlobber, and maybe Casualty of 2 to some extent, of, like, Source Engine videos. Because I love the Source Engine, and I, I specifically, like, there's, there's only real, I think there's a guy called Pat Bites, and that's about it in terms of Half-Life 1 content. Uh, let me see if I've got that guy's name right. Yeah. Uh, there's only this, this seems like the main Half-Life 1 gold source guy. Uh, and I'm pretty big into Half-Life 1. In fact, there was a while where I was planning to make a big Half-Life 1 video, but I tried writing it and sort of ran out of things to say. I realized that the concept was maybe not as interesting as I thought. And then secondly, I realized I was really rehashing a lot of the same stuff that came from uh, this video by The Examined Life of Gaming called uh, Half-Life 2 is a Bad Sequel. And I was like, I accidentally ended up just like half of the stuff that I was saying was also just stuff that he'd already said in his video. Uh, so just watch that video and you, you'll pretty much know my opinion. Imagine that video, but then way more schizo. And that's what my Half-Life 1 video would have been. I might still make something based on that because there's a couple of things that I want to point out about the game that I don't think have been pointed out. But there's a few technical reasons why I haven't done this yet. Uh, it's a little annoying and complicated. But there's a video idea that's been hang like floating around in my head for a while. And maybe I should make it. Uh, anyway. Uh, so yeah, I have this idea for sort of a video SAE thing. But that might just turn into a segment in this video. Uh, because I realized I, I, you know, I think there's something in there. But I don't think that that subject is long is like interesting or complicated enough to make into a full video, unless I, oh, I could do that. Hmm. Hmm. I'm not sure. I have to think about it for longer. I I haven't come down to a conclusion on this video topic. But what I'm trying to say is I have some ideas, but I don't really have, like, I don't think my channel is necessarily going to become, I don't know. I don't know what my channel is going to become. I don't, I don't want to feel, pre like, it's not, actually, you know what this reminds me of? There's this podcast called The Safety Third Podcast. It's a bunch of, like, science and engineering youtubers podcast it's an incredibly boring podcast it's a sh it's a shit podcast honestly like uh, <laughs> it's one of those podcasts that is entirely just like no effort put in other than like we are these personalities and we have a podcast together with no nothing beyond that like they're not 
they they hate I like I like William Osman and Niall Red like I like their YouTube videos um and, and like the podcast is not it's not actually like terrible but it's it's not good compared to the good podcasts it does they don't have the the humor or the the comment like the the chemistry I mean or any sort of gimmick or like the podcasts are really about like their particular area of expertise because that's what their youtube channels are about so it's like you just kind of they just sort of talk about nothing but not even any really in, like they doesn't have the chemistry of a really good like friendship simulator podcast uh because they're still just kind of youtubers i don't know it's weird and it, i say it's a shit podcast but the fact that it's a shit podcast is kind of the appeal because you listen to it and the, you don't have to pay any attention it's just background noise it's just guys that you vaguely know about but have never cared about their personalities really just having conversations about really not very much at all and it's it's not bad background noise uh so do whatever you want with that information uh but they did a video with resource which is their best episode in my opinion uh and in this Vsauce video, they, they the conversation ends up actually in a really interesting direction. They're talking about YouTube Shorts and how like this they they don't like they or they're talking about this concept of like purposefully not letting your video like not making good stuff because once you start making something good, you have to keep doing it. So like the, when like these guys who have been making long form YouTube videos have like experimented with shorts, like purposefully making sure that like the shorts don't spiral into months or weeks long projects, like making sure that like the shorts are low effort, quick content to pump out and have fun with because like they could probably look I like I could probably make better better videos if I spent more time on them and put more effort into it but I like can't take that pressure in my life that I have to perform like that uh and so resource has been was talking about how like he purposefully wants to like make sure that his shorts don't become too good because if he accidentally puts out a short that's too good then he'll feel pressured to always make his shorts like match up to that level of quality uh, like you don't want it, the fans to actually expect something good out of you, and I feel like I've made I fucked up here because I it's not just like people's expectations. I because I, I don't you know at the end of the day I'm doing whatever I find interesting and fun, but it's my own expectations. Like once I know I'm capable of making high effort YouTube videos that are completely edited and with like an and so on, it's like well now I kind of have to keep doing it. Now <laughs> like how how can I go back to mental syrup or you know whatever now that i know that or now that i have this mark of quality on my channel which i mean the thing that there's a couple of really big problems with this the first one is ideas which i don't mind about you know i'm i think this podcast format is actually sick I think this is really what I've been chasing after the whole time because the visual aspect of my long vloggy ranty videos has never been the point or it's really very rarely been the point. The point is just you tab over and I'm just rant about stuff I'm interested in or talk about that whatever my kind of opinions kind of vlog kind of you know off the cuff kind of scuffed lo-fi whatever that's been the point and you know, if the visuals don't matter, why even bother with the visuals? Uh, I like this, like, hours of podcasts to listen to while you just chill out, because that's basically what my videos already were. And initially, my videos were, here's one rant. And I still have done that sometimes, like with the breakfast opinions video, for example, and the wireless video recently. Uh, I've been trying to kind of get back on that. Uh, like, that's one format of thing. But also, there are times like here where it's like, well, I want to tell... A I just want to tell my life story because I watched another YouTuber do that. And, like, maybe the thing to do is to start just 
turning on OBS when I'm... You know, maybe, maybe I will have done that for this video. Maybe I'll just have turned on OBS when I'm gaming, and that'll be the background footage that you're seeing right now. Like, I don't know. It's kind of embarrassing, because, like, I'm not particularly good at, at, at games, so it's like, do you even want video game footage? I don't, I don't know. Anyway, so that's the first problem. So, sorry, got a little off track there. That's the first problem with this, like, continuing to make high-effort videos, is that it puts pressure on... I, I'm sort of very susceptible to this thing where you're sort of putting pressure on yourself to always to like keep yourself making these really high effort videos which is a little more stressful it feels like you I'm a little less free to do what I want I know in reality I can put out whatever I want but it feels that way for I don't know whatever reason um and the second thing is the editing process now, I don't mind editing. I've said this before, that, like, I even said that in this video. I studied film for a bit because I wanted to be an editor. You know, I had other friends who were interested in editing, but they were all interested in VFX. Because at the time, you know, on YouTube, the uh, Freddie W and Cardo Digital were sort of blowing up. And me and some other people in the school were, were like, all into that at the same time that it was blowing up. We were, like, the perfect fan exact target demographic for that sort of content and so you know we all became interested in video but they were mainly interested in learning after effects and learning uh you know to to do vfx whereas i was interested in video because of editing cardistry videos and that is like pretty much just editing and I would record, you know, cardistry and edit it down, and I would be sort of having type two fun or whatever. Like it wouldn't, I wouldn't be sitting there smiling and giggling the whole time. But at the end of it, I would come out of my dark room editing for like three hours, and I would feel good, good about myself. It's kind of meditative in a way, and it's kind of I don't know. It's hard to describe the appeal of it because most like most. YouTubers find editing really boring. Like, everyone says, edit, like, oh, being a YouTuber is 90s and editing, it sucks, blah, blah, blah. I like editing. I like the grind of it, just sitting down and just, you know, doing the, the rote work. It sort of is meditative in a way. Um, so that, that's not the thing that I mind. The problem is my computer. Now, I, I edit on my Mac, which is really fast at rendering. This is the big advantage of using Final Cut is that it renders super fast because it's super optimized for, for Apple's hardware. It's great. Final Cut is a good piece of software most of the time, except the few times when it isn't. But most of the time, it's either like very good or absolutely awful in the tiny aspects where it's awful. But I'll let you do your own research into fucking video editing software comparisons. No, the problem is the computer itself because Macs are expensive, and I have to make sacrifices buying a really expensive computer. And the thing I decided to sacrifice was storage space. I only have 512 gigabytes. And one of the problems with Final Cut projects is they get really fucking big, really fucking fast. Uh, the Mario 64 video, 17 minute long video, I'll give you a second to guess how big the project file was for that. I'll just give you a second. I don't, I'm sure that I'm doing something wrong in my workflow because this can't be right, but this is what it was. I'll give you a second to guess how big it, big it was. Write it in the comments. Go ahead. Comment how big you think the project file was. It was 364 gigabytes. 364 gigabytes for a 17 minute video. I don't know why. I don't fucking know why. I don't know what I did wrong to make it that big. But, like, that's what it was. <laughs> and I had to start deleting shit off my computer to even make space for it. Like, that's not something I can do. Like, that's not a sustainable workflow. Is like, run out of space on your computer every fucking time. Not a sustainable workflow. So, if I ever do make a big video like this, I either have to figure out what settings to change in Final Cut to make my projects not, like, ridiculously huge. Because uh, I know there's one thing you can... Oops, sorry, that was probably quite loud. 
I know that there's a, a thing you can do which is like turns off render previews and that should reduce your file size a lot but then you don't have proper render previews and that's like kind of annoying to edit like when you're editing is to, to have like shitty low res low frame rate render previews I, I I need to see the whole thing properly when I'm editing well maybe I do maybe I'd be okay making that sacrifice I'd have to experiment and find out but really I suspect that well let me go back a, a little bit when I bought the Mac and I decide I was deciding what to sacrifice and deciding like to go with the the to not spend the extra few hundred dollars or uh, pounds to buy the, the the bigger hard drive the reason I did it is because I thought well I already have like multiple one terabyte external HDDs like if I if I run out of storage space I can just move stuff over to there and it's not a big deal because uh, one terabyte HDDs are so cheap these days it's insane they're like 20 quid 15 quid like they're they're so cheap uh, and you can you set up Final Cut to save the project to a, an external hard drive. I've done it before. The problem is, they're all HDDs. They're all hard disk drives. And they are cheap ones. They are not particularly fast. They are actually way too slow for real-time um, video editing. It is incredibly frustrating to edit off of a hard drive, an external hard drive like that. It just makes everything really slow and painful, and I hate it. So, if I actually do decide to make more videos like this, I have to, I pretty much have to buy an external uh, SSD. I don't think there's another option for me. I have to buy an external SSD, and those are kind of expensive. Uh, pretty expensive, actually. It's, it's something I can justify to myself. Like, I think it might be worth it, because making videos is fun, and it's one of the main things I do with my life and my time and whatever uh not that they make me any money like i'm not it's not that i can justify it as an investment in my future business although you know these videos are more mainstream there is a possibility that it at one point at some point in the distant distant future i can get monetized uh but that's not the point the point obviously is not to make money the point is to do it for fun i think the internet was better when no one was making money off of anything uh and yeah, I don't particularly see that as it, it's not it's not even a part of the calculation for me. Uh, so that's that's the other problem. Those are the two main things is I, I'm scared of this like escalating feature creep of making high effort videos and feeling like I can't make low effort videos, although I feel like if I just have a podcast like ridiculously long podcasts, things like this. I can feel comfortable putting all the low effort spur of the moment stuff in here and then making those high effort videos as like a once a month kind of situation. And I think I would be happy doing that for a long time and then interspersed with rant type videos in the style of, uh, you know, you, you know what I'm talking about here. Uh, my main, like, I just, I think, I don't know, I need to do some more thinking about this off camera not that there's a camera but that off mic uh if i if i come up with another good idea for a video i will make it that's the fun that's the fundamental point i'm getting at i said let me know if you'd like to see more videos like this and everyone wants to see more videos like this and so my answer to them is if i come up with any more really good ideas i will make more videos but that's as much of an answer as I can give. You know, another reason why I like this podcast format better than... Well, I don't necessarily like it better, but it, I like it. Is it, it decreases my reliance on my phone even more. Like, I, I fucking hate my phone. And these days, like the past few days, I've realized I've woken up. It's not even a few days. I, I, like, everyone these days wakes up and the first thing you do is you check your phone, right? But because I don't need my phone for anything anymore, since I'm not recording videos on it, and, you know, blah, 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 I just let my phone run out of charge 
because it's old and the battery is shit. Uh, so, you know, recently, my phone, I wake up and my phone is just dead. I don't leave it on charge overnight. And I feel fine about that. It's nice to not have to rely on my phone to record videos. And it also, opening my phone is really, like, it's, a very, it's all a very slow process. And then transferring the files onto the computer to upload. And also, if you wonder why my video is always fucking quiet, it's just my phone. Like, the mic is just quiet. Even though I have all the settings on the camera app to record at, like, the loudest possible volume. It's just dog shit. This doesn't have that problem. I'm just in audacity. Now, yes, I am on a Mac <laughs> recording this, because it has a good microphone uh, and lots of storage space. Although, actually, my ThinkPad has a terabyte, so I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, but, yes, I am on a Mac because it has a nice microphone, and recording podcasts on my ThinkPad is really bad because the the one big design flaw with ThinkPads... Look, ThinkPads almost entirely, like, master classes in design they are put they are pretty close to being like as well designed as a laptop can possibly be two fatal flaws are they have terrible speakers uh which isn't too bad if you just use headphones but a little annoying and the microphone is right next to the fan that is the worst design decision in thinkpads it's a terrible idea the microphone is not very good, but that's not a problem. You know, I don't mind having a sort of lo-fi sound. But it's right next to the fan, and all you can fucking hear is the fan going, like, making, uh, what do they call it, whine. Just whining. You just hear the fan fan whine really, really loud whenever you try and record something. Uh, and I, it's possible to go in and edit, edit and, like, EQ that frequency out. But that's just a pain, and then it sounds weird. I don't know. I hate it. It's a ter- It's a, like the worst thing about ThinkPads. I don't know who decided to do that. I don't know. I suppose I could just. I don't know. There's you, obviously you can plug in a mic or something, but th- 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 honestly, the teeth, def- the whatever mics they're building into Max are like really good. Like I, I use them to record vocals. I they're better at recording vocals than my hundred pound. SM7, SM57, SM57, uh, like, they sound very, nat- they, 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 they're, they're definitely tuned for the human voice, uh, but, which makes them pretty good, I think, I, I, anyway, excuses, excuses, whatever, it's, it's good to be less dependent on my phone, even if I'm maybe being more dependent on my laptop, I would, the, given that they're both equally bad as objects, in terms of privacy and freedom and whatever, uh, as form factors, I would rather be dependent, all other things being equal, I would rather be dependent on a laptop than a phone. So that's nice. I bought these trousers on Uniqlo, uh, because my pajama pants are all old, and they've just started ripping. Uh, like, they've all got holes in them, basically. I can't use them. Uh, try, yeah, I actually got Dolt's weight to stitch one pair back together, and I immediately ripped them again. It was pretty funny. Uh, I actually ripped two in, in like, quick succession. Because I just have the... I don't know, I just, I just sit down, and I, like, sit down on my bed, cross-legged, and, like, that just rips the crotch open. <laughs> it's, it's pretty funny. Uh... And so, I sort of ran out of trousers, and I just decided to buy more. And I went, the first thing I thought was buy more cheap tracksuit bottoms. But then, I thought, actually, I have an even bigger problem, which is that, as well as not having trousers to, like, chill in, now that these pajamas are ripped, uh, I also have a severe lack of trousers to go outside in. I basically have, like, one pair of jeans. My other ones, one of them... When I bought it, they fit me, and then I kind of, they like barely fit when I bought them, and now I'm too fat, and they're kind of uncomfortable to wear. Uh, The the other one has a broken button, which I haven't been bothered to fix, so it doesn't button up properly. Uh, And then I have like 
with jeans that look terrible on me because they're skinny jeans and that's not my they never suited me frankly uh but nowadays i'm even more don't want to wear them like they don't suit my style anymore uh, i have two pairs of old skinny jeans uh and then one pair of normal jeans which is the only yeah that's the only dream, jeans i actually own so i thought best option is to go to uniqlo because i know they make high quality shit and comfy shit and buy some trousers that are like tracksuit whatever lounge wear whatever that i can chill in that's comfy but also stuff that is like versatile and can go outside and so i bought a couple of pairs of these trousers and i'm very happy with them so far they're pretty pog i bought one of them which is like closer to the tracksuit bottom side of things in terms of the fabric it's made of and one that is like kind of an in-between hybrid but also pretty comfy uh, and it feels like the build quality the, oh, uh, feels good. Like, I feel like these are going to last me for a long time. Uh, which is pretty pog. Uh, but then I also bought some socks, which is good. Always need new socks. Like, you, you always buy socks. Like socks. Um, but, but I also bought this, uh, like, fleece. And they sent me the wrong one. They sent me, I don't know if I maybe clicked the wrong thing. I don't feel like I did. But the whatever they sent me is XXS size, extra, extra small. <laughs> it obviously isn't even close to fucking fitting. Uh, and I don't know what to do because they know, like, they didn't send me an email Normally, when you buy something online, they send you an email confirmation with, like, a receipt. But they didn't do that. Unless I just put... Wait, did I put a different email in? Let me check my other email. It doesn't look... No, it doesn't look like it. I did not... Nope. I, I don't know what I did. I have... I have not received any emails from Uniqlo. I have no way... I have nothing, so I can't check if I ordered the wrong thing or if they sent me the wrong thing. I don't know how to return. Oh, they did send me an email to. I did use the other email. Okay, let's find out. Oh, it says I bought XXS. I don't. I swear I did not do that. Fuck. I could have cancelled it. God damn it. How do I return? How do I return my order? This is so annoying. I hate I hate going through shit like this. I don't I just bought the wrong size, like a retard. Why did I do that? I swear I clicked the right one. The website's poorly designed. Actually, no. I think it's my dark mode plugin that made it bad. I think the dark mode plugin kind of fucked me. Because I, th I think it made the button less clear. That was stupid. Or oh, whatever. Anyway, that's annoying. I need to fucking... Find a way to return this XXS fleece. It looks cool. It feels like good quality, but it's just <laughs> ridiculously tiny. It looks like clothes you would... When I opened it up, the first thing I said is it looks like clothes you would put on a, a, like a, a dog, not a human. Like, it looks like gimmick dog clothes. Uh... But Uniqlo's based, I don't know, someone once said that they use, like, slaves or something, or sweatshops, but I looked into it, and it looks like they're not that bad when it comes to sweatshops. I mean, obviously, every large clothing manufacturer is going to be doing a little bit of that, but Uniqlo is far from the worst. I am sure it's better than... 
whatever cheap sports direct shit I was gonna buy in terms of ethics. Not that it, not that I care because that's not my responsibility. I'm not a moral actor in this situation. That is the responsibility of governments and regulators, not the responsibility of consumers. You can't buy your way out of stuff like that. But I digress. Uh, Muji, also Muji based. This is, I'm trying to vibe myself here, right? I'm trying to change my vibe. What I'm trying to get at, I'm trying to switch up, become a little more comfy as a as a person. And get some of the like, like Muji style, like m- minimalism and like own stuff that is going to last me for a long time rather than the cheapest option that's going to break in five minutes. That's, that's my plan. Uh, yeah, that's my plan. I'm I'm on the Muji website. They sell food. They sell they sell food. They sell rice. What the hell? Home. Store you know what? This would actually be so useful for me. Buying some of these storage tubs. Why don't I do this? Bro, I should hella do polypropylene storage. Bro, I should buy these and put stuff in it. Why have I not been doing this? I guess it's kind of, it's not they're not even expensive. These things are like fairly cheap. This is genius. I will need to think about doing this. What else do they have on this website? Cardboard and wood storage? What the fuck is rattan? Yo, what? These are these go crazy. These go kind of Kind of hard, frankly. What the hell is rattan? I need to rattan storage. Oh, it's like it's like weaved, woven woven uh, basket tr- baskets, basketry type of stuff. That's kind of fine. It's kind of mid. What else do they have here? All sorts of stuff. But what about food? No, that's not what I meant to say. What about clothes? Because pajamas and loungewear, that's the section you always got to check. Yo, this goes hard. It's, it could, I, I would never be able to wear it. I told, this is way too weeby. I can't get it. This is too Japanese. This, <laughs> if I wear this, I'm never living it down. It looks fucking sick. It looks fucking sick, but, but like, it just looks like a, a fucking, a, a Jinbei thing. Is that what it's called? I don't know. That's just what it says on the website. I don't know if that's the right word. No, that's just a character from One Piece. <laughs> no, it is the, it is the right thing. Yeah, Jinbei is a traditional Japanese clothing. Yeah, that's what it is. It's also a character from One Piece. That's pretty funny. Yeah, I don't think I can get away with wearing this. Like, that's just too weeby. Maybe I shouldn't be self-conscious about stuff like that, but... Like, I feel like I'm already at risk of being a massive weeb, you know? What else have we got? Jumpers, like, jumpers are based. Here's a fact about jumpers. They're based. See, I should buy this mustard one. This looks actually pog. Yo, it's on crazy sale. I shouldn't buy it. I mean, I kind of need it, but not super bad. I don't know. I shouldn't buy it until I return. How long is this sale going to be going on for? Are they going to say? They're probably not. That's how these things work, right? Middle ga- gauge crew neck jumper. I mean, this looks this, this, this kind of goes hard to be honest with you. I mean, it's just like 
It's just nice. It just looks comfy. Anyway, sorry, this is probably extremely boring to listen to. I'm just, I'm not, you can't even see the clothes I'm looking at. You just hear me talking vaguely about clothes. And no one wants to hear about clothes. Like, fashion is the least interesting thing of all time. Just dress how you want to dress. Dress comfy. And practical, practically. Pockets and good build quality. That's, that's what I think matters. But the only, it's just because I'm, yeah, my, like, it seems like I'm, I'm going through clothes. And also I'm like, my vibe is changing as a human because I'm getting older. And I don't want to be like, dressing like I'm trying to look young, if you know what I mean. Like, that's always kind of cringe to me. I kind of want to. I don't, I don't want to look like I'm trying to be something I'm not. But maybe I am what I am. <laughs> I was stupid. It's the next day again. I just spent uh, about nine hours playing TF2. Uh, you know, the appeal of the internet, of people who we would now call maybe influencers, but back then we didn't have a name for really internet personalities vloggers bloggers youtubers let's players these types of people twitter accounts that you like you know, whatever artists etc at one point the appeal was that that it was real that you could go i mean this this was at least what like the mainstream th thought which was part of the case, but also, I mean, it's obviously complicated. There's, when you make sweeping statements like this, as if, uh, you know, it can all be sort of narrowed down to one sweeping statement of like, oh, the, the internet personalities grew because they, they were more real, they were more down to earth than mainstream celebrities. Like, of course, you're going to have exceptions to that on both sides, and it's, it's not a monolith, and that's not the only reason why this took off, of course. So I'll preface with that. If I actually had to say why I think the internet personalities grew so much is because is less down to earthness and more uh, the fact that I suppose the, 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 you, they're more specific, right? You can find someone who is making videos or whatever about a very specific interest you have. Uh, whereas mainstream celebrities, you know, they are in the biggest movies, the most broad sweeping thing. You can find a, an internet micro celebrity who maybe, you know, makes videos that get like hundreds of thousands of views uh, or, you know, fairly popular tweets or whatever about some hyper specific thing that it's just that everyone who's into that hyper-specific thing is into this person, that you could never have that before, and that's, I think, the main appeal. But anyway, another part of the appeal was that these are, like, real people that you can relate to. That was definitely another part of the appeal, that it... You know, a lot of people... This is why, like, parasocials is such a, a big, big meme buzzword these days, is that, you know, it definitely existed in the past... Uh, but the idea of treating content creators and shit like your friends and having a a more individualized relationship with them, a more humanized relationship with them, uh, was part of the appeal. And that th this definitely, you know, the, the jokes don't have to be super polished, right? Because a lot of the internet is based around comedy. It's like the jokes don't have to be super polished and as funny as the best comedy shows on TV because the jokes you make with your friends when you're hanging out are funnier than those comedy shows, you know? And that's the, the same appeal, right? The jokes, the, the sort of improvised jokes that early, you know, Yogscast or whatever would make 
they didn't they they you'd show them to your parents and they wouldn't understand because it, it it's like when you try and explain an in joke to to someone like you just had to be there it's just a different thing and so the fact that these were like people and this this is the case you know not just i'm i'm not just saying this oh this was the case back in the early days of the internet it's also just the case with smaller creators in general it's just that back then every creator was what we would now even the biggest creators I hate calling them creators. I've been fucking infected by corporate fucking fucking speak. Oh god, I'm calling them people content creators. Like I'm, I've been fucking brainwormed by these people just repeating these goddamn corporate words. Ah, kill me. I don't know what else to call them. That's the thing. I've, the, the, I don't even know what else to call these people. Anyway, the problem here is right that. If the appeal is that people are down to earth and real and you know them on a more personal level, part of the appeal of that is that people are flawed. People have flaws. Then you're not perfect, right? You're, you're not, you, you see all sides of a person. You get to hear about their troubles as well as their successes and how they've failed and grown and so on. The problem with this is that as the there are more and more people who put themselves out there online and get successful and there's a larger and larger market to consume that sort of thing, you run into the issue of not only is everyone a flawed human being, but most people are actually just f- fucked fucked up. <laughs> like, uh, you look at Twitch, right? And the proportion of people, you know, it sort of grew. And right now, for the last, like, year or so, or whatever, Twitch has been sort of collapsing because of stupid drama shit. And when I say stupid drama shit... Some of it is stupid drama shit, as in, like, stuff no one cares. Oh, so-and-so's had a falling out with their girlfriend, and, like, who fucking cares type of drama shit. Although, if you think I don't follow... If you think I'm not following the XQC adept fucking weird divorce thing, then, you know, I, I we've all got a little bit of drama frog in us, okay? I, I think... I can't deny it. I can't deny it, okay? it's I, I do follow it. I'm guilty as charged. But I digress. Keeping up with the Pogdashians. However, the biggest dramas are sexual assault. Like, they are like... And it happens a lot. <laughs> like, there's a lot of it. And it took me a while to be convinced of this. Because, you know, I'd always figured that, like, oh, you know, this idea that, like, oh all men are these, like, rapey, creepy weirdos or whatever. It's just, like, some misunderstanding or some driven by, like, ideology. But more and more I'm realizing that, like, there are there are two things happening. The first thing is a lot of these people are just, just have, are just, like, weird, like me, and just don't know what they're doing in the, the sort of social dating, having sex game. But are too stupid and horny to realize that they don't know what they're doing and they just they just think that this is normal and they just you, like this is what happened with Andrew Callahan right like you you get you you don't realize that what you're doing is wrong because no one ever explicitly tells you how to do these things and for some reason you're so stupid and horny that you just keep doing it regardless until eventually it's going to all blow up in your face that's type 1 this happens a lot and the other type is that a lot of these people are just fucking monsters. Like, there's real, r- proper, like, rapists out there. And there's, like, quite a lot of them. Like, these feminists weren't kidding. <laughs> you know, I didn't realize. I've never known any. Like, I would, like, that, do, like, I've always thought this whole thing, where they're going on about, about how, 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 how rape is, is common this is just some insane thing maybe it happens in like a far off distant land that i'm not aware of but maybe like it's overstated 
because because I would never you know the idea of doing that is so far removed from my experience of life like I've never considered even considering doing something on that level that is just such a, a, a like psychopathic outside of my worldview experience thing and I'm obviously a man so I figured like that must be just the common experience and maybe it is the common experience but there's a surprisingly high number of people who are just fucked up and evil <laughs> and it's not just in t- cases of rape and sexual assault like or just men I mean it's definitely not just men it's it, the gender doesn't play a, a role in here men tend to be the ones who are raping people out here but everyone is a fucking monster like most people are just bad there is no like pure goodness in the, in the human soul where like everyone is a flawed person just trying their best no most people are deeply flawed and just unaware and unwilling to fix any of their flaws and just stupid to the point of like uh evil they are they are just incompetent unaware and stupid to the point where it just makes them do do evil shit that is the vast majority of people if anyone that you know like hasn't done evil shit it's probably just because they either got lucky or they haven't had the opportunity to but most people are are just incompetent to the degree that they will just commit the most heinous acts without a second thought because they don't they don't have any level of control or or awareness or consciousness or understanding or anything that's what it turns out most people are and especially you know maybe you maybe I'm maybe you're saying I'm over exaggerating maybe maybe I am for the general population but especially in a place like Twitch or YouTube which is kind of a weird thing to like to to like lust after fame and money like that especially being like a a gamer dude or a Twitch streamer who has to have no life and stream for 16 hours a day right like like you're already in a weird population of weirdos who are not socialized well so you're going to fall into the first camp of people who are just unaware that this isn't normal but also like like i'm aware that i don't understand how to navigate these situations like i am i am in don't take this out of context this this feels like something that would take it be taken out of context i'm aware that i'm autistic and that i don't understand social cues very well and so because of that i just i don't i i know to stay away from the game like like the game the game of having you know weird casual sex and fucking a bunch of bitches and doing whatever these normies get up to going out for beers with the boys and all of this shit firstly it doesn't interest me but even if it did i would stay away from it because it's so easy to make a mistake and fuck up if you're not hyper good at navigating these social situations because they're really complicated and normies think how is this complicated this is super easy you know you don't do the and then they have all these unwritten rules and like they they will never understand why it's complicated because they just understand it all intuitively and there's no excuse i could ever give right and i in my teenage years obviously i never did anything even fucking close to what andrew callahan did but i definitely was a bit of an asshole to a lot of people um for this very reason and to be honest there were sometimes even more recently when i've been a bit of an asshole to some people but thankfully i try and apologize and it seems that i'm cool with everyone hopefully hopefully no one's like sitting there harboring like a secret grudge against me uh but yeah of course i've fucked up in social situations everyone has um but yeah these people just don't understand that like if you're not if you if you have any doubt you you don't play the game if you have any question you you just you just stay away from that shit if you think for a second that you might not know what you're doing in terms of anything it's not just in terms of like casual sex and like the navigating that space it's into i don't even understand like i don't even understand i just i just think most people are monsters 
like like i just i just i don't know i think there's this myth that like people are fundamentally good or that there is like oh that like people are just products of their environment it's like well if everyone's just a product of their environment then everyone's of course fucked <laughs> it's clear that people aren't fundamentally good if you still believe that you're kidding yourself okay now there are some people who believe like oh everyone is is just fundamentally bad and so we need like authoritarianism to keep them in check or whatever that or at least, or actually more likely they would say like there's some specific group of people who are just fundamentally bad and we need authoritarianism to keep them in check that that I don't agree with also however I also I I like there's no there's no because they believe that there's a group that's exempted right uh, like oh but but us the 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 ubermenches we're based and we, you know we we would never be bad uh, so give us all the power the, nope like you're just as bad as everyone else every, every uh, there's there is no there is no savior group of people who are above it all uh, like the only people who are, i don't know like it's not the boring people right although bo- this is like the the thing that no one wants to tell you is that the the people who are like bored? It's not actually the weirdos, on the edges of society, who are really the evil ones. Like the really evil ones are the people who are like giga normie, completely boring, nobodies, or maybe they're like really popular giga normies. But those are the those are actually the truly evil people. Are the really the people who are hyper social, like, like. I mean, it's just what what Patrick Bateman is is meant to parody, right? Like he is like hyper aware of these insignificant social situations, like the the business card scene in American Psycho, right? Like he he takes these social situations way too like seriously, but a lot of people are like this. Like there is there's a like that's there's a reason that scene is in the movie. Like there's there is a lot of people who take these like normal social situations where they don't come out on top every time because to the, like to, to the normie brain everything is a competition where you like I, I don't know it's fucking insane this is the problem is like you, you don't want the super squeaky clean unfiltered or like super filtered celebrities but it turns out that the average person celebrities are extremely flawed people, sometimes to the point of being evil, but mostly to the point of just making fuck-ups. Oops, sorry. And this is why it's just a problem to idolize people, <laughs> but it's also kind of hard to avoid, because kind of, like we've kind of built a whole economy around idolizing people. But ideally, you shouldn't do it. Only idolize dead people, because they can't, they can't turn around and do something. If you idolize dead people, I think that's a good idea. Because that you can never get your image of them ruined when they... Do. I mean, not like I actually think Mizkif is a good guy, or like I was ever into any of these people that I'm talking about. Uh, like, I highly doubt... I guess, you know, Simple Flip's kind of fucked up. But he didn't do, I don't think he did anything evil. He just cheated on a bitch, which was really stupid. <laughs> he was more stupid than evil. He's just kind of stupid. Uh, but he's also cracked at Mario. And he did the right thing and took a took a long break. And he's finally back. He posted a video today. You don't know how hard I pogged, man. I've been waiting. I've been waiting this whole time for Simple to return. He finally posted a video again. I pogged. I pogged so hard. Yeah. Anyway, can't wait for you guys to find out I'm secretly a terrible person. <laughs> I don't know. I hope I'm not. But the thing is, like, no one's ever... Wi- this is, like... No no one's ever willingly evil. Right? Like, people who do evil, fucked up shit don't think they're doing that. They think they're doing the right thing. Which terrifies me. Because, like, how do I know that I'm not doing, like, evil fucked up shit and I'm just unaware of it. Like, how how do I know that? 
I try and be as like self-critical as possible. I think that's the only way you can avoid it is by being like constantly self-critical. And I also try not to have frivolous like relationships, not sexual relationships, but just relationships in general, because that just opens up more opportunities to fuck up. Uh, like I keep my friend group small. But that's also like I would I'm not saying I do that for high minded reasons, but that's part of it. Uh, the main reason is just because I struggle to have a lot of friends. It's like a lot of effort. It's a lot of work that I don't have the capacity for. Uh, you die if you work. Anyway, I don't know. The, like this, I think the the true answer to this is actually just to become more forgiving as a person to just be willing to like let let more shit i mean i'm not saying obviously i'm not saying let like serious shit slide but to have a reason have like a good understanding of scale uh like i think a lot of people lack this understanding of like oops that was an alarm i am autolyzing bread or some dough uh yeah, I think people have... Kind of, everything on the internet has to be bombastic, right, to get you to click on it. So there's a race to the race to the bottom of, like, making everything seem as bad as, as it could possibly be. Like, no one's just an asshole anymore. You're an abuser, right? And it takes... no And no one is going to, like, voluntarily neuter their own story to make it to make it seem less bad. Like, if you've been in a bad relationship, but not not like a... Like a, you know, just a shitty relationship, but not necessarily an abusive relationship. And, you know, you're going to feel wronged. Like, of course, you're going to blow it up to the maximum proportions. And it can be hard to know in those situations whether, like, what has really gone down. I think that's like a difficult skill that you're going to have to cultivate more and more is the ability to, to like, actually reason out scale and be skeptical of everything on every level, but don't be, like, overly skeptical to the point where you're just, like, you know, being a retard, uh, but try, like, have a good sense of scale, and try and, try and do some forgiveness, because otherwise you, you're just gonna be left with no one in this world, you're gonna be left with no one, because everyone does stupid shit, I don't know, this was kind of a pointless segment, I just wanted to, I don't know, I don't know why. I don't know. I I just I'm 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 constantly surprised when people are surprised by the fact that like, hey, it turns out this Twitch streamer was an asshole. Hey, it turns out this eagle th- did some fucked up shit, and it's like you're surprised by this. Of course they did. That's what they do. That's what people do. <laughs> I think people are figuring this out more and more. Uh, that like oh, the world is just, people are just fucked, and the world is just fucked, and the problem is, they, they see this, and they think, wow, that's so fucked, could never be me, though, and then they go and do some equally fucked shit, try and do a little bit of introspection, here, I don't mean to be, be, become a self-help handy here, but, like, try and, try and look at yourself critically, critically examine your behaviors, be ready to apologize in life, like, you're gonna fuck up, I know a lot of people who watch my videos are, that get down I feel like a, uh, you know what I'm not even gonna go there that's cringe that's actually cringe I was gonna say I, I I feel like a lot of people who watch my videos are young and like maybe you could use this advice that's actually cringe I, I, I should never say shit like this I'm also fucking young I mean I feel like a like old because I'm you know balding and I look older than I am uh but you know on the grand scheme of life I'm still young so I shouldn't act like I have, like, actual life experience. Just do introspection from time to time. Critically examine yourself. That's all I can say. If I had, Not that you come to me for advice. But I feel like this is pretty safe, basic advice. I'm, I'm trying to take it myself, right? I try, I try and do as much of that as possible so that I don't accidentally fuck up because I know that it's very easy. It's incredibly easy to fuck up in life. That's what no one tells you, is that, like, you can you can just be coasting what, for, like, years and years and doing the same shit for years and years, and then one day, 
the same thing it feels like nothing's changed and then suddenly you fucked up and you fucked up big time and you're and you're gone and then that just follows you forever like that's how life works it's fucked it's so fucked that that's how life works i hate it we need to do something about it but there's nothing we can do anyway that was a bit depressing I'm gonna go make a make a flatbread now with with fucking I don't know what I'm planning to do with this flatbread. What do I have? I have some broccoli. I have some bok choy. I don't think bok choy would go good in a flatbread. <laughs> it's more of a like noodles or rice kind of vegetable. I have I have some some liver. I have some liver sausage. You think that would go good in a flatbread? Maybe. And some cheese? Liver sausage, some cheese. I only bought the liver sausage because it was ridiculously cheap. And it turns out it's actually tasty. I have smoked salmon. That was not cheap. It was actually more expensive than normal. Maybe I maybe smoked salmon. That'd probably, probably be good. Uh, what else do I have? I'll go figure it out. Man, that meal was way better than I had any right to be. <laughs> that let me let me tell you what I had. So I made I the problem was right the the we're kind of low on food, uh, and I didn't. There's a couple of like frozen stuffs, but adults might hadn't eaten yet, so I would they were gonna have some of that. So I was like, okay, I have to make something. Excuse me, I have to make something from what's in the fridge and in the cupboards and whatever. Uh, I could have just had pasta. That was an option. My original plan was to have something on toast. But I go to get the bread out. Mold on a bitch. Mold on a bitch. So, not even moldy bread. But then I remembered. Bread is just made of flour and water, bro. You can just make bread. Um... I'm tell this is actually like making a very basic like kind of pan fried flatbread like you can understand why it, like a primitive it's like you understand why agriculture was such a big deal because <laughs> it tastes great like just flour water salt mix it up leave it to autolyze for 30 minutes come back, knead it for like two to five minutes, get a pan, a little bit of oil, and then fry it. No, no, not right, no leavening or anything. Like, just on its own, that shit is, is like super delicious. So I had that, and then just random, literally just random bullshit. I had these liver sausage slices, and some cheese, and then I put broccoli on it because I just have some broccoli that I needed to use because it's it goes off today and also it's good to eat vegetables. I, that's one of the things I'm trying to improve about myself is eating. I I've I've gone too long eating not enough vegetables. I'm trying to eat more vegetables. Um, I think I'm making progress in that department slowly but surely. Uh, and then a little bit, this is a little bit weird, but yeah, I put some broccoli on it. Broccoli and liver. <laughs> broccoli, liver, liver sausage, cheese, and then mayo, because I figured it would be dry, like it might be dry, so I, I put some mayo on it. And then just, um, and then pepper, and then I thought... I know. I have a couple of shallots. Shallots? I never know what syllable to put emphasis on in that word. Shallots. 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 I'm going to say shall shall Neither way sounds natural to me. Shallots. I'll say shallots. Uh, shallots. Whatever. I put... I chopped up one of those raw on the top because... I really like raw onion. I know a lot of people... Like, I just really like the pungency of raw onion. I, I've This is another thing that's been getting me more into vegetables. 
is I've been putting raw shallot or green onion on like everything I eat because it just tastes really good and it takes five seconds. You don't have to like the big thing that's been keeping me from cooking vegetables isn't actually anything to do with vegetables themselves. I have nothing against the way like I, I'm not someone who doesn't like the taste of vegetables except for raw tomatoes, which is a genetic thing. But other than that, like I like broccoli. I like cabbage a lot actually like a lot of vegetables i really like i really like asparagus i really like um uh well lots of things um <clears throat> the problem is really that like you have to use an extra pan and it it makes me think like oh, i'm gonna have to like wash an extra pan and like use you know set it up and do extra cooking and get the timing right because that's like the number one thing i struggle with when it comes to cooking, is trying to make it so that everything is finished at the same time, roughly. Uh, and so that's like the main reason I have been slacking on eating eating my veggies, is <laughs> literally just because I don't want to use a pan, not because I don't like the taste of vegetables. Uh, anyway, that was kind of off topic. What was I talking about? Oh yeah, this bread thing. So fried flatbread. I didn't use much oil, but it was technically fried, not just toasted. Um, yeah, fl fried flatbread, cheddar, cheese, grated, uh, liver sausage, broccoli, raw shallot, shallot, whatever, and black pepper. And that was it, I think. And you would expect this to be like pretty mid, but, like, it was so much better than it had any right to be. <laughs> like, the, the the thing that really, like, made it, which I didn't expect, an accident, is the mayo. Because mayo has this, like, you know, it has, like, a, a tanginess to it because of the acid in it. It has, like, a little bit of a tang to it. And that tang plus the, like, the tanginess of the mayo mixed with the... Uh, Acc acridity of the raw onion like really cut through the fattiness of the sausage and cheese and it was just super good and the broccoli didn't really taste of anything but it added some nice texture uh, yeah I would actually genuinely make that again on purpose Anyway, that's not what I wanted to talk about in this segment. What I wanted to talk about in this segment is I'm going to I'm going to attempt to do progressively tougher world capitals. I am not good at geography. I want to point this out. Like I have never I, we never even took geography classes in school. I am not particularly good at geography. I don't play GeoGuessr. Uh I just want to test myself and if it's embarrassing, if I'm embarrassingly bad, I'm embarrassingly bad. Okay, USA, that's Washington, D.C., France, that is Paris, U.K., that is London, Mexico is Mexico City, uh, Spain, oh, fuck, <laughs> I always forget, it's Madrid, yeah, Russia, oh, Russia is St. Petersburg, right? No, is it, uh, is it, oh, yeah, it's... I thought it was a trick. I I thought I forgot. Okay, so, you know, some countries, they have, like, the capital isn't what you'd expect. Like, Australia is Canberra, for example, but you'd expect it to be Sydney. Uh, I think that's true. I think that's correct. I, I thought Russia was one of those where St. Petersburg is the capital, but no, Moscow is the capital. Germany is Berlin. Uh, Japan is Tokyo. Italy is Rome. Ireland is Dublin, China is, what's up, Beijing, oops, spelled it wrong, Beijing, Norway is Oslo, Egypt is Cairo, Portugal, ah, Lisbon, Canada is, is it Toronto? No, I actually, Ottawa? There's no way, right? I don't actually know what the capital of Canada is. <laughs> Uh, forced order no skip I can't skip 
Oh, fuck. What's the capital of Canada? Okay, Canadian cities I know. Ottawa and Toronto aren't it. What else exists? Ontario? No. Vancouver. How the fuck do you spell Van Vancouver? I, I always, whenever I do these spoken quizzes, I always allow myself to look up spellings. You can you can say that's cheating. If you if you want to say that's cheating, then you can say that. It's not Vancouver. Damn. Is Vancouver even a city? Or is that an, like a... Like an area? I don't know shit about Canada, man. Uh, what the fuck else exists up there? I already did... I don't know. And I can't skip. Fuck. What do I do? Okay, well, I got... I got stuck at Canada. I feel like Americans would know this, and I feel like I'm going to kick myself when I find out. Alright, I'm going to press give up. It's, it is Ottawa! Wait, that was my first guess! I just spelled it wrong. It's, I thought it was Ottawa. Fuck, I spelled it wrong. That's, that's dumb. I'm giving this another try. I literally just spelled Ottawa wrong. I didn't know it was Ottawa. No one pre pronounces it like that. Okay, Washington... Paris, London, Mexico City, um, Madrid, uh, fucking Putin land. What's it called? <laughs> oh god, I'm retarded. Uh, Moscow, uh, Berlin, Tokyo, Rome, Dublin. Uh, Beijing, Oslo, Cairo, Lisbon, Ottawa, Brazil is Sao Paulo, no, is it, um, Rio de Janeiro, I don't know Brazil. Okay, I think that's the... F no, Brazil. I should know this. Brazil is, is weird. <laughs> I'm going to look it up, because I want to get to the more obscure countries. Capital of Brazil. Brasilia? I didn't know that. Okay, well... That's where we've actually failed out. I will. I got one further than failing. Uh, but I'll keep going just to see. Uh, capital of Greece is Athens. Australia is Cam Canberra. Canberra. I don't know how to spell spell it. I think that's what it is. Canberra. Oh, I spelled it right. The capital of Finland. I don't know this one. Okay, I give up. Helsinki. Oh, I should have. Uh, I should have guessed. Okay, well, not great. <laughs> not a particularly good performance. Uh, yeah, I didn't expect to do very well. But there's my there's my I I know as many countries as eighty four point six percent of. Oh no, wait, I failed it earlier. Eighty five percent of people. Not great. Now I feel like I want to... I, I can get sucked down the Sporkle quizzes rabbit hole so fucking easily. Okay, I'm just going to not do it. I'm not going to... I'm not going to do more Sporkle quizzes. I'll get stuck in it. Hey, so in this segment, welcome to... I am just going to read a random post in a 4chan thread on VT about about VTuber feet 
it's not actually, it's in the Hololive general, which I only clicked on because because of feet memes in the in the the OP. But you don't need to know that. This is a random co- random reply in this thread, and I'm just gonna read this out to you. I don't. I'm not interested in Hollow Life. I go on VT for Fallen Shadow and nothing else. The only good VTuber. Okay. Generative AI does not mean the death of content, but content is a historical artifact that arose from a combination of capitalism, distributional scarcity, and cognitive surplus. So content's value is headed to zero. Alternatively, art and other forms of communication where a person is trying to convey something to other people and other people are invested in interpreting it, obviously this is not threatened even a little by generative AI. So content will die, but communication will live on. The fact that parasocial is a real adjective that means something like I actually have a relationship slash connection with with and investment in this creator It's such a bizarre thing that can only happen in a world where content is the norm. What we see as parasocial was the normal way to relate to cultural objects in a pre-content era. If a work like The Odyssey didn't have a clear provenance, you had to invent an author as culture hero, Homer, for it, so hearers would care about it and know how to relate to it. In other words, free-floating content had to attract an author, real or imagined, so that people could enter into what we'd call a parasocial relationship with that figure that would make the content worth investing one's attention in. And so VTubing will inherit the internet in the coming decades when we return to this dynamic. I legitimately think this is a very good post, and it's just a shit post that was respond like it was completely irrelevant to the discussion. This person just decided to post this out of nowhere and I read this and I was like, damn, that is a good take. That is a, that is a solid take. I think I agree. Because I've always had a problem with the stigmatization of parasociality. Um, I think parasociality much like a lot of things, uh, is a way of sidestepping, uh, well, it's 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 just dumb. It's just dumb. It's used to deride people who are passionate about things. First of all, uh, it's it's used to like, um, hold on, take a drink of water and hit the hit the pendulum real quick. It's used to deride people for being passionate about something. First of all. Secondly, it's used to blame shift everything onto the audience rather than actually keeping people accountable for encouraging uh, uh, destructive relationships with their fan bases. A lot of, uh, well, uh, you probably know the sort of person I'm talking to who encourages destructive relationships sort of encourages their viewers to form up an idea of them as a parasocial friend basically to exploit them for money and then when those viewers who have sort of been exploited end up feeling betrayed and lashing out or acting inappropriately because they have been manipulated or they're just otherwise you know, maybe not in a great state of mind or position in their life, whatever, the create the, the 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 person just blames it on the audience for being parasocial rather than taking any accountability for their actions. And third of all, again, in a similar way, it creates this idea that parasocial relationships are this one sided thing where it's always fans becoming parasocially attached to large creators and stalking them or whatever. Look, not, not that I think stalking is obviously, you know, there, but that's not the same thing, right? The, I, the Even the fact that I linked stalking and parasociality in my mind shows that I've 
been surrounded by this stupid meme. They're not the same thing. No one should think they're the same thing. They're not related. It's a dub. But in reality, parasociality goes both ways. And I'd argue that the more common form of parasocial relationship that's actually harmful is creators who have an addiction or a... I try not to use the word toxic because it's, it's, it's kind of a cringe buzzword, but a toxic relationship with their fan bases. For example, I guarantee you that, like, there's something, there's something weird going on in the minds of some of these larger streamers, like, who, that they have this sort of codependent relationship with chat, where, you know, their chats sort of constantly berate them and make fun of them, but also, like, vehemently defend them, uh, and they have this sort of weird black and white, up and down relationship with this monolith that is chat. Um, and I think it probably fucks with a lot of creators and they probably fall into this, like Twitch streamers specifically. And I think they, they probably get kind of addicted to it, like trying to please chat. Uh, or, I don't know, They just it's just a really weird dynamic. And I think a lot of the streamers or, you know, it doesn't have to be streamers, YouTubers or musicians even, or anything, who people who have an audience do end up forming this attachment where they see their fans as sort of like their friends. Like they hang out, you, you know what I mean. And it, so I, you know, there are definitely cases where that's unhealthy, but there's also plenty of cases where that's great and fine. It all depends on whether you're reasonable with it. Like, you know, I, for example, really appreciate you guys who watch my videos and listen to my stupid podcasts. And I enjoy, generally speaking, reading through your comments and seeing the same people in my live stream chats and, you know, so on. I want to do more of a... I did, did a TF2 stream recently where... I went in the voice chat in my Discord server and played with some people from my Discord, and that was really fun, and I'd love to do that more, especially for a game like TF2. I think it suits that game really well. Uh, yeah, so, but I, I don't, you know, maybe that's parasocial because there's a sort of difference in dynamic there, but it's also just fine. Like, there's no way, there's, I don't, you know, there's nothing unhealthy about that relationship. It's not a stereotypical IRL relationship. It's a different form of interaction. But it's, you know, I think people are just scared because it's different and they just freak out. Uh, as if they think the human mind was built with the purpose of having this one type of IRL interaction. When... You know, that's obviously a fallacy. Uh, so, shouts out to Anonymous Poster in random VT thread. I think uh, I think you hit the nail on the head there about the history of parasocial relationships and, and so on. Check this out. We sound a little one of these.
a little improvisation using a gamelan tuning system. I really like microtonal music. I wish I could... I, I mean, there's nothing stopping me from just composing more. It's just a little... It, it's always felt a little gimmicky to me, I guess. Um, although I have made microtonal songs in the past. I mean, uh... Are You Autistic uses a microtonal tuning scale. I don't remember which one, but it's one of them. Uh, but that one's using a, a Balinese uh, tuning system, which I think is really cool. I fucking love gamelan music. Uh, if you have never heard of this, I cannot implore you enough to go on YouTube and look up uh, ga- gamelan, gamelan, it is the coolest, it's like the coolest musical tradition I am aware of, it is just so unique and so cool, uh, it, it's just a perfect demonstration of how like western music traditions are not the be all end all of like how music could have evolved, like western classical music is not just like the natural logical conclusion of how acoustics works that there is this whole completely divorced from anything even resembling the tradition of western classical music everything is different the tuning system is so different like they don't even have octaves in the same way the tuning system like uh, in the West, the, the the way that the octave is split up into 12 notes is obviously the same, no matter what 12 notes you're talking about. Whereas in Gamelan, there are three different uh, uh, registers that are tuned differently from each other. And there are two different tuning systems that are used simultaneously. And those tuning systems are completely different from the Western scales. Just, like, don't even really have... Like, they have sort of weird fifths. Like, they don't... The fifths are, like, really off in, in like, very different from a, like, perfect in nature fifth. Um, and everything else is just completely... Doesn't even have a similar note in the West. Uh, and it sounds great. Like, it's... You listen to it and it just works. And you realize that, like, the 12-tone equal temperament or any other 12-tone western scale is arbitrary and not the only thing that can sound good. Like, you listen to, you know, macams that have quarter tones in them, and the quarter tones are, you know, as, as cool as they sound, they're kind of flourishes, right? They're kind of like, you have the 12 tones and then you have these extra quarter tones that are, like, little flourishes in between it. But gamelan, and there's lots of other musical traditions that are similar to this, but gamelan is uh, my personal favorite, um, is just completely different in, in every way. So the tuning system is different, like not even close, uh, but it still sounds great. The instrumentation is different. Gamelan is based around these like um, xylophone looking instruments like it's all sort of these metal like mallet instruments and it's an ensemble music so like ensembles of these sort of people who play these sort of xylophone style i believe they're called metallophones is like the fancy word for them uh and they play these super intricate melodies where they are like like when they need to play fast runs they will like hand the beats, because obviously you need to hit it with a with a mallet, right? And you can only hit so fast. So they're like they they're so skilled. Like they mute the notes with one hand and they hammer with the other hand, and they're so smooth with it. And then when they get into passages where they play fast, they're like exchanging. Like one guy plays one note and then the next guy plays the next note, and they alternate and they stay perfectly in time, and they're muting at the same time. It's insane. Uh, and it sounds, it just sounds so cool. Uh, so the instrumentation is different, and they also have drums and flutes as well, and like big gongs and and, and, and cool stuff like that. Uh, and then 
Uh, so if you, that wasn't enough, that's different. And then, of course, the w- way they think of rhythm and is is also completely different. Song structure is completely different. Like the way they don't have a numbered counting system. They they have a steady pulse and they have like rhythmic cycles that you would kind of think are like beats and bars and like time signatures. But the way that the players are conceived, like you could technically write it down in a way that would be like beats and bars. But the way they're conceiving of it is completely different. Like different instruments in the ensemble represent different time scales in the piece. In the same way that like in, you know, we have the concept of like a beat and then beats happen within bars and bars happen within phrases. And, you know, and then there's uh, like sections like verses and choruses and so on. Like they have a similar thing, but they're represented by like instruments. So like there'll be one instrument that plays like all the time and then there's one instrument that just plays every bar and then one instrument that just plays like every measure or whatever like you know but they don't call it they don't they're not thinking about it in the same way like there's no separation between the the cyclic rhythmic rhythmic concept and that instrument itself and the sound of that instrument and the role of that instrument and it's all it's fucking fascinating to dive into like it's such a rich history and such a rich form of music that is just completely divorced from anything you're familiar with. It's it's honestly amazing. I cannot recommend enough listening to some gamelan. It will transport you to a different dimension. And there's also a, like dance is a integral part of the tradition as well. It's very cool. Shasa Indonesia, I believe is where it's from. Let me make sure I got that right. <laughs> that would be kind of cringe if I got that wrong. Javanese, Sudanese, and Balinese peoples of Indonesia. Okay, good. Good thing I got that right. That would have been pretty embarrassing. Uh, Yeah. I feel like I had something to talk about other than just that gamelan thing, but I don't remember what it was. Uh, no, don't remember, no memory. <sighs> I was about to go to bed. Uh, I wanted to talk about classical music. I would love to call myself a big fan of classical music. And I think I'm probably a bigger fan of classical music than, like, most people my age. But the problem with classical is that it's kind of its own thing. It's very hard to be into classical if you're not, like, exclusively into classical. Because every composer has, like, there's a billion composers that you need to know. And everything's really long. And everything's super complex. So in order to actually digest it, you need to listen to them multiple times. And there's, like, hundreds of years of history. You know, it's, it's like, there's just so much classical music. Uh that unless you are a classical musician yourself and you're, like, learning the pieces and involved with the culture or just really, really into it, it's hard to sort of be... I wouldn't count myself as, like, a classical music fan, although I am a fan of classical. Although, actually, specifically, I'm much more of a fan of Baroque music than I am of the actual classical period. Like, Baroque is, like, earlier. Um, And then I also like some of the more some of the later, like, more contemporary stuff, some of the more more dissonant stuff, you know, Stravinsky and and so on. And then I, I, I think there's really interesting, like, I find, uh, you know, the really out there shit, like Schoenberg or, um, I always, somehow this guy's fucking name always, always slips my mind. Uh, oh, whatever. 
the guy, crazy guy, crazy music guy, crazy classical, contemporary, dissonant guy. I'm going to have to look this up, hold on. Stockhausen is who I was thinking of. Stockhausen, I like Stockhausen, I like Schoenberg, I like a lot of the minimalist composers, although minimalism is not, like, crazy dissonant, you know, like, uh, like, like the, uh, the other shit, like, uh, I like John Cage, and, uh, well, that's kind of silly, but, uh, you, you know, I like various different, I like NC, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right, um, I've given a brief listen to Milton Babbitt, uh, who's fucking nuts as far, like, that, that guy's shit is fucking out there, man, that guy is on some shit, like, I'm telling you, go, go, go on YouTube and look up Milton Babbitt, like, this guy is, is on some fucking crazy next level brain shit, it's like giga brain I don't even understand. I, I, I cannot comprehend his music, although it's extremely interesting. Uh, in terms of serialism, like, he's like a serialism guy. Th- like, that stuff's super interesting to me. I, I like the idea of starting, like, I don't know, I, 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 like, I like serialism conceptually, although I've tried, it's, it's, and it's a fun challenge to try and make music within those rules. But I, it, it's the sort of thing that takes a lifetime of study to even start to sound interesting or good. And I am not there. And I'm not interested in doing that. But anyway, <laughs> that guy's... Fu- Milton Babbitt, that guy's shit is nuts. Stockhausen is absolutely fucking insane. This guy... If you don't know anything about Stockhausen, let me tell you two of his pieces. He has a, he has one piece which which is designed to be played by musicians who are flying around in helicopters. So the helicopter noise is like a part of the song, and they're flying around in helicopters playing the song in helicopters. Like he's fucking nuts. He has another song that is three different orchestras playing different fucking key signatures and tempos simultaneously all surrounding the audience, so the audience is in the middle, and there's an orchestra on three sides of them, each playing, like, interweaving with each other, playing in different keys and in different tempos, independent, it's fucking insane, the guy's a lunatic, he also was, like, super, in, super, um, influential in, like, early electronic music, and his, his electronic music is also fucking nuts yeah this shit is insane Th- that stuff's really weird and interesting to me uh although you know it's kind of hard to listen to <laughs> uh uh yeah i'm looking i don't know if i, I don't think i've I really know any of these. I'm I'm on the Wikipedia page for contemporary classical music, and those are the only names that I've actually listened to. Uh, I think. I believe. Postmodern music. What the hell is this? Huh. Yeah, okay. New Complexity, I've heard of that. I've heard of New Complexity. These people, I've never heard of any of the people who make it, but I've heard of the name New Complexity before. Strange. Anyway, that stuff's fucking, I like it. Oh, Pauline Oliveros, I know this, I know this person as well. I've listened to uh, something by them, something with violin, a long time ago. I I oh, maybe it didn't have violin. I don't remember. Maybe it was electronic. Yes, 
very vaguely, I've listened to something by her. Uh, anyway, these are the sorts of people, we're talking about nutty, nuts people who are making insane music here. And that's always cool. But there's also, we're talking about Bach. This is the thing, is that like, you go through music, and then like Bach is just, 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 he's just beat music. He just completed it. Like his shit is just crazy good. Like he's just crazy on so many levels. He's a crazy man that Johann Sebastian Bach. Yeah, I don't know. Shit's cool. Baroque music, cool. Classical music, it's interesting, but a lot of it feels kind of pompous. Not that that not that it's necessarily bad. You know, like you know the the ones you that you've all heard of, yeah, your Beethovens, your Mozarts, your Liszt's, yeah, all of these guys. Like, not that it's necessarily bad. It's just kind of Tchaikovsky. You know, it's just kind of over. It's just kind of. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's a little less. Uh, how do I put it? There's less of it that's like immediately tickles my musical interest part of my brain, you know? Like, there's not that much crazy harmony or rhythm stuff going on. There's not that much crazy, like, you know, Bach counterpoint genius shit going on. Not that it's bad. I still like it. But I don't normally go out of my way to search for it. But classic music's cool. It's a cool idea. Have a bunch of guys play an orchestra. That's a weird concept. I was in an orchestra once. Very briefly. Because I'm a fucking guitarist. I don't know why they put me in an orchestra. Because my stepmom used to play classical violin when she was younger. And she was in an orchestra. And so she sent me to an orchestra. But I'm a fucking guitarist, not a violinist. And I was also really... It was like a, a youth orchestra. Everyone sucked. It sucked. I don't even remember what piece we played. I just mimed my way through it because I couldn't read music. And the thing with an orchestra is... Orchestras only work when everyone's already a good musician. Right? You can't have a bunch of people who don't know how the fuck to play their instruments in an orchestra because you don't have time to help everyone you know there's too many people too many kids but the orchestra had like you would th- this is how the sessions went you would go and then you would do some like orchestra practice and then you would go do like individual shit like school it was on sunday so like all of sunday it would basically be an extra day of school but all music i'd go into and it was in a school i'd go into the school and i would like yeah you you go in you do some like orchestra shit for a while then you split off and then you have like individual instrument lessons so it was like an extra guitar lesson for me where there was like a guy there who was the guitar teacher and you know we have a one-on-one guitar lesson and he he was actually cool like he he would teach he taught me some stuff he he was like teaching me bar chords i hate and like i hated it but he also started to teach me how like the very basics of improvisation i remember which was fun i liked that although i sucked at it and to be honest i still suck at it uh I have not practiced it well enough because I have not practiced anything well enough. Uh, And then we also, the one that everyone hated was mandatory choir lessons. You, you had, everyone had to go to choir and everyone fucking hated choir. Now that I do remember what we played or what we sang in the choir. One of the songs we sang in the choir was the, the swing, swing classic in the mood. Uh, that song sucks, and we sucked at singing it, because we were all fucking children without any, it was, it sucked, choir sucked, the reason choir sucked is because it was an hour-long lesson, 
and you had to stand up the entire time, you were not allowed to sit down. That's why everyone hated it. And singing is kind of cringe, that's the other reason why people hated it, because they were like, I came here to play my instrument, not to fucking sing, and the least you could do is let me sit down. Uh, It was retarded, I don't know why they did it that way. The choir teacher was, like, fairly chill, but just not on, like, sitting down. (laughs) Like, you you know, it was weird. It was a weird setup. I don't know what that was about. And then you'd come back at the end of the day and do another orchestra practice altogether. Um, Yeah, it was retarded. I fucking played guitar. I don't know who thought it was a good idea to send me to an orchestra. Mm-hmm. They wrote parts for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah, I don't know. They, they wrote parts for... Uh, you want to know the dumbest shit? Speaking of guitar, <laughs> speaking of guitar, you will never fucking believe what I've done. You will never believe the level of idiocy I'm on. Speaking of guitar, I fucking left my acoustic guitar lying on the floor and I fucking stepped on it and snapped it in half. <laughs> I fucking snapped my guitar, it's broken. It's like the the the, the head fell off it snapped i've had that guitar for so long that that acoustic guitar i've had for like at least 10 years yeah and i i broke it i just fucking stepped on it and it just snapped yeah don't step on they're not made to be stepped on don't do that yeah i haven't bought a new one yet because i'm lazy and they're expensive But yeah, I, st- I stepped on my guitar. So now I have no working instruments because my bass is broken and I know how to fix it, but I also don't know how to fix it because I need to replace a part. I don't even know where to begin looking for like specific parts for specific models of basses. I just need to... Re- the The thing that's broken is that the, the gear for the tuning peg on the low E string is is like the teeth are broken on it like it's it's just it just needs replacing i just replaced the gear on that tuning pe- tuning peg the bass is perfectly fine uh but i just need to do that yeah <sighs> i don't know music is stupid i've just been making electronic shit anyway Music isn't stupid. Music, well, music is stupid, but it's fun. I've been, I've been making microtonal shit today, like giga experimental microtonal stuff that sounds really cool to me, but probably doesn't sound cool to anyone else. Uh, Patreon, Patreon dot com slash no thank you, if you want to hear that, and uh, early access songs. I posted Victoria Line on Patreon like three days before I posted on YouTube. There you go. That's the sort of thing you can find on the Patreon. Not to shill. Not to shill too hard. But there you go. I I tend to... I feel like people think I'm... Maybe people don't think that. I don't know. I've I've been kind of thinking... Like, I don't feel like I ever stopped making experimental music... But I feel like I've kind of stopped releasing experimental music. Like, all the more experimental shit I make, I'm kind of, some of it I'm just saving up to see if I'm going to do something with it in the future. And some of it I'm posting on Patreon, but I'm not really releasing it. Like, I I used to put more of that in albums and, and stuff like that. Uh, I don't know. It's a whole it's a whole weird situation we got going on here. It's a whole weird situation. I don't know what's going on. I've been like me and Dotes both have been like weird and sick and fucked up and like fucked up and sick today. Like I woke up and I was too sick to play TF2. I couldn't fucking focus on the game. Like, I, I don't know, man. I didn't even get to play... I played only one match of Upward. And I was too 
too sick to play the game properly, man. Sad. I don't know if I'm sick or what's going on. I must be, right? Because we both woke up and we both felt like shit. And I think we've been feeling a bit better as the day's gone on, but like crazy brain slow feeling. And so I've just been making this album, which I didn't mean to make an album. I just sort of accidentally made an album. (laughs) Or not made, but started to make this like electronic album with a lot of like microtonal and inharmonic, zen harmonic, whatever you want to call it sounds in it um inspired in part it's interesting it's actually a really weird coincidence so so this is what happened i was listening to gamelan have i gone over this i did oh yeah i talked about gamelan earlier in the podcast i listened to a bunch of gamelan music because gamelan is fucking sick uh and i stumbled across a video about the theory behind Gamelan. Uh, Actually, I should find it because it's a really good in-depth video. Uh, I also recommend reading the comments because there's someone in the comments who points out like some extra stuff that wasn't included in the video. Um, Let me see if I can find it. Uh, Yes, Tuning of Gamelan and Sensory Dissonance by the channel New Tonality. It was a really, really interesting, very in-depth video about Gamelan. Um, And then I saw, I was like, this guy is interesting. Let me check his channel. And I checked his channel and I saw he has a video called Can Octave Sound Dissonant? Which I was like, whoa. Like, there's got to be some gimmick here. There's no way an octave can sound dissonant. Octaves are the most consonant interval. So much so that we call octaves the same note. We have a con I believe it's called octave equivalence. Um, but it turns out that if you use inharmonic sounds, octaves can sound dissonance. And this blew this kind of blew my fucking mind watching this video. I, that's so cool. Then an octave can sound. I really recommend this guy's channel and listening to the, his very underrated. He only has 995 subscribers. Uh, I really recommend checking these videos out if you have an interest in weird music stuff. Uh, so, I, yeah, I listened to this video and I was like, whoa, this is crazy. Um, especially because I just sort of vaguely been thinking about inharmonic stuff anyway. So I listened to this and I go back to his channel and I see he has this video called Zen Tonal Synth in Your Browser, part one out of three. And I'm like, that sounds sick. So I give it, so I go to the link in the description and I open up this Zen Tonal Synth and I start messing around with it. And it has the ability to export sound. It's really powerful. It's a really cool thing. It's a little buggy. Uh, It's not, not, it crashes sometimes. Uh, and you can't like save presets as far as I can see. It's a little limited, but it does. It is also really powerful um, and very very cool. And it lets you save things as samples, so you can play them back in a door. And so I started messing around with this, and I started messing around with the samples of it, and I ended up making some sort of lo-fi electronic. This was yesterday. Some like pretty lo-fi but not lo-fi in the sense of like emulating uh you know tape or something like that a lo-fi as in like just using like very basic primitive sounds and not much sort of fidelity not much like high production value Uh, i made like this song like that and i started to work on a, a second one as well then complete coincidence I go to check my Discord server, uh, and someone in, someone added me in the music sharing channel with a link to an album by a man, or actually, it's not a man, sorry, by a a person by the name of uh, Lick Nand, which is a pretty funny name, Uh, an album called Forever Bastard Child of Your Angel Meat, which is hella a name I would come up with. 
uh, and it has a really cool cover. Um, and obviously the guy's, or the person, is called Lick Nand. It's confusing me because Nick Land is a guy, but this person is not a guy. So I'm getting mixed up. Apologies, Lick Nand, if you're listening. I highly doubt it. Um, and this album is more sort of techno side of things like my one was more punk side of things like electro punk kind of thing whereas this is more like techno hardcore inspired but it's weirdly similar to what i was making like lots of inharmonic sounds basic sort of lo-fi synths and it's fucking sick and i listened to this album and it was really cool and then yeah this just i listened to this and it just inspired me i was like damn now i want to like make more stuff in this vein so yeah i've just been making i i hope that it doesn't sound too much like forever bastard child of your angel meat i don't think it does i think it's different enough um But anyway, then I, I, I'm like, who is this Lick Nand person? Uh, I listened to some of their other stuff. It seems like Forever Bastard Child of Your Angel Me is their most popular album. But they have a link to a thing called cybergrunge.net. And, like, this is so my shit, it's insane. Like, cybergrunge.net just hosts a bunch of weird-ass music, and it links to, like, EFF and, uh, you know, Linux shit, uh, and, uh, this person has a bunch of free VST plugins they've made, which unfortunately I'm on a Mac, so I can't use VSTs, but, which is kind of stupid, like, it feels wrong to you, I, I, I could totally, this whole album, I made it in Logic, because that's what I'm used to, but nothing that I used to make this album couldn't have been done on a much more basic door like LMMS, which is kind of makes me a little... Uh, I feel like maybe I should have been doing it in LMMS instead, just for the, for the, for the, for the, the free software, you know, shit. Anyway, this person who runs cybergrunge.net seems really cool. And they just have a whole bunch of, like, uh, Ellie Void, that's their name. Uh, they they have a Neo Cities, and, yeah, just a, just seems like a really cool person. Um, anyway. Cool music. Anyway, I've just been making this insane album, and just a weird coincidence that I started making an album that was kind of like Lick Nand, and then came across. Shouts out to uh, Do Less from the Discord for linking me this album, uh, by the way. Yeah, just a really weird coincidence that I, I was making something similar and then stumbled across this thing, and then that inspired me. I probably would have just fucked around with it for a little bit. Anyway, yeah, I've just... It's not the same. Like, I just want to clarify. It, is, it isn't just a rip-off of this, pers- this person's sound, but it, it is in the same sort of vein. Uh, a little more focus on the microtonal shit I think uh, although I have I don't have that much powerful tools to make microtonal music like I've been using the the new tonality inharmonic web based synth thing and I've been using logics like tuning settings which are like powerful ish like they're more pow- they're powerful enough to do more than you would think but uh they you're still stuck within like you can't have more than 12 tones in an octave uh well you could you could have 13 maybe if you actually no i don't know how you would do that you only get to like you can change 
the pitch of each of the 12 notes in an octave, but you can't change anything beyond that. Like, you can't do, like, 17 tet or whatever, which is sad, because I really like the sound of... I would like to make an album in 17 tet, because that's my favourite uh, equal tempered tuning system that isn't 12 tet. But you can't do that with Logic's tuning thing. And there's, there's as far, like, the, the, a lot of the microtonal synths that are free, like the audio units that you can find, are not supported on modern Apple Silicon, which is really dumb. I hate Apple. I don't know why I'm using, uh, like, again, I could, I could have found that out and just been like, well, time to whip up LMMS, but I didn't for some reason. I was just like, because it's frustrating to use. The software fucking sucks. Like, Logic has its flaws, but it's also generally very usable. Much more usable than LMMS, or I don't know. Maybe I should try Reaper. Anyway, yeah, just for making this insane. And this album has a lot of... It has a lot of variation on insanity. Like, there are about two tracks that are really catchy songs, genuinely. And then there are some tracks that are, like, not catchy, but, like, could pass for weird hard techno kind of stuff. And then there are some songs that are just completely fucking insane, like, don't fit in any genre particularly just, just, uh, other than experimental electronic music. I, I, I don't know, I'm, uh, my brain's fucking all over the place. I've just been making music for, like, all day, and with no particular goal in mind other than the vague ideas of, like, try and make things that are inharmonic and microtonal. And I've been having fun, I've been having a lot of fun with it. Um... And, like, don't worry about the production sounding good. Yeah, I don't know, just a really weird coincidence. Because this person does fuck around with inharmonic stuff. Like, that's the, this, this Ellie Void person. Uh, the, they've made the, some of their own synths. I already pointed that out. Uh, and one of them is an inharmonic synth. Uh... Which is cool. Uh, did I have anything else to say? Uh, I don't know, making music is fun. Oh yeah, the other thing that inspired me is the album Pharmacy by Youth Serum, uh, which is, I suppose, how do I put it? It's the sort of thing that's kind of obvious, like someone had to do it, but I'm glad that Youth Serum did it, because they did it well. Youth Serum, I believe, is one of the members of KFC Murder Chicks, if KFC Murder Chicks is even multiple people, no one really knows. Uh, but it's 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 KFC Murder Chicks side project, and I really recommend the this album. Um, I, yeah, I've been messing around with this like MP3 compression as a cool effect thing for a while, uh, but. Yeah, and I've wanted to make an album that's kind of, that's the concept for a while. Uh, which I kind of did. A couple of times I kind of did it. But this Pharmacy album, I think, does it, goes harder than I did and does it really well and makes a really unique, interesting sound. Uh, highly recommend this album. If you like experimental, weird electronic music that has um, uh, mp3 compression and the the song Gl Glaucus on it 
I was listening to his album. I knew nothing about this, right? Literally, all I knew is I was like, I like KFC Murder Chicks. And hey, they put out a new album. So I listened to it and was kind of blown away. And then the second track, Glaucus, halfway through, or like, it has a it has a Wiley sample. And these, these guys aren't even from the UK. And they know about the OG Wiley shit. You know, not even like a modern Wiley song, but like an OG Wiley beat, it samples. Like, damn. You never hear this shit. No one, no one outside of the UK cares about early grime. And even UK people don't even care about early grime, really. Just me. Well, a lot of people, actually. But people seem to have forgotten about it. I don't know. Early grime, like, the first Wiley albums, the first, like... BBK shit and all this stuff. It's so good, man. That stuff is so good. Like, a boy in the corner. Like, man, listen to Boy in the Corner, okay? You think, like, that's just like. Are you listening to I Love You? Okay, here's the, here's the thing, right? You know Death Grips? You remember Death Grips, right? The Guillotine? Like, that song came out. It's crazy, right? Oh, it's so crazy. I Love You by Dizzy Rascal was got fucking radio play. Go listen to that song. Like, the, the, <laughs> it's, it's insane. Anyway. Love Grime. Love KFC Murder Chicks. Uh, although, I don't want to say it like... It's not like what happened was. Like, I want to say... Like, I, I don't know how to clarify that... I'm trying to point you in the direction of artists I think are cool and uh, stuff I'm drawing from, but not trying to say, hey, I plagiarized this, <laughs> you know? Not that plagiarism is even real, but uh, I'm saying that, like, I stand on the shoulders of giants, I guess. I don't know what the fuck I'm trying to say. I'm just trying to point out cool music that I, that you should listen to, really. Uh, like, the album itself that I'm making, which just doesn't quite have a title yet, tentative title, uh, Selected dis Discordant Works. <laughs> selective, no thank you, Selected Discordant Works. This is the dumb title, right? It's not, not the final title. Uh, I kind of want to call it disease world because I'm like sick and the album kind of sounds like a disease uh, but the, that sounds too close to Sick Town which is an album I already made I already made Sick Town disease world sounds like a kind of play on Sick Town but Sick Town I also made while I was sick so I don't know maybe disease world is kind of a cool name I have the the cover I made a cover for the, for the album, and I think the the cover looks pretty cool. Uh, you'll probably, maybe the album will be out by the time you hear this podcast. I don't know. I don't know how I'm gonna market this podcast, because I I I I did X hours of. I mean, the the idea originally was just to title this video X more hours of podcast to relax slash study to. Um, so maybe I just, maybe I just do that. Uh, but, but I don't know. It seems like there's some level of Mr. Beast pushback has finally happened. I've been waiting for this. I mean, there's always been pushback by people who aren't like 12 and don't find his videos entertaining. Like, like me as one of those people, <laughs> his videos are not very good. Um... Some of them are fine. I, I watched a couple of Mr. Bit. I, I like his React channel. It's 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 good. Like, not good. It's, it's nowhere near good. It's like a 4 out of 10. His main channel, uh, whatever. I'm not, gonna, I'm not here to fucking rate Mr. Beast videos. The point being, it seems like people are trying to push back at him or something. There's some controversy. I don't know much about it. I'm just curious a little bit. And I think, I just don't think people, these like chronically online people have the context to understand what emotion they're feeling. Um, 
you know, Mr. Beast, oh, he make a video, he, oh, we, we cured 10,000 blind people or whatever the fuck he did. It's like weird, the video is edited really, really badly. I, I couldn't finish it. It was so bad. It's, it's awful. It's an awful video as a piece of entertainment, but hey, it's nice that he did that, I guess. Uh, whatever. The, the point being, you know, I think he's cringe as fuck as a human being. He sleeps under a poster. He sleeps under two posters, one of Elon Musk and one of Steve Jobs. Like, the dude is giga cringe. Uh, anyway. The, f the thing that's happening here is the Bono effect. You know Bono, the singer from U2? Everyone hates Bono, even though he's, like, objectively a good person. He just, he's, like, does loads and loads and loads of charity work and, like, gives away a shit ton of his money. But everyone hates him because he's really conspicuous about the charity work he does and he's also still really rich. And the reason everyone hates him... I don't know. It has no reason. It's just annoying. Just don't do that. It's too much. You're doing too much. Chill. This beats the same way. It's like you're too rich and you're doing too much and it's too conspicuous. Like there, there's nothing I can point to that's wrong with it. But it's just don't do that. It's just wrong. Be rich and be evil. Okay? Don't be rich and try and be like a goody guy or whatever. Okay? But like you, you know... It, there's no reason behind it. There's no reasoning. There's no lefty reason. Anyone who tries to make a lefty reason is a fucking brain-dead, sub-zero IQ idiot. There's no lefty reason. There's no reason. It's just, it's just bad. It's just bad because it's weird. That's the only reason. You know what's fucked up? You know what's fucked up? You remember back in the day? It was like, don't fuck with 4chan, man. Don't fuck with 8chan. Don't fuck with those guys, man. They got hackers. They got trolls for days. Don't fuck with those guys, man. They'll order a hundred pizzas to your house. They'll swat you. They'll raid you. Whatever, right? When was the last time 4chan did anything? It's been... I, I, I can tell you where it was. Is he will not divide us, right? Like, that's the last time 4chan did anything interesting. Was he will not divide us. I'm trying to think. Like, there's nothing else that comes to mind. There's no, like, oh, don't piss off those guys. You know who's the, you know who's more scarier than fucking 4chan people now? K-pop. K-pop people. People are more scared to insult K-pop people than they are f fucking 4 channels. Isn't that insane? Isn't that fucking insane? And to be fair, to be fair, it's not like I ever participated, you know? Maybe, maybe all the old fags who were doing that sort of thing have just moved on with their lives. And, or like, they're just like me and they're just lurkers. Not like I ever hate raid, joined in on a hate raid or did any any of this shit, you know. Kept kept to myself, just enjoyed the lols from afar. Most people probably were like this, I should. What happened, man? I know a couple of things that happened. The first thing is, uh, well, there's a few things that happened. I think, I think. Websites got significantly, uh, like the internet in general is far more moderated now, and the moderation is much better enforced. It seems, uh, like people generally have, you know, even if there's not some moderator from the big above, like people themselves generally have options to moderate who they interact with online. I think. Right? Like, that's got to be a thing. Just that the internet became, like, site design 
became aware of this sort of thing and made it harder. But not really, because people still do it all the time. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what happened. I don't understand. Botan just became pussies. I don't even... It's so weird. The the journey of, like, being on 4chan for years. And then... Oh, 8chan, man. Like, that's where all the people are, really. Right? And you go there, and then that, that disappears after a while. And that's, like, dead dead right now. Remember correctly? I forget. I... I f- and then I just sort of stopped using image boards for a while. Because I was, I was like, got Lane Chan and then Sushi and more obscure ones. And stopped using them, but the bigger ones. And then years later, people are like, oh, 4chan's good again now. I don't know if 4chan ever stopped being good. I don't know what happened. I don't remember. What a strange website a series of websites what a strange series of occurrences <laughs> I recorded a segment actually I don't even need to tell you that I don't know what I'm going to do with this I've decided I'm not going to post this on backwards channel I'm going to post this on IDMR because this is not particularly good content and apparently I have standards now. I'm going to post this on IDMR, and then in whatever next main channel video I make, I'm going to link to IDMR. Uh, yeah. Just to randomly get personal here. Um, comparing my mom to my stepmom. Uh, like, I think it's an interesting case in, you know, when I count someone's weird, harmful behavior as, like, how much blame can you put on someone? Because both my mom and my stepmom had weird, fucked up, traumatic childhoods. Uh, I won't get into too much detail, but they both had separately, like, in different ways, they both had weird, fucked up, traumatic childhoods. Um, my mom just sort of never grew out of it. So the way I see it, it was hard to, you know, my mom did some fucked up shit, but it felt like she was completely dragged around by her own emotions and mood swings. Um, and not particularly aware of the consequences of her actions. Not really capable of empathizing with other people in that sort of way. Um, and uh, yeah, just not particularly self-aware of like like what is like you know the sort of post hoc justification of like I'm mad or like I'm upset therefore like someone must have wronged me without the ability to like think self-critically and examine why you feel these emotions and sort of take a step back and be like okay I just like I need I'm I'm like feeling upset because this isn't this, this but I so I'm going to, like, take a moment to calm down and go do something else or something like this. It is something I do all the time. Um, is like, you, you may not be able to control your emotions, but you can be aware of them and make others aware of them and, like, know, you know, like, if I didn't get enough sleep and I'm all touchy and, and irritable, right, and I notice myself getting mad about something, it's hard to not be mad but it's pretty easy to say, hey, just warning you, like, I didn't get enough sleep, I'm feeling really irritable, so sorry if I am, like, a dick. 
because people understand that that's a normal thing to happen to someone and then secondly to like think to yourself okay well i'm just not go i'm going to try and avoid situations that would sort of trigger me right like i'm going to avoid if i'm if i'm you know in a situation like that if i like didn't get enough sleep or some other thing right something to get my mood fucked up something to get my mood on edge okay well i'm just going to distance myself from shit that could fuck me up i'm not going to you know get in arguments with people or or do anything i'm going to i'm going to keep to myself i'm going to wait till it passes right that's one thing you can do my mom never figured out that you could do that um she didn't have the self awareness to think think like that she didn't have she didn't have the capacity to have that sort of type of thinking she would just be dragged around by her moods completely um she didn't have yeah she, she sort of i i don't want to call her stupid because she was like smart in other fields but she was not emotionally intelligent she was good at like arithmetic and you know she was a really like high level pediatric nurse like you know she knew her shit in her field of expertise and she was a great cook and smart in lots of other ways but she had zero she had the emotional intelligence of a 13 year old right whereas my stepmom um so you know even though my mom did fucked up shit to me she was like traumatized as a child and then re-traumatized multiple times as an adult uh, and it's like she was just fucking lost and th- and then she eventually like started to figure herself out and then she just died which is <laughs> pretty fucked up like the last couple years before she died she was like chilling out she was calming down you know she was sort of settling in for life and she just fucking died isn't that fucked up <laughs> It's crazy. Anyway. Um, my stepmom, on the other hand, this is not the case. Like, whereas my mom was sort of just a slave to her own mood and didn't have the capacity for self-reflection in that sort of way, my stepmom was very emotionally intelligent and just didn't give a shit. She just made terrible choices <laughs> that fucked with me on purpose, knowing full well what would happen and just choosing to do it anyway. That's the difference. This is why, like, you know, maybe my mom... I mean, it's I'm not going to weigh up who fucked me up more, but it's like, on one... I can almost feel like I, I like, forgive my mom, right? She was, you know, trying. Not super hard, and not succeeding very well, but like she she didn't really have the capacity to try as that hard, and she was trying. My stepmom, on the other hand, didn't need to try, but still didn't even attempt to. She just was like knowingly fucked up, for as far as I can tell, no real reason. Um, it's uh, very confusing to me. You know she was very, or she is, sorry, very self-aware and able to think, think critically, um, understand psychology, um, you know, deals with people very well, like sociable and so on, uh, knowledgeable, smart, knows how children work, like, work, worked with, I mean, both worked with children, but, you know, so on. Yeah, so, like, if my mom says to me, let's take two examples, right? Actually, a perfect example, because they both said this to me on separate occasions. My mom said to me that I'm a disappointment, it's like, I just know that she's just mad. Like, she's just mad at me because we've been in a fight. And she's just saying this, right? And then, like, an hour later, she's going to come crying to me and apologize and whatever. Right? Because she's just nuts. It's just a mood swing. Right? It is what it is. It hurts. It still hurts. 
But like, you know, it is what it is. When my stepmom said I was a disappointment, I knew she, I, I don't know if she meant it. I just knew that she knew that she was hurting me when she said it. Like she, she said that with not on impulse, but premeditated. Like she, she knows what happens. Like she, you know, you don't say that to someone if you're not trying to fuck with them. So that's that's why I have more resentment for my stepmom. Even though, on paper, I mean, you know, again, I'm not here to compare which mom fucked me up more. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's the difference. Is I find it much easier to blame my stepmom than I do my mom. Okay, random deep shit. I'm a little worried that people won't get my new album. I'm worried that people won't get it. I know, like, maybe that's something that I shouldn't be worried about, since it is experimental music, and that's kind of the point. But I'm, like, there's multiple ways to not get it. If you think, like, why does it sound out of tune? Why are the chords so dissonant? Uh, like then that's like I don't, like I don't understand it doesn't sound good why is the synths weird like that's fine if you don't get it in that way that's totally understandable but I'm worried that people will listen to it and not realize that that stuff is all that like I'm worried that they'll listen to it and they'll hear the sort of amateurish production of it the the sort of po- like the 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 minimalist mixing let's say <laughs> the way that it it doesn't it sounds uh rather than overproduced it's it's intentionally underproduced i'm worried that they're going to hear that the basic synth sounds and so on and they're going to hear that and they're going to think like oh this person doesn't know what the fuck they're doing like this is just like ba- this is like their first time trying to make electronic music and they don't know they don't know what they're doing which is not true like, should I put in the description, uh, like, I think I, I, I'll I put something in the descri- in the dis- album description, like, about, like, how mainstream, like, it does, it's supposed to sound like this, <laughs> you know, or like some sort of, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll do a, like, holier than thou thing, where I, I'm like, fuck, fuck sounding over, fuck that overproduced garbage type, type shit, like, just, just, you know what I'm saying? Maybe I put, maybe I make a thing that says, like, anti-overproduced garbage in the description. I think that's fun, actually. That's probably a good solution. Some people will read that, maybe. Not that I actually believe that. Like, I don't mind the sound of I don't like it particular. I don't. I think both are good. Like that. I don't have any particular. I. I mean. I do think that act like really overproduced music sounds bad, but I don't think like just complicated like serum patches or whatever are necessarily bad. I just didn't want that sound for this particular album for. Autistic reasons. I mean, artistic reasons. Haha. <laughs> yes, those words sound similar. Software is going to die. I I I've been thinking about this. Okay, that was actually a retarded. That's not even what I meant to say at all. Proprietary software is going to die. Web two is going to die. I ju- I am now just genuinely believe this. I'm I'm no longer a skeptic. I'm no longer like oh. We're just a niche, like, Linux users who use, like, blogs and whatever. I legitimately think that uh, peer-to-peer internet stuff and free software federated stuff is just going to dethrone its competitors. It's just going to happen, like, 10 years from now. And here's why. Because stuff just gets worse. Your stuff is literally worse than it was five years ago. Your your people don't buy the new iPhone because it's uh, lasts for ten years, 
right? It, it's worse. It lasts for less time. <laughs> you know, modern laptops last for less time than ThinkPads and so on. Uh, <clears throat> and the same thing applies to software. You end up, every single piece of the, in, like, the major, infra- major internet infrastructure or the sort of hub hubs of the internet are cl- like so very clearly worse than they were in the past. The big obvious one is Twitter, which is just completely breaking these days. I, I have not, I've quit Twitter. Uh, I, I, I just stopped using it. Uh, not actually because I have any problem, well, at the time, not because I had any problems with how Elon was running the site. It did happen to coincide with roughly the time when Elon was starting to make big changes. But I actually quit Twitter just for my own sake, just because uh, I I was a little worried that I was spending too much time on it. Uh, and I also just sort of got interested in other stuff. Uh, like, I didn't really have... Like, in the first place, I felt like I was wasting time on Twitter. But then also... I had other stuff that I wanted to do more than browse Twitter. And then, you know, like a month later, after I hadn't been using Twitter, I went back and I was like going through my feed and I was like, all of these people, like these are these are just not interesting people that I felt like, like all of these people are so like self-serious and self-important and like they think that they're like geniuses, but they're just retards. Like what sort of thing is going on on this website? Like this is a dog shit website. This is worse than like B. This is, this is, this is ass. Like, why does anyone, like, I can't believe I went here for so long and I was actually interested in the stuff these people had to say. Like, this, these people are stupid. Um, so, so <laughs> I scrolled for about five minutes, came to that realization, and have not used Twitter since. Now, I have no desire to use Mastodon either. I've already gone over why I think the Fediverse and Mastodon, Mastodon sucks uh, in, a, in a blog post, uh, which you can read on my website. Uh, however, uh, you know, Mastodon aside, there are lots of other alternatives uh, in terms of peer-to-peer stuff. So, so the big problem, right, is that uh, YouTube, Twitter, all all of these websites are worse than they used to be, uh, and they're worse than free alternatives. I don't know. I mean, I, I, you could say some a Discord. Discord is a great example of this actually, because Discord is currently not worse, but it, everyone knows. If you don't know this, by the way, you probably just haven't thought about it, but it becomes very obvious for the second you consider it. Discord is not profitable. What is Discord's business model? A couple of users buy Nitro. Discord is barely monetized, right? How many people do you know that they use the free version of Discord versus Nitro? They have a game store built into it that no one uses. Like, that was a complete flop. No one uses any paid discord features very very few people offering like unlimited free storage and free communications and voice chats you know discord hosts like i think it's something like three million concurrent voice chats at any one time something like this like can you imagine the amount of server bandwidth that takes up discord is bleeding money they're they're just propped up by investor money there is no universe where they are making enough money from nitro to fund all of this like, it's incredible, like, they're just not. And Discord is, so there's only one option, which is in the coming years, you know, this is how these tech, this is like the model that these tech companies use, right? They run off of investor money for as long as they can, and then eventually the investors start to, you know, start asking for some returns. And so now that they've outbeat all the competitors and you don't have any other options, um, then they start aggressively monetizing their service and it goes to shit. Uh, so that's what we're going to see with Discord in the future. They're going to be advertising to you more. Uh, they're going to be advertising to you more. They're going to be making more and more uh, parts of the service paid. Uh, it, it's just going to become unusably bad. Uh, because it's become sort of the default communication platform, uh, They that, that's their point, right? Their, their point is, uh, it just happens to everyone. Discord is going, it, right now, Look, I'm, I admit it, right? right now, Discord is, apart from encryption, better than Matrix. It's better. It has more features. It does voice calls better. It, it's just, it, you know, there's, there's many different ways in which Discord is better than Element. Uh, however, this will just stop being the case because, or Matrix, I should say. Matrix will continue to be developed 
and Discord will have, be forced to aggressively monetize its platform. You can see, so this is one example where uh, right now, you know, for a long time, everyone on Mastodon was a weird tech nerd who was just like uh, an internet vegan, you know, <laughs> like, oh, don't use Twitter, it's privacy and stuff. And now, you know, those are the vanguard of users guiding all of the Twitter refugees. Okay. And so if you use Matrix, you are going to be the vanguard of Matrix users guiding the Discord refugees in a few years time. Um, and this is just going to continue happening. Right? There's a there's a sort of a infamous fact that Zoomers don't know how to torrent. But the fact is that Netflix is also bleeding money. And people must be watching stuff somehow. Right? So I, I don't know. I think piracy is probably fairly big. Um, and even if it isn't, people can always learn. People can always learn. Uh, so, the, yeah, Discord, that's one example. Another example, and this one's a little harder. With There's not really a solid uh, false alternative. Um, but maybe the entire platform just shouldn't exist, which is live streaming. Right now, there are only really two players in the live streaming space. It's Twitch and YouTube. Twitch has the vast, vastly bigger market share. Uh, and Twitch is killing itself for the same reasons that all of these applications kill themselves, which is users have come to expect free content because they, the, because the platforms themselves, in order to break into the industry, uh, offer everything for free. And then it turns out, hold on a minute, <laughs> so that's not a sustainable business model. And they start to monetize more and more aggressively. They're forced to. Twitch has, you know been on a tirade of shoving ads everywhere and anywhere they can, and they're just going to keep doing it. And they're more and more things are going to become paid. You know, they've already limited. They're going to, like, one reason YouTube has an advantage over, over Twitch is um, uh, right now there's places where you, you, you Twitch's bandwidth is just low. Like, they, they don't stream in as high quality, which to me doesn't matter. Uh, but some people does. Uh, so, for example, in Korea, I believe, in Korea, you can't stream over 720p. You just physically can't, I believe. Uh, it's something like that. that I, it might be a little higher than that. I, I don't remember. Uh, whereas YouTube supports, like, 4K streams. But YouTube is, at least on the books, not profitable, or only slightly profitable. Now, that's probably for tax purposes. YouTube might be way more profitable. But, um, you know, it doesn't... YouTube is, just like Twitch is part of Amazon, YouTube, obviously, part of Google. Now, Amazon doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Uh, they're not... You know, they, they expand a little too hard. The, the Amazon kind of... Uh, they did the, the pandemic thing that every company did, where they expanded a little too hard in the pandemic and are now, like, bouncing back to where they should have been. Um, but they also have been expanding too hard just in general, you know, but at the end of the day, Amazon has an infinite money printing machine, which is actually amazon.com being like the shopping thing. And unlike, you know, I will, I, I've said this before, I'm kind of an, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of a, a soft defense for Amazon because other than dark patterns, amazon.com is the best online shop. Like it's, it just works. Uh, uh, however, you know they've overextended. They've they've expanded into way too many. They've they've expanded into way too many markets, which is smart. Like they're trying to diversify, but uh, the problem is that none of those other projects, or very, only some of those projects, have actually been profitable, uh, and a lot of them have not been profitable. Twitch included, and so Twitch is probably going to die maybe in five years time, and everyone will be streaming on YouTube. Now YouTube is currently propped up by Google. But Google is right now terrified because their business model, their in, their infinite money printing machine, right, a Amazon has their internet money printing, uh, infinite money printing machine. Google's infinite money printing machine is currently under attack from ChatGPT. They're terrified of ChatGPT taking away their infinite money printing machine. And if they do, well, YouTube is very expensive to host. It's very useful to have. 
it's like if one company owned all of TV, you know, it's a pretty pretty big deal that they own YouTube, and I don't think they would kill it, but they definitely make it worse. I mean, they've been making it worse for years and years and years, and uh, I think uh, I've been terrified for years that YouTube is going to do the obvious thing that would just make the site so fucking awful to use, which is to remove the subscriptions, to remove the, the, the subscription page. I, I, I know a lot of people, they go on YouTube, they just use the home page to watch stuff. I don't know how people do that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a hardcore youtube.com slash feed slash subscriptions person. I do not use the home page. If YouTube ever removes subs, I don't know what I'll do, but I'm just going to pray that someone makes like a browser add-on <laughs> to make it work. Uh, or just use RSS, I guess. <laughs> Whatever. Um, so YouTube, you know, that might be okay for, for now. It might not be. I don't know. I can't speak on that. But Twitch and Discord are definitely going to go down the shitter, especially Discord. Discord is absolutely fucked. Twitch is also absolutely fucked. More and more of these companies are just going to be going down the drain. Facebook is also bleeding money. They've been bleeding money forever. I mean, they're not bleeding money. They're fucking... They're losing, like, half their value because Mark Zuckerberg keeps pushing meta. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, which is almost smart. Because they know... Actually, Facebook is a good example because they're, like, five years ahead of the rest of these companies in terms of, like, the life cycle. Where, like... Twitch is only just starting to die. Um, you know, Discord is going to die in like five years and so on. Whereas Facebook has been starting to die like five years ago. And so... I mean, in most places it has been like dying for like 10 years. Okay, 10 years, yeah. right? So they know that Facebook isn't coming back, the website. And so they need to expand into a different market to make money. And they've just gone all in on VR, which is kind of dumb. But also, I can see how, at the time, <laughs> they thought it was a good idea. And maybe it will turn out to have been a good idea. Maybe we'll all laugh, and then one day, VR will be everywhere. Uh, but who cares about any of that? Because the point being, when, t when Discord dies, we will be there to say, have you ever heard of Matrix? When... When Twitch dies, when YouTube dies, we'll be there. Have you ever heard of PeerTube? You know, and so on. Windows keeps fucking up their offering system. And, you know, I don't think there's going to be a mass migration to Linux anytime soon. But uh, it's getting there. I mean, th there's only two problems with Linux right now. It used to be m massive Linux problem, gaming. Gaming sucks. But that's how, that's solved. I haven't come across a game I couldn't run in Linux I mean, I mean, if you use Steam, everything runs. If you use Steam, almost everything runs. Yeah. And at, at the very most, you have to do a little bit of troubleshooting. And, of course, the more people actually switch to Linux, the more developers will develop for native Linux. Um, but, yeah, Proton is a fucking godsend. Uh, and Wine, it just default Wine is also really good at this point. It's pretty good. It's like Wine Tricks and shit. Yeah, really so I said default, but I mean, like, yeah... A, a, a heavily wine tricksified and troubleshooted <laughs> wine is pretty good. Uh, so, you know, year of the Linux desktop, <laughs> it's happening. But, no, but Linux's market share has been going up consistently. It, like, doubled. It's, it's like, more than doubled, I think, over the past, like, two years. I mean, like, the number of times I've seen people have miscellaneous Windows issue and I've wanted to be, like, just use Linux. Yeah, right? Like, oh... My system forcefully rebooted the update. Though my fucking entire thing fucking destroyed itself because of an update. Like, mm -hmm. just use Linux. Yeah, there's only two things which I think really stand in the way of, like, full Linux desktop being the best thing ever. Which is, they're kind of niche. Video editing, which is less niche. Uh, Caden Live is really good for, like, basic stuff. Caden Live is good for basic stuff. But more importantly, I've just found out today about a, a software called Olive, which is still in alpha. But it looks like a much better open source video editor that's in like two years once the development's like sorted. I mean, yeah, I could have a tab open of a Bodie Robinson video, Robert Robertson video about it right now. 
Also, randomly developed by Matt KC, who's one of my favorite YouTubers. Uh, but yeah, Olive looks to be a killer app on Linux video editing, um, which is probably going to be like on the level of Premiere, I think. I mean, Kdenlight is really good for most people. I, I just, Kdenlight has got a very clunky workflow, in my opinion. It's it's a little, I don't know, it's it's good enough. You can probably get away with Kdenlight. You can do, like, the one thing that Kdenlight like, sucks for you is motion graphics. If you're not doing motion graphics, like Kaden Live is pretty much like K- Kaden, do Kaden Live is like iMovie, right? Like you can yeah. do basic stuff with it, and you can, in theory, do more complicated stuff. Yeah. It's just a massive fucking pain. Yeah, but the only thing that's like actually a massive pain is motion graphics. I mean, lots of things are a pain. Like I've what? struggled to make videos with like, uh, well, generally things are just. I, so here's the things I've struggled with with Kaden Live: the like overall editing workflow. Like, the the way things are sorted in Windows, the way the timeline works when you, like, cut clips and edit clips and so on, uh, like, looking for the correct effects and the quality of those effects, I found, is just generally substandard compared to Final Cut, like, pretty significantly I mean, yeah, below. If you're, if you're looking at, like, fucking, like, professionals of the reality, it's not even close. Yeah, whereas Olive is built on, like, a much more flexible system that can be, like, extended to sort of be like blender for video editing like people can build much more complicated and advanced plugins uh so uh, olive's still an alpha and crashes a lot and you probably shouldn't use it yet but in the next coming years i'm excited about olive the other thing which is more niche that linux sucks at it's niche but it really affects me is music production there are no good doors on linux I mean, just the entire sound system. Yeah, Linux sound is fucked. Pipewire was supposed to fix it. Fuck Pulse Audio. Fuck Pulse Audio. Fuck fuck Alsa. Fuck Pipewire. It's a complete mess. And that, I think, may just be where Apple reigns supreme. Uh, You know, Ableton and Logic on Macs might just continue to be the standard. I don't see Apple dying anytime soon. Like, Apple is by far the most profitable company in the world. And unlike all the other tech companies, don't show any signs of slowing down post-pandemic. Um, so, you know, maybe Apple will stick around. Uh, I think, you know, you can do stuff. I was actually making uh, some music in LMMS earlier today, like an acid techno track. And, you know, you can do basic, like if you want to make 90s techno, you can do that. But you can also make 90s techno on like a phone. Like, it's very, very basic stuff. You could not make, like, hyperpop <laughs> in LMS. I've heard people talk about Reaper being good. I actually haven't tried Reaper. I, wait, is Reaper the correct one? I don't remember. There's there's some other, uh, but I think it's 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 it runs on Linux, but I think it's closed source, the one that people suggest. Um, so, the, yeah, Linux audio stuff is fucked. Um, but... Uh, yeah, and video is is coming along nicely, I think. Uh, com- and yeah, I, I just think that all of this free software stuff is eventually what's going to happen is these companies are just going to kill themselves. These companies are going to die and people are going to be like, well, I don't want to experience that again. We're, we're fucking over it. We've gone through like three generations of tech companies dying and everyone becoming refugees from their software platforms. And people are going to be want people are going to think like, I don't want a platform. I want a protocol. And we're going to be there with our protocols. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is I read a, an interesting blog post uh, by... Ah, fuck. I actually... I need to look this guy up. Um, uh, fuck. I, I don't remember the guy. Uh, the, one of the many people I follow on RSS. I've forgotten, I've forgotten the guy. Uh, but he wrote a blog post about something he called Web Plus. Um, which is like, uh, as he sort of laid it out, a transit, uh, uh, an idea of like having peer to peer web stuff or like peer, peer internet stuff. He just calls it like peer web, I think, um, like overlaid on top of standard websites just to extend their features. So as an example, his blog, if you run it in the beaker browser, like, the blog works 
on normal, uh, you know, web, HTTP. But if you run it uh, on the Beaker browser, it has like live updates. So like if he updates the website without refreshing the page, you just see the update in real time, uh, which is a pretty minor feature. But that's the sort of thing that you can do with like peer peer web stuff that you can't like it's a little more, I mean, you can do that with JavaScript, but, uh, you know, these sorts of features just being implemented seamlessly, I think, are, are cool. Uh, and he, he laid out a bunch of other examples, I've forgotten them. <laughs> um, but but that sort of thing, I think, is going to gonna become more prevalent. Uh, I actually haven't experimented with DAT protocol at all. Uh, I'm actually interested in it. But I've seen, you know, people use this sort of thing all the fucking time. I mean, OSS should be more prevalent than it is. It's like one of the best things ever created. It's one of the best pieces of software ever created. Um, email is obviously super common. Uh, I always, I just talk about the same things over and over again. But Torrent, also very popular. Hopefully, it just continues to be popular. Um, Matrix. Um, but there's there's also yeah I mean all of these like hypercore which I actually think is a little lame but whatever S S secure scuttlebutt which actually sucks um, and, and I hope I hope no one uses it because <laughs> it's absolute dog shit um, you know there's a whole bunch of there's a whole bunch of interesting things going on in this realm and there's a whole bunch of very smart people going g doing this stuff. And uh, I'm not one of those very smart people. I just like to look at the stuff that they make. Uh, but yeah, I'm gonna make more of an effort. I think, I think we're gonna be doing stuff. We're gonna be we're gonna be doing interesting stuff in the coming, in the future. Uh, I I think I think the future is honestly looking bright for. You know, this this sort of side of things. I, d I don't know, I don't think it's ever going to replace proprietary dog shit, I don't think that, you know, I don't, I don't know, I'm not going to be super optimistic about that, but I do think that these, like, that the, the, whatever the incentive mechanisms are under capitalism, or under whatever system we even live under anymore, <laughs> who, who fucking knows, under, like, techno-feudalism, um, they just make shit worse, and eventually... People are going, like, it's just slowly going to dawn on everyone that superior alternatives are available for free and that they have no real reason not to, not to be using them. The only thing stopping, like, these softwares from taking off are uh, the weird paradox where it's like, you know, you ha the reason I use this is just because all my friends use it type of thing, and it's like, Oh, I'm not going to switch to this other thing because not because it's worse, but because my friends aren't on there. Um, that's just something that happens over time, I guess, and gets fixed. But the the point I actually try to make is that uh, that this whole thing about tech companies killing themselves to make money, like Discord is going to, um, is is the big thing that pushes people to move to a better version. Like, that's, that, you know, right now it's kind of annoying to convince people to move to Matrix, um, which thankfully bridges exist, which is uh, a nice feature. Uh, but yeah, right now it's kind of annoying to convince people to move to Matrix, but when Discord, when Discord is full of ads and shit, it'll be much easier. It'll be, m when Discord is making you pay to, like, do voice calls or whatever weird, whatever fucked up monetization strategy they go with, it suddenly becomes much easier because people will be out here like, I want to stop using Discord, what's an alternative? Instead of internet vegans like me, you know, software vegans saying, um, you should really not use vegan Discord, it does not respect your, uh, the user's freedom. You know, you know, uh, the, 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 it's the, 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 the tables are going to be flipped. The tables are going to be turned. Uh, I was going to say something else. I forgot what it was. Oh, well. I think, yeah, I, so while I'm not super optimistic about the entire tech industry dying, sadly, I do think that we're going to have a few dubs in the future. 
I think Discord is an obvious dub that is going to happen, and I think uh, if someone can figure out uh, how to make Twitch happen, <laughs> a Twitch a, a usable Twitch alternative, uh, that that could be a pretty pretty big dub. Although I like a peer to peer Twitch alternative. The thing is, like th- that would be the best option, right? Is because live streaming is 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 an insane thing to even be able to do. And it's ridiculously expensive. And so the only people that can afford it are, like, t- Amazon, YouTube, and, like, Kick. You know where? You have Kick. Kick.com. It's a, it's a Twitch clone funded by a gambling company for gambling. Well, primarily so that they can run gambling streams. Um, but you can really stream anything on there. Uh Right, so right, right, because these are like, that's the limitation of centralized client-server architecture. Uh, and so peer-to-peer architecture circumvents that entire problem because your hosting service is everyone's computer. Uh, so I don't know how it would work. I- I'm sure it's possible. Uh, I just don't know if it'd be very good. I feel like it might like buffer a lot and, and be very slow and low quality. Uh, but we'll have to see. You know what would be neat is, uh, you could stream shit lower quality video and just have, uh, some sort of AI upscaler on the end user's computer that, uh, you know, up the video to be more watchable. I, I think that would be interesting because that sort of software is getting better, it's better and better. Um, not that I want to be one of those, like, AI, just, just put AI on it, you know, this is just how, like, the industry is, right, where it's just, like, whatever's the current thing, just put that on the software. Um, I don't think that's the case at all, but I do think AI image upscaling is really fucking good, and video upscaling is getting there. Game upscaling is also really good. Shouts out to Clicks Philip. Um... I know. I'm I'm fine watching 480p live streams. I don't know why everyone else isn't. Everyone molds when they see like a, a a fucking compression artifact in their video. I don't understand. Like I'm so okay with compression artifacts. I don't understand. Anyway, like that seems like a that, I'm not saying it's going to happen. That seems like a kind of a pipe dream, but also it is theoretically possible. I, I, it's more likely that YouTube just takes over the game, um, but it is theoretically possible. <sighs> YouTube is the big, YouTube is the big whale, okay? YouTube is the, the final, the final thing to kill. I don't think, like, big YouTube alternative is, is gonna happen, really, anytime soon, because video hosting is expensive, and it's such a popular service, it's hard to, yeah, you know, YouTube is like the final boss of killing big tech, but something like Discord is very doable. Discord, very doable. Twitter, very doable. Uh, what else? Netflix, very doable. Uh, what else? I, I don't, I can't think of anything. Facebook, already dead. Uh, Amazon, maybe? There's Open Bazaar. I don't know if anyone uses Open Bazaar anymore. Uh, Amazon seems a little more tricky, frankly, but it could happen. I don't think it's going to happen. No, Amazon. I think Amazon has their big. Amazon is such a uh, powerful delivery company because they have all of their own infrastructure, physical infrastructure. They don't have to take, you know. They have their own warehouses, they have their own, um, fucking delivery services in big Twitter, in big cities, uh, you know, that Amazon and YouTube are, like, probably too hard to kill by just making better software, uh, that's free. But I think a lot of these other services are very killable, they're extremely killable. I mean, there's loads of industries where, I mean, you know, Blender is already taking, like, slowly, you know, eating away at the other 3D rendering software, uh, 
right, as becoming an industry standard. Krita and GIMP are very popular. Audacity, which I'm using right now, is an industry standard. OBS is industry standard. Uh, you know, there's there's nothing saying Olive, when it's eventually good, won't become an industry standard of some kind, uh, or at least a competitor. Like, all we need is for someone to make Ableton but open source. And then, then I will be contented in my life. I think a lot of my problems with producing music on Linux just comes from, I don't know, it just feels not very well integrated. But I'll give, I'm, I'm down, I'm very down to keep trying. I keep trying. I'm giving LMMS so many chances. Uh, maybe going, maybe I'm going about it the wrong way. Maybe I should be trying to make music in a completely different software instead. I'll, I'll look into it. But oh yeah, all I'm saying is there is hope. There is some, it's not even hope, there's just like natural laws of economics that seem to be making companies make their products worse, and eventually people will figure out that there are better alternatives. Like, I don't see how that, since it's already happened in so many industries, you know, this the, these sorts of things just keep happening, and they don't seem to, they, it, it just keeps happening. Guys, it just keeps happening. Look, I've enjoyed lots of games, but I'm not really a gamer type of guy. I say I've enjoyed lots of games, but compared to people who grew up playing video games, I've played very, very few video games, particularly, you know, single player games and especially console games. I have played very, very few. I have played about four PS2 games, and I've completed none of those. Um, you know, the amount of games I've actually beaten is very small. It's very, very, very small. I'm not like a hardcore gamer. I'm not really a gamer at all. I find it difficult to fit gaming in, I suppose. Especially because most, a lot of these games are just unappealing to me. A lot of games are just really unappealing to me. Like, if I see third person shooter, third, third person action game, most of them, not all of them, but like, especially shooters. Third person shooter, I'm just not interested. Like, the, you, I've never, I just don't think they figured it out. Like, I just, maybe this is a crazy thing to say. <laughs> maybe this is insane. But I've never seen a third person shooter that I've thought, like, damn, this really nails the mechanics. They've always felt clunky and awkward. Right, uh, 2D platformers? I get, I get it, like, sure, some of them, I can see from the outside, are well designed, but I've never had fun playing them, not that much, I've had a little bit of fun, but the the challenge has never been appealing to me, like, some people, I, there's, there's a, a weird thing about video games, right, which is, the, it's the only, it's the only, well, it's not the only, but it's 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 a type of art that you can consume wrong. I mean, you can do that with any art, but you can very obviously do it with video games. Um, you you can you can experience it incorrectly by just being wrong at it. Uh, and when it comes to certain games, like like Toho, for example, uh, if I say uh, I I didn't like Toho. And then someone asks me, you know, like, how far did you get if I beat it? Whatever. No, it was too hard for me. That's what I would say. You know, the implication is I lack dedication. You know, I don't I don't have the 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 dedication to to the game to actually give it a chance, which is not the case. Like the people misunderstand this. If I I am someone 
you know, like I enjoy difficult video games. I grinded for every author medal in Trackmania Nations Forever, which is not that hard, but it's like some of the later maps, it's kind of hard, right? I have, you know, I've, I've practiced movement in source games, I've speedrun games, you know, like I don't have an adversity to difficult video games or a lack of dedication to those games. Like, to, to, like, if a game is hard, I'm not dedicated, like, I can't be bothered to work hard at it. That is not, I do not have that. The, if, if, and I don't think anyone really has that. If I am saying, you know, Castlevania, I, 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 I kept dying and it was frustrating and it was, and it was annoying, right? And then someone says, like, oh, well, you just get good. If I was enjoying the game, I would have gotten good. <laughs> Like you, no one's no one is perfect at every video game the first time they try it. That's why people play games. You don't want a game. You don't want it to be that because then it would be too easy. It would be trivially easy. It wouldn't be fun. There would be no challenge to it. The point of video games is that it presents you with a challenge, and then you have to improve somehow. You know, either you get better, or by progressing the game, your character gets better. Pardon me. Uh, you have to improve until you can overcome those challenges. That's the point of games. And so if I say the game was... What I'm saying is the challenge wasn't fun. Not, I couldn't overcome the challenge. There have been a couple of games that I have I have wished I could, but I've just been incapable of beating. Like, uh, some of the, the, the final, the last, the black tracks in Trackmania Nations Forever... Um, like the final difficulty of tracks, I I tried for hours and hours and hours and couldn't couldn't get author medal, not even really close. Like I, that, those tracks were just really fucking difficult, which is fair because that's supposed to be like an, a really difficult challenge. Author medals are an optional, really hard challenge for people who aren't you know really hardcore Trackmania players. Um, there's lots of there's there's a few situations like this where I've enjoyed a game but it just has been like too f- really difficult. But those are normally like end game challenges that stump you like that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the the very basic gameplay loop challenge of the game. If I'm if I'm saying like oh I couldn't beat Toho, what I'm saying is really I didn't find the gameplay fun enough to grind until I could beat Toho. I didn't find the challenge of Castlevania exciting enough, interesting enough, varied enough to go through the trouble of learning attack patterns and mastering the movement. That's what I'm saying. It's it's the game's fault. It's not my fault. Is when I'm well, you know, it's not the game's fault because people like those games. You know, I'm not saying if you like Toho, you're bad. I wish I could get into it, I just can't. And obviously, lots of people like Castlevania. I'm not saying those games are bad, I'm saying they're not for me. That's all I'm saying. They're not for me, not because I'm bad at them, but because. The fact that I'm bad at them is indicative of a difference between me and the game. <laughs> that our first uh, we're incompatible. Fundamentally, I don't know. I keep saying fundamentally these days. It's weird. It's because I've I'm trying to move away. I realized I say basically a lot, and so I'm I I I have just replaced it with fundamentally. I don't see the point of video games that don't have skill-based movement in a 3D environment. I know, it's a really specific, really autistic thing to be interested in, in video games. It's also pretty common, but not as common as I'd like it to be. But I just can't get into games that don't have that. Or something really special has to be happening for me to be into that. To me, that's the point of games is how can you move around this 3D environment in interesting 
ways. Uh, you know, how does the game treat this? Because at its core, all games are about, well, not all games, some games aren't. At, at their core, the majority of games, games where you play as a character in a world, moving around the world, movement is your primary method of interacting with the game world. That's like the majority of games. Obviously, there are some games that are like Tetris or, you know, abstract puzzle games where you don't move so much. And there are games that are 2D uh, and there are game, you know, obviously there are exceptions. But the majority of games are about moving around. Like the fundamental way you interact with the game is that you move around an environment. And if that movement is as simple as just hold up, I'm not fucking interested. If there's nothing deeper, if there's no, if there's no, like, depth to that most fundamental interaction, I'm just like, why should I care? What am I even playing this for? Because I like moving. I like moving around. I like, I like being on trains. You go fast. I like cycling. I like climbing. You know, I like moving. And in video games, especially. Because I can move in ways that I can't move in real life. And that's interesting. And it's cool. But so many games just see movement as like a chore. As like, like nothing. Like, oh, well, since it's the most basic interaction, we need to make this like seamless. So it doesn't get in the way of the real gameplay, which is combat encounters or something. That's the, that's backwards. That's the wrong way to think about it. That core should be, should have the most depth of any of your mechanics. Movement or whatever the fundamental unit of interaction is within your game. But most commonly, that's movement, movement and like aim, positioning, let's say. That should have the most, the most, the highest level of expression available, the most options, the most mechanical depth, the highest skill ceiling, you know? And it shouldn't be, there's only one option you press up to move forwards, and that's like as far as it goes. Oh, well, you know, if we make the movement system more complicated than that, it'll be, it'll be distracting from our narrative or, or our cool uh, beat-em-up mechanics or whatever, exploration mechanics, you know. It's like, at the end, you know, it, there's, no, there's very few games where you're walking around a map and you're walking there and you're thinking, you're not thinking to yourself, or at least this is how I always am, whenever I'm playing a game, and I'm walking around somewhere, I'm always thinking my, to myself, if only I could get where I need to go faster. That's all, I, I'm always thinking about it. There are some games where it's very purposeful that you can't go fast, that, like, the, the, the limitations on your movement are supposed to feel frustrating. Uh, pathologic comes to mind. Um... Obviously, you can't just have infinite speed because that would be ridiculous. That would be impossible to control. Uh, but nonetheless, when I'm walking around a game world, you know, when I'm riding around on the horse in, in Shadow of the Colossus, I'm thinking, I know where I need to go. I don't want to fight the guy. Like, the world is pretty. I like looking around the world. But I want to, be I want to get where I'm going. I don't want to be going there. I want to be there. If only there was some way that I could get there faster, or that getting there could be more interesting. And that's where skill-based movement exists. That's what the, that's the whole point, is, well, if you are, if you spend the time to master the controls, not only you, you, you can you get somewhere faster, but that journey is also more interesting. And that's, that's like the, that's satisfying. That's what games, that's, that's, that's video games for you. That's a, that's a challenge I actually want to overcome.
get, getting places fast in a video game isn't just a matter of like, it, you know, it can be a matter of, I know I'm supposed to go and I want to do the thing when I get there, that's the actual gameplay, and this is just a, an annoying gap where I just have to wait until I get there. That can be a thing. But oftentimes, it's much more fundamental than that. Let's take uh, Melee. If I'm on one side of the stage, the difference between, you know, a a couple milliseconds of time it takes me to move from one side of the stage to the other can be life or death. In CSGO, the difference of, like, how fast can I, like, or, you know, how well can I move between different parts of the map uh, timings-wise can give you the jump on an opponent and make the other parts of the game better, like, infinitely better. If, and this is one of the reasons why CSGO is so good, is that movement and shooting are intertwined. Like, the first thing you get good at in the game is learning to uh, move and shoot seamlessly together. Like, like, uh, I forget what the name for it is, but sort of when you, like, uh, run in one side, you strafe, like, in one direction, and then you strafe in the other direction, and then you shoot at the exact point where you've stopped moving in one direction, but before you've started moving in the other direction, so you have um, accuracy. Like, the game rewards you for having a good coordination between shooting and moving Uh, and that's good that's good gameplay that's why that that's why that's the most popular game on steam is because that is a lot of mechanical depth and replayability that is much that requires much more um of everything that is much more engaging than just run and gun hold w and shoot And then, you know, TF2 is another obvious example. It may be the biggest example where having really good movement in that game directly translates to getting frags and directly translates to surviving encounters that you wouldn't otherwise. Having excellent control of your character is extremely rewarding. And there are other games where there you don't have the option to be better than someone at controlling the character, and it's inconsequential. There's no time you even can put into it, and that's unrewarding. That is that is that is that makes me want to stop playing your fucking game. And I here's the thing. I know. I know that Neon White would be, like, my favourite game ever, but I'm also terrified that it won't be. I'm terrified that Neon White is... Here's what I... Here's my... Here's what I'm scared of. I haven't played it yet. I'm probably going to, like, tomorrow. I'm scared that Neon White is a a sort of dumbed-down, normified version of my brain. That, That Neon White is a game that forces you to interact with it the way I naturally interact with every game and that somehow this will be a problem (laughs) that like the fact that that uh how do I put it like the the one of the interesting things about skill-based movement is how it can initially feel awkward, but then over time feel, like, incredibly natural. Um, B-hopping, rocket jumping, trimping, these are some examples, right? They also all happen to be in TF2. Um, Like, to someone who's never heard of the concept of B-hopping, it's very strange. Why would, like let go of W to move faster, it's weird. Like, jumping in the air to move faster makes sense, but, like, like, 
you you don't hold forwards you hold sideways and you wiggle your mouse in certain time like it's kind of a weird unintuitive thing but once you get it it feels so natural uh rocket jumping you know like look at the ground and shoot like that's kind of a like look in the opposite direction of where you want to go it's 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 like there's a bunch of weird unintuitive stuff but once you get it it feels super intuitive it feels super natural and smooth and i'm worried about neon white that it won't have it doesn't have any of that everything is exactly what you expect it to be and like i've seen lots of gameplay of neon white and it seems interesting but just running around the map like I think like it looks like they've minimized the bits where you're just running that you're mostly jumping and strafing and shooting because just running isn't that interesting but I kind of want just running to be interesting so I'm a little worried about that like take um Titanfall 2 movement right like that strafe topic or no slide hopping I think they call it like that's and and the weird and all of the war run mechanics from that game, you know I've not actually played Titanfall two even though I bought it, <laughs> I just uh, I bought it I opened it it wanted me to make an account on some weird service and I I went I'm gonna do this some other day, uh so I haven't played Titanfall two but what I have played is a mod for Half Life two, which puts Titanfall movement in Half-Life 2. And I've played that, but I haven't put much time into it. I basically played the first level of Half-Life, the first, like, two levels of Half-Life 2 with Titanfall movement and didn't put that much time into it. And it felt awkward and, and like, weird and kind of bad. However, this is not the mod's fault. This is not that movement engine's fault. I could feel from the get-go this is because I haven't put the time in to master it. And I tried. I did the tutorial course, again, in, in the way that Neon White is just how I, how I perceive video games naturally, you know, formalized in an actual game. When it, when it gave, the, the first thing the game, when you load that mod, I believe it's called like the advanced movement mod or something. When you load that mod, it puts you in an obstacle course to teach you the movement mechanics and it gives you a timer. And no one told me to do this. I didn't have any intentions to do this. But you know, I grinded that obstacle course to lower my time. Because that's what I do. I see a timer in a video game and I go, that has to be lower. That number's too big. Uh, and I grind it until it gets a bit lower. And then I think, okay, I've gone that lower now. Like, another example is uh, Sonic. They, there's a, there, All of the Sonic games, the original Sonic games, 2D original Sonic games on on uh mobile like Android, right? I downloaded Sonic one and I played through the first level, Green Hills, you know, classic. I've played it before. I had fun. I got to the second level and the second level, if you remember, is a bit weird. It doesn't like play super into the momentum and mechanics that Sonic is known for. It's kind of a weird like kind of slow awkward puzzle platformer thing with like instant death pits it kind of sucks so I played through that died a couple of times and said I'm not having any fun doing this I want to play Green Hill again <laughs> so I went back and for about like two weeks at the time I was doing something I don't remember what I was doing um but I uh, maybe this was like while I was in uni well, no it can't have been I actually don't remember what I was doing at the time, but I had to be, like, on trains a lot for some reason. I was, like, doing something where I had to go somewhere every day. I forget what it was. Or, or not every day, but regularly. Um, and so my default mobile game for going to and from on the train, wherever it was I was going to... It was uni. It, mu it must have been uni, I think. Was, the, was just grinding green hills. Until I could, and lowering my time on Green Hill, on Green Hill Zone. I never speed ran any of the other levels. I didn't even, I didn't play the game beyond the first level. I just grinded and watched the world record on YouTube and was like, I'm doing that. 
and I just grinded it and grinded it. I never, obviously, I didn't get the world record, but I got pretty fucking good. I got pr- like pretty decent times. I don't remember what the time was, but I remember being pretty satisfied. And then I got bored. But that's just how I like. That's video games to me. If you show me a timer, I'd make it low. <laughs> I I can't. I've done it forever. Ever since I was a kid. Anyway, I'm worried that in formalizing these mechanics, in making them more rigid. And intuitive. Neon white will have ruined them. But I doubt... There's also a part of me that just thinks it's going to be the best game ever. Okay, so... To, the the thing I'm, clou- I'm, I'm scared about with Neon White... I don't know why I don't just play the game. Well, I can't right now. But I will play the game tomorrow and we'll see. And you'll get to hear about it in a few seconds for you. But for me, it'll be a day. Uh, so I saw Game Maker's Toolkit make a video about Neon White. And they said... They described it as letting you speed run, speed running, and this is precisely what I'm scared about. I don't want to speed run, speed running. I want speed running to be a slow and arduous process that is very difficult, shaving tenths and hundredths. This is why I liked going for the. This is why going for the author medals in Trackmania Nations Forever was one of the best gaming experiences of my life, because. It involved playing the first, the same approximately, you know, 30 seconds to just over a minute level over and over and over again, sometimes trying to save off literally, at one point, I was literally two hundredths of a second away from the author medal time. Like, that's how close it was. Like, no, like, making really tiny optimization, like, that's what I find fun, and grinding for hours and hours the same thing it's like i don't want the game to hold my hand and make help me speed run speed running i don't want it to be an easy streamlined version of speed running i want the opposite of that but maybe hey you know if all of these people like it maybe it's a good game i'm not saying it isn't i'm just saying i'm scared because if it is exactly what i want it's going to be my favorite game of all time it's got visual novel stuff in it like, it's it's like it was designed to appeal to me specifically. I don't know. The only way it could have been more designed to appeal to me is if it was made in the Source Engine. Uh, but we'll we'll see. We'll see. But that's what I'm scared of. I think that's a pretty good way of summing it up. That I'm scared that it's going to streamline the fun out of speedrunning for me. The thing about difficult video games... Actually, you know what? The thing about video games... Is that humanity, we already invented the best video game. It's called art. It's called making art. The best form of interactive art everyone talks about. Oh, I like video games. You know, all all of these games, they try and give... Player expression. Player freedom. And so on. You, the, the best version of that is to just sit down and draw something. Is to pick up a guitar and write something. It is to pick up a pen and write something. You know? We already invented the best video game. It's called Art. It's called making art. People talk about video games being the big exception. Interactive medium. You have movies, you have books, you have all of the music. These are passive mediums, you just consume them. I disagree with this characterization, but sure. Right. As an audience member, you just consume them. Whereas video games, you have no choice as the audience but to interact with it directly. Except that there's always been the option to interact with every medium 
by making it yourself. If anything, video games offer a neutered version of that experience. Not to say they're bad, not to be anti-video game or anti, you know, I'm not, maybe that's a little inflammatory way to put it, but the thing about making a song is there are the elements of skill and like technical ability to playing an instrument. You can pick up a guitar, but if you don't know how to play it, it's useless. In the same way, you can pick up a controller, but you won't be able to beat Sekiro first time. So there was the, this same process of incremental improvement at a skill-based mechanical thing in order to express yourself with no clear end goal, ex except, you know, you have these big open worlds, right? But nothing will ever be as open world as the infinite open world of the human ima artistic imagination, right? And that's really the problem. That's really the challenge. As There's a Brian Eno quote. Let me, let me look up a, this Brian Eno quote. There's always a Brian Eno quote. Uh... Uh, let's see if I can find it. The great benefit of computer sequences is that they remove the issue of skill and replace it with the issue of judgment. That's a Brian Eno quote. Um, and I get what he's going for here, and I agree. I think that, yeah, there isn't, there isn't really, yeah, it's interesting. It's a very interesting trade-off. And this judgment is the game. Because you open up your DAW of choice. And it presents you with a blank screen. And every option you could possibly imagine. Now, when you're a beginner, when you don't know what you're doing... Right, you don't have that many options because you don't have the knowledge of how to create a sound that sounds like Skrillex or, you know, whatever. You don't know how to do it. And so it's actually, I think, easier to make music the less you know about it. It's like the game has an inbuilt skill curve to it. Because then, the more you learn, the more sound design techniques and production techniques, mixing techniques, etc. Music theory, so on. The more you learn, the more options, the more tools you have available, the harder it becomes to choose which one is represents your vision, represents what is emotionally appropriate. And so the game is, rather than here is a specific obstacle, overcome it. The game is, there are no obstacles. There is nothing stopping you from doing anything you can possibly imagine. Now make a decision. That's the game. And that is the most compelling game ever invented. Because that's obviously an impossible choice. You can't make a... That's why... That is like... Why... You can't beat music. <laughs> you can't beat art. Because there is no ultimate correct decision. And that's why creativity comes from limitations. I, I strongly agree with that saying. That a good place to start, like what you learn as you progress from having inbuilt limit, you know, first you have the inbuilt limitations of being a beginner. And then as you learn more and more, 
you know, Stockhausen, he put it as, he, he, he would talk about temptations that, like, like it almost in a, like a biblical sense, like the, the, the temptation of making popular appealing music or something, right? And he would talk about resisting those temptations very, like, uh, you know, consciously. And this is Stockhausen we're talking about. So when he talks about popular, you know, consonant music, he's talking about, like, having a, a normal chord ever. <laughs> right? Uh, but I do think this is, like, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily phrase it like that. Maybe I would, I don't know, but he, like, what he's getting at, I think it hits on something real, which is that the more you learn, the more you're able to make highly polished music, the more you are tempted to take the easy solution, which is to, you know, well, since I can make highly polished music, why wouldn't I? You know, why wouldn't I make something catchy and poppy and so on when when you don't know what you're doing everything is experimental you know if a baby picks up a pen if a, if a chi- if a child picks up a a paintbrush and draws a a crude image of a, a a bird you know that's just because the child doesn't know what he's doing but when picasso does it you know he could have drawn anything. He knows how to paint, right? He knows how to paint realistic, photorealistic images or any sort of scene. And yet, he chose to paint like a child. Why? That's interesting. Now, that's interesting. I think this is what happened with Grimes. Grimes' first album, I think, sounds really interesting because she didn't know what she was doing. And so it just ended up sounding kind of weird and experimental. But then, you know, she got more popular. She learned more about music production and singing. Because she didn't used to know how to sing. You know, her first album is drenched in reverb, all of the vocals. Which sounds really cool. But eventually, you figure out, that's because she couldn't sing. If you don't know. Drenching your vocals in reverb is a really easy way to cover up bad singing. Or the, the weird sort of synths that she's using. The the very stripped back, sparse, angular production. It's all really interesting choices until you realise it wasn't a choice at all. She just didn't know what she was doing. Which doesn't make the music necessarily worse or better. You know, you can make your own decisions. But... uh. I personally know that I prefer that Grimes album much more than the albums when she knew how to produce a song that sounded normal. Uh, I actively dislo- dislike those albums. So, if you have all of the options in the world, you have to choose some sort of limitation for yourself. And before you even choose how to work within those limitations, you have to choose a limitation. Uh, And that's, that's the, that's the whole game of it. It's crazy. And it's not, uh, sometimes it's fun. Sometimes it's traditionally fun. But most of the time, it's something deeper than fun. I, I think the word for it is is catharsis. I think it's it's incredibly cathartic. Uh, and but if you look at me while I'm making music, I am not smiling and laughing. I might be bobbing my head, but I'm probably frowning and focusing. I'm not having traditional fun. It's something else. And that's what, that's what video games struggle to capture. But not that they even necessarily should be trying to capture that. Um, you know, I'm 
I am in some ways comparing apples to oranges here. Uh, I I I I know. I think this is interesting. Like, there's a debate about player freedom in video game design. That like a lot of developers seem to especially influenced by the success of Minecraft. Maybe less so now. It's it's kind of... There was a trend a few years ago. It seems to have sort of died down a bit. Of, like, more player freedom equals better. Um, but they would end up creating massive open worlds where you could go anywhere and do... But you could, you know, the stuff... that You could go to anywhere, but there's nothing to do in those places. There's something interesting happened there uh that sort of thing uh and so in the end you're just sort of i don't know but then there's, there's other games that offer like really really linear experiences and some people you know myself included i i think all of the best games are uh very linear uh, but also, I don't necessarily think that this is like linear versus open is like a good way to judge games in the first place. I don't know if it's, that's actually a useful framework for like the quality of a game. Uh, but now it seems like expressiveness. People have realized it's not just openness that people want. It's expressiveness that people want. And some developers have used this to create predatory business practices where you hey, you can customize your character, but you have to pay for it. You know, back in my day, customizing your character was a free option in video games. Uh, Now you have to pay for it. Um, But games like Mario Odyssey, uh, they have these movement systems that are expressive. That's how people describe them. Uh, And I think that's neat. I think that's neat. I think that actually gets to the heart of the thing that people want to do, which is it's trying, it's, it's, it takes a little bit, just a little bit of that catharsis from creating art. And I think that's, that's, I think people want to do that. I think that's, that's something in the human experience that is desirable to people. Maybe some people value it more than others. You know, not everyone is going to go out of their way to spend hours learning to make art. Some people value it more than others for whatever reason. But I've, I don't know, expressing yourself doesn't sum it up to me. Like, I've never, I've always thought that the description of, like, art as self-expression has never been satisfying to me. I I have never felt like I'm necessarily primarily expressing myself when I make music. It's something different. It's something it's something else that I can't really describe. Cuz often it doesn't feel like necessarily myself was such a big part in it. Like it doesn't like the identity thing because all art is so derivative of each other, like, that's kind of the point. But then it all is filtered through you. I don't know. There's definitely an element, but self-expression just feels like the wrong word to use to me. But I I could not offer a better word. Uh, anyway, that's something interesting that I was thinking about. Uh, maybe that was insanely pretentious. It's the next day. It's actually quite a while into the next day. And I have to come clean. Frankly, I keep saying this. I keep saying fundamentally and frankly in an attempt to stop saying basically. But I think I should just stop using those words at all. as like filler words. It's the next day. Anyway... And I lied. I lied to you all. I lied to myself. We all lied. We were all 
lies lies happened although they weren't lies they were just they were just mistruths they were just alternative facts because no i did not play neon white today and here is why because i woke up and i went to go to steam to install neon white and it was like 25 quid and i was like i ain't paying that <laughs> I'm gonna wait till this shit goes on sale, motherfucker. I ain't paying that money. So I wishlisted it. And I'm just gonna wait until it goes on sale. I Yes, before someone mentions it. Before someone types in the... I know you're typing right now. One of you. Is in the comment section. Timestamping this segment. And typing... Meme arrow. Green text arrow. Paying for software. Paying for video games. Yeah, I know. I could pirate it. <clears throat> I thought about it. I thought about it. Um, I have my reasons. Let's just say that. But also, the big reason is because I wasn't really in the... The big reason I, I thought, well, going out of my way to find a guitar and so on, you know, whatever. <clears throat> like, am I going to have more fun playing Neon White than I will just playing TF2? The answer is no. Not right now. Maybe at some point in the future, I will think that. <clears throat> Sorry, I've, I've got something stuck in my throat, rather annoyingly. But not right now. I just would rather play some Demo Man, Demo Night, Dem, Demo Man Gaming. I'm not that knight anymore, you know? I think this is actually my problem, is that I, I don't knight enough. Like, but at first, I was I was knighting too much and not using grenades or pipes or whatever at all. But now, I'm like exclusively spamming grenades and it makes me think what's even the point of having a sword equipped. I mean, I still use it, but maybe I should be going for those, those sword kills more. <clears throat> Which I think I should be. It's just that the two... Like, they're very different styles of gameplay. You know, playing with the sticky... Play, playing like normal Demo Man is all about spamming into groups of enemies and spamming chokes and stuff. Whereas Demo Knight is all about finding, you know, going around the uh, edges of the map and uh, finding stragglers to pick off. Uh, so you're normally not in a situation where you get to choose which... You know, you know what I'm trying to get at here. But, anyway, I had fun. Uh, although, what happened was that I I logged on to TF2 and immediately was faced <laughs> with, like, 50 bots. It's this fucking cunt called Omegatronic, who, who is probably the worst person in the world. And I don't even... I know he... Who... I don't know what sort of person you have to be to... I don't know. I, w I, would, I would like this person to, to, I don't know, man. I, I would like things, to, I, would, I would like, th let's just say, very broadly, there are things in this world, not connected to, any hey, sure, not connected to anything I was saying before. Let's just say there are things in this world that I wish would happen that I can't talk about on YouTube. Let's just say that, okay? There are things to certain people in this world there are certain things that I wish would happen. That's all I'm going to say. So, then I logged off TF2. Uh, well, actually, well, pretty much that's what happened. I, I tried to go on a community server, but it was really laggy for whatever reason. Probably because it had like 30 people on it. And then I thought, I can't be able to deal with this. And so I logged off and played CSGO instead. I played Wingman for a bit. And I rank, I played like three games of Wingman, and I ranked up twice in the space of those like three or four games. I am now MG2 Wingman rank, which is the highest rank I've ever had in CSGO. Sure, it's Wingman, not comp, so, you know, does it count? It's up to you. It's a different thing. I'm not going to go around telling people, someone asks what rank I am, I'm not going to say I'm MG2. But that's neat. 
not that I like particularly care about. I'm not necessarily tryharding to to get a good rank. It's just surprising because I don't feel like I'm playing like better than I have been in the past, really. So it's strange. So I played some wingman. Then I got kind of bored, and so I decided to play some Counter Strike Source. Some CS Crack House Deathmatch, you know how it is. And that was fun for a while, played that for about an hour. Then I went and made some food, came back, and uh, decided I was bored of Counter Strike. Wanted to play something different, and I ended up playing some Trackmania. It turns out my memory was a bit fuzzy on what I had actually done in Trackmania. And I actually had fewer author medals than I thought I did. So there's actually a few tracks that I didn't have author medal on that weren't like the black, really difficult tracks. So I actually don't have as many author medals as I thought I did. Uh, so I went back and I grinded. I got two new, two new author medals. Mainly, I, I you know, the problem is that all the author medals I have are on the tracks that I actually wanted to grind. Like they're the most fun ones to grind. The ones I have left are on tracks that. I didn't particularly want to grind, um, and so these ones are a little less fun to hunt. But uh, you know, put put the yard on in the background, and and you grind and it's fine. And I play a bit of Trackmania. Trackmania is a fun game. Um, then I got bored of that, and I was like. If only I could be playing TF2, but there's too many bots. If only there was some way to play TF2 without bots. And then I remembered, it was like God whispered in my ear. Uncle Topia. I forgot Uncle Topia existed. I had never played on Uncle Topia servers before, but I've heard, I've heard, I've heard legend of them. And so I was like, people say these are good. Let me go and see what that's about. And so then I just played on Uncle Topia servers for a while. And that was actually really fun. I think I will probably play on those rather than official Valve servers in the future. Because the community is super nice. People actually talk to each other. Um, the servers are good quality. And they just have a... It's just nice. It's just good. There's no bots. It's, it's great. Uncle Topia is based. Uh, so yeah, I just played, played some Uncle Topia for a while. And that was sick. And someone recognized me, not from YouTube, but just from having played casual. Like, in the chat, someone said, uh, uh, something that they were talking about how, like, uh, there's only, like, a few people you run into the same people, like Wide Appreciator, for example, which is my name. And I said... And I don't remember what I said, but I was like, hey, that's... If someone recognizes me from being in casual servers, that's funny. And then someone asked me what my name meant, and I explained Hidamari sketch to them. And that was fun, and someone said I had a good taste. So, that was the adventures in... And then I played like shit. <laughs> and I played really badly, but I had fun. Because I'm not good. And especially on Uncle Topia servers, everyone's good. Every, like, this, this is where the, the people who are better at the game hang out, because obviously you have to know that they exist and seek them out. You have to be in the community a bit. And so, yeah. I, I understand to some extent. Like, I don't know, man. I kind of get, I get mad about modern gaming a lot about like rounding rounding off corners and sanding down edges i understand why it needs to happen but i don't like that i understand it like i think that so for example uh xqc if you don't know xqc biggest streamer in the world he used to be a professional overwatch player um and Overwatch is a lot like T Team Fortress 2. Uh, and so you would imagine XQC would have played some TF2 a little bit, right? But he's only played T 
TF2 once, as far as I can tell. I, I looked this up because I was curious, because I was like, actually, good at Overwatch, has he ever played TF2? And he's only played it once on stream, as far as I can tell. And for some God knows why reason, he played a 2-4 instant respawn infinite deathmatch server. That was his first and only experience with TF2, is... Like, I listen, I like playing 2-4 instant deathmatch 24-7 forever, the matches last forever type of... You know, I like I like playing that. But that is not how I would introduce someone to TF2. I don't know how he ended up there, but that's... Yeah. And so I understand why, you know, modern games don't have community game modes and all of this interesting stuff. Because if there's a chance that, you know, XQC decides to stream your game and he doesn't play the real version of the game or, like, the, 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 the you know, the purer version or whatever, if you, if, you end, if you can end up doing weird shit, someone who doesn't know what they're doing is going to have a bad time. And one of your competitors will have made a game that is much more seamless to a first-time player. And so, you're going to lose customers. But I don't, you know, I think there's, like, that sacrifice is reasonable. <laughs> it, because I want there to be 24-7 infinite two-fort servers with fast respawn. Those are fun. I've had fun on those servers before. Who hasn't? <clears throat> You know, maybe the difference is literally just UI design. Like, I understand... People get mad because CSGO, like, hides the community server browser behind a drop-down menu somewhere. But honestly, like, that's not a big deal. Like, everyone who... I don't know anyone who's played CSGO who hasn't, like, at least tried out a surf or something on a community server before. Like, as far as I know, everyone knows that the community server browser exists. It's not actually hidden. Like, it's... It's right there in the drop-down menu, you know, it's it's still in the game. It's not like Valorant, where it just doesn't exist. I assume it doesn't exist. You know, a lot of these games just don't have this option. And this is a pretty... like, this sucks, because you end up with situations... So, you guys know Northern Lion? I'm I'm big into... Dotsma introduced me to Northern Lion a while ago, and I've I've been absolutely eating his content up ever since. I love Northern Lion. Northern Lion p used to play this game called Rumbleverse. No, no other, as far as I could tell, like, very few other streamers, no one cares about this game. But Rumbleverse is, like, a melee-only third-person, like, wrestling game that is a battle royale. So it's like a, it's like a, a really unique game. It's like a 3D fighting game battle royale. Like, there's combos. It's really interesting mechanically. Uh, and it has lots of pog moments, but it also seems pretty, like, skill-based. Like a fighting game should be. It seems like an interesting game. Not really my kind of game. Like, I don't know if I would necessarily play it, but, like, it's an, it's an interesting game. There's clearly a lot of depth to it. Uh, but it has been announced that Rumbleverse is shutting down its servers, that they they just didn't, you know, it cost a lot of money to host servers, and they're just shutting down. Now, maybe for a battle royale, community servers don't work, like, I get it, you need to host, like, 70 players at once or something, you, you like, you have massive player numbers, maybe you can't expect people to host that on a random server, maybe you need big beefy servers and whatever, but... You know, there are so many situations where games have shut down their official servers and communities of those games have kept the game alive by setting up their own servers. Uh, I think there's like various Mario Kart games that uh, have, uh, have community servers where people still play, even though Nintendo doesn't support them, and, and there's a bunch of games like this. Like, this... Like, it's good for the game companies, no? Because they don't have to, like, they don't have to support 
the games anymore. They don't have to actively pump money into keeping servers running after the game's, like, initial lifespan is over, but they can still... People will still buy the game and buy cosmetics and, you know, maybe... Or maybe not, I don't know, but people will still play the game and pump money into it and so on, and you'll get new players. Like, if you kill the servers for your game, you can never... No one will ever buy your game again if it's a multiplayer-only game. If you kill the servers but allow the community to still maintain their own servers then at least some people less than initially but you'll still be making some revenue from it i don't understand why game studios don't do this are they scared because they can't moderate it like no one cares you know how much call of duty is worth as a franchise that game is like notorious for having Toxic voice comms and so on. Like, you know how much Counter Strike is worth as a franchise? You can go on the community server browser and find all sorts of fucked up shit. Like, you know, including porn. <laughs> no one cares, is the point. It doesn't interrupt anyone who's just like normally playing the game. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I just don't understand why games companies are terrified of opening their games up to the community when. That's the only proven way to give any video game actual longevity. And every game that's been like super successful has done it. It's very strange. I don't understand the logic. There must be some logic somewhere. Maybe creating the tools that allow... Maybe like Source Engine games are like uniquely... Uh, Maybe the source engine makes it uniquely easy to set a system like that up. I don't, I don't, I genuinely don't know. Uh, because there must be, so, like, they can't just be stupid. I, I, <laughs> I don't, you know, there, there must be some reason. I just don't know what it is. Like, no company that would just willingly throw away money. You know, the old account, like, I don't think people realize that all of these people that have been playing count, like, there are hundreds and thousands of people who have been playing Counter-Strike games since 1.6 or since Source. Those games didn't ship with Valve servers. If you play th those games, there was no choice, you know? It was like Minecraft before they added Realms. Like, there's there's no... You know, games like this happen all the time. There, there are loads of games that are uber successful that don't have official servers. And this used to just be a thing. Is it for console players? Is that it? Is it like a console thing? Fuck consoles. No one cares about consoles. I don't know. I don't understand it. Personally speaking, I don't understand it. This whole everything has to be seamless. If something's seamless, if something's like it just works easy to like, you don't have to put any effort into it, then you don't understand it. You can, And you can never understand it. It's like closed source software. You know, Windows, it just works, but you can never actually understand it. You you get some, like, suckless software or something like that, I don't know. You get some, some FOSS shit, and it's like, yeah, this might... Maybe when you get this program, it it is doesn't have a great default config, and you have to go in the, the config file and recompile it or whatever. But... Once you've done that, you've actually learned something, and you've improved yourself as a person. And the end result will be something more personal and more useful to you than the alternative that is supposed to just work for everyone. So making anything that just works for, for the broadest demographic is just going to mean that it's kind of bad for everyone, instead of having something be a little difficult for the end user, but, like, reward them for their dedicate, like, you know, give them actual customizability. I don't know. It's weird. Software is weird. Because these opinions are not like common opinions. They may seem obvious to people who listen to this podcast. Like that I'm preaching to the choir here. But these are not obvious opinions to normies. You know, like if if XUC plays TF2 and someone says to him like, Oh, you're not playing the real version. He's just going to be like, dude, 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 what the fuck? Like, why is there a fake version? You know, <laughs> like he's not going to understand it. He's not going to think about this. He's just going to be thinking, like, I could be playing anything right now. Why would I play a game that requires me to, like, learn shit, to, like, read something, to figure it out? I saw people have the same reaction 
when people would when Twitter started going to shit and people were talking about switching over to Mastodon, and people were like, uh, bro, like I don't want to have to like learn something new. Like I don't want to have to read documentation just to use social media. And it's like Mastodon is the simplest fucking thing ever. You just have to learn one super simple concept of instances. That's all you need to learn. And you already know it because you already know how email works. Like, that's how retarded normies are. You don't, you don't, like, there's nothing, (laughs) you know what I mean? There's nothing to these people. They don't have any desire to learn or anything. They don't have any curiosity about the world, I guess. Like, they, (laughs) they don't have any, like, you know what I mean? That's the fundamental thing, is that I'm, curious about the world and i i want to learn thick things even if it turns out to be completely useless the act of learning and finding that out is rewarding in itself i know a bunch about like you know well actually that's not really relevant i have an image let me read off an image for you this is another another no thank you reads a 4chan post have i already read this one in this video podcast I'm just going to read this. These are all with um, meme arrows. Give normal fags access to the web, a place where they can say and host anything. They choose walled garden social media instead. They ruin the entire web in less than 10 years. Give normal fags access to all the free audio, video, video, books, and content they could ever desire, for free and uncensored, in better quality than any streaming service or cable provider. They pay $10 a month to multiple low-quality streaming services instead, where content is constantly censored, removed, or edited to suit the opinions of people that don't even watch it. They ruin the entire entertainment sector in less than a decade as content providers produce more and more low-effort shit that caters to people that don't even play slash watch slash listen to it. Give normal fags access to hardware so powerful a nerd in the late 90s would have murdered someone for it. It's so small they can carry it with them anywhere. You can always get an intake connection. Normal fags use this device to take pictures of themselves and share them with other normal fags. This eventually morphs into short videos where they do retarded dances and pointed slogans on screen. Ruin the concept of OC in less than a decade. Everyone producing high quality work is drowned out or gives up altogether. I disagree with that. There's lots of people who are still producing high quality work on like YouTube and stuff, but whatever. Give normal fags access to the world's collective knowledge and archives detailing everything you can imagine. Instead of reading it, learning from it, debating it with others, and improving upon it, they do web searches to find opinion pieces that align with their existing opinions and beliefs. They demand everything they personally dislike be censored instead of closing their eyes or the web page they're viewing. They incite campaigns to de-platforming anything to de-platform anything they don't like when they don't get their way. It took them less than ten years to ruin free speech on the internet. Why do they ruin everything? Why did we allow this to happen? We didn't allow this to happen. We never had any power in the first place. That's the fun. That's that's what that's what Anon doesn't understand here. Just because we were here first doesn't mean we had any power. We were just the first peasants to move in. But yeah, other than the couple of things that I disagree with, I think that post sums it up. They're just um they're just they're just subhumans. <laughs> I don't know. There's just something wrong with people. They just have no ability to think. Here's something I want to bring up. I don't want to get too edgy here. But I think it's I think there's an irony that is lost on most people about and I'm I'm not actually taking a stance here in terms of what you should and shouldn't be allowed to say in a video game. Like, it's not a hill I want to die on. It's not particularly important to me, you know. If I go into a video game and I die and I can't type the N-word in all chat, that's not going to ruin my day. It's not going to really affect me at all. <laughs> it's, if you choose to do that... When you develop your game, I'm I'm not here to, like, you know, I don't, th- this is not a big deal to me. That's what I'm saying. I'm putting my hands up in the air, 
saying this is not a big deal to me. This is like, this is not a hell I want to die on. This is not something I care deeply about. Uh, I do just want to point out a bit of irony here, which is censoring words, censoring, you know, uh, essentially this concept that game developers are for, for some reason hate it when people can talk to each other. They hate it. They hate the fact that someone a while ago figured out that you could put the ability to talk to each other in video games and that uh, gamers like this feature. They hate this. They hate this more than anything. They wish that this had never been invented and more than anything, they hate you for using this feature. Like they wish that no one ever talked to each other in video games and, and, you know, they hate it. They, they fucking hate it. They think that uh, you should, if you want to talk to someone, if you want to communicate, you should be able to choose between five different predetermined emotes, each of which cost 20 bucks in a store. That's what they think, right? They, 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 that's how they want communication to happen in video games. They want communication to be, uh, look at this skin I paid 50 bucks for and like, I'm going to now do a little silly dance because I, I bought this silly dance. Like this is, this is what, this is what game developers want. They don't want you to actually be able to talk to each other. They hate it for, for whatever fucking reason. And here's the, here's the bit of irony that I want to point out. The bit of irony is, uh, that like, if you use one of these naughty words that they don't like, you, you, you say mean things to someone else in a video game. Like, it happens all the time. Video games, you know, they're in, they're, 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 uh, people get passionate about them. <laughs> and, and people say mean, sometimes pretty fucked up shit to each other in video games. If you do this, right, that's your bat. However, the fact that that video game is a war simulator, Okay, if you, look, look, if you go up to another player and you call them a mean word, that's bad. You're banned. But if you go up to another player and shoot them in the face with a realistic gun, that is intended gameplay and good, and good for society, and we all like it. Isn't that fucking insane? Isn't that insane? If you, like, act out carefully, like, created to be super realistic... Uh, you know, reflections of real-world conflict and real-world violence. Uh, like, there's no abstraction here. You're literally shooting someone. That is great. We all love that. But the second you say a bad word to someone, the second you start saying something mean, you can shoot someone, but if you tell them to kill themselves, suddenly, that's a problem. Why is that a problem? Why? Uh, well, I can understand. I can understand why that's a problem. But uh, what I'm saying is, like, why, why, why? There's a there's a very much a disconnect here between like what we're counting as moral and immoral actions. Like, you know, the same. I would argue, the same logic that you can use to say, well, you know, it doesn't matter because the violence in video games isn't real. It's just simulated. I would make the same case for language. Saying something mean to someone isn't real. It's just simulated. In fact, even the act of saying it, you know, can... Because language is such a contextual thing, if you can have... Okay, um, maybe that's too edgy. <laughs> maybe that's too edgy. Let's, let's pick a different example. Let's say... Uh, Let's say kill yourself, right? So I tell if you, if you tell someone to kill themselves, right, in in video game chat, that's that's bad. But if you shoot someone, that's fine. Okay, we established this. You shoot someone, it's fine because it's just cartoon violence. Why can't the words also be cartoon violence within the context of the video game? Like if I tell someone to kill themselves, I don't know very few people who say that actually want to like be sent a video of the guy hanging himself or whatever. Like no one no one actually means means it in a real way. Right? It's cartoon it's cartoon language. It's not meant to be taken literally. It's just meant to be part of the role play or part of the the simulation of a video game. It's the same thing as shooting someone in a video game. They're both only contextualized within the mechanics of the game. They aren't contextualized within 
actually shooting someone, right? If I sent someone a video, if I if I like found found someone I disliked, and I send you a video of me like shooting a representation of you, if I take a picture, take it down to the shooting gallery, and then send you a video of me shooting that pic, like that's that's like you know a threat on your life, like that's fucked up. But I do the same thing. I shoot a representation of you in a video game. That is perfectly okay. Like, this is the thing about these 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 developers that hate co- the fact that players can communicate with each other. They hate the communication. Because, I don't know, it's just a weird double thing. It's a weird double thing that, they, that it's okay to make games where the primary interaction is killing each other. Which I think it is, by the way, just to clarify... All of my favorite games are games where the private, the primary interaction is violence. I'm pro violence. Uh, do you un- do you understand what I'm getting at? I just think there's a little bit of a hypocrisy here. People who make video games about violence being terrified of like the most weakened nonsense simulation version of. Like, I can't believe that the word violence has been stretched so much to mean that, like, some... Ugh, I'm so over this. I'm not going to talk about this. This is some bullshit Twitter stuff that no one cares about. Like, this is something that you would see someone molding about on Twitter. This is not what I'm here to do to, with you guys, man. I'm not here to, to give you the experience of reading something bad on Twitter. I just... I'm here to laugh... I'm here to laugh at normies and normie game devs. That's what I'm here to do. Okay, I'm not here to give you triggered. To give you triggered thank you on Twitter. Okay, extremely autistic moment incoming. Extremely autistic pedantry incoming. So there's a song called I Can't Be Airman. Japanese song. Old internet meme from like Nico Nico back in the day. Uh, and then there's an, a popular English translation of I Can't Be Airman, or like an English version. And I like that English version. It has kind of a lo-fi aesthetic to it. It's recorded on kind of a crappy mic. And the translation isn't very good, but that's fine. Then Jan Meesley, who is a popular YouTuber who made videos such as Hangman is a Weird Game. I like this guy's YouTube videos. I think he's made some bad YouTube videos. Uh, and I think he has some bad opinions in general. However, uh, I do like his videos in general. Jan Meesley made a version of the song. And he says at the beginning, if you read the translation notes, this is a translation of Airman Ga Tosanai, a song about having a hard time playing Mega Man 2, written in 2007 by Nico Nico user. Uh, I can't read Japanese, so I'm not even going to try. Uh, <laughs> uh, later arranged by the group Team Nekokan. There's already a decently popular English version of this song made back in the day, but I figured I could do better. Now, that's what I have a problem with. Because this version is a more accurate translation. In many respects, the translation of this version works significantly better. However, it is not better as a song. Because Jan Meesley, for, for a couple of reasons. The main reason being... A, Jan Meesley isn't a very good singer. B, he doesn't know how to mix vocals properly to compensate for being a very bad singer. Um, And so what he does is a very common baby's first mixing yourself singing technique, which is uh, auto-tune the fuck out of it and put a bunch of reverb on it. This sounds god-awful in the context of this song. I almost recommend listening to it because the vocals are mixed so badly they just don't sound like part of the song they sound like someone being recorded at a karaoke booth singing over the song they do not sound like a part of the song because he hasn't mixed them properly they're way too loud there's there, there's no eq like they're very boomy and 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 uh, and muddy they they don't have any you know there's there's no like presence in the high end uh, he recorded it on a decent mic, but he hasn't mixed that mic to sound good. And the autotune sounds really bad. Uh, I'm sure you could make autotune fit this song, but Jan Misley has not done that. He has not sung 
like a, a lot of people don't realize that you have to sing in it. This is why T Pain sounds fucking great with auto tune. Is he's a really good singer, and he knows that you have to use different singing techniques if you're planning to use auto tune. The things that sound good when you're just singing to like normally, don't sound good when you're singing in auto tune. You need to use different singing techniques, different techniques of projection and enunciation and uh, word shaping, the shapes of your mouth. Different things sound different, right? Jan Measley has not done this. Um, yes, and also I have a problem with a lot of the translation. Uh, uh, here's one particularly egregious line. Um, so the uh, original line is Kyori o totemo izurue wa kyori o tsuma, tsumeraderu. Um, literally, he closes the distance. In the original, uh, or it, it's no use, I tried to stay away, but he keeps closing in. That's the in the original English translation. And Jan Misli has changed this to, but it's meaningless because he keeps jumping towards me and it's completely unfair. And then in the translation notes has said, so cool how you can just skip, skip the first syllable of the word completely and it's fine and doesn't sound wrong. Because the way he sings it is... Uh, hold on a second. But it's meaningless because he keeps jumping towards me and it's completely unfair. That's what he sings, right? And it's completely unfair. Just remove the and. Just remove the and and put a comma there. Instead of saying pleatly. No, it doesn't sound fine. It does sound wrong. It sounds very wrong. You're clearly saying pleatly. That's why I paused the video and went, did he say pleatly? You can't say pleatly. That's not a word. And you already have. I understand. If you're doing it, it's difficult to translate things and make them fit the meter of the song. It's difficult. And, you know, there's lots of situations where that sort of artistic license is warranted and sounds fucking awesome. But in this situation, you have a filler word in the sentence that you could get rid of that is one syllable long, giving you the ability to say the word completely properly. You can say, but it's meaningless because he keeps jumping towards me, it's completely unfair. And it, it, the sentence flows perfectly fine. Instead of, he keeps jumping towards me and it's completely unfair. What the fuck is completely unfair? That is distractingly awful. But it's meaningless because he keeps jumping towards me and it's completely unfair. That's so stupid. But it's meaningless because he keeps jumping towards me. It's completely unfair. It works so much better. Why not pick that other? Why not pick the obvious thing to do? That's such a weird choice. Yeah, I kind of want to make my own version because this is just so bad. The translation is generally fine. I, I, like it's generally pretty good, but uh, this is this isn't the 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 song itself is is just butchering a classic. Because the original Japanese one is a fucking classic, and the popular old English version is also a classic, and this is fucking butchered. <sighs> yeah, I did a little bit of musical supremacism. This is the one thing I'm allowed to be a little... Look, I'm good at music. I'm better than Jan Meesley at music. It's true. I'm not saying that I'm a better singer than Jan Meesley. I'm an awful singer. I can sometimes pull off some good performances, but I am by no means a good singer. 90% of singing is confidence, but uh, the rest of it, I suck at. <laughs> um, so, you know, it is what it is. I'm not saying, like, this song is not in my range. I don't think I could make a good cover of it. I might try, but I don't think it would sound particularly good. But, oh, well, it might sound good, but it would sound good to me because, to me... And this is a thing in Japan as well, is that being a really good singer matters less. <laughs> uh, you hear in a lot of, like, Moe music uh, that the singing is kind of off-key. This is less of a thing these days, now that autotune is more prevalent as, like, an industry standard tool. But when this song was made originally, it would have been expected that music would be sung kind of out of key. Uh, you know, it's... There's so many artists have made 
uh, an aesthetic out of singing kind of poorly, uh, that it's fine. It's fine. You don't have to try and cover it up and make it sound good. Even the original Japanese version is, like, not perfect, and that's fine. It has a little roughness, and that sounds good. So I don't think I could make a version where this is sung extremely technically proficiently, uh, but I could make a version that's, that that is honest about itself and doesn't say the word pleatly, which isn't a word, in case you haven't noticed by now. Pleatly is not a word. <laughs> Also, I changed my mind. I changed my mind. I'm not putting this on IDMR. I'm putting this on my main... On not, I don't know what's a main channel and what's a side channel anymore. My main YouTube channel for YouTube, not my music channel. The one that's spelt U0Y, that one. Backwards channel, that one. I feel like... I've been thinking for a while of changing the name of this channel. Um, but... Uh, yeah, because I decided, I've just come to the conclusion that I have very little desire to exclusively make super high effort like the Mario video videos. I have no desire to do that. That does not sound fun and engaging to me. That sounds boring and annoying to me. That sounds like making YouTube into a chore. I want to make those videos when I want to make those videos, and that's it. And I have, uh... I just want to make whatever, yeah, 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 you know what I'm trying to say, right? I don't, I, I, I there was a little second there where I felt like I was kind of pressured to, to I felt pressured to make other videos in that vein, and I don't have that pressure anymore. I feel comfortable making whatever the fuck I want to make, and if that means posting a seven hour long podcast, or it'll probably be longer than seven hours, but it's about seven hours so far. How are you doing, by the way? How are you hanging in here? It's been seven hours and you're still listening, so I assume you're enjoying something. I assume you're getting something out of this. Sorry for my terrible takes that I've had throughout this video. Just awful ones. In fact, one of them was so bad I had to delete it. One of my takes in this video was so bad <laughs> I had to delete it. How are you hanging in? Let me know. Wait, write me a comment. Let me know how you're hanging in. Uh, what are you up to making this video? What are you, oh, oh, sorry, what are you up to listening to this podcast? What what you got going on on the other monitor? What you got going on? Taking a walk? Playing a video game? Talking to friends? Uh, who am I kidding? You don't have any friends. Ha, look at you. You're a loser. <laughs> sorry, I don't know why. I'm sorry, that was so uncalled for. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, let me know. Let me know how it's going for you. How's life? I will be posting this on the Oi Naton Backwards channel. Uh, and, uh... <sighs> oh yeah, I'm posting, I'm posting that album that I mentioned earlier. By the time you listen to this, the album will be out. Uh, the album will be published. It will have been published for a while, actually. Maybe a couple of days, if I end up... Ten hours is a nice round number, you know? <laughs> we might send ten hours. Ten hours of podcast to relax slash study to. Although this is a less relaxing and studying podcast. Uh, so I'm not sure what to call it. I'm not sure what to call this. Uh... Yeah, I actually have no clue. The other one was easy because I knew what I was going to do. I knew I was going to copy that Penguafi podcast video in the title. I didn't know immediately, but I figured it out as a... Because, you know, originally it was a... I'm not, no, I said, I promised you I would not mention, so I will not mention. I remember. Anyway. Uh... Yeah, no idea what the fuck to call this. I was thinking of calling it... Wait, how many hours was the original one? I don't remember. Uh, what did I What did I call this? 
That was six hours. Oh, we already, we already beat, we've already beat the original. But this is a very different thing. That's the thing. That's the that's the problem here. Is that this this is, this is a, a completely different thing because it's like an hour. Like the first hour is just immediately me talking about like my life story and my life struggle and problems and stuff. You know. Uh. So we got we got a totally different vibe. Rather than like the fifteen minute chunks about random shit, we've got a totally different vibe going on here. So I kind of feel like I have to. I have to call it something different, because it doesn't, we don't, I, I feel like, I don't know if you could necessarily relax slash study to me just, like, telling you how fucked up I am, you know? Like, that's how it starts. I think people are, I think, it, I think you're gonna be like, I'm, I can't, this isn't comfy, relaxing podcast material, this is, like, you know, something else. I don't know what it is, but it's something else. I don't necessarily have a name for it. Uh, what if I called it unapologetically maximalist brackets podcast edition? But I don't think I'm going to be going for 12 hours. I think I'm going to be going... I was thinking... I don't know. I shouldn't... Aiming for a time. It can be fun. But I'm just going to do it until I feel like it's done. And... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, I, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what to call this video or podcast. I have thought I could put it off, but I feel, it feels like I'm approaching the end now. It feels like I'm approaching the last, the last stretch. Uh, so, so now I'm starting to feel like I need to think of, of a name. Uh. And I, I'll, I'll, I have to do that. <laughs> I mean, I could just describe, like, I think it's fine to just make, have the video just, dis the title should just describe the video. It should just be called, like, you know, uh, here's some podcasts. I don't know, maybe, maybe I'll just do that. Here's, here's a really long podcast. That's what I'll title the video. The video will be titled, here's a really long podcast. I think that's a good name. Maybe. Maybe I'll change my mind. You already know. If you're watching this, you already know what decision I made. This is back... It's like a backward situation. Normally, I'm... Actually, that's not true. Speaking of time, playing a game with projectile weapons is like staring into the universe. Because just like the Hubble Space Telescope looks into deep space and sees stars and galaxies as they were billions of years in the past. You, when you play soldier in TF2, stare the further away from yourself, the further you stare into the future. It's the reverse. It's backwards. It's interesting. It's, I don't know what it is. I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> I don't know where the fuck I'm going with this. You stare into the future because... The further away you look, the further you have to lead your shots, the more prediction you have to do. I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that. I kind of realized halfway through saying it that it was backwards. And I wasn't sure, wasn't sure what to do with that information. Well, I just did something a little out of character. Except it turned out to be extremely in character. Allow me to explain. I just went outside. It feels like it was a dream. I just went outside for the first time in over a month and a half, excluding one two-minute section where I had to go and check my gas meter for annoying reasons. But that doesn't really count, because it, I didn't step outside of my front yard type of situation. I barely stepped outside of the door. My gas meter is like about, let's say, 50 centimeters from the door. Uh, so yeah, I don't really count that. Uh, but maybe you want to count that. It doesn't matter to me. I just want to recount my experiences and you can make of them what you want. 
I think the the my level of hikikomoridom right now is like actually a problem. I've never felt that there was a problem before, and I don't feel that it's a problem mental health wise. I am quite happy to stay inside forever. I don't want to go outside. I don't want to do it. It's nice in here. I don't feel like I'm going insane. I don't feel like I'm trapped. I feel comfortable. I feel generally fine with being inside. No, the problem is my physical health. Um, I've been getting sick much more recently. And sure, everyone's been getting sick much more recently. There's just a lot of viruses going around. However, I can't help but feel like uh, my complete lack of any physical exercise and fresh air is... It can't be good for me. It just can't be. I also have been getting... I'm not losing any weight. (laughs) Let's just put it that way. Uh, Even though I don't eat like crazy. Osaka, when they came over here, was surprised that like I eat normal portion sizes and like, you know, maybe not like the healthiest food in the world, but nothing like super crazy most of the time. You know, I have a treat now and then, something a little more calorific from time to time as everyone does a pizza from time to time and so on but generally speaking especially now that I'm eating I've made like a concerted effort to eat more vegetables and I'm succeeding in that effort you know so so not as much as probably I should be but definitely much better than I was a month ago and I'm only going to get better from here hopefully um what I'm saying is my diet isn't the problem here you know, it's probably pretty average. Uh, the problem, you know, I'm what I'm saying is, I'm. It's not that I'm lo- gaining weight because I'm eating like a crazy person, and I don't even know if I haven't weighed myself in a while. So maybe I'm not gaining weight. I actually don't know. The problem must be that I do zero exercise most of the time. Your weight is determined primarily by your diet, but I think in this case, exercise is playing a pretty big role here. Because exercise lets you, I don't know, it does a bunch of stuff. I'm worried about my physical health due to my lack of going outside and just sitting on my bed all day. That's what I'm worried about. And uh, I don't want to play games with that, really, too much. It's getting a bit crazy at this point. So I've decided to try and make a little bit more of an effort to reintegrate myself into the outside world. Um, so I don't have that much food in the house Groceries are being delivered tomorrow, so this is like the end of like current grocery cycle, don't have that much food, kind of can't be bothered to cook something complicated, like the only things I have would be like an hour of cooking, it's kind of annoying, like a stew type of thing, maybe more, I don't know, it's just annoying, didn't want to make something from super scratch like that, so I figured, hey, you know what I found out not that long ago? There is, stop fucking messaging me retards. Um, there is a Greg's, there is a Greg's sort of in my neighborhood. There is a Greg's sort of in my neighborhood. It's not super close by, but it's, it is walkable. And I've been meaning to try and make that walk for a while. Um, so I thought this is a perfect opportunity. Uh, this did not go as planned. Uh, I stepped outside and I was immediately struck by everything looking kind of weird and warped and not quite how I remembered it. The scale of everything was off. Lighting didn't seem right. I'm not kidding you here. Like, this might seem like an exaggeration, but, the like, something was, something's deeply wrong with the world. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It wasn't that bad, but I felt but what this really culminated in is was a little bit, not super intense, but a, a bit of a sense of vertigo and panic creeping in. I started to panic almost immediately. I'd say two minutes into my walk, I started to panic. Uh, people were scary. The, w- the world was too bright. Everything was too loud. It was, it was not fun. I started to panic almost immediately. Um... And then I realized that my body is deteriorating very quickly 
and uh, I'm not going to be able to make this walk <laughs> because I have an ankle, I have this like ankle problem which seems to flare up at strange times unpredictably and I felt it starting to stress to flare up uh, about, you know, a few minutes into the, the, the my journey I felt my ankles starting to feel fucky and this ankle thing it, I don't know what it is. I've been to the doctors about it, and they, they didn't really know what it was either. Uh, yeah, and they didn't really help me either. <laughs> they didn't seem to really care. Uh, I don't think I did a good enough job convincing them that it was, like, a big deal. Um, the, the problem is that it comes up... It seems to happen at random times. Uh, like, it doesn't happen every time I take a long walk. I've had long walks where my ankles have been perfectly fine the entire time, not even noticeable, and then sometimes I walk for five minutes and it becomes unbearably painful when I have to sit down and wait, and it doesn't go away for, like, the pain doesn't go away for, like, half an hour. It it really sucks. It makes, it literally is debilitating. I can't fucking walk when it, because it's that painful to keep walking. Um... Now, my theory is that this is just because I don't walk enough and that, like, my muscles have atrophied or something has gone terribly wrong there and that, like, the the way to cure it is just to start walking regularly enough. But there's also the possibility that I have some sort of injury and that walking on it is only going to make it worse. So I don't know what the fuck's happening there. But I started to feel that happening and I was also panicking at this point and I realised I'm not going to make it all the way to Greg's. So instead, I just decided to go to the local shop and get a sandwich which was fine, nice sandwich, I enjoy a sandwich, um, but uh, I think this is, you know how fucked up I am? At one point, while freak, while I was panicking, uh, and I thought everyone was looking at me, I instinctively looked down and to my left to check my health, to check my health meter, to check on, to check on my health, <laughs> that's, that's how fucked up I am, I was like, like, without even thinking, I caught myself just sort of micro looking down and to the left to where, where your health would be. <laughs> isn't that, isn't that ridiculous? I think that's pretty fucking ridiculous. It's like there was one time when I was a teenager or like a, I don't know, 15, 14, whatever. I don't remember the age, but I had gotten really the first, my first period of being super, super into Minecraft. And I was playing, I like I had just gone into Minecraft and I spent a whole weekend pretty much playing Minecraft non-stop, and then uh, the next day, I went outside, and it was foggy outside, and my brain defaulted to just, like, like, uh, it's hard to explain, because it sounds like a joke, but it's sort of like how, you know, in a, like, in a dream, sometimes you just have knowledge, but no clear idea of where it came from, but you just know something, in this case, I walked outside and I just somehow knew, oh, I'm near bedrock, <laughs> because it was foggy. Uh, a little bit silly, a little bit of a silly time. And then I instantly laughed at myself for, because I noticed what just happened. It was a similar sort of thing, I think, uh, except pretty different context. But yeah, so that was not fun. I was really panicking and... Uh, yeah, I decided to take a shortcut, not take a shortcut, but just go to the shop and come straight back. But this has, this has definitely shown me that, uh, this is becoming a problem. Uh, I am not solving my issues of agoraphobia by staying inside. I am making them significantly worse. I'm aggravating my agoraphobia and I need to be working on slowly going outside more and more to exp exposure therapy myself into being less of a retard. I think my idea that I've been becoming more mainstream might have been wrong. Also, album is now out. Uh, looking back at my last albums, <laughs> it's been Dead Form, which has a few more poppy more catchy, riffy songs on it. But then, I made ADHD, which is pretty, like, ambient, noisy, drone metal, doom metal, weird stuff. Uh, and Lama Yoroisku, 
which is DSPM, and now Total Organ Failure. I don't, yeah. Maybe I'm not going mainstream. Maybe I'm not going mainstream at all. Maybe I need to make another Yes Thank You album. You know, I have a Yes Thank You album called uh, Men Have a Moment. Just raring to go. I might just put, put that out somewhere. I don't know. I don't like it, but everyone else who I've shown it to likes it. I, I, it's been a, I made it a year ago, and I only released it on, uh, well, I released it in a very strange way. I released, like, a very low-quality MP3-ified version on one of Osaka's side channels with the title in Russian, uh, which is impossible to find, and no one listened to it, and it doesn't sound very good because it's all mp 3 Uh So, yeah, I don't know. You know, here's a hot take. I actually like random crits in TF2. I think random crits are unironically fair and balanced. It's fun. You do a bit of gamba. You're playing TF2, and suddenly there's a bit of gamba. It's fun. That's all I care about. Is it fair? Yes, because everyone has access to random crits. No no one has an unfair advantage over anyone else, because the chance of random crits is the same for everyone on the server. Does it feel bad when you die to a random crit? It feels kind of bad. Does it feel great when you kill someone else to a random crit? Yeah, feels great. Some people say that it feels unearned. It doesn't feel unearned. Not to me, at least. Because, you know, the the point is that you don't know when it's going to happen. So you have to, pl- you have to always play as if you're not going to get one. You can't rely on getting a random crit with most weapons, right? You have to always play as if you're not going to get a crit. So, the fact that it's like you're just sometimes rewarded a little bit extra for being a good player. Rare high moments, as Gaben said. I think it was Gaben about random crits. Just a just a occasional little dopamine bloop to remind you that you're you're having a good time playing the game. Uh, um, that's kind of the one thing I don't like about Uncle Topia is that they don't have random crits. It's not a massive problem. Uh, I don't use any weapons that really make advantage of, like, take a big advantage of random crits. Like, the Scotsman Skull Cutter, I believe, relies pretty heavily on crits to be useful, but I don't use that. Uh... <sighs> Uh, yeah, so it doesn't really matter that much to me. Uh, but I just think it's kind of cool that they're in the game. Like, uh, yeah, I don't know. Everyone hates them. I've never understood it. Yeah, do, do, they, do, do random quits belong in competitive 6v6? No, fuck no. Fuck no, they do not. I'm. They should not be in that game mode, obviously. But in casual, hell yeah, put them in. I like it. Should anyone play competitive 6v6? No. It I it looks like the most boring thing ever in the universe. I I've tried to watch Six's like gameplay and I do not understand the appeal. Uh I mean I can see that there are people who play this game mode are extremely high skilled. Some of the the most high-skilled gamers I've ever seen. Like, these guys are absolutely cracked. Like, you look at these guys, and they're just cracked. Everything about their gameplay is just cracked. Them And how important movement is. Like, their rollouts are cracked. Their aim is insane. Their teamwork is insane. Their comms are insane. Everything's insane. They're fucking cracked. 
right? These guys are insane who play like high level competitive 6v6 TF2. But all of that being said, it was, I've never had, it's not fun to watch in the same way like competitive CSGO is fun to watch, in my opinion. I, I, there were occasional pog airshot moments and stuff, but, but generally speaking, uh, no, I don't understand the appeal and it does not, it does not look fun to play at all. It does not, I don't understand why anyone would play sixes. If there's not enough players, it's not enough. You need more. You need more players than that. I don't get it. Like, half the classes in the game become unviable. <laughs> What's that about? You, you, It's just uh, medic, scout, soldier, and demo. That's it. Like, I don't get it. What's the point? Whatever. Hey, have fun playing playing comp if that's if that's what you really want i'm sure that the game mode is super tuned to maximize having the highest possible skill ceiling and that's why it's only 6v6 and that's why those are the only viable classes i'm, sh I'm sure that's all true uh yeah but it doesn't look fun to me I like random crits. I like, I like when the game goes, tihi. And then you is it low cheeky, and you get a you get a random crit. That's fun. Maybe maybe I'm just a Counter Strike player, and that's why I'm okay with critical with random random crits. Because Counter Strike is all about managing randomness because every part of the game is good. You know, there's an image which uh, describes Counter-Strike as a gun with a, a dice on the end and the bullet being affected by the dice. Because every behavior in Counter-Strike is going to have some impact on the randomness of where your bullet goes. And you as the player, your job is to have a complex understanding of that randomness and judge what sort of risks you think are appropriate at what sort of times. And uh, I think this is one of the things that's so great about the game, is that you can turn it into a slot machine where you go for jump shots all the time, or something like that. Or you can turn it into a highly competitive shooter where there is very little random chance involved at all you minimize that entirely now obviously you always want to minimize randomness but you can't and sometimes the trade-off is worth it like if you're right next to a guy uh and you have an ak there are lots there are times when it is appropriate to break the rules of Counter-Strike and strafe while shooting or, you know, run and gun a little bit to make yourself harder to hit because you're so close to the guy that the random randomness, the movement inaccuracy, isn't going to have that much of an impact. There, You learn to judge these sorts of things. The whole game is centered around managing randomness, having, building up an instinctual understanding of chance when you shoot your weapon. 
and uh, maybe that's why I'm more okay. And obviously, this has not prevented Counter Strike from becoming the biggest comparative FPS in the world. People don't mind it. It's a little tricky to get your head around at first, but once you do, it's genius. How do you guide players down a specific playstyle? You don't have to ban it, you just have to nudge them by saying, well, you could do that, but if you do this, the likelihood of you succeeding is increased. And if you do this, the likelihood of your bullet going in some random direction is increased where you didn't aim. And doesn't it, you know, you, you you don't want your bullet to go where you didn't aim. That feels bad. But you could have avoided this by having better movement or whatever. Whereas in TF2, it's not really there to punish um, undesirable playstyles. It's just there to be a sort of background element. But maybe that's why I'm okay with it, because I'm just used to navigating randomness. But maybe not. Maybe I'm okay with it because I just haven't sunk enough hours into TF2 and I don't really understand it. I will say, there is a very good argument against random crits, which is, if they didn't exist in the game... If they had never existed in the game, no one would be asking for them. There are lots of people, because they do exist, there are people like me, not as many people as want them removed, I think, uh, from my impression. Uh, but there are, you know, a niche of people who uh, say, no, keep them, they're cool, they feel good, they feel pog or whatever. There are, there are a niche of people. But if they had never existed, no one in their right mind would be saying, the game's good, but what it really needs is is a, the random chance for you to do like way more damage for no reason. No one would be saying that. <laughs> and so I think that's a pretty good like example of the sort of lopsidedness, where it's like, well, you say you want it in the game, but I can't imagine you independently suggesting this you know, maybe maybe you're just resistant to change. I don't think I'm resistant to change. I haven't had enough time to get used to anything to be resistant to change. I just think I'm bad at the game and like it when the game rewards me for no reason. And also, I've seen Counter-Strike. You know what some of the most popular, famous moments in Counter-Strike are? Like, the, 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 the in, impossibly famous Cold Zero jumping orb shots? Like... That's RNG. He got lucky. The Cookley jump shot. Yeah, he was hacking, but he wasn't. He didn't have jump hacks. That was luck. That was RNG, and it was fucking pog, because you calculate the. You do a risk benefit analysis, right? Your Cookley in that situation, or Kelly, or however you pronounce his name, right? He's banned anyway. Back banned for cheating. First big pro to get back banned if you don't know about Counter-Strike lore. Uh, but uh, there's a, a famous clip where he was retaking and uh, he just got, went for a random pistol jump shot uh, and hit it, and it, it won him the round. That's a, that's a good calculated risk. You know, people might say that's RNG or bullshit or whatever, but the fact is, going for that jump shot is incredibly unlikely to actually do anything. Like, nine times out of ten, you are not... I mean, more than that. More than nine times out of ten. I think Three Clicks Philip actually tested how unlikely it was. I, I don't remember what what result he got. But, um, like, that, that pistol shot, generally, the vast majority of the time, does not connect. Uh, but, jumping up to peak that angle... No one expects you to do it. No one's pre-aiming you there. By the time they flick, you've already, you know, you only peek your head over for a, a split second. The chances of you actually dying from that are extremely low. It's pretty much low risk, uh, 
and low reward because the chances that you actually hit anything are extremely low and the chances that you take any damage from it are extremely low. It was pretty much just sort of a fidget. Like, you may as well go for it because the one time it works, it's going to be fucking sick. And that is fair because, you know, maybe the other team should aim better. There is, it's still possible to flick and headshot someone who jumps up like that to peek. It's possible. It's difficult, but it's possible. And, you know, it's as difficult. It's easier to hit a skill-based flick shot than it is to rely on random chance to hit a headshot jumping. You know what I'm saying? It makes sense. It makes sense. That's all I'm saying. And it's a pog moment. Everyone remembers it. Cold Zero jumping orb shots. Everyone remembers it. Pog moment. Those jumping orb shots shouldn't be in the game. I've always been really surprised that people really like this moment because this Cold Zero is an excellent Counter-Strike player. This is not a skill-based moment. Okay, this is a pure luck jumping orb no-scope moment. <laughs> this is not a... Like, he's he's an excellent... One of the, the all-time greatest Counter-Strike players who has pulled off some insane plays. And the thing he's most known for is getting really, really lucky once. Uh, it's it's strange. It's a strange thing. But the thing is, it's calculated. That's what pose do. Anyway, it's cool. I don't remember if I already talked about this, but uh, there are a lot of people in the CSGO community who repeat, who parrot the phrase, Valve doesn't care about CSGO. Valve doesn't care about Counter-Strike. Valve doesn't care. Valve doesn't care. Blah, blah, blah. Valve, the, I want to I wanna say two things here. Firstly, Valve clearly cares about Counter-Strike. They don't care that much, but they probably want it to be like fairly playable, since it's a pretty big cash cow for them. However, they don't care that much like other companies would, because they have an infinite money printing machine in the form of Steam. Even if everyone decided to stop playing their games tomorrow, they would still be one of the most valuable games companies. I mean, we don't know how valuable they are because they're not publicly listed, but uh, given that Gabe Newell owns a super yacht, I'm pretty sure they're quite valuable. Uh, so that's the first thing. Is like, does I don't know. I don't know what that means. You can decide for yourself what that means. Uh, <laughs> but... Like, the the thing is, you don't need Valve to care about your game as long as Valve gives the community tools to care about the game for them. This is, like, the hack that Valve has figured out, and it's actually better this way, because the community knows what people want. Just as I was talking about earlier with TF2, Valve has completely abandoned TF2, effectively, uh, but they have given the community tools to do what they want with the game and set up their own servers, and so you get things like Skial and Uncle Topia and stuff like that, which are essentially just a fan being like, fine, I'll do it myself. Uh, Counter-Strike has the same sort of thing in the form, maybe not fans, you know, they're kind, it's kind of a different dynamic, but Counter-Strike has Face It and ESEA and so on. But also, Counter-Strike is nowhere near as fucked as TF2 is. Like, TF2 ha is, like... TF2 casual servers are unplayably broken with bots. Uh, it's not just a lack of new content. Uh, I mean, there is obviously a massive lack of new content and updates, uh, but there are mapping tools and community servers. You can always find something new to do in TF2, and you can also always find something new to do in CSGO. There are probably game modes that you've never tried. There are game modes in the community server browser that you've never played. Have you played Zombie Mod? Have you played, like, the two different variations of Zombie Mod? Have you played um, uh, HNS? Have you played KZ? Like, there's so many various different game modes to try and skills to practice, 1v1 servers, you know, there's a million different ones. I don't know why. Everyone's always talking. This is the the weird thing. This is, like, a weird brain thing. There's a There's a push right now. A little bit. It's like a, it's been bubbling under the surface for a few years that like Valve should add an official version of the 1v1 game mode. Why? 
the Gibbon V1 game mode already exists and is good. Valve is just going to butcher it. Why do you want this? <laughs> For what purpose? You can go in the server browser right now and find a million 1v1 servers that are set up exactly how you want them to be set up. Why do you want Valve to do it? There's nothing wrong with these servers. L seriously, what is wrong with these servers? The only thing is that they like have occasional adverts that's a bit annoying and that they sometimes play loud, obnoxious music, which you can normally toggle off. Uh, like when you win, a lot of them, they have like, when you win, they play like an EDM song. It's kind of annoying, but normally there's a way to turn that off. Uh, the ads are a little more complicated, but uh, I, I don't I don't know. They normally are not very intrusive. It's not really a problem. I've never even really noticed them. Uh, I know they exist, but yeah. Why do you want Valve to do this? <laughs> like, you want it to also be unsupported? You want their, like, tiny Counter-Strike team to be stretched even thinner? Why? It's literally, it's pointless. It's it's a, it's a silly idea. We already have the thing. Why? It, it, it's this weird, you know, modern Zuma ideology that, like, it's not real unless the creators of the game themselves deem it to be official. Like, oh yeah, well I may be able to get frags on 1v1 servers, but like that doesn't count because Valve hasn't given me the stamp of approval to say it's real. This is an insane logic. This is not how video games used to work and it is, it is, it is backwards. It's a backwards way of thinking about it. Why is that the case? Explain yourself. It's silly. I don't understand. Um, but does Valve care about CSGO? No. Valve doesn't care about you. Valve doesn't care about anything. A lot of people like to praise Valve's openness. Me included. But in my opinion, Valve are doing the bare minimum. It's just that every other developer is so far behind and just disgustingly awful in terms of allowing community support that Valve seems really, really good. But saying for example releasing the steam deck and then saying hey look it's yours to modify as you please it is your pc after all is not like shouldn't be something worth praising that is like that should just be standard default stuff like i'm glad that valve has taken a stance on right to repair um like i'm i'm happy that there's a big company that supports that sort of thing but at the same time that should be the default. Like, that shouldn't require, like, oh, Valve is so amazing for letting us do this. No, Valve is not... Because the second that openness threatens any of their products, they 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 suddenly switch up. There's multiple situations where this has been the case. The biggest two are Open Fortress and Counter-Strike Classic Offensive, both of which are mods for... TF2 and CSGO, respectively, which, uh, if released, may compete with the main game. And so Valve has basically blacklisted those developers from getting access to the tools they need to create their mods, which I think is, frankly, fucked up, because both of those projects are super cool. Now, uh, Open Fortress is doing okay. They've They've found workarounds, and I, I think what, I don't remember, there's a, there's a long story about, like, the history of Open Fortress, where uh, they, like, were in contact with Valve, and then Valve, like, suddenly ghosted them, then didn't respond, and then I think that they were just like, well, we're going to keep trying to get in contact with you, but you're not responding to us, so fuck it, if you don't respond to us, we're just going to put the game back up, and then they never got a response, and they put the game back up, I think is what happened. Um, but as far as I remember, there were, like, developer tools, source code, SDK stuff that they aren't allowed access to. Uh, and on uh, Classic Offensive side, it's way worse because they really need these SDK tools and Valve refuses to give it to them. Uh, and it's a really interesting mod. Like, Classic Offensive could be... Huge. I mean, there's a vi there's multiple videos about Classic Offensive by like Felix Philip, which have millions of views. It's clearly a mod which has a lot of appeal. 
it would probably be very big. Um, but classic offensive, uh, in order to exist, needs SDK tools. Now, the fucked up thing is, the guys who make classic offensive, they know they could hack the game and implement the features they want. I don't know how, they're all geniuses, but they know like they could hack the source code in order to implement the, the features and create their mod. But if they did that, they wouldn't be allowed to release their game on Steam. And so for some reason, they refuse to do this. In my opinion, just release the game not on Steam. I, I understand why, like you will not get a bigger player base if you don't release it on Steam. But the thing is, this is literally what Valve wants. Valve is sitting there like, well, hold on, we're not going to let you make a free competitor to Counter-Strike that doesn't have predatory skins and gambling mechanics and uh, is actually supported by a community who cares about it. We're not going to let you do that. Hold on, that would compete. If you're going to make Counter-Strike without skins, no, 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 because then people might switch over and then no one's going to no one's gonna buy our loot crates anymore. You know, all of the problems in the gaming industry come from Valve directly, innovate, quote-unquote innovating. Like, predatory loot box stuff all comes from Valve. Microtransactions all comes from Valve. The Fortnite emotes comes from TF2. Everything comes from Valve. Like, they, they somehow managed to pull it off in a way that feels, like, semi-natural and doesn't interrupt the gameplay too much. But other companies didn't. And oftentimes, Valve fucks up too. The agent skins in CSGO are a big example of this. Everyone knows that they're fucked. Valve refused to remove them. Uh, everyone agrees that hey, there's no re- like agent skins should not be allowed in competitive play. They are not conducive to competitive mechanics. But they're not banned in tournaments because Valve won't let them. Valve is not your friend. Valve is not a good company. They they won't even open source the gold source engine. They, people have been asking them to open source the gold source. Kind of annoying to say, open source the gold source engine for years. And Valve have sort of said, "Oh, we'd love to do that. Yeah, that's a great idea." And then never done it. Why not? It would take no. It would take no time. You just do it. It would take a day of like work, pretty much. And do you know how much amazing shit could be created if they did that? It'd be wonderful. Now I believe. I, don't don't quote me on this. I, I'll need to double check this, but I think there's like an open source clone or decomp or something of Gold Source. I don't remember, uh, but that's interesting. Uh, so yeah, you know, it, it it like let's just clarify this. Like Valve is not a company that likes you. They do a lot of fucked up shit in their games, and as a company. You know they have they have a a weird organizational structure. Everyone knows this by now. Uh, that has like various advantages, but also various disadvantages. Um, they, uh, but I'm honestly I can't be too upset with you know I can't be like oh Valve employees are victims because they are like so well paid for the games industry. Everyone knows that you go to work at Valve, you get paid out the wazoo. Even you know they have like a really bad system where you like get paid ba- you get bonuses based on how your co-workers rank you which has always i really hate shit like that um but your base salary is already really fucking high so like t- it doesn't matter that much <laughs> like yeah the bonuses are, are nice. like it's weird to not know how much of a bonus you're gonna get and that's dependent on your co-workers ranking you but that only is really matters if your base salary isn't that much and if you work at Valve, you're already making fucking bank as like a baseline. So, you know, I can't really pity these guys that much. Uh, no, the real problem with Valve is, as people keep making jokes, like, oh, Valve, Valve is just a small indie developer. They should not be a small indie developer. Like, they, they are doing a disservice to their own community. I mean, to be fair, the fact that they are small and insulated allows them to create stuff that other companies wouldn't do. And that's kind of interesting, and they're a, they're a weird kind of anomaly in that sense. But they also just don't... I don't know. I don't know. I'm not here to talk too much about Valve in, in internal structure. There's already a bunch of videos about this. Um, I just want to say that, like, Valve's openness 
it should be the default for every game. There is, yeah, you know, you know, you know what I'm saying here. Like that should not require praise. That should just be how video games are. And for a really long time, it was how video games were. Like this isn't actually Valve innovating and creating this like, you know, open space for players. This is just Valve not moving on from the nineties because that's when they they were all gamers in the nineties who liked that stuff. And so they just and you know, they just kept doing it because that was what was standard then and they have chosen not to move on. Every other company is just exception it's not the valve aren't evil it's just that every other video like triple a developer is exceptionally evil i think at some point a lot of social media just sort of stopped working on me it was a it, it's been sort of slowly happening over the course of like a year uh for example about a year ago when i was in uh a when I was in bad depressive slumps or periods of intense brain fog, uh, one of the things I would do is watch TikTok compilations. I know it's very extremely cringe, but I was in a state where I couldn't focus on anything or do anything. And that was like my default. And I would end up getting sucked down these rabbit holes where I'd watch these TikToks for like hours. And this is a common experience with the app. Like, everyone talks about TikTok being like this. Like, I've never actually installed the app myself or used it. Um, but I've used YouTube Shorts, which I guess is kind of similar. And I've had similar things with YouTube Shorts as well. Where in the past, you know, I would be on the toilet and I'd watch a YouTube Short because no ads or whatever. And, uh, you know, I'd end up watching, like, 50 because you just keep going and it just keeps recommending you more and it's, you, you know, it sucks you down the rabbit hole. But then, over time, it just stopped working on me. I have not watched a TikTok compilation in, like, a year. <laughs> you know, like, who wants to do that? At some point, you know, it used to be that I had to, like, actively avoid it because I was scared that I would end up getting sucked down a rabbit hole and, and this addictive cycle would continue. But then at some point... I just try and watch a TikTok and I'm just like, this is fucking awful. What am I watching? And I just stop. And YouTube shorts are the same. Like, I don't find them interesting or I don't know. They did the whatever addictive thing was working on me before suddenly stopped working. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. And Twitter is the same, obviously. Like, I already talked about that earlier in this video. At some point, Twitter stopped working on me. Like, these things just stopped working on me for some reason. I don't, I don't really know why, but I'm pretty fucking happy it happened, because I feel like my life is better now, and I wish this would happen to more people. The world would probably be a better place if everyone suddenly lost the ability to find this stuff interesting. Uh, yeah, like, people, you know, people, I, I admit, like, it's cringe to watch TikTok compilations. I, I accept it, and I agree. Uh, I also think that, like, everyone, like, the amount of population that's on TikTok is fucking insane. Uh, and uh, honestly, I maybe this is kind of a lib take, but I think TikTok needs to be regulated by the government in the same way. I think, our, and so I think the EU is actually starting to do this. I think our algorithm, algorithmic recommendation uh, sites need to be regulated in the same way gambling is regulated, especially for children. Uh, I think... In China, you know, Douyin is the same as TikTok, but much more heavily regulated by the government. And the uh, the content that you find on there is generally educational and uh, much less sort of, you know, TikTok, <laughs> TikTok-y. It's much more uh, informative and better in every way, as far as I've heard. Maybe that's less interesting to a lot of people, uh, but... I think that those sort of regulations should be, in, you know, maybe, hey, maybe, maybe you can say this is like against free speech on the internet, but TikTok isn't the internet. TikTok is a platform. Platforms don't count. This is this is my my general take. Uh, <clears throat> these days, is that yeah, it's bad. I think it's bad that the that mainstream social media websites have obstructed free speech. I think it's bad. 
However, I also think that the real problem comes when uh, you can't host whatever speech you want on your own website. If you, uh, if your government is censoring you from making your own website where you say whatever fucked up degenerate shit you want to say, and then your government comes to you and says that's bad, you can't do that. That's when it's a that's when it's a real fucking problem. Like if that happens, I have no like that's very bad, and that can happen in countries like the UK and Canada, uh, and and obviously you know even countries that have stricter censorship like like China. Um, that can happen, and I do not think that's good. But if you go on Twitter and expect to be able to say whatever you want without getting banned, and then see the one that doesn't happen, it serves you fucking right for using social media. Like, this the, this Elon Musk idea that Twitter is the de facto public square is insane and retarded, and no one should allow this to happen. Twitter needs to be regulated out of existence or something, I don't know. It, it just needs to stop existing. Uh... I, 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 don't, I don't know. I have very little sympathy for people who expect to be able to say whatever they want on mainstream social media websites. Uh, I, I just, like, oh, but that's where all the audience is. Because you're the audience. Because you're, you're, because you're doing that. To, you, you're participating in that. If you start unparticipating, more and more people will, will unparticipate. And this happens in real life. Like, this has happened... Uh, and it's continuing to happen, and it will only happen more and more. I already kind of talked about this. Uh, so, yeah, at this point, I think if you are... Uh, I mean, obviously, there are some forms of content that are just hard to self-host, like live streams, for example. And in that case, I do think it's it's a, it's more acceptable to get mad at companies for censoring you. Um, uh, especially when these systems are so abusable by uh, groups of you know, internet activists who have a uh, a vendetta against you or trolls who have a vendetta against you. Like, these systems are very easily abusable and that's something that is bad and needs to be fixed. But it's also an inherent problem with the centralization of the internet. And uh, <clears throat> maybe, you know, it's if it's that difficult to host live stream content, if you need some megacorp, then... You know, no one's forcing you to do it, I guess. Uh, I'm sure it's possible to self-host live streams. Uh, I don't know the, the too many details about how this works. Like, I think hosting one of your own live streams on some platform is probably not that hard. It's probably, it probably gets exponentially more difficult the more streams you're trying to host at once. That's normally how it works. Uh, so, you know, I, I just think... Uh, and, you know, I think Destiny has a pretty good setup here, right? He has his, like, destiny.gg website plus the YouTube streams, which is, like, an interesting way of circumventing this. I think that more things like that are probably a good idea. Uh, I think more streamers should probably have things like that. Uh, mo- most, most streamers don't want to because they don't value this kind of thing, right? Most streamers are, like, uh, some sort of corporate entertainment factory. Uh, which is kind of strange. Um, anyway, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, free speech on the internet. Yeah, I, I only think it really becomes a problem. Like, I, don't, I don't think it's, a, it's too big of a problem that social media platforms uh, have increased censorship because I just don't use those platforms very much. I mean, I suppose I still use YouTube and um, Discord, uh, although I, I have a perfectly working alternative to Discord that I also use equally as much, and I have gone through periods of months where I have not used Discord and had zero problems in my life, really. So, uh, you know, I'm Discord is not something I'm super reliant on or particularly invested in. If Discord bans my account for saying mean things or using third-party clients, uh, that's fine. Well, that won't really affect me. Uh, YouTube, on the other hand, is a little harder to escape. As I said before, I think YouTube is the final boss of internet centralization. It's just kind of the hardest one to kill because hosting that much video for free is just something that no other... It's very hard to match. 
I think peer-to-peer -peer software will have to improve significantly in order to create a, a viable alternative um, in terms of uh, accessibility and, and you know, just quality. I do think it's possible. Uh, you know, there are obviously platforms like Odyssey, which work fine. Uh, and uh, Peertube also works fine. It's just Peertube is not... I have trouble... I have trouble with Peertube. Like, I have trouble... How do I put it? If you're trying to make a YouTube alternative, that's... I don't think Peertube is the way to go about it. Because it's quite different, but it looks similar. And that's kind of hard for people to wrap their heads around, if you understand what I mean. Like, the actual way Peertube functions is not very comparable to YouTube. But on the surface, it looks like the same thing. And I think that gets in the way of people understanding how it works. Uh, and that, that, therefore, gets in the way of, a, like, general adoption. However, there is one fun thing you can do, which is just use, like, just piggyback on these megacops. Just say fuck them and just use their services while you still can without offering them anything. Use Invidious. This is the actual solution, I think, as of right now. It's not necessarily sustainable, but I think this is the optimal solution as of right now, which is just use YouTube via Invidious, and you circumvent all of the, the Google fuckery, all of the, the Google glowiness, and so on, while still being able to take advantage of all of their services for free, without ads, and without tracking. It's a giant middle finger to Google, which I think is something everyone wants to do. So, use Invidious, uh, and I think that's probably the most sustainable way. To, I, I would recommend the people who watch my videos use Invidious. Uh, and uh, it's, you know, Invidious, unlike Peertube, is easy to understand and works the same way as YouTube. Uh, it looks like YouTube, and it, it doesn't look exactly... You know what I'm trying to get at, right? Like, there's no sort of trick. There's no there's no sleight of hand going on, uh, which makes it kind of obfuscated. Obviously, Peertube is not actually obfuscated, but uh, maybe what I'm saying doesn't make any sense to you people. Uh, I, <laughs> it makes sense to me. Uh, so, yeah, I think, uh, I think that kind of sums it up. You, social media stopped working on me at some point, aside from YouTube, and... Uh, yeah. I just played TF2 for about 10 hours. Uh, <clears throat> my voice is going for some reason. Even though I wasn't really... I briefly had a Discord call with someone, but it didn't feel like it went on for that long. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I just played TF2 for like 10 and a half hours. That was really fun. You know, what a good, what a good game. What a fun game. I, uh, I need to get a little better at Scout now. I think that's going to be my next, my next class that I learn is, is going to be Scout. And then maybe, uh, maybe NG. I know, a little strange, a little, little bit of a strange pick, but I actually have no idea how to play NG. And uh, I feel like that might be, uh, kind of fun. Uh, especially because I really like... I think, you know, now that I've played quite a few maps, uh, I think Upward is probably my favorite map so far. And Upward is very NG-centered. So that sounds fun to me. PL Upward. Good map. Very well designed. Genius, I would say. Uh, lots of the TF2 payload maps are just really cleverly designed, the way that, like, it becomes gradually harder to push the cart forward, like, exponentially until the last, the final, final checkpoint, where, uh, like, seeing how you, like, just with pure map design, how you give one team an advantage over the other is really interesting to me. Anyway, um, TF2 is fun. Scout is also really fun. I feel like when you play Scout, it's very different, you know, the, I was, at first, I was so against class-based mechanics, but now I'm so for class-based mechanics. Like, it's like you can play nine different games. It's insane. 
uh, I'm still not totally, like, there's definitely a trade-off. Like, the fact that uh, pyros exist <laughs> kind of sucks for me. Uh, but they do, it's, uh, like, again, I'm not, I don't think py I don't, I don't know if I said it again, I feel like I've said this before. I don't think pyros should be removed from the game. They definitely are an important class to play, and as much as I might, as much as they have a, a kind of a, a, a lower skill floor, than other classes, like it's quite easy to WM1 with Scout and get kills even if you're not very good. Scout does have a very high skill ceiling and like it does require skill to actually, sorry, Pyro does have a very high skill ceiling and does require skill to get like big combos with and actually do well with. And uh, I mean you can see that at like the highest pro level, Pyro is not that good. Like, Pyro obviously has a really big weakness, which is ranged weapons uh, that aren't projectiles. Ranged, like, you know, snipers and demo. Although, I, f I really suck at fighting scouts. I mean, fuck. I really suck at fighting Pyros as demo. Like, this is, like, my biggest weakness, is I, I just... I, I, I get fucking rolled by Pyros, and this is why I hate them. But, anyway... That's all. A, that's all. Just a side point. What I actually wanted to say is this: a little bit of self advice or something. Don't get memed by memes. Don't allow yourself to be memed by memes. What do I mean by this? Well, there's there's a saying of like like falling for the meme. You know, like, uh, he fell for the meme of blah, blah, blah. He fell for the meme of X, Y, Z, right? Don't fall for the meme of memes. Literal memes. Because these are, like, the one thing that keeps a lot of people on predatory social media websites. And you're, you know, and I think memes are fun... But the real problem is that everyone sees social media as the real place to post your memes. Except this isn't even so much the case anymore, because a lot of people post them on Discord these days, which I guess is also social media. But sort of Discord and Twitter are like the main meme mills these days. Uh, and avoid, you know, if you want to avoid those in your life... You're going to be in a situation where people are sharing memes and you don't have any funny ones to share. You're going to end up in that situation. And it's going to feel bad. But then you have to remember that in order to get these memes, these people, you know, was it worth it? No, it's not worth it. The answer is it's not worth it. The answer is that these memes are constructions of... They're basically psyops, is what I'm saying here. Uh, and what we really need to be doing is you need to be stealing memes from every place on the internet and we need to create we need to create a new place and that new place needs to be called the meme the meme place <laughs> and that's where everyone posts their memes and it's going to be free and open source software and distributed and so on maybe maybe on it's going to be on fchan remember fchan does fchan still exist fchan.xyz did it die i think it died pool closed uh, F channel. I think it died. Maybe. F channel index. Aha. This is what I want, right? Uh, where's the fucking. Am I brain dead retarded? What? As a experienced neat, I've been thinking of doing a video about this for so long. Like, actual neat tips from someone who has been a neat for a really long time at this point and, you know, knows, I think I know my shit. I've just kind of struggled because the thing is, there is no secret to being a neat. The secret is that there is no secret. That there's only two ways that anyone is ever a neat. Uh, the way one is, uh, there's only really, let's say three ways, um, because the, the first way is you're a neat because you live with your parents and you mooch off of them, or your parents pay for your existence somehow, 
Way two is you have neat bucks or autism bucks, you're getting money from the government. Those are the only two ways that it ever happens. And the third way is there is some exceptional circumstance. Now I happen to be in camp three, but most, like the vast majority of neats are in camps one and two. Uh, uh, you're either mooching off your parents or you're getting money from the government. Uh, I think everyone should be getting money from the government in the form of some sort of universal basic income, but I digress. Uh, so, the you know, you see a lot of threads. I used to see threads on Lane Chan back in the day. Uh, how to make money being a neat, or like how to make money online and stuff. And there would be people talking about drop shipping and Amazon Mechanical Turk, you know, the standard shit that we've all heard before. All of that is bullshit. There's only one way to actually make money online. There's, there's only one way. It's to, to do, to participate in the retarded creator economy. You just be a, be, you have a couple of options. You can be a YouTuber and uh, if you just want to make money, it's, it's not that hard actually. I, I imagine everyone knows how to do it because we're all aware of shameless YouTubers, right? Like we're all aware of what it takes to be a shameless money hungry view clickbait YouTube channel, right? Everyone knows what that takes, but people don't want to do it because it feels soul sucking. Which is fair enough, I suppose. Like, if you're doing that, chances are you're not having fun doing that, right? So it may as well just be a job. Are you really a neat anymore? Uh, but you're not going to make any money being a Twitch streamer or a YouTuber if you're not doing that. You're just not. Uh, you're not going to blow up. None of that's going to happen. Um, you can take my option, which is just be a genius musician I happen to be a genius musician, most people aren't, but you can become a genius musician if you just work at it really hard um, for a long time. Uh, you, you can probably do that. I'm sure that you also have to have good genetics, but you can probably just become a genius musician like me. Uh, but even if you are a genius musician like me, the problem with being a genius is that no one, is that, that people, the, the, you're, you're not going to be popular until you're dead. Uh, so that's fine. Uh, you know, no one's, uh, let's just put it this way. By the way, if it's not clear, I'm, this is dry British sarcasm. <laughs> uh, when I say genius. Anyway, uh, uh, yeah, you make fun music like Total Organ Failure Horizon, and it's not exactly going to blow up. Let's be real here. Uh, but, you know, you make a couple of good songs, make, get, them, get them fairly popular, it'll be fine. Uh, in fact, I think I need to post more of my singles on... Um, I posted my singles on Spotify. How's it you see right through me doing on Spotify? I actually have no idea. Uh, I'm curious, kind of. Spotify. Does it tell me how many views this has? Um, hold on, I think I need to sign in. This is, this is a little confusing. I've never quite understood how Spotify works. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what this is. Anyway, Total Organ Failure Horizon is uh, going to be on all of your streaming services at some point. It's going to be there at some point. Uh, they take a while to accept these sorts of things. Uh, but it sounds like this, if you haven't heard it yet, which you really should have. I mean, come on, go listen to it. It's funny. What the hell is this? I just... I <laughs> Wait, what the fuck? I forgot about this. DistroKid will automatically generate, like, little meme videos for you. 
I just I, Mars. Wait, make one with your song. Uh, let's let's do this. This sounds funny. Okay. <laughs> Okay, two minutes in two minutes time I will show you that that thing. Uh but no you no, the the world the point is the world isn't some video game where there's some secret way to make infinite money as a neat. The secret way to make infinite money as a neat is to uh, uh, have autism or some sort of disability and then bug the government about it until they decide to give you money. That's the only way. And it, I mean, there's also actually there is a there is there you know what there is actually a secret hidden fourth way there is secret video game cheat uh, fourth optimal strategy which is arguably the best strategy for being a neat this is the fourth and hidden neat strategy which is you just grow all of your own food and live with, like in the inner woods that's that's the fourth optimal neat strategy is you just grow all of your own food and go live in the woods or something. Uh, also, here's the here's the vi here's the video. It's a friends meme. I've never seen friends. I think this is friends. It's some sort of American si situational comedy. I just I... Marcel, where are you going with that disc? <laughs> you are not putting that on again, Marcel. Okay, if you press that button, you are in very very big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> this is really funny. I'm gonna post this in the Discord. <laughs> this is really funny. They didn't expect anyone to make weird music, you know. Okay, I'm I'm posting that. That's pretty fucking good. Uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, yeah. There's no secret to being a neat. You just have to. Uh, be born rich or be you know something i would explain this i just did, did, got run over this three times why did i start recording this i think i was just thinking about drop shipping that's why because i remember people on lane chan back in the day being like you can do drop shipping and then other people being like you haven't been able to do drop shipping for like four years there was a brief moment where you could but now the market like the the margins are so slim you can't do it anymore uh, not, not really. You're competing against too many people who are too good at it. Uh, and yeah, this idea of that this was even ever a thing—it's, it's kind of insane. Uh, but the real re way to live is to just, just, just—I don't know. Campaign for UBI. That's what we really should have. I think I, I'm a big fan of it. Here's my, 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 my big. Things I care about, politics-wise, I've already said it, I'm a two-issue voter. UBI and public transport. We need universal basic income and better public transport that is cheaper. Those are the only two things I care about. If you offer those things, one of those things is enough for me to get to vote for you. Uh, as a possible third option, uh, in the UK specifically for our political climate, is marijuana legalization and regulation now that might sound crazy to you and i will explain i do not smoke weed uh, i have no desire to smoke weed weed gives me panic attacks i am not interested in smoking weed uh, however uh, lots of people especially young people are extremely interested in smoking weed for some reason they love it they love the stuff uh, it seems to be pretty much harmless uh, and a very taxable <laughs> and you can make a bunch of free money off of stupid young people who will spend their money on weed instead of food uh, or whatever I don't know people probably wouldn't spend their money on weed instead of food uh, I imagine even for the world's biggest stoner food probably takes priority over weed uh, but you know people will spend them people love to spend their money on weed 
uh, and the government loves to tax things like that, and you can make a bunch of money. So that's the first thing, gives you a bunch of money to fix the fucking economy, because the government is broke right now, and needs money, and uh, is just going to be doing austerity, and instead of doing austerity, you can do a little bit less austerity and a little more weed legalization and taxation. And the second thing is that uh, London specifically has a big problem with criminal gangs. It's kind of a meme around the world that if you go to London, you get stabbed. Uh, these criminal gangs uh, exist in the world, right? They don't exist outside of the world. I know this sounds like stupid to even mention, but it seems like people don't consider this. They exist within the world. Now, they exist in an economic gray or black market, but they still would exist within the economic superstructure of capitalism. Uh, and they have power, right? The thing, these gangs, they have, they have power. How do they have power? Well, they have power because... Uh, they have money. You might think they have power because they have violence, but the reason that people are willing to commit those acts of violence for their gang is for money. And these gangs, the vast majority of income for these these violent gangs comes from drug sales, and marijuana is a very popular drug, uh, and one of, I imagine, a large source of their income. You cut that off, the gangs no longer can have the financial power to have real violent power, and the, uh, you've you've tackled crime. Uh, people, yeah, a lot of like a lot of gang related activity. Why are they fighting over territory? It's because they're fighting over territory to sell drugs in. If you if if drugs if they can't sell, they have no reason to sell drugs because everyone can just buy them legally. Better drugs right, which would massively cut into the, the black market, if not eliminate it, uh, then suddenly these gang wars over territory become much more meaningless. People are much less likely to join gangs, because the reason people join gangs in the first place is that they're young and impressionable, and they're fucking broke, and you, uh, the gang members show up, and they're rich, and they say, just sell some weed and you can get loads of money and they do it and they do get loads of money and it helps them to feed their family and so on that's where people join gangs uh, not just because they like killing people the, uh, the, the, it's then the exploitative structure of the gang that forces them to kill people um, and then die themselves and it's all very sad uh, but if no one buys their drugs then no one's giving them money and they can't sustain themselves. This shouldn't be difficult to comprehend, right? I think everyone understands this, but I think, I think the, uh, the, the sort of popular narrative on this has gone more towards like, oh, people shouldn't be in prison for violent, like non-violent drug offenses, which is true, but it's less to, it's less of it is, and maybe this is just because like the people who sell weed in America don't tend to be members of violent gangs. I don't know. But it seems like there's less of a an emphasis on, uh, you know, do this so that we don't have to deal with fucking violent gangs doing this fucked up shit, you know? That's why I'm in favor of weed legalization. Um, I mean, obviously, that's just like the pragmatic reasons, is more money to put into social programs, which means less need for austerity, which is good for everyone, and... Uh, secondly, uh, it'll reduce criminal organized crime, which is good for everyone. Uh, I don't know, I honestly don't understand why it hasn't happened already. I legitimately don't, I don't understand why Labour aren't, like, pushing super hard on this. I should look, I wonder what, what's Labour's, what's Labour's stance on weed? Uh, who is this? I don't know what this is. Oh, this is some forum. Ki what? I'm confused here. This is from 2022. Labour won't let you... Sadiq Khan... See, Sadiq Khan is actually based. Here's the thing, right? I, I know a lot of, a lot of right-wingers... They, uh, they don't, they, they blame Sadiq Khan. They don't know, they, people who are American 
and don't, don't live in London, they really hate Sadiq Khan because he's like Muslim or whatever. They really hate this guy. But Sadiq Khan is actually so based. The problem is he's, he's like way more radical than the actual government. And like he, he wants to do a bunch of based shit. Like Sadiq Khan in favor of UBI. Sadiq Khan, like, massively in favor of increasing public transport in London. He's, like, the single reason why we have so much, like, well, not, I mean, the Hop Affair. He's done a bunch of great shit for public transport in London. He's super pro-UBI, and he's pro-weed uh, legalization. So this guy is, like, a man after my own heart. Those are, like, the three things I care about, and he's in favor of them. The only problem is that the government won't let him do any of it. Uh, they won't give him the money or the power to do any of it. They won't let him legalize drugs. They won't let him implement UBI, right? That's pretty beyond his purview. And they won't let him, they won't give him the money for, you know, better tube infrastructure, which maybe, I mean, okay, to be fair, it is a well-known problem in the UK that all of the public transport money goes to London and that cities outside of London are left behind. While London's public transport improves, other cities are left with, like, old, outdated, and uh, definitely without, like, the chance to expand their public transport networks. And that's a problem. I agree that's a problem. However, I also live in London and use public transport, so I can't be that mad about it, you know? <laughs> this is the one I'm actually going to use, so I kind of want it to work the best, you know? Uh, and it already does work the best, but it's also ridiculously expensive. That's the problem. Like, it works good in the... Like, it's the best public transport in the UK, but it's really expensive. London has the most expensive public transport in the whole of Europe. It's insane. It's ridiculous. Uh, and we need to bring those goddamn prices down. Uh, anyway, Sadiq Khan actually based. It's just that, like, the only reason that... Uh, whatever... Can I tell a little weird, interesting story from my school? Uh, the second school that I went to after I got kicked out of the first one, slash left by mutual agreement, slash whatever. Uh, this s school... Okay, so there was... I, I saw a really retarded post. I don't even want to mention it, actually. I'm not even going to mention it. But uh, let's just start it off by saying I went to school with a ton of Nigerians. Most of the kids in my school, I would even say most, like the majority ethnic group in my school was Nigerians. Uh, some of them were first generation immigrants, most of them were second or third generation immigrants. And they were chill, uh, you know. Uh, they were very religious, which I was also a really ed edgy atheist, so I kind of had something against them for that. I would, I would try and trigger them about religious stuff a lot. But other than that, they were chill. Uh, anyway. Uh, there was also some Ghanaians, okay? Uh, and there was also a Nigerian teacher. So the computer, the computer science teacher was Nigerian. He was a beast. He knew his shit. He was very patient. Everyone liked him. He was probably the best teacher in the school. Like, he was clearly someone who was, like, a really knowledgeable computer science guy from Nigeria who emigrated to the UK and got a shitty <laughs> teaching job instead of, a, like, probably much higher paying job that he deserves, which is pretty typical. Like, I remember uh, one time I went to get my computer repaired uh, when I was a kid. I, went, I took my computer to a repair shop, and the guy there was, like, an Iranian uh, computer science electro engineer guy. And it turned out he had a PhD. And in Iran, he'd been a professor, and now he was working some fucking computer repair job. Like, this guy was crazy overqualified, and really passionate, and clearly knew his shit. It's kind of depressing when you think about it, but <laughs> anyway, this is not the story I wanted to tell. What I wanted to say is, uh, I don't know if people realize the level of, I don't, it's not racism right? It's, I suppose, xenophobia. Uh, it's not colorism either, because Ghanaians and Nigerians are the same race. They're both of the, the Bantu race uh, of West Africa. <coughs> uh, they, uh, they, I believe, have, like, different historical tribal backgrounds 
for for a long like from a long time ago. Uh, they hate each other is my fundamental point. <laughs> yeah, and they are just very open about it. <laughs> they it, it's, it's kind of a meme though because like they this is like a it's really interesting dynamic. Like I would say they have banter about it kind of like the British and the French have banter about hating each other except when we do it it's like hundreds of years ago but they're talking about like a very modern history it's kind of fucked up I remember thinking it was kind of fucked up so one time um uh there was only like two there was two Ghanaian kids in the class and most most of uh, uh, a lot of Nigerian kids and these Ghanaian kids would just get the shit like they would just they would just get mocked relentlessly for being Ghanaian, um, and so there's these particular type of bags um, that are basically laundry bags, uh, right? And apparently, in Nigeria, these are called Ghana Go Home bags, or at least that's the joke they were making. They were called Ghana Go Home bags, and they were essentially saying. This is the bags that all the Ghanaians used to carry their clothes in when they were kicked out of the country. They're just explicitly calling for like a, a, a some sort of ethnic cleansing, <laughs> just like kick all of the Ghanaians out of the country, and they all carry their clothes home in this particular cheap bag because they have they're homeless now and they've been deported back to you know the neighboring country. And they were just, like, they were just all laughing about this. And I was sitting there, including the teacher, by the way. The teacher was, was getting in on it, the computer science teacher. He was getting in on it, right? Like, he was, he was laughing and, and, and talking about it. And everyone was having fun. Not the Ghanaian kid. He was not having fun defending himself. But everyone else was having fun. And I remember sitting there thinking, yo, this, I looked, like, people, they were looking up Google images because the, what happened was there was a debate where... The, the, the Ghanaian kid was trying to say, no, 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 those are actually called Nigeria go home bags. And they were looking it up on Google Images, and the images were like HD, high res, like this clearly happened fairly recently. I would say, like, within the last, t- judging from the camera quality, uh, it was like digital photos. This had happened rec- like within the last 10 years, I would guess, from when they were talking about it. Uh, and I was saying that, like, you can't just kick all the Ghanaians out of your country. <laughs> you can't just do that. That's fucked up. <laughs> you just, like, and, and, but the weird thing is that, they're, like, outside of that, they all got along. Like, there was no actual resentment there. They were all friends. Uh, you know? It was, it, it was a weird dynamic. I, I, I don't know. It was just an interesting little anecdote that I wanted to bring up. Because I, I don't think... I don't know. I don't know. Maybe people... I don't know the history behind... In Nigeria and Ghana rivalry. Uh, I believe Nigeria is doing much better in the world. Uh, <laughs> I, I saw, you know, some... I don't know. Nigeria is pretty good as a country. Like, it's pretty. It's a pretty cool place. I, I really like it. I've never been there, but, uh, like, they have really nice food and interesting culture. Well, so does Ghana, to be fair. Uh... Yeah, again, I just want to clarify, like, these kids were, like, really, not, like, they were friends, like, ev- everyone was friends here, the teacher, everyone liked the teacher, uh, the Ghanaian kid did get a little bit more shit than everyone else, like, he got his balls busted a little more than everyone else, because there was two Ghanaians, one of them was a guy, one of them was a girl, the girl didn't really get shit, right, because they all wanted to fuck her, because uh, she was hot, but the guy, he was kind of short, like that, I think maybe his problem was that he was just like, he was just kind of a uh, a little bit of a wimpy looking kid. Like he was just kind of short and he wore glasses. Um, yeah, but he was like still hung out with them. And as far as I could tell, he wasn't like really bullied. He was just like got a little bit more shit than everyone else. Um, but he pushed back. He held his own in these discussions. Uh, it was just like seven v one, so it was a little tricky. Including the fucking teacher. But I don't know, I find it weird that they were making such, like, light-hearted comments about what I assume is some sort of event where a whole group of uh, people were forcefully evicted from the country they were living in. Like, I don't actually know the history behind this. I, would, I should look it up. 
because I feel like I'm kind of talking out of my ass now, since I don't know the history. Uh, Ghana Must Go, the ugly history of Africa's most famous bag. Oh, these are old. These are not that... Oh, it's 1983. In, in 1983, Nigeria expelled 2 million undocumented West African migrants, half of whom were from Ghana. The sturdy checked bags into which they packed their belongings have become a symbol of exclusion and intolerance. Nearly four decades later, the region is yet to confront its emotional baggage. Yeah, they were fucking... Okay, damn. <laughs> this is a pretty big deal. This is a pretty serious thing. Uh, okay, well, it wasn't 10 years ago. I guess I misremembered the, how, how the HD the pictures looked. It was 1983. But that's still fairly recent history. That's pretty damn recent history. Just, just kicking out, just, just kicking out all your immigrants. Damn, you can't be doing that. <laughs> you, you, especially because like, like, in in this situation, like, economically, Nigeria is a much more prosperous nation, at least in, in nineteen eighty three, than, than Ghana. It would be like, I mean, it's. It's. It reminds me of America and Mexico, although the the economic disparity isn't that large. But anyway, it's. I don't know. It's just a weird little thing. Yeah, it reminds me of English and French. Like my French friend, you know, I tease him about the Battle of Agincourt, but that was hundreds of years ago. Like we have a little banter about the Hundred Years' War. Who doesn't? Who doesn't have a little banter about the Hundred Years' War? Uh, man, imagine having a war that just goes on for a hundred years. It actually went on for longer than a hundred years. Uh, they just call it the Hundred Years' War because I guess they weren't very good at keeping track of years back then. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I guess wars back then, they were a little more chill. They weren't actually. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know, it was strange. what a strange situation. I can't imagine making fun of someone like that, you know, for such recent serious historical events. Maybe they're just actually fucked up. <laughs> Maybe they just don't have any scrutiny on them, because it's like, but now they're immigrants to another country that is more prosperous, and they're the... It's like a weird cycle of capitalism thing. It's like kick out, we got to kick out all the poor Ghanaian migrants from our country, but then they come to, an, uh, now they're the poor migrants to another country, although they weren't really that poor, they were fine, they were doing fine, uh, I don't know how, I mean, I I don't know, I don't know, I'm going to be frank, I, I don't know that much about the, the, every student's economic background, so I probably shouldn't get it, I probably shouldn't talk about it, uh, but yeah, uh, I don't know. It's just a weird little thing. Maybe they, maybe, yeah. I don't know. I've 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 been trying to pass this in my head for like a long time. I guess, what well, what it really boils down to is like. No one is immune to these sorts of this sort of rhetoric. Because I imagine I mean I should probably read this article, because uh, it looks pretty interesting. Um. Uh, oil oil crash in nineteen eighty two, nineteen eighty three. The price had fallen. The U.S. began producing its own oil. Nigeria was almost exclusively reliant in oil, and it was hit hard. Ninety percent of the country's foreign reserves had been wiped out by nineteen eighty two. That's pretty fucking bad. Holy shit! Food prices have skyrocketed. Salaries became erratic. <laughs> Uh, to, 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 Ghana's nightmare was being replayed in Nigeria. I see. Uh, to, 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 no, to, to. By 1982, politicians started to use words like aliens in their manifestos in preparation for the general election. They blamed African migrants, especially Ghanaians, for the failing economy. Ghanaians had taken all of the jobs and brought crime to Nigeria, and if elected, they would chase them out, they promised. Then that turned into bad relations between Nigerians and Ghanaians. Uh, then, da, da, da. 
Du, 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 du. Uh, even with a weakening economy, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the gift. So when the announcement came that morning, wait, what announcement? Uh, ja, ja, ja. Anyway, basically they kicked they kicked everyone out. They kicked all the immigrants out because they had a failing economy, and apparently they haven't learned any lessons from anything. That that's not how you fix a failing economy. That's just a, a, a scapegoat. I guess every, what I'm saying is it seems like the same right wing rhetoric works across the world. The same populist immigrants are to blame for our problems rhetoric can be found everywhere. Isn't that interesting? I think that's interesting. We don't hear about it that much. You know, we hear a lot about it in Europe, sometimes like South America, um, but here's an event that happened in West Africa. That's an interesting little historical event, I think. And it's weird to see it bubbling up. Like, I think the weird thing is that that the teacher joined in, right? Like, surely that's the weird thing. Because... That's weird, right? <laughs> I shouldn't have to explain. Like, that is kind of weird. But he was a nice guy. Like, there was nothing wrong with this guy. Everyone liked him. I liked him. He was really good at teaching Python. He was friendly to hang out with. He was chill. Like, he'd let... He'd, he was very much of the mindset of, like... If if you want to slack off, you know you're gonna fail the class, but like that's your own fuck up kind of kind of deal, which people liked because some of the kids were, had like there was a particular guy, who already knew he was already like fairly familiar with Python, and so he he just didn't really need to pay attention. He already knew everything they were because it was only really really basic stuff, and they were teaching it really slowly. Um, and this guy already knew the basics, so he didn't really have to pay that much attention. And uh, the teacher was fine with that. Like, he was generally chill. Uh, yeah, just a weird fucking thing. Ha <laughs> 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 ha, we, we kicked all the immigrants out of our country. Ha <laughs> ha. What the fuck? That's so weird. Hi, guys, and welcome back to my review of the... Furosity Tyson Fury Sugar-Free Caffeine Energy Gum Peppermint Review. Furosity Tyson Fury Energy Gum. Uh, am I going to be reviewing this? So, I'm going to put... Excuse me. I'm going to put this in my mouth now. Right off the bat, it tastes like peppermint. Now, I'm normally a spearmint. A spearmint kind of guy when it comes to gum. Uh, my my standard gum. That was probably really loud. Sorry. <laughs> uh, my standard gum is is your Wrigley's extra spearmint gum. Uh, so this is a this is a different one. I got this for free as part of some sort of promotional thing. And uh, here's the thing: is as as uh, excessive consumption may produce laxative effects. That's one of the things. Uh, but that's actually very common for for gum. I believe it is the chemical additive sorbitol, which is an artificial sweetener, uh, and if you eat a lot of it. It gives you the shits. Uh, we got sorbitols, malitols, aspartame. Damn, they just put every sweetener they could find in him. Acyl, acesulfame K, sucralose. That's a lot of sweetness. Why do you need so many different sweeteners? Let's check the Wrigley's extra. What have we got in here? Sweeteners, sorbitol, xylitol, aspartame, mannitol, and acesulfame K. Why? I don't know why they need so many, but fair enough. We got caffeine, 
It's peppermint and menthol flavoured. Sugar free chewing gum with caffeine, vitamin B6, and sweeteners. Um, so, so far, flavour wise, it's pretty intense. Pretty intense peppermint menthol flavour. Which is to be expected. I mean, it's clearly trying to market so market itself with like this Tyson Fury branding, as some sort of manly strong thing. So it's not surprising that it has a very strong flavor. It's not bad per se. Again, I'm more of a spearmint than peppermint kind of guy, but uh, it's not bad. Uh, I will say, there is one. The other factor that makes a gum good or bad is the texture. And on the texture department, for me, this just kind of fails. It's not, it doesn't resist the chew enough. It kind of just sort of gives in a little too easy. You don't get the satisfying push resistance of a chew. Um, and then an even bigger problem which is a serious problem that makes this product makes this product unviable in my opinion is it doesn't have the cohesion of your your typical Wrigley's extra or other chewing gum brand what i mean by that is when you chew a normal chewing gum it stays together in one lump even when you chew it hard right whereas with this one Little bits break off sometimes. Um, and that's extremely annoying. Because it's very hard to... You might accidentally swallow those little bits, first of all. And uh, it's very hard to put the gum back together in your mouth. I think it's just a total failure. If your gum has little bits falling off of the sides when you're chewing it... Uh, that's a problem. That's a problem, and for that reason, I'm out. There's a YouTube channel called Answer in Progress. They have some decent videos. But they have one video called Why Japan's Internet is Weirdly Designed. Now, if you're a weeb like me, you already knew that Japan's internet was weirdly designed. But w weirdly isn't really the the word here. It just is kind of old-fashioned. It do They don't have the same minimalist web design tenants that Western countries have. I think everyone agrees this is based, right? Like everyone seems everyone seems to love Japanese web design. I don't know why people don't do it more in the West. It's a bit silly, really. Uh but I do think that that video is a little stupid. Uh for a couple of reasons. I think it's badly presented first of all. It's very overproduced as a video, but that's a uh, neither here nor there. Uh, what I'm actually... There's actually just one particular thing that rubbed me the wrong way, which is at one point, uh, the host, she says, um, the web was invented as a way to share documents between nerds, uh, and it looked like this, and then shows a basic HTML website. Then, sort of, cut to a, a close-up, looking into the camera not good see that triggered me a little bit because that is literally what the web should look like that's literally based motherfuckers like this are the ones these are the enemy guys these are the enemy we have identified the enemy and it's people like this who see a basic extremely functional minimal accessible html only web page that just serves a document and say, not good, in a sarcastic tone. I'm sorry, what the fuck is your problem? <laughs> what do you want a document serving platform to be? What do you want it to be? I don't understand. I don't understand the logic. And then they find Japan's design. The, 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 if you want to know why Japan has a differently designed internet, it's because unlike every other country in the world, they made, they figured out good web design in like the 2000s, and then they just stopped changing it because they were like, yeah, that's good, that works, and then they just kept doing it like that. 
because that's how the internet looks. But, you know, they found that, that having densely organized web pages uh, works very well because it does work very well. Uh, and then instead of every other country in the world, which went, okay, but what if we could make it work less good in order to look more like Apple? Instead of doing that, they just went, nah, <laughs> let's just keep it looking good. Uh, or working good, I mean. I mean, I also think it generally looks good. Obviously, not every Japanese website looks good, but uh, the general web design principles, I think, look good. Anyway, I don't know why I felt the need to bring that up. This is an extremely nitpicky, autistic thing to mention. I feel like it's so easy to pirate shit. I don't, I don't know. I think, here's a, here's a bit of, copy punk anarchist praxis just saturate things with co with copied versions of those things this is my yo what if i made an oh, yo anarchist moment i'm having a i'm having a, a radical moment guys i i thought you know what i that i had a in in my like anti copyright speech, my like default anti copyright speech, where I talk about how like, you know, there is no such thing as an original work, and also copying is not theft and that sort of thing. One of the like hypotheticals I bring up is, let's say I were to take an album by a popular artist. Like let's say I were to take, uh, an Ed Sheeran album, and I were to just upload it like bar for bar. The exact album, zero changes, same cover, same title, but just claim that I made it. Even that context changes the meaning of the album. It can be the exact same album, but the different context. Like, because the second you hear that, you'd start thinking, why did he do this? Like, what was the meaning behind this? And what if I did? What if I, I've said that as a hypothetical multiple times. What if I actually did it? What if I took a popular album? I, what if I found some artist, found, if I found some musician, semi-popular musician, who's like a, a pro-copyright guy, and I just re-upload their album with my name, and call it Fuck Copyright? <laughs> I, that would be funny, maybe. I don't know, it's like a funny protest art thing. Um, <clears throat> the only anime I'm watching this season is Onichan wa Oshimai, in other words. Onimai. Onimai. Um, I've noticed something strange. Wait a second. Wait a, wait a second. Real? Is this real? Have I just uncovered a real conspiracy? I think I have uncovered a real life conspiracy. Maybe? I've uncovered a real-life conspiracy, maybe. Unless... Okay, if you go on Mal, and you look at the Onimai Mal page, which I actually hadn't scrolled down on until just now, because I was in in the thread on A for Onimai. I was catching up, because I, I'm not caught up. Um... <clears throat> And uh, someone mentioned the Mao reviews, so I went to look at them, and they're they're so cringe. Like I know it's stupid to even care about that. Mao reviews are, are gem. Like I miss the days when Mao reviews were some like fourteen year old who really thought they were a great writer, like writing some like terrible cringe review of like an awful show. Where they say it's the best thing ever. That's like my favorite. I love that. It's so wholesome. It's so like such like light autism core, you know, <clears throat> positive autism in the world. But these days, it seems like every time I scroll down, it's just some retard talking about how the show is problematic, uh, which is which is so dumb. And so the reviews that you actually see, the three like picked top reviews are all, like, <clears throat> I don't know, they're all, like, these, these stupid fucking, 
they're very stupid and bad. <laughs> That's what they are. What they are is they're very stupid and bad. I think maybe the problem... Hold on, I'm very confused. Because you, you look on the More Reviews tab, and... It says fewer... Oh, I see. Huh. Little strange, little strange. <clears throat> anyway. Like, I'm fine if you look at Onimai... It's a lolly fan service gender bending show. Like, that's a niche show. If you don't like it, that is so reasonable. That it's so reasonable to just not like the show. It's insane. Like, it's such a like little niche show for hardcore otaku that if you don't like the show, that is so okay. <laughs> you know why make it some weird moral thing? It's just a cartoon. Very strange. But if you go... I don't know. I'm looking at... I'm just struggling to understand how this... Like, how Mal even picks the reviews it shows you. Because I'm seeing, like, highly scored reviews. I, I don't know. It's weird. <clears throat> I wonder... Maybe maybe I do a little call to action here. Just blatantly breaking TOS on Mal. Uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> just, just go... To the only my page and upvote good reviews. It uh, it doesn't matter if they're positive reviews. There's a there's a review uh, that that um, is complaining about the the censored version and the, the terrible subtitles. Uh, that is perfectly fair. I'm super okay with this. Like that is a reasonable critique, even though it's a not recommended review. Negative review, but that's a reasonable critique. There's a critique of the show being. Uh, uh, I don't care about the fan service, blah, 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 but the problem is the story and characters are terrible and it's unwatchable unless you're a masochist. Uh, it's not wholesome or funny. That's fine if you want to leave a negative review like that. That's fine. Um, you know, but I would, I would encourage people... I would encourage people that if you're watching the show and you're enjoying the show... Go to my anime list and just leave an honest upvote or whatever they call it, a nice, click nice or love it or whatever uh, on, on some reviews that you agree with. We're not breaking TOS here, right? I am recommend. I am not, of course, I am, there's no downvote function, which is so stupid. I hate this goddamn positive utilitarianism that the internet is turning into. Why am I even using my anime list, frankly? Like, there's a there's a free open source software anime list program that's terminal based. I I actually know why I'm using my anime list it's because it can. It's it, I can open it on any computer and it syncs my list between them, and I have four computers. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I'm I'm just a. Uh, I'm just saying, if you uh, if you want to leave an honest, if you want to show your honest appreciation to some of the other, uh, some of the positive reviews, then I think I would encourage you to go do that, because because these th these poor reviews on my anime list are, are kind of a blight on the show because they don't represent. The thing about them is, they don't represent the broad opinion, since the show actually has a rating of 7.31 as of right now, which is a, 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 you know, every show on Mal gets a 7 unless it's terrible, but, you know, it's a positive rating, it's a fairly positive rating. If you actually go to the season, to the season thing, and let's say we sort it, how do I do this? Uh, TV, I want to sort by rating, sort by score, right? And you sort by score. <clears throat> Onimai is about in the the. It's in. It's definitely in the top fifty percent, top twenty five percent, maybe. I would say it's in the top twenty five percent of the of score by this uh, this season. So clearly, it's not like a widely hated show, right? I mean. 
the actual general consensus seems to be that the, the, the show is one of the, you know, it has positive, positive, positive scores and, and so on. But whatever, who you know, the, the My Anime List score system, I mean, the My Anime List review system, the, the, the way it picks the top three reviews uh, is, is allowing for an abuse of the system where a couple of reviewers are able to leverage whatever social clout they have in order to um, to get their reviews to the top, even though it actually contradicts what the majority of people think about the show. Uh, and the inability to downvote means that reviews that are very controversial, like these reviews, you know, the, the top review on Mal, which, which talks about how, how it's abusive or something, uh, actually has more the most reacts because because you don't even upvote you just react on now it's a it's one of the worst systems i've ever seen uh it has 89 nice ratings and 21 love it ratings but it has 105 confusing ratings which is the only like slightly possibly negative react you can have but i'm pretty sure that reacting with confusing actually still contributes to upvoting upvoting the uh the review which i think is is just an awful like that's got to be a terrible system no it's one of the worst ideas ever and in fact the second the second top review has a, a similar ratio where it 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 has um almost as many confusing reacts as it has nice reacts and uh again with the third uh, one actually, the third one doesn't have that many confusing reacts. Uh, that's 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 fine. But the top the, the top two ones have a, a disproportionate amount of confusing reacts, which you know, to my eyes, that should mean that it's like a highly controversial post. If this was a Reddit like upvote downvote system. It would be getting a bunch of upvotes, but it would also be getting a bunch of downvotes. And so it would be highly controversial and not float to the top. But because of the way Mal has organized uh, their their review system, which is just, again, just I, I do not think that it's actually... I, I, do, I think it does a poor job of actually representing what the majority of Mal users believe. Because there's, like, I've seen shows that have low ratings, you know, sub five ratings, and mostly negative reviews. And in that case, it makes sense that the reviews that float to the top would be negative. But the My Anime List system doesn't account for controversial or divisive anime, and doesn't account for shows that, uh, that people might want to target for uh, politically motivated reasons or emotionally motivated reasons rather than actually judging the quality of the show. Uh, because because if you're not aware, the problem they have with this anime is that uh, the sister is somehow abusive. Uh, they they really don't like it because it's an etchy fan service anime with like lolly esque stuff in it, but uh, their excuse is that the sister is somehow abusive. Uh, this is not in the text of the show, like this is this is something that I don't I don't really understand where they're getting this from. Uh, I've read their reviews, um, and uh, they they don't seem to have watched the same show that I watched. I've I've also read the manga by the way, so like I'm. I'm fairly uh, familiar with Onimai. It's not my favorite thing ever, but I do enjoy it quite a bit. I would probably give it a a high seven to a low eight if I had to rate it. So a pretty positive, pretty pretty good show to me. Uh, pretty good franchise or whatever series. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm pretty uh pretty familiar with with the show, and I I don't. I don't think any of this happens. I think they're just lying. I think I think they're misreading the plot quite quite severely. 
that that this was a a forced gender transition. Uh, I think I think you've missed out on a lot of a lot of the subtleties of Mahido's character, if that's really what you think is happening, uh, and if you and particularly if you think that this is a uh, an abusive relationship. I think that you probably just don't know what that word means. Uh, I, I don't think you you know what an abusive relationship is. Uh, because because very clearly, I mean, again, it, it's like insane. It would be like, like calling Chino and Kakoa's relationship in Gochi Yusa abusive. Like, it's just, it's just not. There's, it, it doesn't even, there's not really an argument you can construct. Because it's just so clearly not. I mean, you can't prove a negative, so it's a little tricky to say, here's, here's why it's not abusive. I think the onus of, but the, the, the burden of truth would be on, uh, or the burden of proof, rather, sorry, would be on people like X Kroku and a fat potato. Uh, and, and I just don't think they've met, met that, that burden at all in their reviews, Uh, and and in fact, uh, if you look at X Kroku's review, which is currently the top review on Mel, uh, so uh, approximately, so the first sentence, the opening sentence is about how the series makes them uncomfortable, and then the first, the, the first real paragraph, that's more of an introductory sentence, then the first real paragraph uh, begins with the with the, the uh, this word. I don't know how the story progresses. Uh, so so that's already setting it up. I I think uh, if if you're starting a, a comment with that, you're you're setting yourself up to 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 be disregarded, right? Like I would trust someone who's read the manga and is familiar with the story, much more so than someone who just openly admits. They they're not fami- I'm not familiar with the story, but here's my opinion. Uh, and then uh, there's there is some commentary in this episode in this uh, first paragraph on on the actual show on the, the goings on in the show. There is some commentary on the actual plot of the show, and that's the first paragraph. Then the second real paragraph is uh, is not about the show. It's about um, trans issues uh and how uh how how the the show undermine quote un, uh really undermines their struggles um which i think is a is an insane thing to say about a cartoon uh the next paragraph is again kind of about the show it's a very short paragraph and it's complaining about the fan service again if you want to if you don't like fan service that's fine. I, I don't know why you would click to watch a show with the, uh, I believe this has the etchy tag. Oh, it actually, it actually doesn't have the etchy tag. That's surprising. I don't see it, at least. Uh, that's surprising. This is definitely an etchy show. So, that's, that's again, that's on the, the tagging system on Mal. It should have the etchy tag. Uh, but, uh, you know. Okay, so I can forgive you for that, maybe. Um, but but again, that's more critiquing an aspect of the show. Or, or I, actually, you know what? That's fine. That's fine. Let's let's give them the benefit of the doubt. It, it's okay to critique edgy to say the fan service it makes me uncomfortable. Now, the things I the thing I don't like about this is that rather than critiquing the use of fan service within the show, as in like saying. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't make any sense contextually. It 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 breaks the 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 logic of the world. That's a common a common problem with fan service. Uh, the fan service is, is poorly executed. That's also pretty common. Uh, you know, it it interrupts the flow of the show. It feels like it's not there for any reason. It uh like breaks characters' dynamics. You know, people act out of character for the sake of fan service. It distracts from the main plot. These are lots of problems with anime fans. I was rather than talking about any of that, um, uh, I will now quote. Uh, 
this seems to be a bit much considering the themes present and the age slash body type of Mahiro. Um, now that's a little confusing. What are the themes present? I'm I'm confused. Why 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 does the themes present make that a bit much? I'm con- I'm just confused. If you have a a, a gender bend anime is not allowed to have fan service why like why is that immoral or wrong i don't i don't really understand i don't i don't follow um and the age slash body type well we're not going to get into that they're they're just wrong about that as well um then they give the show a compliment in a one sentence paragraph as for the animation and art style slash art direction it is top tier But then they undercut it with, sad to see it being used here, of all shows, though. Now, I agree. The art style and art direction of um, Olimai is top tier. And they didn't um, mention the animation, which is also top tier. Oh, they actually did. As for the animation and art style slash art direction. Okay, my bad. Uh, And then, the, the next paragraph... Uh, is is not about the show. It it is about how uh, it doesn't matter if fi- if bad things are happening in fiction because and I quote, "Evil is evil." Yes, that's right. <laughs> this show is, according to uh, X Kroku, is evil. It's e like man. How sheltered do you have to be? To use the word evil so lightly. Like, who would I, what would I consider evil? Like, Hitler? Hitler, evil. Without a doubt. But, <laughs> like, that's pretty insane. You Like, you're saying, like, to me, this is like, this show is as bad as Hitler. I don't think it is. I think, I think this is pretty fucked up thing to do, frankly. I, I've seen a, a lot of people do stuff like this. Where you want your point to be more important than it is, so you exaggerate you exaggerate the harm, uh, so that you don't seem like you're nitpicking and so that people pay attention to what you're saying. But the effect this actually has is that people become desensitized to the term, and then when it's used for real, uh, it's sort of a boy who cried wolf situation. Um, it also gives your political opponents a really good weapon to use against you. Uh, An example of this is the word Nazi. So uh, there are real-life neo-Nazis. Some of them don't call themselves neo-Nazis. Some of them call themselves things like Christian nationalists or or something along those lines, right? But everyone knows they're Uh, neo-Nazis. However... And they'll try and deny it because the word Nazi obviously has a negative connotation. But it's quite hard to deny it if you only use the word Nazi to refer to Nazis. But there was a trend a while ago of referring to everyone on the right as a, as a, as a Nazi. To the point where people had to start prefacing the word with literal Nazis when referring to actual neo-Nazis. And then, the word literal Nazis came to be, de- uh, <clears throat> came to be uh, diluted. And, and even that can now mean anything. And what this has done is it's allowed for actual far-right neo-Nazis to, to sort of, you know, when, when called out, to just say, well, the left, they call everyone, they dislike a Nazi. And it's not like you can just have a backlog to prove, no, we don't. We only call Nazis Nazis. Because unfortunately, you don't. Anyway, that was a little, little overboard. A little little bit of a strange example. Being a bit nitpicky here, I I admit it. Uh, But but I have autism. Let's just get that out of the way real quick. Let's just put that out front and center. I am an autistic man with autism. That that was diagnosed by a doctor, and I have a letter from that doctor to prove it. And then the final, the final paragraph, is a sort of meta 
paragraph saying, this is my first re of I'm assuming they meant to say review, but they got the, the V and the W mixed up. They're in, the, they're in backwards places. They're in the, 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 back, the, the reversed spots. Uh, so, so it's a little strange. So the reason I did that is because I just want to break down that really, even if I'm being very generous, less like significantly less than half of this review is actually a review of the show. Significantly less, like uh, at the most generous I could be, let's say a third of the review is about the show. I just don't think that's appropriate. I don't think this should be allowed on my anime list. I think if you're just going to use the reviews page to blog with a slight mention of the show, that should not be allowed. That that's that should be there should be a, some sort of rule against that. That's not what the review section is for. I don't want to that's not helpful. It's poor poor site management. That's why I bring this up. That's why I went through that paragraph by paragraph. It's just to point out that maybe less than a third of this review is actually about the show. And even that third is a little tangential. But even giving them the benefit of the doubt, even giving giving them, steel manning them, less than a third of this review is about the, the actual show. I, I just, yeah, I don't think that belongs in the review section. I don't I don't think it does. You have a blog section on Mal, right? You you can just post a blog on Mal. I I I don't think it's appropriate to have a, a rule where it's allowed that you can use the reviews section to post quote unquote reviews which contain less than a third of content which is actually reviewing the show. And the second most highly rated review of uh Onimai uh is a little better, mostly because it's just shorter and less rambly. Uh, it's actually uh, it's actually not that bad. The second most the second review I actually had I'd only read the first review, so this is this is my fault. I will take the L on this one. I was complaining about this a fat potato review, but this a fat potato review is actually mostly fine. Uh, it's just complaining about the fan service, uh, and and I I I believe that uh, it's shocking, frankly, that Mal has not tagged Onimai with the Echi tag. It's literally like it's it's shocking. It's such a such poor moderation that they've somehow allowed this show to slip through without the Echi tag. It's insane, because of course people are going to stumble across this show who are not interested in Echi. And if you're not interested in Edgy, that's fine. That's so reason. As I said before, if you don't want to watch a Edgy fan service show with uh, lolly stuff and uh, gender bent stuff, that is so understandable and reasonable because those are very niche genres. Those are very. This is in general like a niche otaku focused show, like that should be front. Mal should present that sort of information front and center. So, uh, otherwise, it's misleading people. And, of course, you're going to end up with uh, reviews that aren't actually representative of the audience that this show is meant to reach. Uh, But, yeah, uh, so I I honestly find a Fat Potatoes review um, not particularly offensive. Um, Orkami Rika is also kind of complaining... uh, complaining about the show for its fan service um but taking a little bit more of an objective approach taking a bit more of a pulled back approach less emotional approach uh this is the third highest review uh and they're sort of talking about how it it uh puts a lot more fan service than the manga which it does and i think that's also a, a somewhat reasonable complaint uh i don't necessarily believe that uh, this needs to, to, I mean, I, I wouldn't have rated this a 1 if these were the, uh, or Kami Rika here uh, le- left a mixed feelings review, but then rated the show a 1 according to them, which is a just a little strange, but I mean, you can use the rating system however you want, it's not, 
not something I really have a problem with. Um, what I'm, what I'm not a fan of on this review is, in, is, 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 actually, I guess that's fine. Comparing a show to a, a studio's previous work is probably fine. Honestly, those other reviews, not great, but not terrible. If you just don't like the show, that's fine. It's really this first review that I have a big problem with, for, uh, the top review. Uh, for I will just just uh, reiterate the the reasons. Uh, firstly, um, my anime list's uh, site design allows for reviews that are mainly controversial, rather than actually representative of the fan base's opinion, to float to the top because it doesn't have a downvote button. It only has a confusing button, and that confusing button somehow counts as like an upvote, which is a, a very strange system. And secondly, it's inappropriate for the review section because only a third of the post is a review and the rest is more like a blog post uh, that doesn't really have anything to do with the actual anime. Uh, and the, uh, that's really the problem I have. And there, there are other reviews if you on the more reviews tab that I, I think deserve more attention than X Croco's review. And, uh, I would implore you that if you are a fan of the show or the manga, you li you go and give your honest opinion within TOS. I am not sending my fans to lie about their opinions. I'm just saying engage with the website in the way the website was meant to be engaged in. And uh, go ahead and, and give some of those reviews some some positive reacts. I I really... I want to... I know that was an incredibly autistic segment, and I'm I I stopped thinking about it, but now I'm thinking about it again. But I don't, you know, at at the end of the day, the problem is the the administration of the website and the structure of the website. It's not necessarily this person's fault. People write bad people write bad reviews and have bad opinions all the time. The problem is that this they they have written a review in a way which. Uh, takes advantage of and exploits probably intentionally poor site design but going to that person's profile I've actually forgotten their name now uh, I should I should double check that uh, the person who wrote that only my review um, one second let me let me double check so I'm getting this correctly uh, this ex Kroku person, if you actually go to their profile, you can see they have a whole bunch of uh, of comments on their profile that are molding about the Onimai review, um, which I think is a good thing. I think they deserve that, and I'm actually shocked that... Uh, Uh, that, that these comments haven't been removed because in the past when I left a similar comment on someone's profile for a review of Mushoku Tensei, uh, my comment got deleted and I got a warning from a, a mal moderator. Um, and mine was a little harshly worded, I will admit. But these are also harshly worded. I mean, one of them is, please don't review animes ever again. And this has not been taken down. Uh, which I think is good. I don't think it should be taken down. I think pe people, you know, this is the problem with, uh, this is the exact problem I've pointed out before with positive utilitarian website design. By the way, if you don't know what I mean by positive utilitarian, uh, utilitarianism is a meta-ethical philosophy which says that uh, the, the goal of a, an ethical system should be to maximize happiness and minimize suffering. Uh, and then you can sort of choose one, right? Like, if you just want to minimize suffering, that's negative utilitarianism. And if you just want... Uh, oh, sorry. That's what I've actually... Have I, I've been saying positive utilitarianism. What I actually meant is negative utilitarianism, but I'm retarded. Uh, you know what I'm trying to say? So one of the negative utilitarianism is you just want to minimize suffering, and positive utilitarianism is you just want to maximize happiness. Um... And the, sorry, I meant to be saying negative utilitarian this whole time. That's kind of cringe that I got those mixed up. Uh, but these negative, so 
the idea being negative when i talk about negative utilitarianism i'm saying designing uh, a website where you're rem doing things like removing dislikes on youtube or not having dislikes on on my anime list reviews uh, what you're actually going to do is have the an unintended effect which is sure you you it might seem reasonable to minimize in you know, negative feedback feels bad for the the user so we just don't give people the ability to give negative feedback however when you actually do this this just makes people frustrated and rather than just leaving a downvote and moving on with their lives you get people like me autists who will become frustrated with this site design and then uh you know do stuff like head over to the person's profile and leave a comment that says uh please don't review animes ever again uh or you know something like this and you end up with a sort of uh, more directed uh more people have to fight people end up trying to find ways around the system because having negative emotional reactions is a natural part of being a human being and having that denied from you feels bad uh and so people are gonna it feels very bad and so people are going to find ways to to get around that and have their negative reactions in the first place and negative utilitarianism also is one of the reasons why uh, people in the first place feel the need to make everything into a moral issue because if art is subjective if whether art is good or bad is subjective and leaving a comment saying that art is bad is going to make people feel bad you have to have some reason why uh, making people feel bad is okay is justified uh, and therefore the people who you're making feel bad must be bad people themselves they must enjoy bad things the art must be morally wrong and therefore you are morally justified etc i think it's a terrible thing i think that the, the the end goal of this sort of negative utilitarianism is to turn the entire world into a hospital um it's it's just all it's just all bad um so yeah that's a, that's a, a problem here uh, but anyway this person got a lot of uh pushback for their review deservedly so uh, but fundamentally this is just one person who wrote a bad review this is a endemic problem of my anime list site design and moderation and i just want to point out that there is uh, uh, the the review moderation team this is all public information the review slash recommendations moderators consists of one two three four five six eight people one of whom has only seen 200 anime, which is not very much at all. You know, I would expect a moderator on Mal to have seen, uh, you know, I would say at least three, 350 anime, like at least, which is m more than me, I believe. But like, I'm not out here trying to tell people what they can and can't say about anime. So, you know, th I think it's okay. I have seen, I've seen two, 364. Uh, that's completed at least. Uh, yeah, was there's a a, a a a person by the name of Danielle, uh, who is a a review moderator on Mal, who has only see, completed two hundred, two hundred anime, and that's thirty eight point four days watched. Uh, just as a little um, as a little comparison, I have seventy eight point five days watched, which is again, not crazy high. But that's my point, is that I, I would consider myself to be sort of an average otaku and not a particularly hardcore anime watcher who's seen, you know, thousands of shows like some people. Um, and yet this person who has power over this community uh, is actually clearly not very involved in the community at all, given their, uh, given their, their, their public, public history. Um, so I'm going to assume there's some sort of social game stuff going on here, which which has given this person their their role. Um, and if you look at the uh, community moderators, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There are nine community moderators. Let's take a look at their mouths. Um, well, you see the first person. See, this is a good sign. You look at the first the first moderator, and we've we've got. Over 3,000 completed anime, 3,700 completed anime, 801 days of anime watched. Okay, now I may not agree with this person's taste, right? We have we have diff very different tastes. I may not agree with this person's taste, and hey, I may not agree with this person's opinions on moderation. But, at the very least, I cannot accuse them of being 
uh, are not a part of this community. They are very clearly are a part of this community. Uh, and then, strangely though, the second moderator, we've only got 346 anime completed, um, which is a a little bit a little bit sus there, a little bit sus. Um, and I believe that is a pattern we we may see continued. Uh, 290 for the next one. Not so much. Uh, 292. Again, not so much. I, I again, I'm not saying like, oh, you're not a, you know, you're a bad person if you haven't seen over 300 anime. The problem isn't that. The problem, like, you can you can have seen five anime and have anime opinions. I don't give a fuck. The 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 fact is. I don't think you should be a moderator on an anim- on the biggest anime site if you're not a seasoned otaku, if you're not a part of the community. Like, no wonder the websites fucking run like shit when you've got motherfuckers like uh, Dip It Fu, who has only seen 262 shows, which is honestly not very much at all. But then, Karinada bringing it back with the 946. Respect. Again, I may not agree with your tastes, but I'll defend to my death your right to to say it. What have we got here? We got Detective Conan, Fairy Tale, FMA, Dororo, Vinland Saga, Durarara, Magi, Chihayafuru, Natsume Yujinsho, Mushishi. I mean, this is fun. Like, sure, I may not agree with you. I I may not. Goblin Slayer, even. Damn. And this is a this is a community moderator. Like, damn. Now, next, we've got a Pecora fan. Now, this is kind of based. We've got a Pecora fan with what seems to be a fairly cute and funny uh, image of Pecora, Usara Pecora, the VTuber, in their Mal profile, which I, I think is pretty interesting. And almost 2,000 anime watched. I am very glad. 30 years old and living in the Netherlands... Motherfucker, this is the sort of person that needs to be moderating now. I am very glad that this person, this is clearly a giga autist. These are the sorts of people I want moderating the my anime list community, and I'm glad that they are a community moderator. Um, uh, there are some some other more questionable ones, but most of them seem to be fine. Okay, I'm kind of bored of this now. Uh, in terms of admins. Should we should we take a look at this? I'm, I'm kind of curious. I don't know. I'm curious. Who are they? Like I'm just I'm I've been I didn't realize you could just go through their mouths like this. So I'm, I'm kind of just looking through it now because I didn't. I, you could just go through this and you could just like find out who who are the people that 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 have shitty ideas as to how websites should work. You can find them here. But anyway, the fact that Onimai doesn't have the the, the etchy tag is, is shameful. I was thinking of migrating to Annie List, but uh, I really like my Mal profile. Like, if you look at my anime list, it has a really fun CSS design. Uh, my profile has a funny, funny little uh, profile section, <laughs> I guess. Uh, that I that I that I worked worked super hard on, man. I worked so hard on that. Uh, yeah. Uh, what I do see very underrepresented in the the moderator side of things is any any slice of life fans. There are actually actually none that I saw. No no like big time slice of life fans, uh, which is a little upsetting. Uh, it's a little bit of a shame that there's a sort of a side of the community that is it is very underrepresented, and that happens to be the part of the community that that I, you know, I am a part of. Uh, should we should we keep looking at some of these staff members? Let's look at the admins. Lead administrator. What's the lead administrator of Mao's taste? We've got some sort of the oh oh the lead and oh no, oh no the lead admin. Is, is like a. And uh, oh, oh no. 
No wonder the site is bad. They're like a, a Fujo. They're like a Fujo. Oh no. Oh no. Uh, okay, let's continue going through. Let's see these people's tastes. Um, we got a, a, a site administrator. Uh, seen plenty of shows, but but again, no, not not really a slight. I kill so Giga. That's kind of cute, girlsy, a little bit. Um, in their top ten, but but nothing beyond that. We're still looking for for a cute girls focused uh, focused person. Oh, this person says favorites. Uh, one of them is slice of life, but their top ten. Index Season 2, Blue Axis, Psychopast, uh, with actually no, no cute girl, uh, uh, maybe Shiro Bako could count, uh, oh, Girls and Panzer, that counts, okay, I'm not going to say this is like a hard, uh, uh, a proper slice of lifey person, but we've got a little bit of, of representation here, you know, represent, people always talk about representation matters, well, we're going to go through and we're going to actually see if Mal takes this seriously. Does representation actually matter to these people? Um, next up is Kuro Cyrus's Kyra's. Um, we're getting some Maihime, a little bit of Higurashi, Tajabaki Monogatari, some Lane, a little bit of Summer Wars, a sprinkle of Kyara no Kyokai 5, Ava 2.0, you cannot, uh, what is that? You cannot advance. Uh, Full Metal Panic for Mofu, oh, Obscure, nice, I like that. Toradora, cringe, panty and stocking with garter belt, not bad. Nisekoi, interesting. Noir. Noir in your top 20? That is that is interesting taste. Okay, that's surprising. No one likes noir, including me. It's kind of it's kind of awful. Girls and Panzer, a new game. Shirobako, working. Manabi, straight, based. Uh, uh, Mysterious Girlfriend X, Carnival Phantasm, and Yoru Camp. Okay, so I think I think this is the most based... Mal administrator so far. We've also got a casual one three three seven completed. There's no universe. There's no way you you've got one three three seven completed. That's so okay. This is the clearly the most based Mal admin. Uh, only thing D based, heavily D based. I gotta say, Asuka profile picture. I'm pretty sure that's Asuka. That's kind of cringe, and also Toradora is kind of cringe, but. And also, working is kind of cringe. And also, new game is kind of cringe. But, we do have Manabi Straight and Yuru Camp. Uh, and Full Metal Panic for No Fruit, which is, which is kind of based. Um, uh, next admin, we got a, we got Kimono Friends, but, but not really any. Oh, and Binchotan. Uh, Binchotan is, 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 is interesting. I wouldn't really... Again, the, the only actual thing that I would count as a true like like no qualms cute girls anime so far is Gakuen Utopia Manabi Straight. Um we're we're still seeing a severe lack of representation for the slice of life fan base amongst the moderation staff of my anime list. Uh, so just a severe lack. I'm going through them. I'm not talking about everyone. Uh but 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 no we're 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 seeing a severe lack of of representation. Uh for, for this entire side of the fan base here. Uh, I'm going through, okay, we, we've gone through, we've gone through all of, all of the, 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 the administrators, and now we're going through some of the moderators again. I'm just going to keep going. I'm just, I'm just going to let you know if I, if I see anything, anything interesting. Uh, uh, nothing here really. Uh, fucking Anohana. I, I don't know, something's wrong with you. Uh, nothing. Kaguya, cringe. Uh, no game, no life is good, but nah. Now, just Naruto. Nothing else except for Naruto listed in your favorites. Kind of based. Kind of based. Uh... Show again, Rokudaku. I mean, these are good shows, but they're not. They're not slice of life. They're not moe moe anime. I think that's what I should actually be folk, like saying is like we just have a lack of moe anime representation. None there. 
This this one. None there. Okay, we're keeping going. There's there's simply very few Moe fans in the My Anime List administration. I think this is actually the fundamental problem. Yeah, this this nothing. This one. School Rumble? Not really. No, I don't think I can count any of this. Uh, nope. Nothing here. Fucking Eureka 7. You're wrong. That is not a good show. <laughs> and again, once again, no. Now, again, I'm not saying these people have bad taste. You know, we have a lot of the classic good good shows in here represented and some more obscure good shows like Bincho Tan and Manabi Stray uh, and stuff like this so you know there's a lot of Mushishi a lot of No Game No Life uh, Natsume Yujin Sho uh, you know we got we got plenty of plenty of decent taste here as well as like you know Lane and Ava and stuff like that uh, but but simply a lack a lack of of moe and cute girls and this is this is somewhat upsetting frankly this is a this is a real problem i I've, I've always felt like moe shows w were prejudiced against by my anime list and uh i think i'm i'm finally finding out why uh nope still nothing still nothing Mermaid Melody, that's a, that's a, a fucking, it's not a Moe show. This is, this may be the highest possibility of having a Moe show. Uh, we do have a place further in the universe here. Um, and, uh, what is this? Is this, oh, Mash Edo Symphony, the color, I've never even heard of this. This seems kind of. Uh, this this looks like a visual novel adaptation, kind of based. Um, but but again, nothing nothing very moe here. Baby metal themed profile, interesting. Less than three hundred shows completed, and I'm I'm sure you're going to be able to guess, none of them are moe shows. Mostly like magical high school shows actually. Um. Yeah. No. Once again, no no moe shows here. It's just, well, I mean, uh, that's pretty much it. I've pretty much gone through all of them, except the Discord and social media team. And uh, we've just seen a severe lack of representation in the mal stuff of Moe fans. I think, I think this represents a real problem. They don't know how to run a website, and none of them like the good part of anime. <laughs> or, <laughs> sorry, a little bit presumptuous. But none of them, you know, there's a, a big part of the fandom here which is not represented in any of the moderation or administration stuff of this website, I think it's clear that that's a, that that's a, represents a severe flaw in, in the way that this site is managed. I, I think it needs to be addressed. I, I, maybe I should uh, make a video, a standalone video about this. Um, I, in fact, I think I will make a standalone video about this. Uh, I think this represents a serious problem with the site. And maybe I should just <laughs> move to Annulist. But then I don't get my cool CSS. I like my CSS, it's fun. Just to say, the CSS is important to me. Like, having the, the, the old school website ability to actually customize the way your profile looks is good. That is a good thing that Mal does. They hide it behind menus these days, right? They don't make it easy to do anymore. It used to be very easy to do. It used to be sort of the default for old school Mal users. But nowadays they hide it behind menus and they give you this like pre-made custom thing. And if they ever remove the ability to do stuff like that, I, I will probably leave the site. Um, I'm tempted to do so right now, but uh, it, it would be a bit annoying since I've linked to my Mal in so many places. I suppose I could just put a note in my profile that says moved to Annie list. With a link. I guess I could just do that. I'll think about it. I feel like there was kind of a a dip. A dip in anime quality. 
Like, like there was 2016, which was a, a great year for anime. Shoragen no Kudakyo Shinju came out. That's that's one thing. Uh, Take You Season 7. I'm just going to go through them all. Oyashan wa Shishunki. Underrated show. Uh, what else have we got? Maho Shoujo Nante Mo Kara. Great show. Now Switch Komogi Chan R. Great show. Uh, what else? That's, uh, that's winter. Then, ReZero was a big event. Uh, even though, and Bungo Stray Dogs is very popular as well. Sakamoto Deska is great. Space Patrol Ludico, Flying Witch, Kaysniver, High School Fleet, uh, Shonen Maid, uh, Sancha Sanyo. I fucking love Sancha Sanyo. Uh, Unhappy's kind of mid. Uh, Netoge no Yonne wa onna no ko janai desu kara. Uh, death. Wait. Netoge no Yonne wa onna no ko janai tomota. It's a fun otaku focus show. Bakuon. Uh, Kuma Miko, which I, I will never forgive for betraying me. Kuma Miko betrayed me more than any show has ever betrayed me in, in my life. And then you get to summer. Mob Psycho 100. Psyche Kusuo, right? Shokuyaki no Soma, Relife, 91 Days, New Game, right? Uh, fucking Fate Prisma Ilya 3 Ray, which kind of sucked, but whatever. Uh, Love Life Sunshine, which I don't like, but is very popular. A Manchu, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, like these are a rewrite. You know, I mean, it's more like a, the visual novel is better, so I've heard, but, you know, it's still key, big key adaptation. Uh, and then, we're not done yet, another season of Natsu Made Yujin Show, who cares? But then, Sangatsu no Lion, Hibiki Euphonium Season 2, uh, fucking, um, do, 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 Yuri on Ice was a big event. Flip Flappers, uh, www.working, I don't know what this is, but this is some A1 picture show, I don't, I don't know what that is, who cares, uh, uh, Shankatsu no Taki Musume, great show, underrated, um, Vivid Strike, uh, P Kiss Him Not Me, Keijo, Girlish Number, Stella no Maho, and uh, I think that's about it. Long Riders, weird ass fucking show. Uh, yeah. Like, and Nyanbo. Uh, and the second season of Maho Shoujo and Nantemori Diskara. And Bernard Joe Iwaku, which is actually bad, but what I'm saying here is that 2016 was a really good year for anime. And you get to 2017, and it's like, there's some, some fun stuff. Low Witch Academia, Main Dragon, actually pretty good. Gabriel Dropout, Kimono Friends, actually really good. Urara Men Rencho, uh, uh, right, pretty, we're, we're doing pretty good. Nyanko Days, right, pretty good, pretty good. But then, as far as I remember, it starts to sort of fall off around here. Uh... Yeah, nothing super good. Um, sort of, uh, yeah, nothing except for Akajic Records, which is cool. Uh, Alice Tozokuro, which is underrated. Um, yeah, Awari Monogatari is fun. Made in Abyss, new games, not, not that great. Uh, yeah, it's it sort of starts to fall off. Gamers, Aho Girl, like kind of mid stuff, kind of mid stuff. That Centaur anime that I still haven't seen. Isekai was smartphone totomony, right? We're in that era of anime now, squarely. But then you got Hoseki no Kuni, you know, and Shoujo Sumatsu Ryoko, right? Like some some good stuff is in there. Uh, Net Juno Susume, Konohana Kitan. Uh, and then you get to 2018, and I feel like this is 
I don't know, maybe anime never actually fell off. I mean, Yuga Camp was good. Everyone likes Place Further Than the Universe. Uh, Takagi-san is good. Um, Pop Team Epic was kind of mid, actually, on reflection. Slow Start is good. Uh, Ryo no Oshigoto is, is good, really good. Um, Ramen Daisuke, Koizumi-san. Death March, Kara Hajimaro, Isekai, Kyo, Death March, the Palo, or Rhapsody, which is just unfairly ripped on. Beatless. Beatless is a weird fucking show. Super weird show. Um, but then you got like Steins Gate Zero. Eh. Water Koi. Eh. Golden Kamui. I know a lot of people like it, but in my opinion, pretty eh. Um, Comic Girls based Comic Girls great Uma Musume pretty good uh, second season of a Manchu um, what else have we got here I don't know maybe anime never really fell off I just get the vibe that it fell off yeah like here it just feels like like I mean I don't know summer 2018 that I don't think there was anything good Yaman of Susume, third season, maybe. Hatarako Saibo, maybe. At a stretch. I know some people liked Planet With, but I, I don't know. I, Jashin Chan, Dropkick, I really wish I could like, but it has a really great aesthetic and really a great character design, but is unfortunately not very funny for a comedy show. Um, yeah, nothing, nothing really good. <laughs> Uh, get into fall 2018 again. We've got like Bunny Girl Senpai, JoJo's, uh, a Slimy Sekai is fun. Uh, Slimy Sekai is good. Uh, but, but that's kind of looking like it. I mean, Zombie Land Saga was kind of hit or miss in my opinion. Uh, Goblin Slayer was also pretty divisive. Uh, Tonai no Kiketsuki-san is, is a good show. Um... Anime Yell I still haven't seen. Uh, but you know, we're kind of we're kind of in the like we're not we're not in twenty sixteen and and winter twenty seventeen levels anymore. Promised Neverland, disappointing Mob Psycho season two. Uh it seems like Dororo is like a modern classic that everyone loves. I actually haven't seen it. Um uh Water Ten based Water 10 obviously based. Um, uh, but, uh, and a, a lot of people, I don't know, I, I, Endro was kind of interesting, but, but, but I did, didn't work for me, unfortunately. I kind of, kind of upset about that because I think it had a lot of potential, but I, you know. Uh, and you have the rise of VTubers with Virtual Sun Wamiteiru. And then you get to 2019, and it's just still just mid. We're just in midland. Like, this whole period from, like, uh, mid-2018, we're, in, we're now in mid-2019, it's still midland. you got Kimetsu no Yaiba, whack. Kowloon Tuesday, whack. Like, it's all whack. Fucking uh, Shinjeki, no Ko, Shinjeki no Kyojin, Season 3, Part 2, whack. It's all whack, right? Uh, Hitori Bochi was pretty good, but... Like, you were seriously lacking in in good shows. Senko-san was fun, I guess. Uh, but that's kind of it. It's kind of all we're, all we're looking at here. Yeah, keep going. You keep going. You got Vinland, Mid, Saga. Dr. Stone's fun, I guess. Uh, uh, Machikado Mazoku, I thought was fine. I, I know someone who's really into that show, but I never got super into it. Um... Yeah, just nothing, like, super stand out. Son and this car was weird, but not actually good. Um, yeah, yeah, no, nothing nothing good here in summer 2019. You get to fall 2019. Uh, still, like, we're kind of in mid-city. We're kind of in mid-city right now. Still, I mean, I know some people like Beast Stars, maybe. Um... 
But no, we're, this is just complete mid, mid fucking city. Just nothing good at all here. Just, yeah. Anime fell off. I wasn't wrong. Anime did just fell off for a while. Like, yeah, we're just in mid city here. Just true mid city. Nothing, nothing really good. Uh, yeah. Like, if your number one thing is Chihaya for season three, you know it was a bad season. Uh, but then, 2020, you get Azoken, which is a fucking actual modern classic masterpiece. Ishizoka Reviewers, that was fun. Bofuri, pretty good show. It's like, we're start, you know, you, you get your one masterpiece, and suddenly, it's like, hold on a minute. Things are, things are looking up. Things are looking up again. The, uh, you know... And and you, you keep going through twenty twenty, but then you know it kind of falls off a little bit. Okay, the next the next twenty twenty season, nothing really stand out here. Nothing good. Uh, nothing nothing particularly good. Uh, that I remember. I think I dropped every show I started this season. I know there were some people that were a big fan of Princess Connect Redive, but uh, I didn't find it to be anything particularly special. Uh, you keep going through 2020, we're kind of, we had a little spike with Azoken, but honestly, uh, we're still kind of in mid-territory here in 2020. Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty cringe, pretty mid. Fall 2020, we're still kind of in cringe mid-territory, Jujutsu Kaisen, Haikyuu, Golden Kamui, still kind of in mid-territory, but hold on a second, here to bring us out of the Dark Age, Gotchi Yusa Season 3. Here to bring us out of the goddamn dark age, and this was the start of something, uh, something real. Because by the time you get to winter twenty twenty one, I'm you've got Euro Camp season two, based, slimy Sekai season two based, Mushoku Tensei, not bad. Um, uh, right, we're starting to get something. We're starting to get something good, but uh, Kumodesuka Nani da, Nani Nani Ka. Right? Not bad, not bad. Not great, but not bad. Um, the the supposedly good As Your Lane anime, which I haven't seen, but someone recommended me. Uh, I still would say we're not quite out of the mid. We're not quite out of the mid yet. But we're, we seem to be slowly clawing our way back out of the mid. Um... Uh, and then you get to the next season, nothing notable here. Kinda of, kinda of mid kinda of mid we're still in the mid in the mid territory. I mean Super Cup maybe? Nagatoro, maybe. Uh but but we're kind of still in mid midland. Uh the I like the I killed slimes for three hundred years anime. That was fun. That was a fun isekai that came out. Oh and and uh Yakunana Mug Cup. Mug Cup? Super underrated show. Really highly recommend Mug Cup, honestly. Uh, I know it's a weird name for a show. Yakunara Mug Cup more. But it's genuinely one of the best slice of lives to come out recently. So that's bringing... We're, we're, but we're still kind of in Midland. Like, I feel like we're still kind of in Midland. The second season of Maid Dragon, which I thought was ass... Uh, yeah, we're, st- we're definitely in Midland here. Um, you know, all summer ranking. I know some people like this. Komi-san. This is in recent memory. But, like, nothing actually really good was coming out until, like, you get to 2022. And suddenly, it feels like just all of a sudden anime became good again. But I'm trying to figure out exactly when this happened. I think this was kind of the start. This was the start because you had... Akebi chan no Seda Fuku, you had Slow Loop. And uh Actually I think the previous season you'd had uh Hataraku Saibo, right? I don't remember. Uh Irodori Midori, no that kind of sucked. Uh but then you get to Sprint I'm I'm I keep saying this as if something's gonna happen. You got mid X family, cringe, Kaguya Sama, absolute fucking mid. Um but uh, Daimon, 
looks really good. I haven't seen it yet, but it, it's probably going to be really good. I'm excited. Aharan san wa hakaranai. That was a fun show. Uh, Kunoichi Tsubaki no Mune no Uchi. Not bad. Not bad at all. Um, you know, Onipan. Onipan. Interesting show. Konohira Mendoksai. That was kind of fun. Um, and then summer 2022. I don't know. It feels like we're still kind of in Midland, but we're also like a little bit not in Midland. Isekai Yakyo. I watched this. Oh yeah, that was good. Isekai Yakyo is really good. Actually, Isekai Yakyo is actually, actually a really good at Isekai. I, I actually recommend that one. Um, fall 2022 then that's like last season like suddenly you got Bocce the Rock you got Mob Psycho 3 Chainsaw Mid Spy Fabs Mid Family Season 2 but Bocce the Rock and Akiba Made Senso which lots of people really like um, The Sword Isekai Tensei Shitara Ken Deshita which I haven't seen the anime, but I've read the manga and I liked it. Uh, Do it, you are Serafu, which uh, I'm kind of a. Uh... Bocchi the Rock being as successful as this is, is is kind of a shock, but but a, a, definitely a, a positive. Um, Do it yourself, a, a a pretty pretty big disappointment to me, because uh because of the annoying side characters and nothing else. Um, I feel like the show could have been so much better with a, a smaller cast and uh, a more focused on three or four first, like the, the sort of three or four main characters are introduced at the beginning rather than introducing a bunch of pointless and annoying side characters that kind of ruin the, the show. Uh, but I, I've only watched four episodes of Do It Yourself and I do plan to at least continue in the hopes that it maybe gets better so uh that's definitely a possibility that that's good i just don't i just don't know <sighs> the new fucking digi chat came out i forgot about that i still i actually haven't finished it because i literally forgot it existed and now all of a sudden you know we got fucking such masterpieces as Buddy Daddies. No, I, I, I'm, I, I jest, of course, I jest. Uh, we, we got, we got, fucking, something good, I think. What was it? Oh yeah, Oni Mai. Oni Mai is good. Is that the only good show this season? I'm, I'm basically unaware of everything else. <laughs> uh, what else is even airing? Uh, Ayakashi Triangle might be might be fun fun throwback I don't know. Uh, honestly, looking, uh, very little actually looks super super good this season. So I might have been wrong about anime coming out of its mid era. I think anime might be mid again. I think I think we might be more mid than I expected. Although I've heard Tensei Ojo to Tensei Dejo no Maho Kakume is is a good manga. Um, yeah, I don't know about the, any of this animes. You know what? This was kind of pointless. I don't think I don't think I was able to draw a, a satisfying conclusion at all. There was, I think what I've actually, the conclusion I've actually drawn is that there was like a couple of years where people weren't making good slice of life shows and now they're making good slice of life shows again. Because we've had like Hataraku Seibo, Slow Loop, uh, Bocchi the Rock, D DIY, um, there was another one that I've forgotten. But yeah, there, there was, yeah. And what's even going to happen next season? All sorts of stuff. All sorts of stuff is going to happen next season. Some of it looks terrible. Oh, there's another season of Doctor Stone. I'll watch it. Uh, at what looks to be a terrible isekai. That sounds fun. This also looks like a terrible isekai. 
down. This is a uh, pretty suggestive thumbnail. Very, this looks like a very harumy, harumy isekai. <laughs> I'm kind of curious to see what that's like. I've never seen a, a thumbnail where I have, but whatever. The second season of Isekai Smartphone? Fuck it, I'll watch it. I don't give a fuck. I thought Isekai was dying. Oh, is this another season of Konosuba? Wait, what is this? A spin-off? Oh, it's a, it's a Megumin-focused spin-off of Konosuba. Huh, that sounds pretty fucking sick. Uh, I'm looking for the cute girls doing cute things tag, and frankly, I'm not seeing it, and that's worrying me. I'm looking for that tag in next season, and I'm not seeing it. There is a slice of life. This looks more like a... I, it might be fun. It looks like more of a serious kind of slice of life. Uh, second season of Kuma 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 Bear. I've already read the manga, so I don't really want to watch that. Uh, nope, nope, nope. I'm not seeing the cute girls doing cute things tag at all. I thought Isekai was like slowly dying. Oh yeah, Watashi no Yuri wa Shigoto des. Uh, looks looks good. That's that's the actual show that I might watch next season. I think. Well, I might watch Smartphone and Isekai season two for the for the lols. Uh, but I think a a name a show with a name like Yuri is my job. I mean, like that's just that's just interesting, right? I don't know. I don't have. I'm I'm way less anime pilled than I used to be. Uh I don't know why. I just am. I know this video is literally over ten hours long. Um but I do wanna say I don't know if other people are interested in this stuff. I mean maybe. But I am. I am literally watching Two simultaneous 12 hour long videos right now. I am watching a video by Casual TF2 called Talking About Peel Bad Water for 12 Hours. I'm about three and a half hours into that video. And I'm also watching a video by a channel called The Library of Letourneux, I guess, or Letourneau. Uh, which is a, a Northern Lion clip channel called the Unwatchable Switch Sports Supercut, which is 11 hours, 59 minutes, and 47 seconds long of Northern Lion playing Switch Sports. Um, so, so I do watch this shit. I do watch ridiculously long YouTube videos and enjoy them. Uh, so fuck you if you don't like it, is my point here, I suppose. Uh, yeah. I'm tired. I'm gonna go to bed in a bit. Anyway, I was gonna say something, other than just YouTube videos, but I don't remember what it was. But it's something about anime? Think about visual novels. Think about visual novels, right? Is that most visual novels just have the same problem, which is that I really enjoy reading the common route, and then I read like two of the characters' individual routes and get bored, because they're never as good as the common route, and it's hard to know which ones are good, and it's also I I don't know they're too they they're too damn long. Like, the common routes are never long enough, and the character routes are never short enough. The character routes always take t too damn long. They always have terrible sex scenes that don't serve any purpose. Not always. Sometimes, 
the sex scenes are good and do serve a purpose or are just hot. They, those do exist. I've seen them, but that's a that's kind of an exception rather than the rule. Normally, they go on for way too long and they're kind of mid. Uh, and and yeah, I don't. I just like I just like reading the common roots. Maybe I should just be marking, like, visual novels as complete if I've read through at least one entire route. Because uh, right now, I've marked, like, way more VNs as dropped than I have as completed. But the ones that I've dropped, I've, like, played through at least half of. Like, uh, or more. Um, yeah, they're just really long. And the other thing is, well, actually, that's not such a big deal. But they're very long, and that's kind of annoying. And it's it's a uh, it's especially annoying when you're on a route that you're not super invested in, like with um, the VN that I'm sort of reading, or I was reading, but I haven't been reading recently, uh, which I have currently forgotten the name. Son of a witch, right? Son of a witch. The first route that I read, which is sort of the main girl's route, uh, I've actually forgotten her name right now, so I'm going to have to go look this up. Uh, uh, one second, one second. Okay, there we go. Um, uh, Ayachi Nene, which was the first route I did, uh, I wouldn't say it was amazing, but it seemed like her route had a lot of thought put into it, and it had a lot of, like, emotional pathos. Whether or not it was actually well executed, you know, it's up to debate, but at least, like, it had some drama sort of driving the plot forwards that felt like it was legitimate and meaningful to the people who wrote it. Uh, but the next route I'm doing, which is Meguru's route, which is what I'm currently, like, halfway through, or probably more than halfway through, uh, doesn't really have that. It's a lot more just sort of awkward romance that doesn't really have anything else going for it, except that they can't just stretch that out for an infinite amount of time. So they just sort of force um, uh, uh, problems. Uh, like, the problems don't feel like they come as a natural consequence of the laws of the world. They just they just sort of come from nowhere, and, and sometimes this leads to some absolutely brain-dead retard plot moments in this... Uh, there's been an especially brain dead retard plot moment, uh, which is it involves the complicated magic system and rules of the the world, which is kind of confusing and I can't really explain it. Um, but just know that there's a a a bit that is supposed to be the uh, or at least a emotional pathos climax happy moment uh, of romance, uh, but instead comes across as comedic and insane <laughs> uh, yeah but I do like I am interested in playing through the other routes like Inaba Meguru is is like I don't know kind of mid as a girl uh, I don't know I, and I'm also interested in playing through the hidden route I, like the, the, I am interested that it's not like these are shit tier girls. I'm just a shit tier person who read a lot, but not a lot. If you know what I mean, like it's it's just too much. Like I I, they're they're too damn long. They need an editor. I actually think this is genuine. Like this has been a problem with a lot of visual novels, is that they like people are paying forty to sixty dollars for these games in Japan, and well, it's about forty dollars. People are paying $40 for these games in Japan, and they want, like, their money's worth, so they expect them to be really long. Um, but the fact that they're really long doesn't make them better. Like, some of them need to be that length. Subahibi needs to be as long as it is. I think there's some scenes even in that that go on for too long, but, like, pretty much, that needs to be as long as it is. Cross Channel needs to be as long as it is. Uh, there's yeah, there's a few like this, right? There's there's quite a few that that are like a good length and they have good pacing, but a lot of visual novels are they feel very stretched out, especially after the common route. Once you get into the character routes, and yeah, they just feel very stretched out and poorly paced. This is something I've just noticed as a pattern, which is it's just kind of frustrating and it makes them hard to finish, and then that makes me feel bad. 
I mean, I'm at ten hours. I I can easily do two more. I may as well go for it, right? <laughs> I may as well go for the twelve hour, the twelve hour podcast, and then I can call this video something like the unwatchable twelve hour long podcast, which is a pretty good title, I think. So I'll just go with that. Let me make a note of that, actually. Uh, The unwatchable. Okay. Yeah, fuck it. You you all have already known this. You have more information than me. But but I'm in the past, so but I'm also in the future. If you're watching this. Wait. That doesn't make any sense. I I haven't finished watching one. <sighs> Focus, I'm too tired. I'm not going to podcast. I'm literally yawning every two seconds. During the small window of time when NFTs were a thing, uh, YouTube was actually briefly considering adding some sort of integration of NFTs into their website. Uh, And uh, obviously there was a lot of pushback by YouTubers as well as just users of the website as expected um now i think there are some legit you know i'm not just being a contrarian here like youtubers are constantly complaining about not making enough money from youtube even though they're all rich as fuck it doesn't make any sense but you know i i don't understand mid-sized to small-sized creators have a lot of trouble making any money all the money goes to the biggest creators the argument would be that NFTs represent another way to monetize your YouTube channel and drive, you know, viewers to your thing and make money, and that's good for the ecosystem, which, you know, maybe, I don't don't know. The point I really want to make here is NFTs are bad, right? I think we all agree on this by now. Hopefully it's not a controversial thing to say. Um, And YouTubers were complaining about it, uh, but I'm what I find interesting here is that no YouTuber is that the the YouTubers make their money right now primarily through advertising, which is not a morally neutral thing. Like shilling ads, shilling like oftentimes possible scam products like that that uh, that one that was supposed to make you a Scottish lord. Uh, and, and you know unreliable products like uh, those those uh, headphones, the 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 ones that are like shitty Raycons, right? Or uh, um, exploitative products like like Raid Shadow Legends, which is like a gambling microtransaction mobile game, um, or or products which occasionally used to use false advertising. Like the VPN companies before the Tom Scott video that scared them off of doing false advertising, uh, you know that like YouTubers are perfectly comfortable with that moral burden, but NFTs that's going too far. It's like hold on a second, and sure, you know a lot of a lot of YouTubers they make a lot of money by by Patreon or members or merch sales or uh, maybe they advertise you know more responsible things. But even then, like having a creator advertise something to you is even if the product itself isn't a problem, it like that in itself is at least raises some questions. I don't actually, you know, I don't see any of it because I use sponsor block. Uh, but you know, even even that in itself raises some moral questions. I think as to like you know the nature of. Having some sort of parasocial person advertise to you. I don't know. I just I just want to point it out. YouTubers, very, the NFT is bad. Too, too immoral way of making money. But shilling products and all advertising. Oh, not to mention, of course, actually, I should have mentioned this first. Even if they're not doing sponsorships... They're still making money through YouTube primarily because YouTube is serving ads. And those ads are definitely immoral. Those ads 
are completely privacy violating. I mean, not that morality is real, obviously, but like those ads are completely privacy violating. So YouTubers, suddenly they have a bunch of ethics and morality about how they choose to make money when it comes to NFTs, but they're perfectly fine making as much money as possible. In fact, complaining when they don't make money off of uh, Google uh, stealing all of your data and breaching your privacy and, and, and are advertising to you. As, and, and they're also perfectly happy themselves shilling dodgy products and advertising to you. So, I don't know. Fuck YouTubers. I watched this YouTube video uh, the other day. I feel like maybe maybe a lot of stuff I talk about starts with that sentence. Um, I'm actually going to see if I can find it, because I want to remember. I think the guy who made its name was like Pars or something. It's, it's, it's this channel with very few subscribers that I somehow am subscribed to, and I, I don't remember. Yeah, Pars. P-A-R-Z. Uh, yeah. Pause. I don't don't know how I found this channel, but less than less than a thousand subs. Uh, recommend, maybe kind of, uh, kind of normie YouTube, but kind of like small. May it could be good. Anyway, they made this video, and I had two interesting. Oh yeah, the video is called. Uh, it's got a really cringe clickbait title, but the video is called. YouTube shorts will destroy YouTube. Here's how. Uh, and um, so there's two sort of paradigm shift moments in this video. Uh, uh, I'm trying to. Oh yeah, two two interesting nuggets of information. The first one is that TikTok has apparently been caught, um, purposefully, de-emphasizing certain videos, not for like censorship reasons or anything like that, but rather they give you a big hit video where the, their algorithm shows it to more people or they just artificially inflate the views. And then they purposefully give you a series of videos that don't do very well to make you feel bad in order to trigger like an addiction response where you want that good feeling again, but you can't get it. And so you keep you keep using the app for longer and trying harder to get that dopamine uh, from a successful video. And that's pretty fucked up. And it, it made me realize that I bet e- just because TikTok's been caught, I bet every algorithm does a similar thing. I bet Google is doing the same thing. I bet Twitter is doing the same thing. I bet Instagram is doing the same thing. Like, the, I bet they're all doing this, which is, it's pretty fucking insidious. <laughs> uh, I guess it shouldn't surprise me. I just never thought of it before. Uh, this is why if you should never worry about quote unquote getting big on the internet, which comes to my next thing that I learned from this video, which is Paz says at one point, uh, for most people, something along the line, I don't remember the exact quote, but something along these lines, for most people, the point of the internet is to go viral. Their main goal on the internet is to go viral. And this, like, sounds obvious in hindsight, but I had never considered this, but it's so true that, like, Norman's they don't go on the internet to do the interesting shit on the internet. They don't go on the internet to discuss things or to learn or to have friendships or anything to, to, to improve themselves or to discover new technologies or anything, whatever the fuck, right? Or to share, you know, stuff that they know. They go on the internet to go viral. That's their goal. Isn't that fucking insane? Holy shit. Like, when people are, and I noticed, like, even I've kind of done it a little bit. Like, back when I used to use Twitter, I would definitely craft tweets in a way that I felt may have, like, changed the messaging because I thought they would pop off more if I did it like that. And I don't really do that with YouTube anymore. Or actually, I kind of never have. I just make whatever YouTube videos I want to make. Uh, I have no desire to quote-unquote go viral. Um... And with music, uh, I have a kind of, uh, I think I I have like a happy medium where I also just kind of like making uh, somewhat more mainstream sounding or poppy or catchy uh, indie songs as much as I also like making very experimental drone, ambient, inharmonic, you know, that type of stuff. I I like making both kinds of music. I would never make an all-out pop song or like a all-out mainstream EDM song. Like, these things aren't interesting to me. 
but I have fun making, uh, you know, all sorts of music. And so I think I, you know, I, I think it's good to release singles that are very poppy and then albums that are more experimental. I think that's how I have the most fun. And it also, it feels like a, uh, I don't know, I, I, I think it's a good system. Uh, I, I, I also just don't want to make albums that are very poppy. Like, making a really poppy song just takes a lot longer than making a more experimental song often. Uh, because they have to be much more produced, and that just takes time. And so making a very poppy, well-produced, or overproduced album uh, would take, like, and I, I've done this before, um, maybe not to the extent of a of, of pop album, but, um, you know, making more produced albums just takes a lot longer, uh, and it kind of loses its fun. Because, you know, something that I think people don't really talk about that much is you know that thing where you listen to a song so much that you start to like like i've just i've just heard that too many times even if the song isn't bad you just start to hear, hear it too many times and it sort of stops working on you like you can have that with your own music and it kind of sucks the fun out of it it starts to feel like a chore like i've had that happen before where certain songs i've just been working on for so long that they just sound like noise to me and firstly, it makes it kind of into a chore. But secondly, it actually makes it really hard to exercise artistic judgment. Like you can't tell if the song is good anymore because like you, you've, you've heard it too many times. You know you've heard it too many times. And so you start to lose faith in your own judgment. Like, do I just not like this because I've heard it too many times? Or is the song actually bad? Or is the song actually like bad in real life? But I just think I'm just assuming it's good and assuming that that's I just think it doesn't sound good because I've heard, you know what I mean? It can have problems like this, right? Uh, so I don't particularly want to make very, very highly produced, um, very highly produced uh, albums, but sorry, that was kind of a tangent. I think this, this, like everyone just wants to go viral is kind of insane to me. Like, but it must, it's so true, right? Like that's, that's, that's so everyone's goal. Like, wow, that's literally to everyone else. The internet is a big slot machine where they put in their quarters and, and you know, they get a little likes occasionally. And then once in a while, you know, their, their end goal is a jackpot where, where you, you go viral. Like, that's fucking insane. And, and then maybe, because, because, you know, maybe if you do that, then you might be able to make money off of it and uh, and not have to work your shitty job or, or something like this, which is just speaks to how fucking awful people's lives are and uh, how w weird this dream of like becoming a YouTuber kind of is or, or something like that. No, I, I have no desire to go viral for its own sake. I would, I would like to have a small community... Uh, you know, the only, the only reason that I would ever want more fans is because making stuff takes time and money, and I have plenty of time, but not that much money, uh, and I would, you know, that would be nice, but also, doesn't everyone kind of want more money? Like, at the end of the day, if I really wanted money that much, I could find other ways to make it, uh, and I'm, I'm doing fine, like, I'm not particularly... Well, my money situation is complicated. I don't really want to get too into it because it's kind of boring. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I think I think I'll be fine for a good few years now. From now, um, yeah. Anyway, that just kind of blew my mind a little bit. Those two things, like how far into the addictive rabbit hole everyone is, it's insane. Like I think I don't know. It's weird. The stuff just doesn't work on me. I said this before. At some point, it just, some of it never worked on me. Like, the idea of going viral. When I was really young, when I was, like, like first discovering YouTube and stuff like that, I, I thought I could be a... The first YouTube videos I ever made, actually, I only made one of these, was in Windows Movie Maker. And it was, I, I thought that I could be... I thought I'd figured out, like, a cheat for the algorithm, which was, you remember Ray William Johnson was super popular. And what he would do is he would just take funny videos and add some, like, comedic, well, quote-unquote comedic, I found it funny at the time, like, commentary over the top of them after it. And I thought, well, what if, what if I just record a, like, template that could be applied to any video? So I, I, 
I record a template where I come in and I say like, hey guys, and welcome to today's video of the week. Like we're gonna take a look at the, the viral video of the week and here it is. And then the video would play, uh, which would be like a short sort of funny video like was popular back then. The one that I actually made was a, a video of a guy running into running and jumping into a wall. Uh, which you may have seen, but there's a lot of videos like that. Uh, but it's one of them that you, is pretty famous, uh, of a guy like running and jumping into the wall, which I found hilarious. It was that, and then the video would play, and then I would have the second part of the template, which goes, wasn't that a really funny video? Subscribe, and like that sort of thing. And I figured if I could just make, I could just make one of those a week, where I just use the same template and drag a different video in, I, I would be basically be able to cheat the algorithm and become famous. That was, I mean, I only uploaded one and it got, I think, literally two views and then I deleted it and like actually deleted it, not just privated it. So that's just lost forever, which is fine. Uh, but that I was very young when I made that. I had no, I mean, you can tell from the idea that I didn't really have any conception of what sort of thing. But, you know, I've like beyond literally that, I didn't really have any desire to gain massive fame and fortune on the internet um uh, i really don't want to be famous actually not like particular i don't really want to be famous and it, it seems like being famous would suck everyone says you know that being famous sucks and i just believe them <laughs> like no one seems to believe them all of these all of the famous people are like yeah it just kind of sucks like the money's nice but if you can choose between being rich and famous and just being rich pick just being rich and I just believe them <laughs> like yeah you know what you're probably right if you can you should probably just choose being you know not the famous part I don't really want that level of scrutiny on my my action you know like that's not something I I think I I want I don't think it's something that people really something that people really take into account and I, I think you know maybe if I really wanted to push it I could say that in some ways this focus on virality uh, is what opens the door to like public shamings and stuff like this, where everyone is constantly trying to uh, be the next popular thing. And it's like, if you become the pop, you know, the algorithms are designed to feed you the next popular thing. Everything is the next popular thing, but maybe the popular thing is hating on someone. And people are, you know, it, people are, are shepherded into posting stuff that uh is gonna get a lot more scrutiny than it otherwise would anyway i don't want to get too far into that because that's a whole can of worms but i just thought this was interesting that 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 is that is most people use the internet like that and that's fucking insane to me and i think you know what i think we need to be talking about more <laughs> this is a joke by the way the thing i'm about to say let's just make this very clear to any government agencies that might be listening uh this is a joke this is a there's a comedy bit uh, where I'm playing a character, and uh, and it's a joke. Uh, I think we need to be talking more about just killing them. <laughs> I think I think we need to be talking more about lining people up against the wall, and just shooting them. You know, I think we need to be talking more about that. That was my joke. That was my joke. The joke is that the re the humor comes from it's a massive overreaction to posting things on the internet that that isn't really very uh, much of a big deal at all. That's the joke. The comedic, the comedic element comes from the 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 comedic overreaction to a, a fairly minor thing. Uh, just because you know you have to explain these things because government agencies they don't have a very good understanding of humor at all. They uh, <clears throat> you know like uh. That one guy, I don't like this guy. Actually, I'm not. I'm not going to talk about that because uh, it's boring, and you've already you've all already heard about it. Uh, but uh, yeah, you have to explain. You have to if you ever want to make a joke on the internet, you have to make sure that that you kill any possible humor by over explaining the joke. Otherwise, um, someone's going to come for you. Either a government agency or someone who wishes they were the government. You know, I've been using my Mac a lot as my daily driver recently, my daily driver computer, other than the desktop, which I use when I'm playing Vidya, Vidya games, video games even. Um, other than the desktop, I've been mainly using the Mac, 
And there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, the first reason is one of my favorite things about it as a computer, which is it has a really long battery life. Like it can it can last a day without being charged. No, like not even a problem. Uh, I have actually yet to... I think I've run out of charging it once in all the time I've had it. It's got a super massive battery, which is just a, just something that... The one more thing I don't have to worry about ever. And that's nice. So if I'm, like, cooking or, you know, moving around somewhere, I don't have to worry about, oh, is it going to run out of charge or anything like that. That's one thing that means that I have been using my Mac as a daily driver. The second thing is good speakers. I don't have to wear headphones in order to use it. Again, if I'm cooking or going, moving around the house in some way, I can take it with me, unplug, no speakers. I mean, no headphones, no plug, and it's it's good. It's much. It feels more portable than the ThinkPad, which has to have headphones plugged in really to be audible properly. Um, and has a, a pretty low battery life, which maybe I need to just buy a new battery, I don't know, but it doesn't seem to last more than, well, I should probably do a test, actually, I don't know, but the battery's kind of fucked, I'll just put it that way. Uh, that's the X200, oh, X220 I'm talking about. The the X2, the X60 uh, has a longer battery life, uh, but that has, uh, is also not super practical for using, it's, it, because of its low power, um, but, you know, I'm not here to talk about that, I'm here to talk about why I'm specifically using the Mac, which is, the Mac has the best, best speakers, and the best battery, uh, it also has, uh, uh, the, the shortest boot time, so when I wake up, it, it just turns on straight away, no problem, uh, like, almost instantly. It goes, does bong sound for about five seconds. Bong. And now I've logged, now the login screen. Whereas the other, the ThinkPads, they take significantly longer that to boot. And those are really the three things. Those are pretty much it. Those are the three things. However, this is not to say that... Those things actually make the Mac a better computer. Because switching back to the ThinkPad now, which I'll explain why I've done, it really feels like using the Mac, when, I, when I'm on the Mac, I'm using a computer. And when I'm on the ThinkPad, I'm using my computer. But... Uh, yeah, it's just a much more pleasant experience to actually use use the ThinkPad for most things. And now I will talk about what I've been using it for, which is, um, I, I don't, I might have even talked about this in this video. I did, I think, talk about this in this video, but it was probably a few hours ago for you. So if I, in case you need your memory refreshed and just to set it up, uh, at this point, Linux is pretty much on par with every other operating system in almost every... It's either on par or better than every other than, than Windows and Mac. Uh, in pretty much every uh, use case, including video games now, except for video editing, which you can do basic stuff, and there are programs on the way, like Olive, uh, which seem to be and Blender, of course, uh, that that it seems to be only getting better, is my point, but it's not quite there for, like, a professional standard yet, and the big thing that I find is lacking in Linux is music production, which is, like, the big thing that means I have to spend a whole bunch of fucking money on an Apple product, uh, which I hate, and be locked into their ecosystem, and I don't like that, but Linux music creation... Uh, is just extremely limited. Uh, but I I would hope my plan is my ideal is 
that hopefully within the next, let's say, five to ten years, however, hopefully, basically, how, like, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that through a combination of software, act, like new software being developed or existing software being improved, and me learning more tools, by the time this Mac that I'm talking to you on right now breaks, I will no longer need it, and I'll be able to fully transition to to a pure pure Linux basedness. Um, and I took a big step in that direction today uh, because today I learned some of the basics of two programs. Uh, one of them is called VCV Rack, and the other one is called Orca. VCV. I've been interested in Orca for a long time, uh, but VCV Rack I only learned about today. Uh, t in order to use it in combination with Orca. So what are these programs? Well, they are to do with making music. VCV Rack is a uh, modular synthesizer. It's a sort of simulation of like a Euro Rack modular synth on your computer, and it also can. It's open source, although I don't think it's free software and there is a paid version uh, like a subscription service version which has some other features that I, I don't know what they are um, but it's it's open source actually maybe I should check the license because uh, because it is open source it says uh, da, 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 da. let's see GitHub VCV Rack The Virtual Euro Rack Studio uh, Looking for License.md Oh, it's GPL! It is GPL! Okay, it is free software. Oh, wait, Euro Rack free source code and binaries are copyright. Oh, this program is free software. Okay, so VCV Rack is free software GPLv3, pretty based, highly based, and it's uh, it's also really good. <laughs> like it is maybe the best Euro Rack modular synthesizer on a computer simulator emulator type of thing you can you can get, and it's FOSS and it runs natively on Linux, and it's not very resource intensive. It runs perfectly well on my ThinkPad. Uh, and there are the the ecosystem is actually really quite intuitive and um i would say it's just well managed because modular synthesis itself is quite unintuitive <laughs> like modular synthesis if you don't know is is quite complicated um how do i even explain what it is to someone who doesn't know what modular synths are uh, modulus synths are, um, so a synthesizer, right? You buy, you go out and you buy a synthesizer, and it, it, a synthesizer is made up of lots of different parts, right? In order to produce a sound through some form of synthesis, there are many different, like, forms of synthesis. Uh, the most common one is called subtractive synthesis, but there's also frequency modulation or FM synthesis and a whole bunch of others. Uh, uh, but those are processes of somehow creating a wave, right? You have the sound wave that you want in the end, and then there are a bunch of different components which uh, do things to that wave, essentially, to create the sound that you want at the end. You have a waveform, and you, you want to create that waveform, and so you have a whole bunch of different, um, you know... Uh, there are, there are lots of different ways you can affect that waveform. Um, and so if you go out and you buy a synthesizer, that's all built in. But if you, what, what modular synthesis is, is you have a different module that does every step of that process. And you can have lots and lots of different modules and you can mix and match um, however you want. And then one of the most powerful parts of, of modular synthesis is uh, that you can use 
these so so imagine there's like a knob on one of these modules that might be the cutoff or something right you can then using patches which is basically taking a wire and plugging it in one end and plugging it in the other end you can use one module to affect another module's behavior as well as just the sound so you can feed sound through you can you can feed a sound signal through but you can also use what's called control voltage uh, to control parameters uh, in different modules, and they all speak to each other through control voltage, or CV. And using this, you, you can create incredibly complicated synths from the ground up with, you know, a level of control that is pretty extreme. Now, the thing about physical... Uh, oh, and Eurorack is one sort of type of modulus. It's like the most common, uh, I guess, form factor of modulus synth. Like, uh, if you imagine the way there are different, like, gauges of railway. Yeah, I'm a fucking nerd. I went to railway gauges immediately. Like, you've... Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. It's, a, it's like there are different there are different common formats of, of modulus synthesis, and Eurorack is the most popular uh, and so if you have physical Eurorack modules, um, yeah, you have to buy them and plug them in. And oftentimes you have to assemble them. Your, they're like kits that you have to assemble yourself. Um, and yeah, they're really fucking cool. Uh, um, I'm about to have a but in a second. There's going to be a big, there's going to be a, a big like, but the problem is moment. Uh, you might be able to guess what it is, but I'm going to recommend... Um, I believe Andrew Huang has a has a modular synth video. Yes. Uh, if you okay, I think if you go to if you go on YouTube and you look up uh, modular synthesis explained, I think hey, you should be able to find this Andrew Huang video where he talks about his modular synth and and how it works. So it should be good. Uh, he has a really cool modular synth. Uh, they're fucking massive and they look like spaceships that's the that's the point right um but the the big problem with this is they are famously very expensive <laughs> um modules often are very expensive and you can't make sound like you in order to do something new with a sound you have to buy a new module that does that thing right like if you just have an oscillator you you can't do shit with it you need a filter you know an amplifier uh maybe a mixer you know just to even get started and some and then the final step is just being able to make a noise isn't actually that helpful because at the end like without this big component that i'm about to to tell you what it is you can only just make a noise because what you really want to be able to do is sequence things and sequencing in music refers to like you know uh telling something what notes to play and when that sort of thing right like being able to actually lay out uh t being able to tell tell a, 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 a some sort of device in this case a, a modular synth uh, what to play and when to play it without having to do it manually you can you can somehow set up uh some sort of device that that will uh let you input a pattern and then send that signal to a to another device automatically that sort of thing right without you having to actually play a, a keyboard manually or something like that every time you want let's say you yeah that's what a sequencer does sequences automate uh, they sequence, they automate the sequence of notes that's being played. Um, and th yeah, without one of those, you can't really do much musical at all. And this is where Orca comes in. Oh, well, this is where this whole thing comes in. So firstly, obviously modular synths are very expensive, so having a virtual one where everything's free and open source is quite useful. <laughs> um, it's basically exactly the same. It works pretty much exactly the same as a real modular synth. synth. Uh, but it, it's just all on your computer, and it's emulating everything, and it's very cool. Um, modular synthesis is quite weird. Uh, I do know uh, 
quite a bit about synthesis and how it works just from being an experienced musician uh, but even then there's definitely a bit of a learning curve because nothing is done for you you have to do absolutely you have to set up absolutely every part of the, the signal chain yourself which even though I might understand it on a theoretical level just there's a little bit of a learning curve to actually applying that knowledge but it's not too bad I, I think I'm already pretty pretty get getting the hang of it after just a couple of hours of playing around um, and then so a sequencer now you can have sequences in in uh, VCV rack there are sequencer sequencer modules just like there are in real life Euro rack uh, however there is a program which I've been interested in for a really long time called Orca. I've been interested in it because it is by the guys over at 100 Rabbits, who are some of my favorite guys. <laughs> They're very cool. And Orca is a live coding, esoteric programming language sequencer where every letter is a different function. And it's very cool. It uses a really cool grid-based system. And it does. it's not like normal live coding, which is kind of boring, and it's normally just Python. Uh, it's like a whole thing designed from the ground up for live coding music. And uh, it, it looks really cool, and it's very fun. It's quite complicated, as you would imagine. It has a, it has a pretty fucking steep learning curve. Uh, but... Um, it is very powerful as a sequencer. It lets you do all sorts of stuff. It's one of the most powerful sequences I've seen. Uh, you can do all sorts of probabilistic stuff. You can do crazy polyrhythmic or polymetric stuff. You can you can just output all sorts of interesting and crazy things. And you can do it all live with just a keyboard. And it's... And it can run in just your terminal, natively on Linux. There's a terminal version, and it's lightweight and cool. There's also a UXN version, which I have struggled to get MIDI output from. Uh, but I should probably give that another try, because I, I didn't really know what I was doing. Like, I was still learning. And I was generally struggling to get MIDI output from anything until I figured it out. Uh, but I, I'm actually going to give a try to this UXN version of... Orca right now, so let me uxn emu orca dot rom. Um, let me see. Yeah, I don't really see. I think you can write patterns here, but I don't see how where the output is coming from. I think you may be able to. I I don't see how this is output of MIDI. Uh, Yeah, don't really understand this. Okay, well, I'll, I'll get back to it at some point. But the, 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 the C version that runs in your terminal, or the Electron version, which I just used to learn it, but then I'm probably... Cause, I mean, I've already just switched to the terminal version because it's more lightweight. It doesn't make my CPU burn. Uh, yeah, it's just a, a very powerful synthesizer. And uh, I, I released a video on IDMR, which if you don't know about IDMR, IDMR is like my third channel. Um, I mentioned it earlier, uh, though, though uh, I, I'll put a link in the description or something to IDMR, uh, if I remember to do that. Uh, you know what, I'll go right now, right now so that I don't forget, I will go to my channel and let's just make sure there's a link to IDMR somewhere. Uh, your channel. Hi, my name's No Thank You. Yep, my name's No Thank You. Uh, okay, if I go to Customize Channel. And then Featured Channels. Edit Selection Content. Okay, Featured Channels. Channels in Selection. Search for Channels. Oh, good. Aha, uh -huh. okay. I have now added it to featured channels, which I will move up a little bit. Okay, so if you go to my, to the YouTube channel that you're watching this on right now, 
uh, there should be a section on the channel, uh, on like the, the channel page, which says featured channels, and there should be one called No Thank You and one called IDMR. That's my like third channel where I post like uh, random snippet type stuff, generally tests and just little random stuff. Uh, and I posted a, uh, a video of this minimal techno track I made as an experiment uh, with this with this this software, and I think it turned out kind of cool. Um, Yeah. The thing about modular synthesis is it kind of emblematic of my general views on what good technology is, uh, which is stuff that is, uh, I mean, no, aside from the free open source aspect, which is extremely important, but putting that aside for a second, um, good technology uh, should be, you know, human scale, uh, should be understandable by one person. If you want to talk about, like, Anprim stuff, I think this is where Anprims fail, is that Anprims, they don't, excuse me, they don't distinguish between technologies very well, um, or just primitivists in general. They, they have a lot of trouble distinguishing between technologies, whereas my, it's my, my answer to the technological problems of the world, like, the fact that technology presents a whole bunch of problems in that it empowers people and anything that gives people power is going to corrupt because that's just kind of the nature of power uh, is to build better technology that sort of democratizes that power. In other words, uh, a computer that is so complicated that no one person could ever understand it, like, like the Mac I'm recording this on, or even you know, like the ThinkPad uh, X220 that I make music on, uh, I, I might stand a chance if I really tried hard of understanding every single program on that ThinkPad. Um, but the hardware is extremely complicated when you compare it to the sort of thing I'm thinking about, which is maybe like a 6502 8-bit computer, uh, like, like the NES or... Uh, I, I think the, uh, oh, fuck, what's it called? Not the Spectrum. Um, uh, my memory is failing me. I'm going to have to go on the 8-bit eight, the eight bit, eight bit computer. Um, hold on a second. Um... You're going to just tell me what one is? Notable 8-bit computers, please tell me. Uh, oh, well, who fucking cares? The Mega 65 is a modern example. Uh, of, of, yeah. Commodore 64, that's what I was thinking of. That's not, is that 8-bit? Yeah, it is 8-bit. Commodore 64, that's the one I was thinking of. Um... Like, a Commodore 64 is is understandable by one person. An NES is understandable by one person. But, the thing is, you the, the thing that I think is important is um, the ability to... How do I even put... Compartmentalize. The, the ability to break a complex system down into its individual parts and be able to understand each individual part completely and then be able to understand how those parts connect completely. And in that way, you can have extremely complex and powerful systems that are human scale and easily understandable. And in that way, you're taking away uh, the power over us that technology has, and you're empowering yourself over that technology. Because the second something gets so big and complicated and obfuscated that you can't hope to understand it, suddenly it has to be doing stuff for you. It has to be making decisions that you didn't make because you can't make them, right? It's not insidious. It's not doing it on purpose to, to spite you. Sometimes it is, you know, 
it can be used like that by by Microsoft or or whatever, but not necessarily on purpose. You know, it's not being being harmful on purpose to, the, all of the time. It's just that it, it it's it suddenly is controlling what you can and can't do. Whereas with a simple set setup like like the way modular synthesis works, where you have something like a a, a voltage control oscillator, is extremely easy to understand how that works. Uh, a a voltage controlled filter is extremely easy to understand. An LFO is extremely easy to understand. Uh, a mixer is extremely easy to understand. Each of these modules might take, you know, a couple minutes to wrap your head around if you are coming from zero knowledge of how synthesis works, how additive syn- or subtractive synthesis works. You can all of the component parts of a sort of basic primitive subtractive synth you can understand each of those parts in a couple of minutes and yet like with just those tools you can build you know a large portion of electronic music Uh, and i don't think not understanding something fully is necessarily a problem Uh, for example there are some uh, synth modules that are built to be purposefully obfuscated and kind of surprising because there's one of the points of modular synthesis is that it's kind of it's just fun like as it's not just for making serious music it's also kind of a really expensive or fancy toy uh which is a, which is good that's a that's a good thing it should be a toy um and so having since where you're not quite sure what the, the parameters might have abstract labels and you're not quite sure what they do and you get a surprise when you when you fiddle with them and it makes some sort of you somehow is this piece of electronic equipment is able to surprise you that's a really powerful feeling i think that's a that's a fun um part of creativity you want you want this sort of back and forth between the machines at least some people do some people don't you know, and I think that's a, if you're making that decision on your own, that's, that's fine. But even these sorts of things are still simple when compared to, you know, actually complex systems. Um, yeah, it, it can just get to the point, and obviously there's going to be an, an element where, like, individual, uh, both ability, but also just the amount you care is going to change, right? Like, like someone who has spent years and years studying synthesis and, you know, designing their own Max MSP, uh, you know, uh, ch- what are they even called? I don't sig chains, whatever <laughs> stuff. <laughs> and like, it's just like super deep into it. Might have the ability to just design some incredibly complicated sound generation system that would go way over my head. But to this guy... You know, that's fairly simple and basic, and they understand it completely. And again, that's fine. Uh, the problem is once you get, like, it, even stuff like that, where it's like, it's complicated, uh, and it takes years of study, but it is possible for one person to actually fully understand it. Like, even that is fine. I mean, you know, Commodore 64s, they force you to interact with the hardware, because, it, cause it, you know, it's so low level. Um, but it still takes a while to understand what's going on. I definitely couldn't just jump into a, a Commodore 64 and start poking around in memory addresses and know what the fuck I'm doing, right? Like, you have to have you have to have some experience, obviously. Um, but there's a big difference, right, like, between a Commodore 64 or even maybe something a little more complicated than that, which is something that, you know, it takes study to understand, but it is understandable, versus... Uh, a system so complex that y- you no single human stands any chance of possibly understanding it. Of course, that's going to be able to. Of course, of course. Now that that system is making decisions for you, of course, it's going to have some sort of unprecedented amount of control over your life. And the thing is, these you know, you might think I'm say I'm talking about, uh, or or um. Im- implying that there should be strict limitations on what humans are even able to do with technology, but I think that that uh, once you once you go looking around for the sorts of things I'm talking about, you can find 
that these sorts of technologies are able to do extremely powerful things. They might look a little different from the sort of powerful things you're used to, but they can still do extremely powerful and useful things, as well as extremely fun things. Uh, they, they just look a little different. Um, you know, you can have fairly simple protocols like like html you know like something like html css rss uh, and you know maybe uh i don't know something like that right like maybe email like that stuff i i i i i i don't fully understand email i definitely don't fully understand http http is kind of a complicated thing but i do understand a good amount of html like every time I make a website, I understand exactly how it works, and I understand pretty much all there is to know about RSS. It's very, it's very simple. Like with a little bit of study, you can understand these protocols completely, and that's pretty much the whole internet with just that knowledge, right? Like th there's there's a little more stuff you need to know on the sort of hardware side, um, and on the software side. But like that's a pretty big chunk of it, and th that other stuff, you know, is probably fairly doable in a in a simplified form. I would imagine, but I don't actually. I'm kind of talking out of my ass. Once you get to hardware, once you get to networking hardware, that is so outside of my ballpark. <laughs> I don't understand that stuff. Uh, I don't know where to start. Like I've been talking about wanting to learn about how networking works for for so long, and I just don't know where to start. It's kind of annoying. Uh, anyway, I think the important thing is to have fun, and um, what we need to be doing is 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 using no thank you dot is is using neo cities actually They're not even my neo cities we need to be using neo cities we need to be setting up personal websites and all that shit. You know, my uh, my new album, uh, Total Organ Failure Horizon, uh, is now available on cybergrunge.net, uh, which, is, which is a really cool website that I'm a big fan of. Um, and I think, uh, I think you should all go check out cybergrunge.net, not necessarily just to listen to my music, but go ahead and poke around on there. Bunch of interesting stuff. Uh, there, there's a, a couple of things that I, <clears throat> you know, I, I think it's great. I am a little skeptical of the sort of return aspect of this whole thing. As it like the, the, the website is cool and I think it looks great and, and, you know, and so on. Um, however, I, I think what I really have a problem with is there's this thing called... Uh, how do I even put this? There's there's a lot of people who I basically agree with. Like, it ha me even picking any problems with these people is insane. <laughs> because we're so fighting on the same side here that like the I just want to put it out there like these these are my these are my brothers in arms okay these are my comrades uh, brothers and sisters and, and siblings of of indeterminate gender these are these are my comrades uh, in every way shape and form <clears throat> um and I I do think that there is a lot to be said about more old school web design um, in terms of practical usage. However, and yeah, we're being a very big stickler here. I think that we, we ought not get hung up on nostalgia. <laughs> Interesting timing. What song is this again? It's this song. Okay, we've got we've escaped. No, we're back. I don't I don't want this 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 fucking 
I, I found a website. What is this? Surf the web like it's 1999. Surf the web like it's 1999, and it lets you use Netscape Navigator on on a on a CRT. Anyway, I'm just I just want to go to my Neo Cities on this, just just for fun for funsies. Oh, it broke. Okay. Well, interesting. The thing that I just want to... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know, man. I just think we ought not to get too caught up in nostalgia. But the idea of having personalized web... Des like, the thing about 90s web design is... Some of it is 90s aesthetics, like what was just popular then. But a lot of it is also just what is practical for a single amateur person to do within the limit like it's the sort of thing that comes naturally when using html and css like it's just sort of how the internet is supposed to look a little bit it's sort of like the ob it's often the obvious sort of things to do or or the things that that flow naturally out of the tools available and so in that aspect it's cool um like that aspect of it is definitely fine i just i just worry about um, uncritical nostalgia goggles being a little bit uh, limiting, really. Um, yeah, and even, even, well, that's not necessarily relevant, but yeah, you understand what I'm saying? I think you understand what I'm saying. But I would still much rather surf some random 90s style website than any of these dog shit modern, uh, websites you know what I'm saying yeah you know what I'm saying we're in the final hour now you you made it this far pretty impressive I gotta say pretty impressive you stuck with it uh you you saved your position unlike the previous one this one's a lot more rambly so so we don't, we're not going to have timestamps to remember where you were. You're just going to have to, you're just going to have to save your position somehow. But well done. Congratulations. Um, you know what the problem, you know, you know what the problem is with the Backrooms Horror Series by, by Kane Pixels? There's two problems. The first one is that they show the monster just right off the bat everything else in this in the first episode is like perfect and looks photo real until the second you see that that monster which looks awful and ruins any any suspense you may have had uh and then the second thing they did wrong is try and explain the lore of the of the back rooms and the law of explanation they came up with is kind of neat and interesting. Like, it's not a bad law explanation, but it takes away from the mystery of it. The whole point of it is it's like a video games thing, but in real life, and it's weird. But it kind of makes sense from a video game logic perspective. But when you try and just make it a real life logic perspective, I don't know. It's it's an interesting thing, but it's also... And I mean, it's very well made, so I don't want to complain about it too much. Because just one guy that makes it is pretty impressive. Uh, but I... Yeah, I don't know. Complaining about it is kind of stupid. <laughs> it's kind of... It's neat. I just wish the monster was less lame. It's my big, big problem, I guess. You know what is cool? I, I I keep thinking back on the uh the anti memetic thingy. The SCP anti memetic thingy. That's kind of that's that's such a cool cool thing. It's like the the best SCP thing I've ever seen. And it's it's really well written and, and neat. Even though it gets a bit ridiculous towards the end. But the, the beginning, like, most of it is pretty good. Even the end bits are still cool. They're just kind of different. 
uh, yeah. You know, this ThinkPad running a... Run, running a um, uh, VCV rack, it can get a little taxing on the system. Like, sometimes my CPU kind of slows down and it gets kind of hot. Which is a little annoying, because I haven't really done anything super complicated yet. It's normally when I'm using reverb, like reverb, it makes sense, like convolution reverb or whatever, IR shit they're doing for whatever reverb plugin I have. Like, the thing is, I wish, I wish there was a, a thing on the VCVRAC website that would, that would show you uh, on, like, the library of plugins. Like, they have a tab if you only want to use free or open source uh, plugins, which is which is good. Um, it would be nice if they had sort of a minimum requirements thing, but I guess you can't because one one plugin is not gonna, or or one module rather, is not gonna tax your system that much no matter what you're doing because you can't really do anything with just one module of any kind. So I guess it's kind of hard. Uh, I guess I just have to try out a bunch of shit. Um, but that's fine. It's very fun, I have to say. This is like the, this is like a, it's a whole new way of making music, and it's finally, after years of searching through tracker programs, like Sunvox, and, uh, and LMMS, uh, st stuff, like, it's not a tracker, but, like, I mean, like, searching through trackers, and in addition to searching through trackers, also using LMMS, uh, I finally found a setup on Linux that actually works for me with completely free open source software and that's fucking epic that's that's an epic moment uh, of course it should be expected that this is an old computer and it's going to run kind of slow and maybe there's an alternative where I can use Orca with something like Tidal Cycles um, but I'm, I'm uh, I think or, no, that's not what it's... Is Tidal Cycles is just the language? Hold on, I, I got it mixed up, I think. What am I thinking of? I don't remember. Whatever the synth is, that's like the standard thing they use with... Hold on. Is it Tidal Cycles? That's the live coding... Super Collider, I think, is the thing I'm thinking of. Maybe? Possibly. That might be what I'm thinking of. Um, yeah, I think this is what I'm thinking of, because I think this runs really, really efficiently and fast. Uh, it might be kind of tricky to wrap my head around. I don't know if Orca can... I Actually, I highly doubt that Orca can, can do enough. Orca is pretty much just a, a sequencer. I mean, it's not just pretty much. It is just a sequencer. So, yeah. I'll have to figure out... I'm still 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 figuring out a workflow, but having a lot of fun doing it. You know, generally I am pretty against moderators on the internet. I feel like they have a, a lot a lot of power and a lot of ability to abuse it, and they often do abuse it. I think uh it's not just a, a big company thing. Uh in fact, it's it's maybe it's just as bad, if not worse, in small communities. Like back in the day, you'd have forums where a mod would just get like mad, and just like trash the whole forum, just banning people left and right. You know, this sort of thing used to happen fairly constantly. I think people have forgotten. Uh, so you know. At least on Twitter or whatever, you know, you can you can just be a small account and sort of fly under the radar. But not to not to to give any credence to Twitter's moderation team, who are also pretty heavy handed and misguided. Uh, I, I think it, it's pretty it's pretty common that moderators abuse their power. Uh, on Mastodon, there's a similar sort of thing where, uh, I've told this story before, but, uh, uh, I, uh, I got a, uh, a message 
I, when I briefly was using Mastodon, um, I, I got a message from a, uh, from, from a, a moderator from, actually it was from the guy who ran the instance I was using. Should I name and shame? I'm not going to name and shame. You know what? I'm not going to name and shame. It was a mid-sized instance. Let's just put it, say that. Mid-sized instance. And uh, I said something about fat people. Um, it wasn't even that bad. It wasn't like all fat people should should die or anything like that. It wasn't that bad. Um, it really wasn't. But I got a, like a, a very strongly worded message from that guy and they deleted my post. Um, and so I started looking into it. And this guy had had uh, deleted a. I don't know. This, this guy was interesting. This the the owner of that instance. So I started saying, I started uh, tooting as they call it on Mastodon. I started posting that that the lead mod was a state actor. I started posting that this guy was a, a or that the owner of the server was a state actor, and this really triggered him. I guess, because he banned me real quick, and when I went lol lol lol, that's no problem, this is a federated system, I can just move to another system, to, to another instance, and, and continue, I found that this guy had somehow communicated, because I used the same name, right? and I followed a bunch of the same people, that this this guy had somehow communicated with the admins of other popular instances to get me cross-instance banned. So what I ended up actually doing was making a Pleroma account, which is also a Fediverse activity pub thing that can intercommunicate with Mastodon, but it's not Mastodon, it's a slightly different Twitter clone. Um... Uh, yeah, and I made one there. I used it, and this time with a completely different alias, persona, and vibe, and everything. Um, and that was safe, but then I stopped using it because it was fucking boring. <laughs> uh, so I've I've been at the the the, I I don't know. I think it's pretty fucking cringe to ban someone for calling you a state actor. Like if you get really triggered and not just ban someone, but then like, put someone on some sort of ban list and, like, you know, communicate with, with moderators of other popular servers. I literally joined, and I got a message from the admin of this server, this other server. I forget exactly. This was a good few years ago now, so I don't remember exactly what it said. But it was something like, it was a very snarky message. Like, I remember the tone being very snarky. It wasn't this. It wasn't this. Like, I, I it definitely wasn't these exact words, but it was something, this is how, this is, like, my memory of it was it was something along the lines of like like oh no 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 i see what you're trying to do here no 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 buddy you're out of here it was something like that it was something along those sorts of lines it wasn't like actually those words but it like that was the sort of vibe that i had i don't know pretty fucking s stupid i say all this to set up like i'm fairly anti moderation i i feel like these sorts of places should probably be moderated uh I don't know. There's there's better systems, is what I'm saying. There's better ways to go about it. Stuff like containment boards is a good way to help filter out some of the the noise from the signal. And there's a bunch of other techniques. I've I've talked about this before, but um, all of that being said, for someone who is fairly anti-moderation, I am very pro-moderation in one particular place, which is live stream chats. I have been in live streams with unmoderated chats. I'm talking slightly bigger, not like the size of, of me or maybe Osaka, but like bigger than that. We're talking, you know, because live streams that small, it doesn't really matter. But I, I think live stream chats need to have quite strict moderation um, to be to be usable. This is my this is my opinion that that maybe contradicts my other opinions and the truth is I'm not sure why like I can't philosophically justify it I just think like 
it makes a better experience. I think if you're going into a, a if you're going onto a forum, I don't know, you know what I, I, I don't know. I, I can't really justify it. I just feel like in the case of live stream chat moderation, a heavy handed approach is best. Although, I think permabans aren't so great. I, I don't think there should be things that, that cause a first offense permaban. I think you, if, if you do something that's really, like let's say you just go into a chat and your first ever message is the N-word, you should get a timeout for like a year, I think. Uh, and then with a message that says don't do that. And then if in a year you come back and you just do it again, then you get a perma. I don't think there should be first offense perma bans. But like, that's just, I'm, I'm, that's still fairly, I mean, I guess the N-word is pretty harsh, but like if you're shit talking, I don't know. I think I think live stream chats work best when they're fairly strongly moderated. Apparently Hogwarts Legacy came out some sort of Harry Potter video game. And of course there's a lot of controversy surrounding it. Because because of JK Rowling being a, a fairly controversial figure. Because because she's a turf or whatever. Um uh, you know, the one side is arguing, uh, don't, you know, money from the game is going to go to her, and so you're sort of supporting her, which is, which is bad. And the other side is arguing, like, you know, uh, you, you can't avoid support, like, you can't avoid supporting fucked up shit in this world. Like, is it really worth depriving yourself of something that's going to bring you joy just to spite someone you don't like. And then I'm over here, like, who the fuck cares about playing a Harry Potter video game? Go play Lego Harry Potter. What the fuck is wrong with you? You're a fucking grown-ass adult playing a Harry Potter video game. What the fuck are you doing with your life? What the fuck are you doing? You're fucking 20... You're, like, in your 20s right, and you're spending your money that you worked for on a fucking Harry Potter video game, bro, fucking fix your life, <laughs> get some, get some real fucking brains, get some real problems, I don't know, man, what are you doing, who cares about a, don't buy up the game, because it's fucking shit, <laughs> go play a good video game instead, what are you doing, and also, there's, like, a Harry Potter game from, like, 2004 that's, like, the PS1 Harry Potter game that's fucking based as a, and actually good as a game, and everyone likes it. If you really desperately need to play a Harry Potter game, just play that one. What the fuck are you doing playing Hogwarts? Playing Hogwarts as an adult? Playing Hogwarts as an adult? What are you doing with your life? You know, I'm really happy. There are so there's there's so much shit in the world, but there is also so much good art. This is the point. That I, there's so much terrible art, but then all of that has to exist so that Puss in Boots The Last Wish can exist. And the fact that Puss in Boots The Last Wish grossed significantly more than Avatar Way of the Water just makes me, just fills me with a sense of satisfaction with the way, it, the state of the world. It did gross more. It, it grossed more. It didn't make more net, but I it was see, it had a much, it was like 90 million budget. It made like, uh... I don't remember like two hundred and fifty but no more than that, way more than that. I don't remember. But it made a more it made it grossed more. Hey, studios, maybe pour your money into making better movies instead of bigger movies. Uh yeah. That was a great film. I think I liked it more than you did, Don't Smoke. Yeah, I liked it. I liked it a lot. I would say it's like a seven out of ten. I would say it's a strong eight. Yeah. Yeah, like a like a eight point seven. 
I would say it's like a 7.4. I see. Yeah, I think I liked it more than But also, you're more lenient with, like, your higher ratings than I am. That is so <clears throat> not true. No, but, like, I don't rate things 8s. Like, you rate things 8s, like, way more than I do. So, like, your 8 is, like, my high 7. That's probably not true. That is true. We've compared the stats before. Maybe. We've literally compared our stats. I think you're using the numbers wrong. I mean, to me, like, an 8 and a 9 are exclusive ratings. Yeah, this is an exclusive rating. This was a film that was good in a way that was exceptional to the norm. Like, 7? What's a 7 film? Let's say... Uh, Con Air. I haven't seen it. Um, the Matrix. The Matrix, 1. On rewatching it a few times, I know some people think it's the best movie ever made. I think The Matrix 1 is an 8. I think Puss in Boots The Last Wish is a better movie than The Matrix. I think The Matrix ages out the Puss in Boots. You know what? It's not really fair because I think part of it is just that The Matrix is very like culturally oversaturated. Yeah, yeah. So like the ideas in it feel kind of old. and out, mm-hmm. But like, yeah, so maybe that's not a fair comparison. What's another movie that we would rate the 7? Let me think. A movie that I would rate the 7. <coughs> Uh, it has to. It's. I don't think about movies that are good, but not that good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't even know what a, what's a movie that I would rate a five. What's like a perfectly mid tier movie? The first ever two movie. That's the perfect. Yeah, five. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know what? Or maybe, maybe the first Iron Man. No, that's like a six. No, not to me. It's. Well produced. No, it's. No, I rewatched it, and I actually I might even give it a four. To be fair. I think it doesn't hold up because it's been recontextualized a million times. No, I I went back to it like a couple of years ago, and found it to be pretty bad. <laughs> I think it holds up, other than being a military propaganda movie, which like half of the movies yeah. ever made are. Like, that's yeah no that's not the problem i don't remember the exact problems that i had with I it i like the sound design and fight choreography a lot. The, i don't like the i thought the fight choreography was i like just it. like huge clunky piece of metal trying to fight i think i think th- i think the how did you solve the icy problem is a very satisfying setup and payoff because i still remember that yeah i remember that like that's the thing that stuck with me from the first time i watched the film and i, I knew it, like, that's this book yeah, yeah that's a really satisfying setup and payoff so it's like i think it's a five for me because it has like that, but then also the villain sucks. I think the <laughs> intro like sequence is good. The intro sequence is good. Then it takes a sharp downhill. And then like the montage of Bill and Tyrion Man suit is good. It's fine. I think it's good. I like the sound design in the movie a lot. I see. I think that's ultimately the reason why I would give it a six. It's just the sound design. All movie. right, let me think of another one then. Uh. I like clink clank sounds. You like clink clank sounds. Yeah. What Gundam? I shoot, but it's so fucking boring to like go through on the Mobile 79 or whatever. Because it's like. Just watch the movies. The thing is, though, it's, it's good. It's just. That's why the movies exist. That's so For true. that exact purpose. That's so true. I just think the Colony Drop is the coolest shit of all time. Right. I'm not really into Mecha. So, like, the thing is, like, Mecha is like off putting for me as like a gimmick. Mm-hmm. But, like, the Colony Drop is so fucking pog. Probably the best super weapon in any movie or show or anything ever. I think you can't beat it. Mm-hmm. The only thing I can think of as like a perfectly mid film is... Hmm. Actually, that's not it. That's kind of a bad film, actually. This may be a four. Uh, I think Avatar 1 is perfectly Yeah, mid. maybe Avatar 1. I just don't remember it that well. That's why it's perfectly mid. Yeah, okay, sure. That's per- Okay, that's a perfectly mid film. Yeah. Then like a 6 out of 10, you would say Iron Man 1. I'm I want to use it as an example. Maybe, I think The Avengers is a 6 out of 10 film. I think The Avengers is worse than Iron Man 1. You think so? Yeah, I think it's just way too long for what it is. Honestly, I don't remember The Avengers The thing much. with Avengers 1 okay, is it's really six, fucking boring. Actual 6 out of 10 movie... I think maybe maybe Guardians two. I 
I don't know about that, but Guardians 1 is a perfect 7. Guardians yeah. 1 is a good 7, yeah. 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 This was better than Guardians, significantly better than Guardians 1. Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, at least a full point better than Guardians 1. I think it's like point point better than Guardians 1. No, I but think... But I think it... there's just our point scaling difference. Yeah. I think we think it's the same amount better as than Guardians 1. So I guess to me, Guardians 1 would be like a 7 point. No, one. I'm talking like on a logarithmic scale. The way earthquakes work. On a logarithmic scale, no show this. Is on a logarithmic scale, uh, Puss in Boots is a hundred times better than Guardians 1. To be fair, I don't use a logarithmic scale. I use like a, a generous exponential thing for 8 signs and 10s. I, I think of it as a bell curve, right? To me, it's like a bell curve. And then you get into like the 8 signs and 10s and it goes like... You know. But I don't see why you would have an imbalance. Because tens have to be imbalanced to me. But th- I've already talked about this. Tens are imbalanced by their nature because it's a scale of one, with, but where one is possible. So it's mm-hmm. basically from zero, counting zero is not counted, yeah. up to ten. Yeah. So ten is the upper limit. Yeah. Right? And like that's, that's the reason it's because I... Because I, the, the reason it's imbalanced is that you can have a 1.5 but you can't have a 10.5 in a 10-point yeah. scale. So therefore, since 10 is the upper limit, nothing can ever really be a 10. So it has to be a I think things zero. can be the upper limit. Like, to me, Mushishi is a 10, like, easily. Like, I don't think you can make Mushishi better than Mushishi. Um, so to me, that's I've, I've only seen the anime. You're probably talking yeah. about the manga, which I haven't read. The, the anime is really amazing. Or not so as Enjutsu. That's an easy thing. You can't tell that story in a better way, no matter what you try it. It, it tells the story it's trying to tell in the best possible way. <clears throat> you know what's a 10? The Epic of Gilgamesh. I don't think that's a 10. Because it's lasted all of this time. And it's a good story. It is a good story. He be G- G- Gilgamesh and Enkidu, yeah. they're bros. They're bros. It's sick. Yeah, Gilgamesh is sick, but I don't think it'll be it's, Yeah, maybe it's not a 10. Yeah, but to me, it's like, since 10s are inherently special due to the fact that they're the upper limit, something that's 9 has to be approaching a 10. Yeah, I agree. And something that's 8 has to be approaching a 9. That's just Zeno's paradox. Yeah, but 10, ten after an 8, it's like, there's enough stuff in the world that I can just fucking dash. But what, dash out what, what, is, what is an 8 for you? Let me think. Movie. Eight movie. Doctor Strange Love. That's okay. an eight for me. That's a pretty high for an eight. So what's a nine movie for you? It's like a fucking Melancholia or Synecdoch in New York. Or the meme monster would be like a Blade or a Mean Girls. I see. Yeah. And no ten movies? I haven't seen a movie that's called a ten. I see. Because I haven't seen that many movies. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Those are a different level of thing. I guess that makes sense. But th- yeah, I guess to me, the nines would also be nines. But then like, what did you say was an eight again? I forgot. Uh, uh, Doctor Strange Love. Doctor Strange. Yeah, Doctor Strange Love is an eight. I'm okay with actually. Yeah. I think Kubrick's I don't think Puss in Boots <laughs> comes that close to Doctor Strange Love. I, I think it does. I don't think it's in this. It's a different, because... They're different types of things. I think it succeeds in its goals as well as Doctor Strange Love succeeds in its goals. I, I mean, here's the only problem I had with the movie. Yeah. The creative team, the fucking design work for like the fucking the animation was pretty much perfect. Yeah. The animation was a ten basically. Yeah. It was as good as Into the Spider Verse, which is really fucking good. Yeah. Yeah, and I especially liked how every like person who had a weapon had like a fucking unique particle effect for your weapon yeah i think i thought that was dope as fuck yeah that, that was the dopest shit ever. i i really like the variable frame rate like when when a fight's about to start yeah. when, every time shit's about to get real yeah. it's animated on twos and you're like yeah. oh shit it's on twos shit's about to get yeah. fucking real and yeah it works so well yeah so like on on that level it's a 10 but like i don't think the story conveyed its messages properly and that was most what do you mean like, let, let me. I think the beginning and then were perfect, but I think when it came to the middle, it was like, to me, it was super bogged down, by like. A sort of like. 
Disneyfication by osmosis? I disagree. I think there's one section that that is was was a, like wait like not good. Mm-hmm. If I had to point out like a a, a sequence that I felt dragged the yeah. movie down, it's the the smell the roses sequence. Yeah, like that scene was too on the nose. That was too on the nose for like it was poetic in a way, so I can explain. It was, fu- but the point, like the point of that scene, is that they the they they literally describe the the what's his fucking name the dog guy. Yeah. Spoilers ish, but. They describe, when they see, like, his version of the world when he touches yeah. them up, they say, like, it's corny, it's cheesy, or whatever. Yeah. And then he does something really corny and cheesy. And the point is, like, so being happy and satisfied with your life is, but, like, you just have to let go of your yeah. ego and, you know, that's, yeah. like, it's a setup for that. Like, to me, to me, it's, like, it suffers from push, uh, fuck, post I don't think there was I don't think there was any Disneyfication at all. I no, but, like, the thing is... Is a trick fundamentally changed Disney films and created a new formula for like conveying the type of like message that Disney would like to convey in the framework of like a post trick world where it's like it's willing to use like quote unquote adult motifs and stuff, but it's not so willing to do that they will sacrifice like like for example, the best the first fucking thing in the movie for me was how the um a uh, fucking Goldilocks and Free Bears situation was already solved in the middle of the movie when they went into the fucking cabin and then but No it wasn't solved when they went into the cabin. It was pretty much solved through the flashback. No it wasn't. That was not a solving the thing. That was that was a setup for the solving the thing at the, the end. To me it's like that, they didn't reach a state of emotional catharsis. That was... No, I, I didn't have any... I think I it think didn't deserve the, emotional catharsis. I think it did. I mean... The, to, the thing with, like, Shrek... What made Shrek the original good, right? Was that it didn't require every arc to have an emotional catharsis. And I feel like... The fact that the movie, like, played super... It's into, not Shrek, though. It's a, di- it's a different... It's thing. not Shrek. But that's what I'm saying. It's, like, post, post-Shrek osmosis disnification no i disagree i strongly disagree with this yeah yeah i think the 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 goldilocks thing okay not disnification pixarification it's not pixarification either i feel like it is i disagree i I don't think so at all i i just think it was a, a straight it was a straightforward story yeah it wasn't like shrek is all about subverting tropes for comedy that yeah. was like the whole gimmick of shrek and that, that's also been the gimmick of Puss in Boots from the first and the second movie. Well, the, it's a Shrek spin-off. Yeah, it's a Shrek but spin-off. But the second, this was not a, a trope subversion movie. It was movie. a cowboy trope subversion No, it movie. wasn't. It was not a cowboy trope. I disagree. The, the point of the movie was that cowboys aren't that cool. No, that was not the point of that the movie. That was a bit of the point. The point of the movie was uh, confronting your own ego in the face of death. Yeah, that's true. But also, like, the other point is, like, the, the way you get to death... It's by having, like, a fucking heart-drinking, travel-rousing cowboy life, you know? Because Puss in Boots I mean, is a cowboy, especially in this movie. That exists just... No, Puss in Boots is an outlaw. He, yeah, but he's... He's Zorro. He's Zorro, but Zorro... Like, the modern incarnations of Zorro are just a cowboy. The modern incarnation of Zorro is Jack Sparrow. Yeah, that's true, but, but I'm talking... This is the, the final... So, the the final... The, the, the most recent Pirates movie... Yeah has the same setup as this movie yeah. where it's like I, I don't know I think it's I think it was a, it's I don't know I, I, I don't it's not cowboys aren't cool it's cowboys aren't sustainable <laughs> yeah but like or it, actually it's being being a cowboy won't make you happy it's like it's like this is the story of what happens after you ride off into the sunset. Yeah, and that's cool. Yeah, it's like, yeah, you, you know what's after the sunset? Fucking nothing. Yeah, but... Because the movie ends at the sunset for a reason, you but know? But also, there's, there's a whole bunch of cowboy movies that are, like, actually about how being a cowboy sucks. Well, that's true. There's probably more cowboy movies about how being a cowboy sucks. Yeah, but they're, they're about, like, how being a cowboy sucks in a cool way. The, like yeah, it's cool but that I, being a I like sucks. I like the fact that this movie is is saying like, uh, it, it's presenting a choice, right? 
Would yeah. you rather be this legendary cool figure or would you rather be happy and satisfied in life? Yeah. And in the end, he makes the choice to be happy and satisfied. That's, yeah, a, that's that, a nice... That was good. That that's was good. That's a good message. It's interesting. I haven't seen... You don't see that too often. It's not Disney for kids. Like, Disney wouldn't do a movie But, like, like the like problem... Yeah, Disney obviously isn't... Like, the main narrative isn't disney fight at all, which is why I think the main narrative, like, beginning and end are perfect. But I think, like, the fucking... Uh, Goldilocks narratives and like the fucking whatever the big guy narrative are I feel like those got like I feel like those got stretched out because they needed to start at the beginning and end at the end I, I agree that the Goldilocks characters aren't as fleshed out as I'd like them to be like I feel like I you, you know what I think would make the movie perfect what if uh, you had the start stay exactly the same but then in the middle section, the Goldilocks characters arrive in the fucking dark forest way before the big guy arrives, right? And then up and up until like the middle part, they're like the main force driving like plot progress. And then once they get to the cabin, like Goldilocks just goes like starts having self doubt and slowly starts phasing out and then doesn't go towards the wish. I feel like that's where no, she should that have would made suck her as a movie. No, that would suck. I don't think that would. That suck. would hundred percent suck. The point is to have all of to. That would a hundred. That would be a terrible movie. I just didn't like how all the characters were together at the end. I guess. Why not? I feel like it was just too much. I feel like the individual like senses of catharsis got diluted by him happening all at once. You know. That's weird. I I disagree. I think they had a, a waveform combination where they multiplied each other, even though that like, the the Puss in Boots now na- like his main narrative yeah. was strong enough to stand on its own. Yeah. Right. The the Goldilocks thing. I feel like it could have been better if the characters had been more fleshed out. Yeah. Um, like, you know, the the each of the bears was pretty one note. Yeah. Which, to be fair, like they were basically background comedy relief characters for the po- like that was kind of their purpose in the movie. I, I guess the was, problem is that their jokes just didn't really land on me. Yeah, that's the first thing. That they really exist. And like, like we already have comic relief in the dog. Yeah, I mean the reason they exist is for this this the ending of the cabins, like for that that section where yeah, that was to me that was like perfect, and I feel like yeah, but that's I, an important narrative beat that has to be hit, and that's why they're in the yeah, movie. Yeah, but I feel like when the dog goes like, oh, you won the orphan lottery, and then but also the, it it exists. It's it's important to contrast to to that they exist to contrast the the big bad whatever yeah. his name is. What's it? I, I, I forget. Right. Big guy, the mean? big bad guy. It's important that they exist to contrast him because uh, on the one hand you have victims of circumstance and on yeah. the other hand you have irredeemable evil. And then you have just death. And then you have just death. Right? Yeah. Like these three antagonists that all represent like one's like a force of nature. Yeah. One's just evil guy. Yeah. And one is like people who are doing bad stuff but, but like... But because they're like victims of circumstance and having one of them actually be redeemable yeah is like i think really important yeah but i feel like the point the better point for her to be redeemed was add some more build up before the wish like two lines of dialogue or something uh, like spread out her revealing her wish a bit and so on and so on and then like i think it would have been like cooler for her to be like i'm just not gonna go towards the wish you know i disagree because then they would have just disappeared out of the movie, and it's like, what was they the would point have of disappeared. having They would them? have still been there once the main characters get back from the fight. But they would have just had, like, a little cameo at the end. That would have sucked. But they, it would have felt like, why were they even in the movie? If they just, they show up, and then they just disappear yeah, halfway like, through like the film. The, the fucking terrain shift fight scene was... Yeah, and then they just walk away? That would have sucked. No, they wouldn't have walked away. They would have still continued walking and just slowly gotten worn down by doubt. And just been like, I. What the fuck sort of movie is this? This is an insane. I, I this would have. I don't know. I don't think this would have fit. Maybe the that's film. not the problem. In a solution. in a completely different movie, I yeah. think that could that idea I, works. I just I just don't like how all the plot is solved in one moment. That's how movies work. Yeah, but, but that's how baby Disney movies work. That's just how, it's a straightforward narrative. Yeah, it's not like, like a postmodern. I, I guess I mean, to me, it's kind of like, is a postmodern. To me, it's thing, like but... I'm I'm just comparing it to Shrek too much, because one of the best parts of Shrek was that the narratives weren't solved at the same time. The na- Shrek literally ends with a big fight where all the narratives are solved. I, I, I guess, but there's a lot of, like all the side characters get their little arcs in the middle, basically. Like it's just Donkey Shrek 
And like four quad who get sold at the end, and that's three characters and not like a million. There's not a million characters. There's a lot of like side characters who just like wanna be free or whatever in Shrek, like the cookie gingerbread man. No, I'm talking about but the gingerbread man's just a cop. He doesn't have an arc, really. Actually, he does have an arc that gets resolved. And it gets resolved at the end, it? when he gets big. At the end, in the final fight, and he's like... That's the final movie, not the first Shrek movie. Is that the final movie? Uh, no, that's the... F- I, wait, am I remembering Yeah, that's the final Shrek movie. I, if I remember, I thought what happens in Shrek is there's a castle, and then La Vida Loca plays, and then co- the cookie I mean, guy here, here, is really big. Here's what happens And he's in, like, oh, I'm a big cookie guy. Here's what happens in Shrek... Shrek's a guy living in the woods, right? And then and the then property developers... Somebody once told me... me. Yeah. The, then the property developers come in, basically, and go like, fuck magic, and start rounding Shrek up, and then Shrek sees all the other rounded up guys or whatever, and Shrek goes like, I'm, go- I'm gonna beat up whoever's doing this because I want my fucking swamp hut. And then he picks up Donkey through, like, chaotic circumstances. He goes to the Far Quad Castle. Tapped environment has its own, like, tiny little story arc with, like all the people living there and shit and then Shrek goes up to Farquaad and goes like you're a fuckwad right and then they go towards like the Fiona castle some other stuff happens and then Donkey just makes eyes at the dragon Shrek rescues yeah. Fiona and then they ro- ogres together and then the dragon kills Farquaad okay yeah but like there's the plots in the middle are what like in, in Shrek they don't give side characters like but the these aren't side characters Side characters, like, those, these are main antagonists. The, the movie just has three main antagonists, which is kind of a weird thing, and they just don't really have time to flesh them out. Like, if the movie was longer... Yeah, but I think the problem was is they fleshed out Goldilocks too much. They, they, that's the point. They fleshed out Goldilocks herself too yeah. much and not the bears enough. Okay, you're actually so right. Yeah, that's what one. I was trying to say. Oh, you're so right yeah. in this one. Yeah, if, if they, like, fucking... You, you know what was actually the problem? Yeah. Baby bear was a plot device. Yeah, the bear, like, all of the bears are, like, definitionally one-note characters. Like, I think Mama Bear and Daddy Bear, like, were fine. But I think Baby Bear, sh- if Baby Bear got more development, then I could have, like, yeah, understood that, the catharsis at the end. Yeah, the fact that he, yeah, no, I actually fully agree. Yeah, because Baby like, Bear Like, saving was, him at the end is, like, who is he? He's just the annoying guy that smells. He was just kind of smells. a dick the entire yeah, time. Yeah, he just smells things. That's all he, that's yeah, just the character like, trait. So, like, the cathartic moment being, like, Goldilocks rescuing the guy who has been just kind of a dick to her. Yeah. And telling her that the, she's not really their family yeah. and whatever throughout the entire movie. That was like, to me, that was the part that kind of like was just. No, too I much. I agree with you there. Yeah. I think the baby bear needed better characterization. Yeah. And also, like, I'm, I'll be kind of real. I, I would have fucking loved if they just shoved the big guy in a bag and it just didn't get out. Yeah, I also kind of wish that had happened. Yeah. I, I really liked the way it was sort of unceremonious. I, I was. I was yeah. a little disappointed when he came out, and then it was a. I mean, we knew he was gonna come. Yeah, out. but I was like, I was thinking like, would would they just leave him in a bag for eternity? Yeah. Like that would be cool. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that too. So it's just like I th- I think it was just too much big stuff happening yeah, at the end. But all of that I can forgive. I see. For I see. like like those are to me relatively minor points. Like if you I'm like the actual screen time, of like the bear catharsis. It's pretty not a big part of the movie. Like, I would easily trade lack of bear catharsis for fucking fighting death, and then he says, "Pick it up to death." Yeah, that's the coolest fucking moment I've seen in a film in years. But like what I'm saying is like, to me, to me, if if the movie was this movie scoured Hollywood for every single gruff voiced Spanish man. Yeah. Like, there is no gruff-voiced Spanish man <laughs> who doesn't have a part in this movie. Yeah. Like, I, I think... Like, I, the thing is, like, I'm conflicted about... Because, like, the movie has, like... The high points of the movie, to me, are perfect tense. But I, to me, I guess it just gets, like, way too muddled by, like, the other stuff going on all the fucking time. I like the fact that there's a lot of stuff going on. I see. I feel like it keeps... Like, it's, it's very... I mean, firstly, you have to, they are writing to keep kids interested, and yeah, I'm yeah, kind yeah, of an yeah. ADHD. I, at heart, I'm an ADHD child. Yeah. So it's like there's lots of colors. Yeah. And lots of things moving, and lots of things like like lots of threads going at yeah. once, and I like that. Um, I you know what it is for me. I think I realized why we dis- why we disagree on this. I've seen Homestuck do it better. 
Yeah, but Homestuck takes place over the course of five million pages, or more probably. Yeah, but like, it's this a, is a movie. It's not really it's comparable. A movie, yeah, but like what I'm saying is like, and also Homestuck's gay. I ca- I can't be impressed by having eleven relevant characters in a movie. Yeah, I mean, I've fucking read Horizon in the Middle of Nowhere. There's literally 20 main characters yeah. in, in that vision. Yeah, but Horizon novel. doesn't do this good as Homestuck. Horizon does other things better than Homestuck. I mean, I don't... the cost. Homestuck's un- literally unreadable. Yellow text. Yellow text on a white background. What were they you thinking? just highlight it. I'm not going to highlight it for 10,000 pages. Just comment a on your Mac. That's so retarded. Just don't use that. Don't do that. <laughs> just don't do that how about that it's a mechanic it's and it's not just that it's the, <laughs> the whole troll right i just find like that writing system really annoying yeah it, it anyway it's not just yeah, the can color you, can you parse lead speak just organic i can pass normal lead speak the one that speaks in normal lead speak i can pass fine most of them speak no they speak in weird there's like speak. three that, that speak in yeah and those speak. are the ones that are the, 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 the one of them's yellow one of them's yellow. Yeah, they, it's just uh, it's just too bad. I mean, he speaks in normal way speak to him, he's just yellow. No, isn't he the one that has like sevens everywhere or something? I, I don't he's, remember. He's the one with the zeros. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, who cares about Homestuck? Yeah. Like, what I'm saying is just like... I'll tell you what Homestuck doesn't have. Homestuck doesn't have a wolf with two scythe blades that combines the scythe blades into a Darth Maul double scythe blade. But it could have that. But it doesn't. It doesn't. But yeah, it's like... To be honest, I kind of didn't like the Darth Maul double scythe blade. The Darth Maul double scythe blade was fucking sick. I, I like the single blades more because they had like... The like single blades were cool, but... And like latches. I, I like the latches a lot. Yeah, but the, the Darth Maul double scythe blade exists to... Uh, to 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 show that he has like right so in that the first he could do that what I'm saying is in the first no 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 it's a narrative device yeah. in the first fight yeah. he wrecks puss in boots yeah without even really trying yeah. and he's, he literally says too slow like an anime villain yeah right? I've seen that in so many shows yeah. anime where he's just you're slow you're sloppy right yeah. and then at the end it's like I'm I'm actually having to fight so hard that I'm gonna have to transform my weapon into its try hard. That's right, mode. that's right. Right, that like it exists. I know the entire time I was just looking at that, I was like, this is literally less reach. That's what I was yeah, thinking. Yeah, I I mean I was thinking it's rule of cool though. That's true. Well I just but couldn't spin, stop thinking of it like it spins around and it looks cool. I just couldn't stop thinking about how you how you lost reach. I, I literally thought the same thing. Yeah. I here's what here's the exact yeah. thought, but like within a split second I was like wouldn't that make the weapon worse? And then I thought, it looks fucking cool, though. And he spun it, and it looked cool, and I was like, I don't care anymore. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I just couldn't stop thinking about the reach. Yeah. But yeah. you know, even, like, the prop, like... You know what would have been cool? Yeah. If at some point he just slid the fucking double yeah. thing in one hand, like, phew, and, like, grabbed on the puss in boots as boots or something. Yeah. I think that would have been fucking sick. I agree. Yeah. All of the action scenes in this movie were flawless. They were fucking perfect. Yeah. I don't know, like, I, sh- I just think, like, I like the filler, but like, I think I just can't forgive the filler as easily as you can. No, I, I, I feel like if you are if you have three antagonists, like, notice how none of, how we're not talking about how the, the big bad is poorly characterized. Like, it's fine that he's poorly characterized. Yeah. You know? But the thing is, is like, if the big bad, all of his scenes except the poppy fucking field scene were flawless, the poppy field... Or not the pop, or the poppy field. I have fucking the rose fields. Yeah, or whatever. Like that just took too long. I agree. It took yeah. too long. That was but, like, the worst. Every scene other scene of that character were perfect. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I I know it was a good movie. I know it's just weird to me because it's like out of curiosity, what would you rate everything everywhere all at once? Also, we only we we are four minutes away less than from the ending of this podcast. Eight minutes. Eight minutes, so yeah, right, yeah. I, I would give everything, give you a world once, like a seven, two. You're insane to me. That's a seven, that's like a that's like a, a an 8.9 to me. It's closer to an eight than a six. That's like one of the best movies ever. It's really not, it really is. I just like all quiet on the western front or whatever. I'm a bullshit art film person more than you. Wait, are you saying? Are you? Did you just say everything everyone wants is not it's bullshit art? It's too flashy. Art? I it like. It has too many special effects. 
You're you're actually insane. <laughs> you're you're actually schizophrenic. No, I just I'm just saying like it's a cool <laughs> movie, but like CGI action movie can only be so much of an art movie. What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking. No, about. I don't know what you're talking about. Like, like it was too much of a spectacle for me. It's everything. It's everything. And yeah. it's everywhere. It's everywhere. And do you know at what point in time it's happening? It's all at once. It's all at once. Like the fucking truck scene from the movie was my favourite scene. Yeah, that's everyone's favourite scene. Yeah. It's the best scene in the film. It's the best scene in the film. Yeah, but they need you need the contrast with the flashy fight scenes to make the rock scene work. To be honest, I'd the watch rock... a whole movie that was just a rock yeah, scene. Yeah, and the, that, would be a, that would be a fine movie, but it wouldn't be as good as everything. To me, it would be a was. better movie. I disagree. I don't think you actually think that. I don't know if I actually think... I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a slow paced type of movie guy. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of good slow paced movies. Yeah. But you haven't seen any Ozu films, right? I should, but it's hard for me to like commit to two hours of subtitles. That's that's fair. Yeah. I like I like both. I li- I kind of I'm ADHD as fuck. I yeah. kind of need. I like the f- the flashy. I mean, it doesn't have that much like. The special effects, like, I think it's weird to say special effects get in the way of, like, art moviness. Like, that's, like, something that you would hear in, like, 2005. No, like, what, what I'm saying isn't, th- it's, like... <sighs> to me, it's, like, the decree to which it relies on, like, spectacle action gets in the way of the music. It doesn't movie. rely, I don't think that's true. It does no. rely on... No, on I, think the, I, think the, I think the main story is... is only expressible via spectacle action and also the like the point i i i think it's i think it's it's the point it is the point i know it's the point i just don't like like it as much because i'm not no no, i'm not saying no no i i don't mean the point is like sonic adventure one it's a spectacle you don't have any control yeah but like the point is that it's a spectacle because it's the it has to be everything. I mean, it's like the. I don't know. It's hard to put into words, but it it's not that the the story is being propped up by spectacle. It's that the spectacle is existing entirely to serve the narrative. Yeah, but it's, it's like all the fucking phone guy moments and like the audio world exposition and shit. Like that just kind of sucked to me. What? They were cool. I didn't like the exposition parts. I like exposition parts. I like exposition parts generally, but I didn't like them in that movie. Wait, what's the phone guy? It's like the the guy who like the first transitions into the husband and then he's like. Oh, a phone that guy. He's cool. Guy. That's cool. I like that. I I like the guy, but it's just like. I like the whole like, of it. I I I just don't like the entire angle of. Yeah, the entire movie is the result of a science experiment gone wrong with psychics. It's like, ah, uh, to me. What do you mean? I don't like that the antagonist is a science experiment gone wrong. That's not the antagonist. Or, you know what I mean. The inciting the... event. Yeah. The, but that's that's just background law. Yeah, but I don't like that it's tear. It has to be there some... And it's good. It works. It <coughs> makes sense in the movie. It's all good. I don't think it has to be in there. I think they could have done it, like... What would you... I don't understand. No explanation. What don't you... you no, just want no, no technical ex- explanation. I, 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 I won't... But I mean, I think the point... Of, literally, the point of that is to be like, here's a bullshit technical explanation so you're not stuck. So you don't have, like, peasant pedants like me saying, but how does that work? Just, just go like will jumps, exp- like be like, yeah, you can will jump, but you can't will jump too far because that goes fucky wucky, and then you could be like, fucking, yeah, to, whatever, you know what I mean. I don't know. I like the exposition. It's not like it's a very exposition heavy. Yeah, but it's I... it's like all of the world stuff anyway just exists as like a metaphor for the characters. That's true, but it's like. Like the the reason the spec that's a good way to word it. Like the reason the spectacle stuff exists is that it's like an externalization of the character's internal struggles. Yeah, and I I respect that, but it gets. I feel like at certain points it gets too externalized. I disagree. I I mean I think it's I think it's a it, it I mean 
I think there are good movies where characters have internal struggles and it's represented by just a, a, a guy sitting in a room quietly. No, and I'm not saying it should be a qu- guy sitting in a room quietly. I'm just saying when it came to the bullet hop sequences, the worst ones were the flashiest ones. I, I think they did get a little... Okay, this is like a, a, definitely a problem with the movie. Like, I do think it... Did I say it was an 8.9? Yeah. I'm going to downgrade it, actually. Yeah. I think I got a little a little wrapped up in the conversation when I said that. Yeah. I'm going to downgrade it to like a 8 point something. Like yeah. a, a solid 8. Let's just say a solid 8. Yeah. To me, it's like a solid 7. I see. Because to me, an 8 is like Doctor Strange Love. I, I think it's as good as Doctor Strange. I think no it's better than Doctor Strange Love. No shot for me. I see. I, I'll, I'll, I haven't watched Doctor Strange Love in like five, five years. Slow, black and white Kubrick film. Kubrick, most, uh, Kubrick is the world's most overrated director he's not overrated. in the universe. He's dog shit. I feel like he's exactly rated as high as he The Shining be. is a terrible movie. The Shining is a terrible movie. 2001 kind of is a comedy. No one notices 2001 is great though. 2001 is boring. 2001 to me. It's too long. 2001. It's to got me. bullshit at the end. That does. That's just a like flashy okay, metaphor okay, for, okay. for hippies on acid. But to me, 2001 is as good as Puss in Boots and fucking everything I've ever wrote at once. I mean, 2001 is a good film to watch on the big screen at a cinema, uh, but but it's also too long and boring and shit. I don't think it's too long or boring. It's not actually it. shit. I, it's, it's a pretty good movie. But it's I, not I feel as like good it's as everyone says it is. it's a perfect length and perfect boringness. The, his best movie, in my opinion, is Clockwork Orange. Uh, I saw that when I was like 13 because I read the book first. Well, it's been a fun time talking to you guys in this 12 hour long podcast. Sorry for interrupting the flow. What are you doing in my video? What am I doing my... in the thank yous video? And, uh,. Those might be wrong about movies. <laughs> I just have better taste. <laughs> no, you, have, you. I have better taste. I think you'll find. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks for listening. Um, should I wait out the timer to try and try and pause it at fifty nine fifty nine? Because it'll render differently in YouTube anyway. Like YouTube will put it at like a random thing, no matter what you do, so you can't.